Our story today is called The Diamond Lens. It was written by Fitzjames O'Brien. We will tell the story in two parts. Now, here is Morris Joyce with part one of The Diamond Lens. When I was ten years old, one of my older cousins gave me a microscope. The first time I looked through its magic lens, the clouds that surrounded my daily life rolled away. I saw a universe of tiny living creatures in a drop of water. Day after day, night after night, I studied life under my microscope. The fungus that spoiled my mother's jam was, for me, a land of magic gardens. I would put one of those spots of green mold under my microscope and see beautiful forests where strange silver and golden fruit hung from the branches of tiny trees. I felt as if I had discovered another Garden of Eden. Although I didn't tell anyone about my secret world, I decided to spend my life studying the microscope. My parents had other plans for me. When I was nearly twenty years old, they insisted that I learn a profession. Even though we were a rich family, and I really didn't have to work at all. I decided to study medicine in New York. This city was far away from my family, so I could spend my time as I pleased. As long as I paid my medical school fees every year, my family would never know I wasn't attending any classes. In New York, I would be able to buy excellent microscopes and meet scientists from all over the world. I would have plenty of money and plenty of time to spend on my dream. I left home with high hopes. Two days after I arrived in New York, I found a place to live. It was large enough for me to use one of the rooms as my laboratory. I filled this room with expensive scientific equipment that I did not know how to use. But by the end of my first year in the city, I had become an expert with the microscope. I also had become more and more unhappy. The lens in my expensive microscope was still not strong enough to answer my questions about life. I imagined there were still secrets in nature that the limited power of my equipment prevented me from knowing. I lay awake nights wishing to find the perfect lens, an instrument of great magnifying power. Such a lens would permit me to see life in the smallest parts of its development. I was sure that a powerful lens like that could be built, and I spent my second year in New York trying to create it. I experimented with every kind of material. I tried simple glass, crystal, and even precious stones, but I always found myself back where I started. My parents were angry at the lack of progress in my medical studies. I had not gone to one class since arriving in New York. Also. I had spent a lot of money on my experiments. One day, while I was working in my laboratory, 
Jules Simon knocked at my door. He lived in the apartment just above mine. I knew he loved jewelry, expensive clothing, and good living. There was something mysterious about him, too. He always had something to sell, a painting, a rare statue, an expensive pair of lamps. I never understood why Simon did this. He didn't seem to need the money. He had many friends among the best families of New York. Simon was very excited as he came into my laboratory. Oh, my dear fellow, he gasped. I have just seen the most amazing thing in the world. He told me he had gone to visit a woman who had strange, magical powers. She could speak to the dead and read the minds of the living. To test her, Simon had written some questions about himself on a piece of paper. The woman, Madame Wolpes, had answered all of the questions correctly. Hearing about this woman gave me an idea. Perhaps she would be able to help me discover the secret of the perfect lens. Two days later, I went to her house. Madame Vulpes was an ugly woman with sharp, cruel eyes. She didn't say a word to me when she opened the door, but took me right into her living room. We sat down at a large, round table, and she spoke. What do you want from me? I want to speak to a person who died many years before I was born. Put your hands on the table. We sat there for several minutes. The room grew darker and darker, but Madame Vulpes did not turn on any lights. I began to feel a little silly. Then I felt a series of violent knocks. They shook the table, the back of my chair, the floor, under my feet, and even the windows. Madame Vulpes smiled. They are very strong tonight. You are lucky. They want you to write down the name of the spirit you wish to talk to. I tore a piece of paper out of my notebook and wrote down a name. I didn't show it to Madame Vulpes. After a moment, Madame Vulpes' hand began to shake so hard the table moved. She said a spirit was now holding her hand and would write me a message. I gave her paper and a pencil. She wrote something and gave the paper to me. The message read, I am here. Question me. It was signed, Leeuwenhoek. I couldn't believe my eyes. The name was the same one I had written on my piece of paper. I was sure that an ignorant woman like Madame Wolpes would not know who Leeuwenhoek was. Why would she know the name of the man who invented the microscope? Quickly, I wrote a question on another piece of paper. How can I create the perfect lens? Leeuwenhoek wrote back, Find a diamond of 140 carats. Give it a strong electrical charge. The electricity will change the diamond's atoms. From that stone you can form the perfect lens. I left Madame Volpe's house in a state of painful excitement. Where would I find a diamond that large? All my family's money 
could not buy a diamond like that, and even if I had enough money, I knew that such diamonds are very difficult to find. When I came home, I saw a light in Simon's window. I climbed the stairs to his apartment and went in without knocking. Simon's back was toward me as he bent over a lamp. He looked as if he were carefully studying a small object in his hands. As soon as he heard me enter, he put the object in his pocket. His face became red, and he seemed very nervous. What are you looking at? I asked. Simon didn't answer me. Instead, he laughed nervously and told me to sit down. I couldn't wait to tell him my news. Simon, I have just come from Madame Volpi's. She gave me some important information that will help me find the perfect lens. If only I could find a diamond that weighs. One hundred forty carats. My words seemed to change Simon into a wild animal. He rushed to a small table and grabbed a long, thin knife. No, he shouted, "You won't get my treasure. I'll die before I give it to you." My dear Simon, I said, I don't know what you are talking about. I went to Madame Volpi's. To ask her for help with a scientific problem, she told me I needed an enormous diamond. You could not possibly own a diamond that large. If you did, you would be very rich, and you wouldn't be living here. He stared at me for a second, and then he laughed and apologized. Simon, I suggested. Let us drink some wine and forget all this. I have two bottles downstairs in my apartment. What do you think? I like your idea," he said. I brought the wine to his apartment, and we began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very sleepy and very drunk. I felt as calm as ever, for I believed that I knew Simon's secret. The Murders in the Rue Morgue, by Edgar Allan Poe, Part Five. I was stunned. Auguste Dupin, my friend with the extraordinarily sharp mind and observational powers, still had surprises for me. He had uncovered so much. About the horrifying Rue Morgue murders, that it seemed there was more understanding than mystery left. But still, the major question remained: Who? Dupin had invited someone to our home. Someone he believed knew the answer to that question. As we awaited his arrival. My friend began to put together other pieces of evidence from the crime. We add for our consideration the condition of the room. So we have a strength more than human, a wildness less than human, a murder without reason, horror beyond human understanding, 
and finally, a voice without a recognizable language. A cold feeling went up and down my back. A madman, Dupin. Someone who has lost his mind. Only a madman could have done these murders. Dupin smiled a little. Ah, but madmen come from one country or another, don't they? Their cries may be terrible, but they are made of words, and some of the words can be understood. Let me help with one more clue. Look at this hair. I took it from the fingers of the old woman. Is this the hair of a madman? Dupin handed me the evidence. I could not believe what I was looking at, or the feel of it in my hands. Dupin, what is this? This hair is... This hair is not from a human at all. I described it only as hair. But also, look at this picture. It is a picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The doctor said these marks were made by fingers. Let me spread the paper on the table before us. Try to put your fingers all at the same time on the picture, so that your hand and its fingers will fit the picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The marks left by the killer's hands were enormous. My fingers seemed like twigs in comparison. Dupin, these marks were made by no human hand. No, they were not. I am guessing they are from the hand of an orangutan. The size, strength, and wildness of these apes is well known. And the hair and strange sounds would complete the solution of killer animal as well. Yet, I still do not understand the second voice. We know it was a French-speaking man. His only words were, Mon Dieu! Who spoke, Dupin? Upon those two words, I have placed my hopes of finding a full solution to the crime. The, my God, was an expression of horror. It seems improbable that the speaker of those words helped the orangutan. Could he instead be its owner? Maybe the animal escaped from him, and he followed it to the house on the Rue Morgue. I assume that the man would not have been able to recapture it. Is that who we are waiting for now, Dupin? The Frenchman? How did you reach him? My friend smiled when he answered. I put an ad in the newspaper. Read it yourself. I took the newspaper. Caught early in the morning of the 7th of this month. A very large orangutan. The owner who is known to be a sailor, may have the animal again if he can prove it is his. But, Dupin, how can you know that the man is a sailor? I do not know it. I simply suspect. A sailor could go up that pole on the side of the house. Sailors travel to faraway lands where one might find an orangutan and it would be valuable. The sailor would want it back, so... Finally, Dupin, we learn the whole truth. Come in, my friend. Come in. Slowly, the door opened, and there, before us, stood a sailor. He spoke in French. Bonsoir. Good evening to you, too, my friend. I suppose you have come to ask about the orangutan. Yes. Is it here? No, no. We have no place for it here. If you can prove, it is yours. But of course I can. A shame. I wish I could keep it. It is very valuable, I guess. Well, I want it back, of course. I will pay you for your trouble to find it and keep it. What is your price? Well, that is very fair indeed, 
But it is not money I want, sir. My price is truth. Tell me everything you know about the murders in the Rue Morgue. The sailor's face reddened deeply. He jumped to his feet. For a moment he stood and stared. But then he fell back into his chair, trembling. His face grew pale, his eyes closed, and he said not a word. Dupin then spoke softly. My friend, you must not be afraid. We are not going to hurt you. I know very well that you yourself are not the killer. But it is true that you know something about him, or about it. You've done nothing wrong. You didn't even take any of the money. You have no reason to be afraid to talk and to tell the truth. It is a matter of honor for you to tell all you know. So help me God. I... I'll tell you all I know. About a year ago, our ship sailed to the far east, to the island of Borneo. The forest there, the jungle, was thick with trees and other plants, and hot and wet and dark. My friend and I wanted to explore the strange place, so we did. There we saw the orangutan and caught it and it returned with us to the ship. My friend died on the passage home, so the animal became mine alone. I was keeping it in a cage in my house here in Paris. I planned to sell it very soon. One night I came home and it was, it was loose. It had got free, I don't know how. It held a knife in its hands. It did not know of its dangers, of course. It was playing with it. As soon as the animal saw me, it jumped up and ran from the house. I followed. It ran several blocks and turned a corner. When I made the same turn, the animal was out of sight. I looked far down the street and saw nothing. Then I heard a noise above me. There was the beast climbing a pole up the side of a house. It was maybe two meters up. I also went up the pole. As I am a sailor, it was easy for me. When the animal was close to the top, I saw him jump through an open window. I got to the same place, but could not make the jump. I could see into the room, however, through another window, which was closed. The two women were sitting there, looking at papers from a box on the floor. The animal, knife still in hand, made a noise, and the old woman turned. That is when I heard the first of those terrible cries. I watched with horror as the animal attacked. Soon the two were dead, and the room was a disaster. The orangutan then pushed the young woman's body up the chimney. It picked up the other victim then and moved toward the window. I realized what was coming and I fled. Down the pipe I scrambled. At the bottom I heard the old woman's body hit the ground. I ran. I didn't look back. I ran. Oh, mon dieu, mon dieu. The police in Paris could not charge the sailor. His only wrongdoing was silence, which is not a criminal offense, the police chief said. However, the official did have a problem with Dupin. He was angry that Dupin, and not a member of his force, had solved the mystery. He said people should mind their own business. Let him complain. He'll feel better for it, and maybe learn something. Perhaps he will never again say not possible about that which, somehow, must be possible.
The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe, Part 4. Murder had come to the old house on the street called Rue Morgue. Murder had come and gone and left behind the bodies of an old woman and her daughter. It was a perplexing crime scene. The damage to the daughter's body suggested a killer of superhuman strength. The knife that had killed the old woman, almost separating head from body, was in the room. But the old woman's body was outside, behind the house. The door and windows to the house all firmly closed, locked on the inside. Voices had been heard. One voice was speaking in French. The other voice had not spoken even one word that anyone could understand. And yet, there was no one in the room when police arrived moments after the attack. My friend Dupin was now explaining to me what he had learned when we visited the scene of the crime. I knew that what seemed impossible must be proved possible. The killer, and I believe there was just one, escaped through one of these windows. After the murderer had left, he could have closed the window from the outside, but he could not have fastened the nail. Yet anyone could see the nails which held the windows tightly closed. This was the fact that stopped the police. How could the murderer put the nail back in its place? That's the problem, Dupin. Perhaps, perhaps if you pulled out the nail? Yes, that is just what I thought. Two things seemed clear. First, there had to be something wrong with the idea that the nails were holding the windows closed. Second, if it was not the nails which were holding the windows closed, then something else was holding them closed, something hard to see, something hidden. So I checked the first window again. I removed the nail. Then I again tried to raise the window. It was still firmly closed. There had to be a hidden lock, I thought, inside the window. I searched the window frame. Indeed, I found a button which, when I pressed it, opened an inner lock. I raised the window with ease. Now I knew that the killer could close the window from outside and the window would lock itself. But there was still the nail. So I returned the nail, pressed the button, and again tried to raise the window. The nail held the window closed. Then the window could not have been the means of escape. That window, no. The killer did not escape through it. But I went again to the other window. The nail there looked the same as the one I had just seen. I moved the bed so that I could look closely. Yes, there was a button here too. I was so sure I was right that without touching the nail, I pressed the button and tried to raise the window. And guess what happened? I knew the answer, but I let Dupin have the satisfaction of reporting. The window went up, he told me. As the window went up, it carried with it the top part of the nail, the head. When I closed the window, the head of the nail was again in its place. It looked just as it had looked before. The nail was broken, but looked whole. And what is impossible is proved otherwise. So the murderer went out that window. Did he arrive in the room by that path as well? Dupin answered, although it seemed he was speaking more to himself than to me. 
It was a hot summer night. Would the victim have opened the window to get some fresh night air? Most likely. So the killer found it open and entered, I said. Dupin nodded. And as he came in, the window locked when it closed. The lock held the window closed, not the nail, as it appeared to investigators. Again, that which seemed impossible was actually possible. Dupin's eyes were shining with the satisfaction discovery brings. He was analyzing evidence, and his unusual reasoning ability had found a great purpose. I suddenly understood. This is why going to the house on the Rue Morgue seemed pleasing to Dupin. The use of his sharp mental abilities made him happy. And I had more work to provide that great brain. Dupin, the windows are on the fourth floor, far above the ground. Even an open window. Dupin shook his head up and down slowly. Yes, yes, that is an interesting question. How did the murderer go from the window down to the ground and vice versa? But I had looked around carefully outside, you recall, and I knew a way. And the answer to this question told me still more about the identity of the killer. Do you remember, friend, the lightning rod attached to the house? E yes, yes. A metal pole, and quite narrow. It protects the building from lightning strikes. But it is so tall and, and thin. True. It would take great strength and agility to get up the pole. Some kinds of animals might climb it easily, yes? But surely not every man could. In fact, maybe very few men those of very special strength and special training. This helped create a better picture of the murderer, but still not sharp enough to recognize. I still had the question, who? We know the killer climbed the pole, entered the room through the window, murdered and destroyed all order in the room. He managed to push one body up the chimney. He threw the other, almost headless, out the window. Then he left the way he came. We can answer the how of the crime, but who? Such unspeakable viciousness. What human could do this to another? Dupin continued, trance-like again, seeming to speak to himself as much as to me. Perhaps we can come closer to answering the question of who by exploring the question of why. But Dupin, the police said the motive must have been robbery. But my friend, what was taken? The police said they could not answer the question. They said they did not know what the women had. Maybe clothes and jewelry the investigators proposed. But neighbors described the women as nearly hermits, rarely, if ever, leaving the house. Of what use would fine clothes and costly jewelry be to them? Dupin's eyes were glistening, his brows pointing sharply down, as he circled me, thinking aloud. But what is more telling than what the killer might have taken is what he left behind, conveniently in bags in the center of the room. Of course, the money. You are right, Dupin. It makes no sense. All the money delivered from the bank to the old woman, right there on the floor? Why would the attacker have passed on the riches? A thief certainly would not. So, I want you to forget the investigator's claim that the killer acted out of a desire for money. 
They thought this only because they knew the money had arrived just three days before the killings. But that was just chance. If gold was the reason for the murders, the killer must have been quite a fool to forget and leave it there. No, I think that there was no reason for these killings except, perhaps, fear. The wild nature of the attack leads me to a motive of fear. Hmm, an interesting theory, Dupin. Fear can bring out the crazed beast in a person. In any living thing. Now let us look at the murders themselves. A girl is killed by powerful hands around her neck. Then the body is placed in the opening over the fireplace, head down. Unusual, even by the standards of the most terrible criminals. Think also of the great strength needed to put the body where it was found. It took several men to pull it out. Also, the hair pulled from the head of the old woman. You saw it on the floor yourself, and you saw the blood and skin still attached. It takes great force to pull out even twenty or thirty hairs at a time. But this was hair and scalp. And there was no reason to almost take off the woman's head just to kill her. It is extremely odd, I agree. Especially since there is no evidence that the killer knew the victims. No one could hate a stranger enough to carry out such torture. Dupin's eyes narrowed. Exactly. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 3 My housemate in Paris, Auguste Dupin, was an interesting young man with a busy, forceful mind. This mind could, it seemed, look right through a man's body into his deepest soul. After reading in the newspaper about the terrible murder of a woman and her daughter, Dupin was consumed with the mystery. He questioned the ability of the Paris police to solve the crime. I told Dupin that it seemed to me that it was not possible to explain the strange details surrounding the killings. No, no, I think you are wrong. A mystery it is, yes, but there must be an answer. There must. Let us go to the house where it happened and see what we can see. I know the head of the police, and he will permit our visit. It will be interesting and give us some pleasure. I thought it strange that Dupin thought the activity would give us pleasure, but I said nothing. It was late in the afternoon when we reached the house on the Rue Morgue. It was easily found, for there were still many persons, in fact a crowd, standing there looking at it. Before going in, we walked all around it, and Dupin carefully looked at the neighboring houses as well. I could not understand the reason for such great care. Finally, we entered the house. We went up the stairs to the room where the daughter's body was found. Both bodies were in the room now. The police had left the room as they had found it in every other way. 
I saw nothing beyond what the newspaper had told us. Dupin looked with great care at everything, at the bodies, the walls, the fireplace, the windows. Then we went home. Dupin said nothing. I could see the cold look in his eyes, which told me that his mind was working, working busily, quickly. Dupin said nothing about our exploration until the next morning, when he suddenly asked me a question. Did you not notice something especially strange about what we saw at the house on the Rue Morgue? Nothing more than what we both read in the newspaper, which was unusual indeed. How shall we explain the horrible force, the unusual strength used in these murders? And whose were the voices that were heard? No one was found except the dead women. Yet there was no way for anyone to escape. And the wild condition of the room, the body which was found head down in the chimney, the terrible broken appearance of the body of the old lady with its head cut off. These are all so far from what might be expected that the police are standing still. They don't know where to begin. These things are unusual indeed, but they are not deep mysteries. We should not ask what has happened, but what has happened that has never happened before. In fact, the very things that the police think cannot possibly be explained are the things which will lead me to the answer. Indeed, I believe they have already led me to the answer. I was so surprised that I could not say a word. Dupin looked quickly at the door. I am now waiting for a person who will know something about these murders, these wild killings. I do not think he did them himself, but I think he will know the killer. I hope I am right about this. If I am, then I expect to find the whole answer today. I expect the man here, in this room, at any moment. It is true that he may not come, but he probably will. But who is this person? How did you find him? I'll tell you. While we wait for this man we do not know, for I have never met him, while we wait, I will tell you how my thoughts went. Dupin began to talk, but it did not seem that he was trying to explain to me what he had thought. It seemed that he was talking to himself. He looked not at me, but at the wall. It has been fully proved that the voices heard by the neighbors were not the voices of the women who were killed. Someone else was in the room. It is therefore certain that the old woman did not first kill her daughter and then kill herself. She would not have been strong enough to put her daughter's body where it was found. And the manner of the old lady's death shows that she could not have caused it herself. A person can kill himself with a knife, yes, but he surely cannot cut his own head almost off, then drop the knife on the floor and jump out the window. It was murder, then, done by some third person or persons, and the voices heard were the voices of these persons. Let us now think carefully about the things people said about those voices. Did you notice anything especially strange in what was told about them? Well, yes. Everybody agreed that the low voice was the voice of a Frenchman. But they could not agree about the high voice. Ah, that was what they said, yes. But that was not what was so strange about what they said. You say you have noticed nothing that makes their stories very different from what might have been expected. Yet, there was something. All these persons, as you say, agreed about the low voice, but not about the high, hard voice. The strange thing here is that when an Italian, 
an Englishman, a Spaniard, and a Frenchman tried to tell what the voice was like, each one said it sounded like the voice of a foreigner. How strangely unusual that voice really must have been. Here are four men from four big countries, and not one of them could understand what the voice said. Each one gave it a different name. Now, I know that there are other countries in the world. You will say that perhaps it was the voice of someone from one of those other lands. Russia, perhaps. But remember, not one of these people heard anything that sounded like a separate word. Here, Japan turned and looked at me. This is what we have learned from the newspaper. I don't know what I have led you to think, but I believe that in this much of the story, there are enough facts to lead us in the one and only direction to the right answer. What this answer is, I will not say, not yet. But I want you to keep in mind that this much was enough to tell me what I must look for when we were in that house on the Rue Morgue. And I found it. What did I first look for? The path of escape, of course. I mean, we agree the killers were not ghosts. They could not move through walls. So, how did they escape? At first, I saw no way out. It had been necessary for the neighbors to break down the door in order to enter the room. There was no other door. The opening above the fireplace is too narrow for even a child to go through. That leaves only the windows. We must make that exit somehow possible. Remember, there are two windows in the room. Both of them, you will remember, are made of two parts. To open the window, one must lift up the bottom half. One of these windows is easily seen. The lower part of the other is out of sight behind the big bed. I looked carefully at the first of these windows. It was firmly closed, fastened like the door on the inside. To keep the window closed, to fasten it, someone had put a strong iron nail into the wood at the side of the window in such a way that the window could not be raised. At least it seemed that the nail held the window closed. The nail was easy to see. There it was, and the people who discovered the killings used their greatest strength and could not raise the window. I, too, tried to raise the window and could not. I went to the second window and looked behind the bed at the lower half of the window. There was a nail here, too, which held the window closed. Without moving the bed, I tried to open this window also, and again I could not do so. But I did not stop looking for an answer there. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 2 It was in Paris in the summer of 1840 that I met Auguste Dupin. Dupin was a strangely interesting young man with a busy, forceful mind. He seemed to look right through a person and uncover their deepest thoughts. Sometimes Dupin seemed to be not one, but two people. One who coldly put things together, and another who just as coldly took them apart. One morning, in the heat of the summer, Dupin showed me once again his special mental power. We read in the newspaper 
about a terrible killing. An old woman and her daughter, living alone in an old house in the Rue Morgue, had been killed in the middle of the night. The story in the paper went... Paris, July 7, 1840. Early this morning, cries of terror were heard in the western part of the city. They reportedly came from a house on the Rue Morgue, in which the only occupants were a Mrs. Laspanier and her daughter Camille. Several neighbors and a policeman ran to the house. By the time they reached it, the cries had stopped. They forced the door open. As they entered, they heard two voices, apparently from above. The group searched but found nothing until the fourth floor. There, they came to a door locked from the inside. Quickly, they forced it open. Before them was a bloody horror scene. The room was in total disorder. Broken chairs and tables and the mattress pulled from the bed. Blood was everywhere. On the walls, the floor, the bed. A sharp knife lay on the floor in a pool of blood. In front of the fireplace was a clump of long gray hair, also bloodied. It seemed to have been pulled straight out of a head. On the floor were four pieces of gold, an earring, several silver objects, and two bags containing a large amount of money in gold. Clothes had been thrown around the room. A lockbox was found left open with just a few old letters and papers inside. There was no one there, but when the group inspected the fireplace, they discovered another horror. A still warm body had been forced up the chimney. It was the old woman's daughter. There was blood on the face and dark, deep finger marks on the neck, suggesting a strangling. After searching the house thoroughly, the group went outside. They found the body of the old woman behind the building. Her neck had been cut so severely that when they tried to lift the body, the head fell off. The next day, the newspaper offered to its readers these new facts. Paris, July 8, 1840. The police have questioned many people about the vicious murders in the old house on the Rue Morgue but none of the answers revealed the identity of the killers. Pauline Dubourg, a washwoman, said she has known both of the victims for more than three years and washed their clothes. She said, the two seemed to love each other dearly. They always paid her well. She did not know where their money came from, she said. She never met anyone in the house. Only the two women lived on the fourth floor. Pierre Moreau, a shopkeeper, said Mrs. Lespanier had bought food at his shop for almost four years. She owned the house and had lived in it for more than six years. He never saw anyone enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, and a doctor eight or ten times, perhaps. Many other persons, neighbors, said the same thing. Almost no one ever went into the house. Mrs. Lespanier and her daughter were not often seen. Banker Jules Mignot said that Mrs. Lespanier had put money in his bank, beginning eight years before. Three days before the killings, she withdrew a large amount in gold. A man from the bank carried it to her house for her. Isidore Musée, a policeman, said that he was with the group that first entered the house. While he was going up the stairs, he heard two voices, one low and soft, and one hard, high, and very strange. 
the voice of someone who was surely not French, the voice of a foreigner, maybe Spanish. It was not a woman's voice, he said, although he could not understand what it said. But the other voice said softly, in French, My God! Alfonso Garcia, who is Spanish and lives on the Rue Morgue, says he entered the house but did not go up the stairs. A nervous man, he was afraid he might be sick. He heard the voices. He believes the high voice was not that of a Frenchman. Perhaps it was English, but he said he doesn't understand English, so he is not sure. William Byrd, an Englishman who has lived in Paris for two years, also entered the house. He said the low voice was that of a Frenchman, he was sure, because he heard it say, in French, my God. The high voice was very loud, he said. He is sure it was not the voice of an Englishman, nor the voice of a Frenchman. It seemed to be that of an Italian, a language he does not understand. He said it might have been a woman's voice. Mr. Alberto Montani, an Italian, was passing the house at the time of the cries. He said the screams lasted for about two minutes. Montani, who speaks Spanish but not French, says that he also heard two voices. He thought both voices were French, but he could not understand any of the words spoken. All who went in the house agreed that the door to the room on the fourth floor was locked from the inside. It was quiet. They saw no one. The windows were closed and locked from the inside. There is only one stairway to the fourth floor. They said that the chimney opening is too small for escape that way. It took four or five people to pull the daughter's body out of the chimney. It was four or five minutes from the time they heard the voices to the moment they entered the room. Paul Dumas, a doctor, says that he was called to inspect the bodies soon after they were found. They were in a horrible condition, badly marked and broken. He said only a man could have caused such injury. The daughter had been strangled, he said. When we had finished reading the newspaper's report of the murders, we were quiet for a while. Dupin had that cold, empty look that I know means his mind is working busily. He asked me what I thought of the crime. I said I considered it a mystery with no answer. But Dupin responded, No, no. No, I think you are wrong. A mystery, yes, but there must be an answer. Let us go to the house and see what we can see. There must be an answer. There must. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 1 Paris It was in Paris during the summer of 1840. There and then, I met a strange and interesting young man named Auguste Dupin. Dupin was the last member of a well-known family, a family that had once been rich and famous. Auguste Dupin, however, was far from rich. He cared little about money. He had enough to buy necessities and a few books. That was all 
just books. With books, he was happy. In fact, we first met in an old bookstore. A few more chance meetings at such stores followed. Soon, we began to talk. I was deeply interested in the family history, he told me. I was surprised, too, at how much and how widely he had read. More important, the force of his busy mind was like a bright light in my soul. I felt that the friendship of such a man would be for me riches without price. So I told him how I felt, and asked him to come live with me. He would enjoy using my many fine books, and I would have the pleasure of company, for I was not happy alone. We passed the days reading, writing, and talking. But Dupin was a lover of the night, so often we walked the streets of Paris, after dark. I soon noticed that Dupin had a special way of understanding people. Using it gave him great pleasure. He told me once, with a soft laugh, that he could see through the windows that most men have over their hearts. He could look into their souls. Then he surprised me by telling what he knew about my own soul. He knew things about me that I had thought only I could possibly know. At these times, he acted cold and emotionally distant. His eyes looked empty and far away. His voice became high and nervous. At such times, it seemed to me that I saw not just Dupin, but two Dupin, one who coldly put things together, and another who just as coldly took them apart. One night, we were walking down one of Paris's long, dirty streets. We were quiet, both busy with our own thoughts. But suddenly, Dupin spoke. You're right, he said. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and he would be more successful if he acted in lighter, less serious plays. Yes, there can be no doubt of that, I said. At first, I saw nothing strange in this. Dupin had agreed with me. This, of course, seemed to me quite natural. A few moments passed. Then it hit me. Dupin had not agreed with something I had said. He had agreed directly with my thoughts. I had not spoken a word. Dupin had read my mind. I stopped walking. Dupin, I said. Dupin, I don't understand. How could you know that I was thinking of... Here I stopped speaking. If he really had heard my thoughts... He would have to prove it. And he did. He said, How did I know you were thinking of Shanti? You were thinking that Shanti is too small for the plays in which he acts. That is indeed what I was thinking. But tell me, in heaven's name, how did you know? It was the fruit seller. Fruit seller? I mean the man who bumped into you as we entered the street. Maybe fifteen minutes ago. Oh, yes, I remember now. A fruit seller with a large basket of apples bumped into me. But what does that have to do with you knowing I was thinking of Shanti? I will explain. Listen closely now. Let us follow your thoughts from the fruit seller to the stage actor, Shanti. Those thoughts must have gone like this. Fruit seller to cobblestones, Cobblestones to Stereotomy, Stereotomy to Epicurus, to Orion, and then to Shanti. He continued, As we turned onto this street, the fruit seller bumped you. You stepped on some uneven cobblestones. I could see that it hurt your foot. You spoke a few angry words to yourself and continued walking. 
but you kept looking at the cobblestones in the street, so I knew you were thinking of them. Then we came to a small street where they are putting down new street stones. Here your face became brighter. You are looking at these more even stones. And your lips moved. I was sure they formed the word stereotomy, which is the name for how these new stones are cut. Stereotomy takes a large block and divides it evenly into smaller pieces. You will remember that we read about it in the newspaper only yesterday. I thought that the word stereotomy must make you think of the old Greek writer and thinker Epicurus. His ideas are also about dividing objects into smaller and smaller pieces called atoms. He argued that the world and everything else are made of these atoms. You and I were talking about Epicurus and his ideas, his atoms, recently. We were talking about how much those old ideas are like today's scientific study of the planets and stars. So I felt sure that now as we walked, you would look up to the sky. And you did. I looked also at the sky. I saw that the group of stars we call Orion is very bright and clear tonight. I knew you would notice this and that you would think about the name Orion. Now keep listening carefully. Only yesterday, in the newspaper, there was a report about the actor Shanti. The critic did not praise him, and he used a Latin saying that had also been used to describe Orion. So I knew you would put together the two ideas of Orion and Shanti. I saw you smile, remembering the article and the mean words in it. Then I saw you straighten up, as tall as you could make yourself. I was sure you were thinking of Shanti's size, and especially his height. He is small, he is short, and so I spoke saying that he is indeed a very little man, this Shanti, and he would be more successful if he acted in lighter, less serious plays. I cannot say I was surprised by what Dupin had just reported. My reaction was much bigger than just surprise. I was astonished. Dupin was right, as right as he could be. Those were, in fact, my thoughts, my unspoken thoughts, as my mind moved from one thought to the next. But if I was astonished by this, I would soon be more than astonished. One morning, this strangely interesting man showed me once again his unusual reasoning power. We heard that an old woman had been killed by unknown persons. The killer, or killers, had cut her head off and escaped into the night. Who was this killer, this murderer? The police had no answer. They had looked everywhere and found nothing that helped them. They did not know what to do next. And so they did nothing. But not Dupin. He knew what to do. Love of Life by Jack London Part 4 In the afternoon the man came to a track. It was that of another man who did not walk, but who dragged himself on his hands and knees. The man thought it might be Bill, but he thought about it without any interest. He had no curiosity. Feeling and emotion had left him. He was no longer able to feel pain. Yet the life that was in him drove him ahead. He was very tired, but it refused to die. 
It was because it refused to die that he still ate muskeg berries and small fish, drank his hot water and kept a careful eye on the sick wolf. He followed the track of the other man who dragged himself along. Soon he came to the end of it. There were a few freshly cleaned bones where the grass was marked by the footprints of many wolves. He saw a moose-skin bag, exactly like his own. It had been torn by sharp teeth. He picked it up, although its weight was almost too much for his weak fingers. Bill had carried it to the end. Now he would have the last laugh. He would live and carry it to the ship in the shining sea. He laughed aloud, making an inhuman sound, and the sick wolf howled with him. The man ceased suddenly. How could he laugh at Bill, if that were Bill, if those bones so pinky white and clean were Bill? He turned away. Bill had deserted him, but he would not take the gold, nor would he eat Bill's bones. Bill would have done so, however, had their situations been exchanged. He came to a pool of water. Bending over it in search of fish, he threw his head back as if he had been struck. He had caught sight of his face in the water. So awful was it that his feelings were stirred long enough to be shocked. There were three fish in the pool, which was too large to empty. After several attempts to catch them in his tin container, he stopped. He was afraid, because of his great weakness, that he might fall and sink into the water. It was for this reason, too, that he did not trust himself to ride down the river atop one of the many logs to be found along its banks. That day he lessened the distance between him and the ship by three miles. The next day he traveled only two miles, because he was now dragging himself on his hands and knees as Bill had done. At the end of the fifth day the ship was still seven miles away. He was unable to travel as much as a mile a day. However, the summer weather continued and he continued to move toward the ship. And always the sick wolf coughed at his heels. His knees had become red meat like his feet. Although he bound them with the shirt from his back, it was a red track he left behind him on the grass and stones. Once, glancing back, he saw the wolf licking his bloody track hungrily. He saw clearly what his own end might be, unless he could kill the wolf. Then began as awful an event as has ever been told. Two sick creatures, dragging their dying bodies across a wasteland and hunting each other's lives. Had it been a well wolf, it would not have mattered so much to the man. But the thought of feeding the mouth of that nearly dead thing was hateful. His mind had begun to wander again, and he was troubled by hallucinations. His reasonable moments grew shorter. He was awakened once from a faint sleep by a cough close to his ear. The wolf leaped back, losing its footing and falling in its weakness. It was a funny sight, but he could not laugh. Nor was he afraid. He was too far gone for that. But his mind was for the moment clear, and he lay and considered. The ship was no more than four miles away. He could see it quite well when he rubbed his eyes. He could also see the white sail of a small boat cutting the water of the shining sea but he could never drag himself those four miles. He knew that, and was very calm about the fact. He knew that he could not travel another half a mile, and yet he wanted to live. It was unreasonable that he should die after all he had been through. Fate asked too much of him. 
and dying he could not accept death. It was madness, perhaps, but in the very grasp of death he refused to die. He closed his eyes and tried to keep himself calm. He struggled against the awful desire for sleep that threatened him. It was much like a sea, this deadly sleepiness. It rose and rose, mastering his entire self bit by bit. Sometimes he was almost lost, swimming through its waters with a weakening effort. Then, by some strange power of the soul, his will would strike out more strongly against it. Without movement, he lay on his back. He could hear slowly drawing nearer and nearer the sound of the sick wolf's breathing. It came closer, always closer, and he did not move. It was beside his ear. The dry tongue moved across his face. His hands struck out. Actually, he had willed them to strike out. The fingers were curved, but they closed on empty air. Quickness requires strength, and the man had not his strength. The quiet waiting of the wolf was awful. The man's waiting was no less awful. For half a day he lay without motion, fighting off sleep. He waited for the thing that was to feed upon him, and upon which he wished to feed. Sometimes the sea of sleep rose over him, and he dreamed long dreams. But always through it all, waking and dreaming, he waited for the noisy breath and the feel of the tongue. This time he did not hear the breath. He slipped slowly from some dream to feel the tongue along his hand. He waited. The teeth pressed softly, then more firmly, the wolf was using its last strength in an effort to sink its teeth into the food for which it had waited so long. But the man, too, had waited long. The hand closed on the wolf's mouth. Slowly, while the wolf struggled weakly, the other hand moved across the wolf's body. Five minutes later, the whole weight of the man's body was on top of the wolf. The hands had not sufficient strength to grasp the wolf about the throat until it died, but the face of the man was pressed close to the throat of the wolf, and the mouth of the man was full of hair. At the end of half an hour the man felt some warm drops of blood in his throat. It was not pleasant. It was like hot melted metal being forced into his stomach, and it was forced by his will alone. Later the man rolled on his back and slept. There were some scientists traveling on the fishing ship Bedford. From where they stood on the ship, they could see a strange object on the shore. It was moving down the beach toward the water. They were unable to decide what it was. Being men of science, they climbed into a smaller boat and went ashore to examine it. And they saw something that was alive, but which could hardly be called a man. It was blind and did not know what it was doing. Its movements produced little effect. But still, it continued to drag itself across the ground at the rate of about twenty feet an hour. Three weeks later, the man lay in a bed on the fishing boat. With tears streaming down his face, he told who he was and what he had experienced. He also talked without meaning about his mother and a home in California among the flowers. The days were not many after that, when he sat at table with the scientists and the ship's officers. He delighted in the sight of so much food and watched it carefully as it went into the mouths of others. With the disappearance of each mouthful, an expression of sorrow came into his eyes. He was not mad, however, 
He hated those men at mealtimes. He was afraid that there would not be enough food. He inquired of the cook, the cabin boy, the captain concerning the food supply. They reassured him numerous times, but he would not believe them, and went into the kitchen to see with his own eyes. It was noticed that the man was getting fat. He grew bigger with each day. The scientists shook their heads and gave their opinions on the problem. They limited the amount of food given to the man at his meals, but still his weight increased. The seamen smiled. They knew. And when the scientists decided to observe the man, they learned the reason. They saw him walk about the ship after breakfast. Like a man begging with an outstretched hand, he approached a seaman. The seaman smiled and gave him a piece of bread. He grasped it, and looked at it as a greedy man looks at gold. Then he put it inside his shirt. He received similar gifts from other smiling seamen. The scientists were careful. They allowed him to continue. But they secretly examined his bed. It was lined with bread. Every inch of space was filled with bread. Yet, he was not mad. He was preparing for another possible famine, that was all. He would recover from it, the scientist said. And he did, even before the Bedford sailed into San Francisco Bay. Love of Life by Jack London Part 3 The man had brought his gun half the distance to his shoulder before he realized what he was doing. He lowered it and drew his hunting knife from its cover. Before him was meat and life. He ran his finger along the edge of the knife. It was sharp. The point was sharp. He would throw himself on the bear and kill it. But his heart began its pounding. Then came its wild leap and he began to feel faint. His wild courage was replaced by a great fear. In his weakness, what if the animal attacked him? He drew himself up tall, grasping the knife and staring hard at the bear. The bear advanced a couple of steps and stood up. If the man ran, the bear would run after him. But the man did not run. He was alive now with the courage of fear. The bear moved away to one side with a threatening noise. He himself was fearful of this strange creature that appeared unafraid. But the man did not move. He stood still until the danger was past. Then he yielded to a fit of trembling and sank to his knees on the wet grass. He regained control of himself and then started to move forward, afraid now in a new manner. It was not the fear that he would die from lack of food. He was afraid that he would be destroyed by forces other than starving. There were the wolves. Across the wasteland their howls could be heard, making the air itself a threat most real to him. Now and again the wolves in groups of two and three crossed his path, but they stayed away from him. They were not in sufficient numbers to attack, and besides, they were hunting caribou. Caribou did not battle, while this strange creature that walked on two legs might bite. In the afternoon he came upon scattered bones where the wolves had made a kill. 
What remained had been a young caribou an hour before. He studied the bones, cleaned of any flesh. They were still pink with the life in them which had not yet died. Might he look like that before the day was done? Was this life a fleeting thing without meaning? It was only life that pained. There was no hurt in death. To die was to sleep. It meant rest. Then why was he not content to die? But he did not think about these things for very long. He was soon seated in the grass, a bone in his mouth, biting at the bit of life that made it yet pink. The sweet, meaty taste drove him mad. He closed his teeth firmly on the bones. Sometimes it was the bone that broke, sometimes his teeth. Then he crushed the bones between the rocks. He pounded them into tiny pieces and ate them. He was in such a hurry that he pounded his fingers, too. He felt surprised at the fact that his fingers did not hurt much when they were caught under the rock. Then came frightful days of snow and rain. He did not know when he made camp and when he broke camp. He traveled in the night as much as in the day. He rested whenever he fell, moving ahead whenever the dying life in him started up again. He, as a man, no longer struggled. It was the life in him, unwilling to die, that drove him on. He did not suffer nor feel pain, but his mind was filled with hallucinations and wild dreams. But he still ate the crushed bones of the young caribou, which he had gathered and carried with him. He crossed no more hills, but followed a large stream which flowed through a wide valley. He did not see this stream, nor this valley. He saw nothing except hallucinations. One morning he awakened with his mind clear, lying on his back on a rocky surface. The sun was shining bright and warm. Far away he heard the noises made by the young caribou. He remembered rain and wind and snow. But whether he had been beaten by the storm for two days or two weeks, he did not know. For some time he lay without movement. The friendly sun poured down upon him and filled his body with its warmth. A fine day, he thought. Perhaps he could succeed in locating himself. By a painful effort, he rolled on his side. Below him flowed a wide river. Its unfamiliarity puzzled him. Slowly he followed it with his eyes as it curved among the bare hills. They were more bare and lower than any hills he had yet seen. Slowly, without excitement, he followed the course of the strange stream toward the skyline and saw that it emptied into a bright and shining sea. He was still unexcited. Most unusual, he thought. It was probably a trick of his mind. He was certain of this when he also saw a ship floating in the shining sea. He closed his eyes for a while, then opened them. It was strange how the sight continued, yet it was not strange. He knew there were no seas or ships in the middle of this land, as he had known there was no cartridge in the empty gun. He heard a noise behind him. It seemed like the dry sound that comes from the throat when air is forced out in a cough. Very slowly, because of his weakness and stiffness, he rolled to his other side. He could see nothing near, but he waited patiently. Again came the cough, and there, between two rocks, he saw the gray head of a wolf. The sharp ears did not stand up as straight as he had seen them on other wolves. The eyes were dull, and the head seemed to hang. 
The animal opened and shut its eyes frequently in the sunshine. It seemed sick. As he looked, it coughed again. This was real, he thought. He turned on the other side to see the reality of the world which had been hidden from him before by his hallucination. But the sea still shone, and the ship was still there. Was it reality? He closed his eyes for a long while and thought. And then he remembered. He had been traveling north by east, away from the Dees Divide and into the Coppermine Valley. This wide river was the Coppermine. That shining sea was the Arctic Ocean. That ship was a fishing boat which had wandered east from the mouth of the Mackenzie River. Now it was lying in Coronation Gulf. He remembered the map that he had seen long ago, and it was all clear and reasonable to him. He sat up and turned his attention to immediate affairs. He had worn holes through the blanket wrappings, and his feet were like shapeless pieces of meat. His last blanket was gone. His gun and knife were both lost. He had also lost his hat somewhere, with the matches and the band. The matches against his chest were safe and dry inside the paper. He looked at his watch. It marked eleven o'clock and was still going. This proved that he had kept it wound. He was calm. Although very weak, he had no feeling of pain. He was not hungry. The thought of food was not even pleasant to him. Whatever he did was done entirely by reasoning. He tore off the legs of his trousers to the knees and bound them about his feet. Somehow he had succeeded in keeping the tin container. He would have some hot water before he began what he knew was to be an awful journey to the ship. His movements were slow. He shook as if with a disease. When he started to gather dried grasses, he found he could not rise to his feet. He tried again and again. Then he contented himself with moving about on his hands and knees. Once he went near the sick wolf. The animal dragged itself out of the way, licking its face with a tongue which seemed hardly to have the strength to curl. The man noticed that the tongue was not the customary healthy red, but was a yellowish-brown and covered with a half-dried coating. After he drank some hot water, the man found he was able to stand. He could even walk as well as a dying man might be supposed to walk. But every minute or two he was forced to rest. His steps were unsteady, as were the steps of the wolf behind him. That night, when the shining sea was hidden in the blackness, he knew he was nearer to it by no more than four miles. Through the night he heard the cough of the sick wolf, now and then the noises of the young caribou. There was life all around him, but it was strong life, very much alive and well. He knew the sick wolf was following the sick man's steps in the hope that the man would die first. In the morning when he opened his eyes he saw it looking at him with a hungry stare. It stood with its tail between its legs like an unhappy dog. The sun rose brightly, and all morning the man headed toward the ship on the shining sea. The weather was perfect. It was the brief return of summer which was usual in that country. Might continue for a week, or tomorrow or the next day it might be gone. Of Life by Jack London Part 2 
The man cursed, threw the empty gun on the ground. He uttered a cry of pain as he started to drag himself to his feet. It was a slow task. When he finally stood on his feet, he needed another minute or two to straighten himself, so that he could stand as a man should stand. He climbed a small hill and looked about. There were no trees, no bushes. There was nothing but grassy, gray plants and some gray rocks and gray streams. The sky was gray. There was no sun or promise of sun. He had no idea where North was, and he had forgotten how he had come to this spot the night before. But he was not lost. He knew that. Soon he would come to the land of the little sticks. He felt that it lay to the left somewhere, not far. Possibly it was over the next low hill. He returned to prepare his pack for traveling. He assured himself of the existence of his three separate portions of matches, although he did not stop to count them. But he did pause, trying to decide what to do about a bag made from moose skin. It was not large. It could be covered by his two hands. But he knew it weighed fifteen pounds, as much as all the rest of the pack. This worried him. He finally set it to one side and proceeded to roll the pack. He paused again to gaze at the moose skin bag. He picked it up quickly with a quick glance around him. It was as if he thought the cruel wasteland was trying to steal it. When he rose to his feet, the bag was included in the pack on his back. He started walking to the left, stopping now and again to eat muskeg berries. His ankle had stiffened, but the pain of it was nothing compared with the pain of his stomach. His hunger was so great he could not keep his mind steady on the course he had to follow to arrive at the land of the little sticks. The berries did not help his hunger. Their bitter taste only made his tongue and mouth sore. He came to a valley where some birds rose from the rocky places. Coo, 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 was the sound of their cry. He threw stones at them, but could not hit them. He placed his pack on the ground and followed them as a cat advances on a bird. The sharp rocks cut through his trousers until his knees left a trail of blood. But the hurt was lost in the pain of his hunger. He moved his body through the wet plants, becoming wet and cold in the process. But he did not notice this, so great was his desire for food. Always the birds rose before him. Their cry of, Coo, 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 sounded as if they were laughing at him. He cursed them and cried aloud at them with their own cry. Once he came upon one that must have been asleep. He did not see it until it flew up in his face from behind some rocks. He grasped the air as suddenly as the rise of the bird, and there remained in his hand three tail feathers. As he watched its flight, he hated it. He felt that it had done him some great wrong. Then he returned to where he had left his pack and lifted it again to his back. As the day continued, he came into valleys where game was more plentiful. Twenty or more caribou passed by, within easy shooting distance of a gun. He felt a wild desire to run after them, certain that he could catch them. A small black animal came toward him, carrying a bird in his mouth. The man shouted. It was a fearful cry, but the animal, leaping away in fright, did not drop the bird. Late in the afternoon, he followed a stream which flowed through some thick grass. He grasped these grasses firmly near the root and pulled up what looked like a vegetable. It was round and white. Eagerly, he sank his teeth into it. It was tender on the outside and gave the promise of food. But its inside was hard and stringy, and like the berries... It had no food value. Nevertheless, he threw off his pack and went among the grasses on his hands and knees, eating the grass like a cow. 
He was very tired and often wished to rest, to lie down and to sleep. But he was led on, not so much by his desire to find the land of the little sticks, as by his hunger. He looked into every pool of water, searching without success for things to eat. Then, as the night darkened, he discovered a single small fish in one of these pools. He plunged his whole arm in, but the fish escaped his grasp. He reached for it with both hands and stirred the mud at the bottom of the pool. During his excitement he fell in, getting wet as high as his shoulders. Then the water was too cloudy with mud to allow him to see the fish. He was forced to wait until the mud had again settled to the bottom. Then he tried again, until the water was again filled with mud. But he could not wait. He took a tin container from his pack and began to empty the water from the pool. He threw it out wildly at first, and so short a distance that it flowed into the pool again. He worked more carefully, trying to be calm. But his heart was pounding and his hands were trembling. At the end of a half an hour the pool was nearly dry. Not a cupful of water remained. And there was no fish. Then he discovered a narrow opening among the stones through which it had escaped into a larger pool, a pool which he could not empty in a night and a day. If he had known of the opening, he could have closed it with a rock before he began, and the fish would have been his. Thus he thought, and he sank down upon the wet earth. At first he cried softly to himself, and then he cried loudly to the uncaring wasteland around him. He built a fire and warmed himself by drinking hot water. Then he built a camp on the rocks as he had done the night before. The last things he did were to be certain that his matches were dry and to wind his watch. The blankets were wet. His ankle pained him, but he knew only that he was hungry. Through his restless sleep he dreamed of feasts and food, served in all imaginable manners. When he awakened, he was cold and sick. There was no sun. The gray of the earth and sky had become deeper. A cold wind was blowing, and snow was whitening the hilltops. The air about him grew white with snow as he made a fire and boiled more water. But it was wet snow, half rain. At first it melted as soon as it hit the earth, but it continued falling, covering the ground and destroying his fire. This was a signal for him to put his pack on his back and struggle forward. He knew not where. He was not concerned with the land of the little sticks, nor with Bill and the cash under the upturned boat by the river Dees. He was mad because of hunger. He did not notice the course he followed except that it led him through the bottoms of the valleys. He felt his way through the wet snow to the watery muskeg berries and was guided by touch as he pulled up the grass by the roots. But it had no taste, and did not satisfy his hunger. He had no fire that night, nor hot water. He pulled his blanket around him to sleep the broken sleep of hunger. The snow became a cold rain. He awakened many times to feel it falling on his upturned face. Day came. It was a gray day with no sun. It had ceased raining. The sharpness of his hunger had departed. There was a dull pain in his stomach, but it did not trouble him so much. He was more in control of himself, and once again he was interested in the land of little sticks and the cash by the river Dees. He cut the remains of one of his blankets into strips and bound his bleeding feet. 
He used one of the strips on his swelled ankle and prepared himself for a day of travel. When he was ready to pick up his pack, he paused long before deciding to keep the moose-skin bag. But when he departed, it went with him. The snow had melted under the rain, and only the hilltops showed white. The sun appeared, and he succeeded in locating the way he had been traveling. But now he knew that he was lost. Perhaps he had wandered too far to the left. He now turned to the right to return to his true course. Although the hunger pains were not as great as they had been, he realized that he was weak. He was forced to pause for frequent rests. At those times, he ate the muskeg berries and grasses. His tongue felt dry and large, and it tasted bitter in his mouth. His heart troubled him very much. When he had traveled a few minutes, it would begin pounding. Then it would leap in a series of beats that made him feel faint. In the middle of the day, he found two small fish in a large pool. It was impossible to empty it. But he was calmer now, and he managed to catch them. They were no bigger than his little finger. But now he was not particularly hungry. The dull pain in his stomach had been growing duller. It almost seemed that his stomach was asleep. He ate the fish with great care. The eating was an act of pure reason. Although he had no desire to eat, he knew that he must eat to live. In the evening, he caught three more small fish, eating two and saving the third for breakfast. The sun had dried the wet plants, and he was able to build a fire. He had not traveled more than ten miles that day. The next day, traveling whenever his heart permitted, he went no more than five miles. But his stomach did not give him any pain. It seemed to be sleeping. He was now in a strange country, too, and the caribou were becoming more plentiful. There were wolves also. Their howls could be heard across the land. And once he saw three of them crossing his path. Another night passed, and in the morning, being more reasonable, he untied the leather string that held the moose-skin bag. From its open mouth poured a yellow stream of gold dust. He divided the gold into two equal parts. One half, wrapped in a piece of a blanket, he hid among a large formation of rocks. The other half he returned to his bag. He also began to use strips of the one remaining blanket for his feet. He still kept his gun, because there were cartridges in that cache by the River Dees. This was a cloudy day, and this day hunger waked in him again. He was very weak. It was no uncommon thing now for him to fall. Once he fell into a bird's nest. There were four tiny birds, a day or so old, no more than a mouthful. He ate them greedily, putting them alive into his mouth and crushing them like eggshells between his teeth. The mother bird flew about him with cries of anger. He used his gun as a club with which to hit her, but she flew beyond his reach. He threw stones at her and by chance broke a wing. She then ran away, dragging the broken wing, with him following her. The little birds had not satisfied his hunger. He jumped along on his painful ankle, throwing stones and screaming loudly at times. At other times he struggled along silently, picking himself up patiently when he fell or rubbing his eyes with his hand when faintness threatened to overpower him. The bird led him across some wet ground in the bottom of the valley. He discovered footprints in the wet grasses. They were not his own, he could see that. They must be Bill's. But he could not stop because the mother bird was running ahead. He would catch her first, then he would return and examine the footprints. He tired the mother bird but he tired himself also. She lay on her side, breathing heavily. He lay on his side a dozen feet away, unable to move toward her. And as he recovered, she recovered. 
She flew beyond reach as his hungry hand stretched out to catch her. The hunt started again. Night darkened, and she escaped. He fell because of weakness, cutting his face. He did not move for a long time. Then he rolled on his side. He wound his watch and lay there until morning. It was another gray day. Half of his last blanket had been used for foot wrappings. He failed to find Bill's trail again. It was not important. His hunger drove him on. He wondered if Bill, too, were lost. By the middle of the day, the weight of his pack became too great. Again, he divided the gold, this time merely pouring half of it on the ground. In the afternoon, he threw away the rest of it. There remained now only the half of the blanket, the tin container, and the gun. A hallucination began to trouble him. He felt certain that one cartridge remained. It was in his gun, and he had not seen it. However, he knew all the time that the gun was empty. But the hallucination continued. He fought it for hours. Then he opened his gun eagerly only to find nothing inside. He struggled ahead for half an hour when the hallucination arose again. Again he fought it, and still it continued. To give himself relief, he again opened the gun and found it empty. At times his mind wandered even further, but these moments away from reality were brief, because always the pains of hunger forced him to return. Once, as his mind was wandering, he was returned to reality by a sight that almost caused him to faint. Before him stood a horse. A horse! He could not believe his eyes. A thick cloud was in his eyes, flashing with points of light. He rubbed his eyes fiercely to clear his sight. Then he saw before him not a horse, but a great brown bear. The animal was studying him with curiosity. Love of Life by Jack London Part 1 The two men moved painfully down the bank and fell among the rocks that were scattered everywhere. They were tired and weak. Their faces showed the patient appearance that results from difficulty long endured. They were heavily burdened with blanket packs which were tied to their shoulders. Each man carried a gun. They walked in a leaning position, the shoulders forward, the head farther forward, the eyes fixed upon the ground. I wish we had a couple of those cartridges that are lying in our cache, said the second man. His voice was completely without expression. And the first man, walking into the milky stream that flowed over the rocks, made no reply. The other man followed at his heels. They did not remove their shoes, although the water was icy cold. It was so cold that their feet soon were without feeling. In places the water dashed against their knees, and both men found it difficult to remain standing. The man who followed slipped upon a smooth rock and nearly fell. He recovered his footing with great effort, at the same time uttering a sharp cry of pain. He seemed faint, and stretched one hand forward, seeking support against the air. When he had steadied himself, he stepped forward, but he slipped again and nearly fell. Then he stood still and looked at the other man, who had never turned his head. The man stood still for fully a minute, as if he were deciding something. Then he called out, I say, I say Bill, I hurt my foot. 
Bill struggled ahead through the milky water. He did not look around. The man watched him go, and although his face lacked expression as before, his eyes had the look of a wounded animal. The other man climbed the farther bank of the stream and continued straight ahead, without looking back. The man in the stream watched him. His lips trembled a little. Bill! he cried. It was the despairing cry of a strong man in trouble. But Bill's head did not turn. The man watched him go, struggling forward up the hill toward the skyline. He watched him go until he passed over the hilltop and disappeared. Then he turned his gaze and slowly examined the circle of the world that remained to him now that Bill was gone. The sun was low in the sky, almost hidden by a cover of clouds. The man looked at his watch while supporting his weight on one leg. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. The season was near the end of July or the first of August. He did not know the exact date within a week or two, but that was enough to know that the sun marked the northwest. He looked to the south and decided that somewhere beyond those hills lay the Great Bear Lake. Also, he knew that behind the same hills, the Arctic Circle cut its way across the plains of northern Canada, called the Barrens. This stream in which he stood flowed into the Coppermine River, which in turn flowed north and emptied into the Arctic Ocean. He had never been there, but he had seen it once on a map. Again, his gaze completed the circle of the world about him. It was not a cheerful sight. Everywhere was soft skyline. The hills were all low-lying. There were no trees, no grasses. There was nothing but a vast emptiness that brought fear into his eyes. Bill! he whispered once and twice. Bill! He stood trembling in the milky water, feeling the vastness pressing in upon him with great force. He began to shake as with a disease, until the gun falling from his hand into the stream brought him back to reality. He fought with his fear and regained his self-control. He recovered the gun from the water. He pushed his pack more toward his left shoulder. This helped to take a portion of its weight off the foot he had hurt. Then he proceeded slowly and carefully, in great pain, to the bank of the stream. He did not stop, with a worry that was madness unmindful of the pain. He hurried up the hill to the top over which his companion had disappeared. But at the top he saw a valley empty of life. He fought with his fear again and won. Then once more he moved the pack farther toward his left shoulder and struggled down the hill. The bottom of the valley was very wet. Thick plant life held the moisture close to the surface, and the water flowed from under his feet at every step. He picked his way carefully across the valley and followed the other man's footsteps along the rocks, which made small islands in the sea of wet plant life. Although alone, he was not lost. Farther on, he knew, he would come to where dead pine trees bordered the shore of a little lake. In the language of that country, it was called the Land of Little Sticks. Into that lake flowed a small stream, the water of which was not milky. There was grass along that stream, but no trees. He would follow the stream until it divided. He would cross this place of dividing to another stream, flowing to the west. This he would follow until it emptied into the River Dees. Here he would find a cache under an upturned boat covered with many rocks. In this cache there would be cartridges for his empty gun and fish hooks and lines. Everything he needed for catching food would be there. Also he would find flour, a little meat, and some beans. Bill would be waiting for him there, and they would find a boat and row south down the Dees to the Great Bear Lake. And south across the lake they would go, ever south, 
until they came to the Mackenzie River. And south, always south they would go, while the winter raced after them, and the ice formed in the streams, and the days grew cold. South they would go, to some warm place where the trees grew tall and full, and there was food without end. These were the thoughts of the man as he struggled forward. But as strongly as he struggled with his body, he struggled equally with his mind. He tried to believe that Bill had not deserted him. Surely Bill would wait for him at the cash. He was forced to think this thought. Otherwise, there would not be any reason to continue. And he would lie down and die. As the ball of the sun sank slowly into the northwest, he recalled every inch of his and Bill's flight south ahead of the oncoming winter, and he thought again and again of the food in the cache. It had been two days since he had anything to eat. It was a far longer time since he had had enough to eat. Often he picked muskeg berries, put them into his mouth, and ate them. A muskeg berry is a small seed in a drop of water. In the mouth, the water melts away and the seed tastes bitter. The man knew there was no real food value in the berries, but he ate them, patiently, with a hope greater than his experience. At nine o'clock that night, he hit his toe on a rocky surface, and from weakness and tiredness, he fell to the ground. He lay for some time without movement on his side. He took his pack from his back and dragged himself into a sitting position. It was not yet dark. While some light remained, he felt among the rocks for pieces of dried plants. When he had gathered a pile, he built a fire and put a tin pot of water on it to boil. He unwrapped his pack. The first thing he did was to count his matches. There were sixty-seven. He counted them three times to be sure. He divided them into several portions, wrapping them in paper. He put one portion in his empty tobacco pack, another in the inside band of his hat, and a third under his shirt against his flesh. This accomplished, he began to worry whether he had counted correctly. He unwrapped them all and counted them again. Yes, there were sixty-seven. He dried his wet shoes and socks by the fire. The moccasins were badly torn. His socks were worn through in places and his feet were bleeding. The area between his foot and leg, the ankle, was very painful. He examined it. It had swelled until it was as large as his knee. He cut a long strip from one of his two blankets and bound the ankle tightly. He cut other strips and bound them about his feet to serve both for moccasins and socks. Then he drank the pot of hot water, wound his watch, and pulled his blankets around him. He slept like a dead man. The brief darkness at midnight came and went. Then the sun rose in the northeast. It can be better said that day dawned in that quarter of the sky because... The sun was hidden by gray clouds. At six o'clock in the morning he waked, quietly, lying on his back. He gazed straight up into the gray sky and knew that he was hungry. As he lifted himself on his elbow, he was frightened by a loud noise. There was a caribou looking at him curiously. The animal was not more than fifty feet away. And instantly into the man's mind came the picture of caribou meat cooking over a fire. From habit, he reached for the empty gun and aimed it. The caribou leaped away and disappeared across the rocks. Wilson, Part 2 
In the first part of my story, I spoke about my life at my first school and about the other boys, over whom I gained firm control. But there was one boy who would not follow my commands, who would not do what I told him to as the other boys did. His name was the same as mine, William Wilson. Although he did not belong to my family in any way, he seemed to feel some love for me, and had entered the school the same day as I had. Many of the boys thought we were brothers. I soon discovered that we had been born on the same day, January 19th, 1809. Wilson continued his attempts to command me, while I continued my attempts to rule him. The strange thing is that, although I did not like him, I could not hate him. We had a battle nearly every day, it is true. In public it would seem that I had been proved the stronger, but he seemed somehow able to make me feel that this was not true and that he himself was stronger. Nevertheless, we continued to talk to each other in a more or less friendly way. On a number of subjects we agreed very well. I sometimes thought that if we had met at another time and place we might have become friends. It is not easy to explain my real feelings toward him. There was no love. And there was no fear, yet I saw something to honor in him. I wanted to learn more about him. Anyone experienced in human nature will not need to be told that Wilson and I were always together. This strange appearance of friendship, although we were not friends, caused no doubt the strangeness of battle between us. I tried to make the others laugh at him. I tried to give him pain while seeming to play a light-hearted game. My attempts were not always successful, even though my plans were well made. There was much about his character that simply could not be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one weakness. Perhaps he had been born with it, or perhaps it had come from some illness. No one but me would have made any use of it against him. He was able to speak only in a very, very soft, low voice. This weakness I never failed to use in any way that was in my power. Wilson could fight back, and he did. There was one way he had of troubling me beyond measure. I had never liked my name. Too many other people had the same name. I would rather have had a name that was not so often heard. The word sickened me. When on the day I arrived at the school, a second William Wilson came also. I felt angry with him for having the name. I knew I would have to hear the name each day a double number of times. The other William Wilson would always be near. The other boys often thought that my actions and my belongings were his, and his were mine. My anger grew stronger with every happening that showed that William Wilson and I were alike, in body or in mind. I had not then discovered the surprising fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I saw that in form and in face we were also much the same. Nothing could trouble me more deeply, although I carefully tried to keep everyone from seeing it, than to hear anyone say anything about the likeness between us of mind or of body or of anything else. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that 
this likeness was ever noticed by our schoolfellows. He saw it, and as clearly as I, that I knew well. He discovered that in this likeness he could always find a way of troubling me. This proved the more than usual sharpness of his mind. His method, which was to increase the likeness between us, lay both in words and in actions, and he followed his plan very well indeed. It was easy enough to have clothes like mine. He easily learned to walk and move as I did. His voice, of course, could not be as loud as mine, but he made his manner of speaking the same. Ah, oh, how greatly this most careful picture of myself troubled me, I will not now attempt to tell. It seemed that I was the only one who noticed it. I was the only one who saw Wilson's strange and knowing smiles, pleased with having produced in my heart the desired result. He seemed to laugh within himself and cared nothing that no one laughed with him. I have already spoken of how he seemed to think he was better and wiser than I. He would try to guide me. He would often try to stop me from doing things I had planned. He would tell me what I should and should not do, and he would do this not openly, but in a word or two in which I had to look for the meaning. As I grew older, I wanted less and less to listen to him. As it was, I could not be happy under his eyes that always watched me. Every day I showed more and more openly that I did not want to listen to anything he told me. I have said that in the first years when we were in school together, my feelings might easily have been turned to friendship. But in the later months, although he talked to me less often then, I almost hated him. Yet let me be fair to him. I can remember no time when what he told me was not wiser than would be expected from one of his years. His sense of what was good or bad was sharper than my own. I might today be a better and happier man if I had more often done what he said. It was about the same period, if I remember rightly, that by chance he acted more openly than usual, and I discovered in his manner something that deeply interested me. Somehow he brought to mind pictures of my earliest years. I remembered, it seemed, things I could not have remembered. These pictures were wild, half-lighted, and not clear, but I felt that very long ago I must have known this person standing before me. This idea, however, passed as quickly as it had come. It was on this same day that I had my last meeting at the school with this other strange William Wilson. That night, when everyone was sleeping, I got out of bed, and with a light in my hand, I went quietly through the house to Wilson's room. I had long been thinking of another of those plans to hurt him, with which I had until then had little success. It was my purpose now to begin to act according to this new plan. Having reached his room, I entered without a sound. Leaving the light outside, I advanced a step and listened. He was asleep. I turned and took the light and again went to the bed. I looked down upon his face. The coldness of ice filled my whole body. My knees trembled. My whole spirit was filled with horror. I moved the light nearer to his face. Was this, this the face of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that it was. 
but I trembled as if with sickness as I imagined that it was not. What was there in his face to trouble me so? I looked and my mind seemed to turn in circles in the rush of my thoughts. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same body, the same day that we came to school. And then there was his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me? Filled with wonder and fear, cold and trembling, I put out the light. In the quiet darkness I went from his room, and without waiting one minute, I left that old school and never entered it again. The Fall of the House of Usher, Part 3 I was visiting an old friend of mine, Roderick Usher, in his old stone house, his palace, where a feeling of death hung on the air. I saw how fear was pressing on his heart and mind. Now his only sister, the Lady Madeline, had died, and we had put her body in its resting place in a room inside the cold walls of the palace, a damp, dark vault, a fearful place. As we looked down upon her face, I saw that there was a strong likeness between the two. Indeed, said Usher, we were born on the same day, and the tie between us has always been strong. We did not long look down at her, for fear and wonder filled our hearts. There was still a little color in her face, and there seemed to be a smile on her lips. We closed the heavy iron door and returned to the rooms above, which were hardly less gloomy than the vault. And now a change came in the sickness of my friend's mind. He went from room to room in a hurried step. His face was, if possible, whiter and more ghastly than before, and the light in his eyes had gone. The trembling in his voice seemed to show the greatest fear. At times he sat looking at nothing for hours, as if listening to some sound I could not hear. I felt his condition slowly but certainly, gaining power over me. I felt that his wild ideas were becoming fixed in my own mind. As I was going to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day after we placed the Lady Madeline within the vault, I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep did not come while the hours passed. My mind fought against the nervousness. I, I tried to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the gloomy room, to the dark wall coverings which in a rising wind moved on the walls. But my efforts were useless. A trembling I, I could not stop filled my body, and fear without reason caught my heart. I I sat up, looking into the darkness of my own room, listening. I do not know why. To certain low sounds which came when the storm was quiet. A feeling of horror lay upon me like a heavy weight. I put on my clothes and began walking nervously around the room. I'd been walking for a very short time when I heard a light step coming toward my door. 
I knew it was Usher. In a moment I saw him at my door, as usual, very white, but there was a wild laugh in his eyes. Even so, I was glad to have his company. And have you not seen it? he said. He hurried to one of the windows and opened it to the storm. The force of the entering wind nearly lifted us from our feet. It was, indeed, a stormy but beautiful night, and wildly strange. The heavy, low-hanging clouds which seemed to press down upon the house flew from all directions against each other, always returning and never passing away in the distance. With their great thickness they cut off all light from the moon and the stars, but we could see them because they were lighted from below by the air itself which we could see rising from the dark lake and from the stones of the house itself. You must not, you shall not look at this, I said to Usher, as I led him from the window to a seat. This appearance, which surprises you so, has been seen in other places, too. Perhaps the lake is the cause. Let us close this window. The air is cold. Here is one of the stories you like best. I will read, and you shall listen, and thus we will live through this fearful night together. The old book which I had picked up was one written by a fool, for fools to read. And it was not, in truth, one that Usher liked. It was, however, the only one within easy reach. He seemed to listen quietly. Then I came to a part of the story in which a man, a strong man, full of wine, begins to break down a door and the sound of the dry wood as it breaks can be heard through all the forest around him. Here I stopped, for it seemed to me that from some very distant part of the house sounds came to my ears like those of which I had been reading. It must have been this likeness that had made me notice them, for the sounds themselves, with the storm still increasing, were nothing to stop or interest me. I continued the story, and read how the man, now entering through the broken door, discovers a strange and terrible animal of the kind so often found in these old stories. He strikes it, and it falls with such a cry that he has to close his ears with his hands. Here again I stopped. There could be no doubt this time I did hear a distant sound, very much like the cry of an animal in the story. I, I tried to control myself so that my friend would see nothing of what I felt. I was not certain that he had heard the sound, although he had clearly changed in some way. He had slowly moved his chair so that I could not see him well. I did see that his lips were moving as if he were speaking to himself. His head had dropped forward, but I knew he was not asleep, for his eyes were open, and he was moving his body from side to side. I began reading again and quickly came to a part of the story where a heavy piece of iron falls on a stone floor with a ringing sound. These words had just passed my lips when I heard clearly, but from far away, a loud ringing sound, as if something of iron had indeed fallen heavily upon a stone floor, or as if an iron door had closed. I lost control of myself completely and jumped up from my chair. Usher still sat moving a little from side to side. His eyes were turned to the floor. I rushed to his chair. As I placed my hand on his shoulder, I felt that his whole body was trembling. A sickly smile touched his lips. He spoke in a low, quick, and nervous voice as if he did not know I was there. Yes, he said, I heard it. Many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, but I did not dare to speak. We have put her living in the vault. Did I not say that my senses were too strong? I heard her first movements many days ago, yet 
I did not dare to speak. And now, that story. But the sounds were hers. Oh, where shall I run? She is coming, coming to ask why I put her there too soon. I hear her footsteps on the stairs. I hear the heavy beating of her heart. Here he jumped up and cried as if he were giving up his soul. I tell you, she now stands at the door. The great door to which he was pointing now slowly opened. It was the work of the rushing wind, perhaps, but no. Outside that door a shape did stand. The tall figure in its grave clothes of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white dress, and the signs of her terrible efforts to escape were upon every part of her thin form. For a moment she remained trembling at the door. Then with a low cry she fell heavily in upon her brother. In her pain as she died at last she carried him down with her, down to the floor. He too was dead, killed by his own fear. I rushed from the room, I rushed from the house, I ran, the storm was around me in all its strength as I crossed the bridge. Suddenly a wild light moved along the ground at my feet, and I turned to see where it could have come from, for only the great house and its darkness were behind me. The light was that of the full moon of a blood-red moon which was now shining through that break in the front wall. That crack which I thought I had seen when I first saw the palace. Then only a little crack. It now widened as I watched. A strong wind came rushing over me. The whole face of the moon appeared. I saw the great walls falling apart. There was a long and stormy shouting sound. And the deep black lake closed darkly over all that remained of the House of Usher. After coming here, uh, I read my poem uh, in a uh, few events uh, in uh, Pittsburgh and uh, this poem uh, about uh, my country's situation. So the name is uh, It's Midnight in My Bangladesh. I don't know uh, how I can express myself as feelings become obtuse from fear. Soldiers of darkness caught me like an animal and butchered me in dreams. You know the feelings of dreaming are like a reality. It is midnight in my Bangladesh. The darkness of evil is growing, lives are slain, but they will be reborn like the phoenix. I know you all have dreamed, some of your dreams are beautiful, sometimes they are full of sadness. I know you can feel what I have been through. Do you know it is midnight in my Bangladesh? Tomorrow I die, tomorrow I die, and today I want to tell the world what happened, and thus perhaps free my soul from the horrible weight which lies upon it. But listen, listen and you shall hear how I have been destroyed. 
When I was a child, I had a natural goodness of soul which led me to love animals, all kinds of animals, but especially those animals we call pets, animals which have learned to live with men and share their homes with them. There is something in the love of these animals which speaks directly to the heart of the man who has learned from experience how uncertain and changeable is the love of other men. I was quite young when I married. You will understand the joy I felt to find that my wife shared with me my love for animals. Quickly she got for us several pets of the most likable kind. We had birds, some goldfish, a fine dog, and a cat. The cat was a beautiful animal, of unusually large size and entirely black. I named the cat Pluto, and it was the pet I liked best. I alone fed it, and it followed me all around the house. It was even with difficulty that I stopped it from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which, however, my own character became greatly changed. I began to drink too much wine and other strong drinks. As the days passed, I became less loving in my manner. I became quick to anger. I forgot how to smile and laugh. My wife, yes, and my pets too, all except the cat, were made to feel the change in my character. One night I came home quite late from the inn, where I now spent more and more time drinking. Walking with uncertain step, I made my way with effort into the house. As I entered, I saw, or thought I saw, that Pluto the cat was trying to stay out of my way, to avoid me. This action by an animal which I had thought still loved me made me angry beyond reason. My soul seemed to fly from my body. I took a small knife out of my coat and opened it. Then I took the poor animal by the neck, and with one quick movement I cut out one of its fear-filled eyes. Slowly the cat got the hole where its eye had been was not a pretty thing to look at, it's true, but the cat no longer appeared to suffer any pain. As might be expected, however, it ran from me in fear whenever I came near. Why should it not run? Yet this did not fail to anger me. I felt growing inside myself a new feeling. Who has not a hundred times found himself doing wrong, some evil thing, for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Are not we humans at all times pushed ever driven in some unknown way to break the law just because we understand it to be the law? One day in cold blood I tied a strong rope around the cat's neck, and taking it down to the cellar under the house, I hung it from one of the wood beams above my head. I hung it there until it was dead. I hung it there with tears in my eyes. I hung it there because I knew it had loved me, because I felt it had given me no reason to hurt it, because I knew that my doing so was a wrong so great, a sin so deadly, that it would place my soul forever outside the reach of the love of God. That same night, as I lay sleeping, I heard through my open window the cries of our neighbors. I jumped from my bed and found that the entire house was filled with fire, it was only with great difficulty that my wife and I escaped, and when we were out of the house all we could do was stand and watch it 
burned to the ground. I thought of the cat as I watched it burn, the cat whose dead body I had left hanging in the cellar. It seemed almost that the cat had, in some mysterious way, caused the house to burn, so that it could make me pay for my evil act, so that it could take revenge upon me. Months went by, and I could not drive the thought of the cat out of my mind. One night I sat in the inn drinking as usual. In the corner I saw a dark object that I had not seen before. I went over to see what it could be. It was a cat. A cat almost exactly like Pluto. I touched it with my hand and petted it, passing my hand softly along its back. The cat rose and pushed its back against my hand. Suddenly I realized that I wanted the cat. I offered to buy it from the innkeeper, but he claimed he had never seen the animal before. As I left the inn, it followed me, and I allowed it to do so. It soon became a pet of both my wife and myself. The morning after I brought it home, however, I discovered that this cat, like Pluto, had only one eye. How was it possible that I had not noticed this the night before? This fact only made my wife love the cat even more, but I myself found a feeling of dislike growing in me. My growing dislike of the animal only seemed to increase its love for me. It followed me, followed me everywhere, always. When I sat, it lay down under my chair. When I stood up, it got between my feet and nearly made me fall. Wherever I went, it was always there. At night, I dreamed of it, and I began to hate that cat. One day, my wife called to me from the cellar of the old building where we were now forced to live. As I went down the stairs, the cat, following me as always, ran under my feet and nearly threw me down. In sudden anger, I took a knife and struck wildly at the cat. Quickly my wife put out her hand and stopped my arm. This only increased my anger, and without thinking, I turned and put the knife's point deep into her heart, and she fell to the floor and died without a sound. I spent a few moments looking for the cat, but it was gone. And I had other things to do, for I knew I must do something with the body, and quickly. Suddenly I noted a place in the wall of the cellar, where stones had been added to the wall to cover an old fireplace which was no longer wanted. The walls were not very strongly built, and I found I could easily take down those stones. Behind them there was, as I knew there must be, a hole just big enough to hold the body. With much effort, I put the body in and carefully put the stones back in their place. I was pleased to see that it was quite impossible for anyone to know that a single stone had been moved. Days passed. Still there was no cat. A few people came and asked about my wife, but I answered them easily. And then one day several officers of the police came. Certain that they would find nothing, I asked them in and went with them as they searched. Finally they searched the cellar from end to end. I watched them quietly, and as I expected they noticed nothing. But as they started up the stairs again, I felt myself driven by some unknown inner force to let them know, to make them know, that I had won the battle. The walls of this building, I said, are very strongly built. It is a fine old house. And as I spoke, I struck with my stick the very place in the wall behind which was the body of my wife. Immediately. I felt a 
cold feeling up and down my back as we heard coming out of the wall itself a horrible cry. For one short moment the officers stood looking at each other. Then quickly they began to pick at the stones, and in a short time they saw before them the body of my wife, black with dried blood and smelling of decay. On the body's head, its one eye filled with fire, its wide open mouth the color of blood sat the cat crying out its revenge. The Red Death had long been feeding on the country. No sickness had ever been so deadly, so great a killer, or so fearful to see. Blood was its mark, the redness and horror of blood. There were sharp pains and a sudden feeling that the mind was rushing in circles inside the head. Then there was bleeding through the skin, though it was not cut or broken. And then, death. The bright red spots upon the body, and especially upon the face of the sick man, made other men turn away from him, afraid to try to help, and the sickness lasted from beginning to end, no more than half an hour. But Prospero, the ruler of that land, was happy and strong and wise. When half the people of his land had died, he called to him a thousand healthy, happy friends and with them went far away to live in one of his palaces. This was a large and beautiful stone building he had planned himself. A strong high wall circled it. This wall had gates of iron. The gentlemen, after they had entered it, brought fire to heat the iron of the gates to make them close so firmly that nobody could open them. Here they could forget the sickness, the Red Death. They would leave the outside world to care for itself. Prospero had supplied everything they needed for pleasure. There was music, there was dancing, there was beauty, there was food to eat and wine to drink. All these were within the wall, and within the wall they would be safe. Outside the wall walked the Red Death. It was near the end of their fifth month there that Prospero asked his friends to all come together for a dancing party, a masquerade. Everyone was asked to come dressed in fine clothes and with his eyes, or perhaps his whole face, covered by a cloth mask. It was a scene of great richness, that masquerade. There were seven rooms in which Prospero's friends danced. In many old palaces, the doors can be opened in such a way that rooms like these seven can be seen all at the same time. In this palace, it was different. Little more than one of them could be seen at one time. There was a turn every twenty or thirty yards. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, was a tall pointed window. The windows were of colored glass of the same color that was used in each room. The first room had blue cloth hangings on the wall, and blue were its windows. The second room had wall hangings of that blue-red known as purple, and here the windows were purple. The third was green, and so was the glass of the windows. The fourth had hangings and windows of yellow, the fifth of white, the sixth of violet, but the seventh room had hangings on the walls made of a rich soft cloth which was black, black as night. And the floor, too, was covered with the same heavy black cloth. In this room the color of the windows was not the same. It was red, a deep blood color. 
All the rooms were lighted through the outside windows. The resulting light was strange indeed as it colored the shapes of the dancers. But the light that fell on the black hangings through the blood-colored glass was the most fearful of them all. It produced so wild a look on the faces of those who entered that there were few of the dancers who dared to step within those dark walls. In this room stood a great clock of black wood. Gently it marked the seconds as they passed, and when it was time to mark the hour, the clock spoke with a loud, clear voice, a deep tone as beautiful as music, but so strange that the music and the dancing stopped, and the dancers stood still to listen. And then, after another sixty minutes, after another three thousand and six hundred seconds of time, of flying time, the clock struck again, and the dancers stopped as before. Nevertheless, it was a happy and beautiful masquerade, and you may be sure that the clothes the dancers chose to wear, their costumes, were strange and wonderful. The dancers looked like the forms we might see in troubled dreams. And these, the dreams, danced softly through the rooms, taking the color of the rooms as they moved. It did not seem that their steps followed the music, but that the music rose from their steps. But into the seventh room the dancers do not go for the red light coming through the windows and the blackness of the wall hangings make them afraid. And he who enters hears more deeply the striking of the great black clock. But the other rooms are crowded, and in them beats hotly the heart of life. And the dance goes on, until at last the clock begins to strike twelve. Again the music stopped. Again the dancers stood without moving, while the slow, striking sound continued. Before the clock was quiet again, many in the crowd saw that in the first room, the blue room, there was a masquerader who had not been seen before. As they talked softly to each other about him, a feeling of surprise spread through all the dancers, then a feeling of fear and sickening horror. In such a group as this, only a very strange masquerader could have caused such a feeling. Even among those who laugh at both life and death, some matters cannot be laughed at. Everyone seemed now deeply to feel that the stranger should not have been allowed to come among them dressed in such clothes. He was tall and very thin, and covered from head to foot like a dead man prepared for the grave. His mask which covered his face, or was it really a mask? The mask which covered his face was so much like the face of a dead man that the nearest eye could not see the difference. And yet all this might have been acceptable, but the masquerader whom no one knew had made himself look like the Red Death itself. His clothes were spotted with blood and the mask over his face was covered with the terrible red spots, or perhaps it was indeed his face. When Prospero looked upon this fearful form, he was at first filled with terror, and then with anger. Who dares, he cried, take him, seize him, pull off his mask so we may know who we must hang at sunrise. Prospero stood in the blue room when he spoke these words. They sounded through the seven rooms loud and clear. At first, as he spoke, some of the dancers started to rush towards the strange masquerader. But they stopped, afraid, and no one dared to put out a hand to touch him. The stranger started to walk towards the second room. He passed within a few feet of Prospero, who stood still, surprised. And while the dancers moved back from the center of the room, the stranger moved quietly, without being stopped. With a slow and measured step through the blue room to the purple room, 
through the purple room to the green room, through the green to the yellow, through this to the white, and then to the violet room. As the stranger was entering the seventh room, Prospero suddenly and angrily rushed through the six rooms. No one dared to follow him. He held a sharp knife high over his head, ready to strike the stranger. When he was within three or four feet, the strange masquerader turned and stood silent, looking firmly into Prospero's eyes. There was a cry, and the knife dropped, shining upon the black floor, upon which a moment later Prospero himself fell dead. The dancers then rushed into the black room. The strongest of the men tried to hold the masquerader, whose tall form stood beside the black clock. But when they put their hands on him, they found inside the grave clothes no human form, no body, nothing. Now they knew that it was the Red Death itself that had come in the night. One by one the dancers fell, and each died as he fell. And the fires died, and the clock stopped, and darkness, and decay, and the Red Death ruled forever over all. The Red Death had long been feeding on the country. No sickness had ever been so deadly, so great a killer, or so fearful to see. Blood was its mark, the redness and horror of blood. There were sharp pains and a sudden feeling that the mind was rushing in circles inside the head. Then there was bleeding through the skin, though it was not cut or broken. And then, death. The bright red spots upon the body, and especially upon the face of the sick man, made other men turn away from him, afraid to try to help, and the sickness lasted from beginning to end, no more than half an hour. But Prospero, the ruler of that land, was happy and strong and wise. When half the people of his land had died, he called to him a thousand healthy, happy friends and with them went far away to live in one of his palaces. This was a large and beautiful stone building he had planned himself. A strong high wall circled it. This wall had gates of iron. The gentlemen, after they had entered it, brought fire to heat the iron of the gates to make them close so firmly that nobody could open them. Here they could forget the sickness, the Red Death. They would leave the outside world to care for itself. Prospero had supplied everything they needed for pleasure. There was music, there was dancing, there was beauty, there was food to eat and wine to drink. All these were within the wall, and within the wall they would be safe. Outside the wall walked the Red Death. It was near the end of their fifth month there that Prospero asked his friends to all come together for a dancing party, a masquerade. Everyone was asked to come dressed in fine clothes and with his eyes, or perhaps his whole face, covered by a cloth mask. It was a scene of great richness, that masquerade. There were seven rooms in which Prospero's friends danced. In many old palaces, the doors can be opened in such a way that rooms like these seven can be seen all at the same time. In this palace, it was different. Little more than one of them could be seen at one time. There was a turn every twenty or thirty yards. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, was a tall pointed window. The windows were of colored glass of the same color that was used in each room. 
The first room had blue cloth hangings on the wall, and blue were its windows. The second room had wall hangings of that blue-red known as purple, and here the windows were purple. The third was green, and so was the glass of the windows. The fourth had hangings and windows of yellow, the fifth of white, the sixth of violet. But the seventh room had hangings on the walls made of a rich soft cloth which was black, black as night. And the floor, too, was covered with the same heavy black cloth. In this room the color of the windows was not the same. It was red, a deep blood color. All the rooms were lighted through the outside windows. The resulting light was strange indeed as it colored the shapes of the dancers. But the light that fell on the black hangings through the blood-colored glass was the most fearful of them all. It produced so wild a look on the faces of those who entered that there were few of the dancers who dared to step within those dark walls. In this room stood a great clock of black wood. Gently it marked the seconds as they passed, and when it was time to mark the hour, the clock spoke with a loud, clear voice, a deep tone as beautiful as music, but so strange that the music and the dancing stopped and the dancers stood still to listen. And then, after another sixty minutes, after another three thousand and six hundred seconds of time, of flying time, the clock struck again, and the dancers stopped as before. Nevertheless, it was a happy and beautiful masquerade, and you may be sure that the clothes the dancers chose to wear, their costumes, were strange and wonderful. The dancers looked like the forms we might see in troubled dreams, and these, the dreams, danced softly through the rooms, taking the color of the rooms as they moved. It did not seem that their steps followed the music, but that the music rose from their steps. But into the seventh room the dancers do not go, for the red light coming through the windows and the blackness of the wall hangings make them afraid. And he who enters hears more deeply the striking of the great black clock. But the other rooms are crowded, and in them beats hotly the heart of life. And the dance goes on, until at last the clock begins to strike twelve. Again the music stopped. Again the dancers stood without moving, while the slow striking sound continued. Before the clock was quiet again, Many in the crowd saw that in the first room, the blue room, there was a masquerader who had not been seen before. As they talked softly to each other about him, a feeling of surprise spread through all the dancers, then a feeling of fear and sickening horror. In such a group as this, only a very strange masquerader could have caused such a feeling. Even among those who laugh at both life and death, some matters cannot be laughed at. Everyone seemed now deeply to feel that the stranger should not have been allowed to come among them dressed in such clothes. He was tall and very thin, and covered from head to foot like a dead man prepared for the grave. His mask which covered his face, or was it really a mask? The mask which covered his face was so much like the face of a dead man that the nearest eye could not see the difference. And yet all this might have been acceptable, but the masquerader, whom no one knew, had made himself look like the Red Death itself. His clothes were spotted with blood, and the mask over his face was covered with the terrible red spots. Or perhaps it was indeed his face. When Prospero looked upon this fearful form, he was at first filled with terror, and then with anger. Who dares, he cried, 
Take him, seize him, pull off his mask so we may know who we must hang at sunrise. Prospero stood in the blue room when he spoke these words. They sounded through the seven rooms loud and clear. At first, as he spoke, some of the dancers started to rush towards the strange masquerader. But they stopped, afraid, and no one dared to put out a hand to touch him. The stranger started to walk towards the second room. He passed within a few feet of Prospero, who stood still, surprised. And while the dancers moved back from the center of the room, the stranger moved quietly, without being stopped. With a slow and measured step through the blue room to the purple room, through the purple room to the green room, through the green to the yellow, through this to the white, and then to the violet room. As the stranger was entering the seventh room, Prospero suddenly and angrily rushed through the six rooms. No one dared to follow him. He held a sharp knife high over his head, ready to strike the stranger. When he was within three or four feet, the strange masquerader turned and stood silent, looking firmly into Prospero's eyes. There was a cry, and the knife dropped, shining upon the black floor, upon which a moment later Prospero himself fell, dead. The dancers then rushed into the black room. The strongest of the men tried to hold the masquerader, whose tall form stood beside the black clock. But when they put their hands on him, they found inside the grave clothes no human form, no body, nothing. Now they knew that it was the Red Death itself that had come in the night. One by one the dancers fell, and each died as he fell. And the fires died, and the clock stopped, and darkness, and decay, and the Red Death ruled forever, over all. Caliph, Cupid, and the Clock Prince Michael of Valleluna sat in the park on the seat he liked best. In the coolness of the night he felt full of life. The other seats were not filled. Cool weather sends most people home. The moon was rising over the houses on the east side of the park. Children laughed and played. Music came softly from one of the nearer streets. Around the little park, cabs rolled by. The trains that traveled high above the street rushed past. These cabs and trains, with their wild noises, seemed like animals outside the park, but they could not enter. The park was safe and quiet, and above the trees was the great round shining face of a lighted clock in a tall old building. Prince Michael's shoes were old and broken. No shoemaker could ever make them like new again. His clothes were very torn. The hair of his face had been growing for two weeks. It was all colors, gray and brown and red and green-yellow. <laughs> his hat was older and more torn than his shoes and his other clothes. Prince Michael sat on the seat he liked best, and he smiled. It was a happy thought to him that he had enough money to buy every house he could see near the park if he wished. He had as much gold as any rich man in this proud city of New York. He had as many jewels and houses and land. He could have sat at table with kings and queens. All the best things in the world could be his. Art, pleasure, beautiful women, honor. All the sweeter things in life were waiting for Prince Michael of Valleluna 
whenever he might choose to take them. But instead, he was choosing to sit in torn clothes on a seat in a park. For he had tasted the fruit of the tree of life. He had not liked the taste. Here in this park, he felt near to the beating heart of the world. He hoped it would help him to forget that taste. These thoughts moved like a dream through the mind of Prince Michael. There was a smile across his face with its many-colored hair. Sitting like this in torn clothes, he loved to study other men. He loved to do good things for others. Giving was more pleasant to him than owning all his riches. It was his chief pleasure to help people who were in trouble. He liked to give to people who needed help. He liked to surprise them with princely gifts. But he always gave wisely, after careful thought. And now, as he looked at the shining face of the great clock, his smile changed. The prince always thought big thoughts. When he thought of time, he always felt a touch of sadness. Time controlled the world. People had to do what time commanded. Their comings and goings were always controlled by a clock. They were always in a hurry and always afraid because of time. It made him sad. After a little while, a young man in evening clothes came and sat upon a seat near the prince. For half an hour he sat there nervously. Then he began to watch the face of the lighted clock above the trees. The prince could see that the young man had a trouble. He could also see that, somehow, the clock was part of the trouble. The prince rose and went to the young man's seat. "'I am a stranger, and I shouldn't speak to you,' he said. "'But I can see that you are troubled. "'I am Prince Michael of Valluluna. "'I do not want people to know who I am. "'That is why I wear these torn clothes. It is a small pleasure of mine to help those who need help. First, I must feel sure they are worth helping. I think you are. And perhaps your trouble may be ended if you and I together decide what to do about it. The young man looked up brightly at the prince, brightly, but he was still troubled. He laughed then. But still the look of trouble remained. But he accepted this chance to talk to someone. I'm glad to meet you, Prince, he said pleasantly. Yes, I can see you don't want to be known. That's easy to see. Thanks for your offer to help, but I don't see what you can do. It's my own problem, but thanks. Prince Michael sat down at the young man's side. People often said no to him, but they always said it pleasantly. Clocks, said the prince, are tied to the feet of all men and women. I have seen you watching that clock. That face commands us to act, whether or not we wish to act. Let me tell you not to trust the numbers on that face. They will destroy you if they can. Stop looking at that clock. What does it know about living men and women? I usually don't look at that clock, said the young man. I carry a watch, except when I wear evening clothes. I know men and women as I know the trees and the flowers, said the prince warmly and proudly. I have studied many years, and I am very rich. There are few troubles that I cannot help. I have read what is in your face. I have found honor and goodness there, and trouble. Please accept my help. I can see that you are wise. Show how wise you are. Do not judge me by my torn clothes. 
I am sure I can help you. The young man looked at the clock again, and his face grew darker. Then he looked at a house beside the park. Lights could be seen in many rooms. Ten minutes before nine. Ten minutes before nine, said the young man. He raised his hands and then let them fall as if hope had gone. He stood up and took a quick step or two away. Remain, commanded Prince Michael. His voice was so powerful that the young man turned quickly. He laughed a little. I'll wait ten minutes and then I'll go, he said in a low voice, as if only to himself. Then to the prince he said, I'll join you. We'll destroy all the clocks, and women too. Sit down, said the prince softly. I do not accept that. I do not include women. Women are enemies of clocks. They are born that way. Therefore, they are friends of those who wish to destroy clocks. If you can trust me, tell me your story. The young man sat down again and laughed loudly. <laughs> ah, prince, I will, he said. He did not believe that Prince Michael was really a prince. His manner of speaking proved that. You see that house, Prince? That house with lights and three windows on the third floor? At six tonight, I was in that house with the young lady I'm going to... was going to marry. I'd been doing wrong, my dear Prince, and she heard about it. I was sorry. I wanted her to forget it. We're always asking women to forget things like that, aren't we, Prince? I want time to think, she said. I will either forget it forever or never see your face again. At half past eight, she said, watch the middle window on the third floor of this house. If I decide to forget, I will hang out a long white cloth. You will know then that everything is as it was before, and you may come to me. If you see nothing hanging from the window, you will know that everything between us is finished forever. That, said the young man, is why I've been watching that clock. The time was past twenty-three minutes ago. Do you see why I'm a little troubled, my torn prince? Let me tell you again said Prince Michael in his soft voice, that women are the born enemies of clocks. Clocks are bad. Women are good. The white cloth may yet appear. Never, said the young man hopelessly. You don't know Marion. She is always on time to the minute. That was the first thing I liked about her. At 8.31... I should have known that everything was finished. I'm going to go west. I'll get on the train tonight. I'll find some way to forget her. Good night, Prince. Prince Michael smiled his gentle, understanding smile. He caught the other's arm. The bright light in the prince's eyes was softening. It was dreamlike, clouded. Wait! he said, till the clock tells the hour. I have riches and power, and I'm wiser than most men. But when I hear the clock tell the hour, I'm afraid. Stay with me till then. This woman shall be yours. You have the promise of the Prince of Valleluna. On the day you are married, I will give you one hundred thousand dollars and a great house beside the Hudson River. But there must be no clocks in that house. Do you agree to that? Sure, said the young man. I don't like clocks. He looked again at the clock above the trees. It was three minutes before nine. I think, said Prince Michael, that I will sleep a little. It has been a long day. He lay down on the seat, as if he had often done it before. You'll find me on this park on any evening when the weather is good. 
said the prince. "'Come to me when you know the day you'll be married. "'I'll give you the money.' "'Thanks, prince,' said the young man. "'That day isn't going to come, but thanks.' "'Prince Michael fell into a deep sleep. "'His hat rolled on the ground. "'The young man lifted it, "'placed it over the prince's face, and moved one of the prince's legs into an easier position. "'Poor fellow,' he said. He pulled the torn coat together over the prince's body. It was nine. Loud and surprising came the voice of the clock, telling the hour. The young man took a deep breath and turned for one more look at the house. And he gave a shout of joy. From the middle window on the third floor, a snow-white wonderful cloth was hanging. Through the park a man came, hurrying home. Uh, will you tell me the time, please? asked the young man. The other man took out his watch. Twenty-nine and a half minutes after eight. And then he looked up at the clock. But that clock is wrong, the man said. The first time in ten years. My watch is always... But he was talking to no one. He turned and saw the young man running toward the house with three lighted windows on the third floor. And in the morning, two cops walked through the park. There was only one person to be seen. A man asleep on a long park seat. They stopped to look at him. Ish, Michael a dreamer, said one. He's been sleeping like this in the park for twenty years. He won't live much longer, I guess. The other cop looked at something in the sleeper's hand. Look at this, he said. Fifty dollars! I wish I could have a dream like that. And then they gave Prince Michael of Valialuna a hard shake and brought him out of his dreams and into real life. Old Anthony Rockwall, who made millions of dollars by making and selling Rockwall soap, stood at the window of his large Fifth Avenue house. He was looking out at his neighbor, G. Van Shulite Suffolk Jones. His neighbor is a proud member of a proud old New York family. He came out of his door and got into a cab. He looked once, quickly as usual, at Anthony Rockwall's house. The look showed that Suffolk Jones was a very important man, while a rich soap maker was nothing. I will have this house painted red, white, and blue next summer, said the soap king to himself, and we'll see how he likes that. And then Anthony Rockwall turned around and shouted, Mike! in a loud voice. He never used a bell to call a servant. Tell my son he said when the servant came, to come to me before he leaves the house. When young Rockwall entered the room, the old man put down the newspaper he'd been reading. Richard, said Anthony Rockwall, what do you pay for the soap that you use? Richard had finished college six months before, and he had come home to live. He had not yet learned to understand his father. He was always being surprised. He said, Six dollars for twelve pieces. And your clothes? About sixty dollars, usually. You are a gentleman, said his father. I have heard of young men who pay twenty-four dollars for twelve pieces of soap, and more than a hundred for clothes. You have as much money to throw away as anyone else has. But what you do is reasonable. I myself use Rockwall soap because it is the best. When you pay more than ten cents for a piece of soap, you're paying for a sweet, strong smell and a name. But fifty cents is good for a young man like you. You are a gentleman. 
People say that if a man is not a gentleman, his son can't be a gentleman. But perhaps his son's son will be a gentleman. But they're wrong. Money does it faster than that. Money has made you a gentleman. It has almost made me a gentleman. I've become very much like the two gentlemen who own the houses on each side of us. My manners are now almost as bad as theirs. But they still can't sleep at night because a soap maker lives in this house. <laughs> there are some things that money can't do, said the young man rather sadly. Don't say that, said old Anthony. Money is successful every time. I don't know anything you can't buy with it. Tell me something that money can't buy. And I want you to tell me something more. Something is wrong with you. I've seen it for two weeks. Tell me. Let me help you. In 24 hours, I could have $11 million here in my hands. Are you sick? Some people call it a sickness. Oh, said Anthony. What's her name? Why don't you ask her to marry you? She would be glad to do it. You have money, you're good-looking, and you are a good boy. Your hands are clean. You have no rock wall soap on them. I haven't had a chance to ask her, said Richard. Make a chance, said Anthony. Take her for a walk in the park or walk home with her from church. You don't know the life of a rich girl, father. Every hour and minute of her time is planned. I must have her, or the world is worth nothing to me. And I can't write to say I love her. I can't do that. Do you tell me, said the old man, that with all my money you can't get an hour or two of a girl's time? I've waited too long. She's going to Europe the day after tomorrow. She's going to be there two years. I'm allowed to see her alone tomorrow evening for a few minutes. She's coming to the city on a train. I'm going to meet her with a cab. Then we'll drive fast to the theater where she must meet her mother and some other people. <sighs> Do you think she would listen to me then? No. Or in the theater? No. Or after the theater? No. No, father, this is one trouble that your money can't help. We can't buy one minute of time with money. If we could, rich people would live longer. There is no hope of talking with Miss Lantry before she sails. Richard, my boy, said old Anthony, I'm glad you're not really sick. You say money won't buy time? Perhaps it won't buy all of time, but I've seen it buy some little pieces. That evening his sister, Ellen, came to Anthony to talk about the troubles that lovers have. He told me all about it, said Brother Anthony. I told him he could have all the money he wanted. Then he began to say that money was no use to him. He said money couldn't help him. Oh, Anthony, said Ellen, I wish you wouldn't think so much of money. Money is no help for love. Love is all-powerful. If he had only spoken to her earlier, she could never say no to our Richard. But now I fear it is too late. All your gold cannot buy happiness for your son. At eight the next evening, Ellen took an old gold ring and gave it to Richard. Wear it tonight, she said. Your mother gave it to me. She asked me to give it to you when you had found the girl you loved. Young Rockwall took the ring and tried to put it on his little finger. It was too small. He put it inside his coat in a place where he thought it would be safe. And then he called for his cab. At the station he met Miss Lantry. We must not keep my mother and the others waiting, said she. To Wallach's Theatre, as fast as you can drive, said Richard to the cabbie. They rolled along 42nd Street to Broadway, and from there to 34th Street. Then young Richard quickly ordered the cabbie to stop. I've dropped the ring, he said, getting out. It was my mother's, and I don't want to lose it. This will only take a minute. I saw where it fell. In less than a minute, he was again in the cab with the ring. 
But within that minute, a wagon had stopped in front of the cab. The cabbie tried to pass it on the left, but a cab was there. He tried to pass on the right, but another cab was there. He could not go back. He was caught where he was and could not move in any direction. These sudden stops of movement will happen in the city. Instead of moving along the street in their usual orderly way, all the wagons and cabs will suddenly be mixed together and stopped. Why don't you drive further? said Miss Lantry. We'll be late. Richard stood up in the cab and looked around. He saw a stream of cabs and wagons and everything else on wheels rolling toward the corner where Broadway, 6th Avenue, and 34th Street meet. They came from all directions, and more and more were rolling toward them. More and more were caught there. Drivers and cabbies shouted. Everyone on wheels in New York City seemed to be hurrying to this place. I'm very sorry, said Richard. He sat down again. We can't move. They won't get this straight for an hour. If I hadn't dropped the ring, we— Let me see the ring, said Miss Lantry. Since we really can't hurry, I don't care. I didn't want to go to the theater. I don't like the theater. At eleven that night, someone stopped at the door of Anthony's room. Come in, shouted Anthony. He had been reading and put down his book. It was Ellen. "'They are going to be married, Anthony,' she said. "'She has promised to marry our Richard. "'On their way to the theatre, their cab was stopped in the street. "'It was two hours before they could move again. "'Oh, Brother Anthony, don't ever talk about the power of money again. "'It was a little ring, a true love ring, "'that was the cause of our Richard finding his happiness. "'He dropped it on the street and had to get out and find it.' and before they could continue, the cab was caught among the others. He told her of his love there in the cab. Money is nothing, Anthony. True love is everything. I'm glad the boy got what he wanted, said old Anthony. I told him I didn't care how much money. But, Brother Anthony, what could your money do? Sister, said Anthony Rockwell, I'm reading a book with a good story in it. It's a wild adventure story, but I like it, and I want to find what happens next. I wish you would let me go on reading. The story should end there. I wish it would. I'm sure you, too, wish it would end there. But we must go on to the truth. The next day, a person with red hands and a blue necktie whose name was Kelly came to Anthony Rockwell's house to see Anthony. That was good soap we made, said Anthony. I gave you five thousand dollars yesterday. I paid out three hundred dollars more of my own money, said Kelly. It cost more than I expected. I got the cabs, most of them for five dollars, but anything with two horses was ten dollars. I had to pay most to the cops. Fifty dollars I paid to two, and the others twenty and twenty-five. But didn't it work beautifully, Mr. Rockwall? They were all on time, and it was two hours before anyone could move. Thirteen hundred. There you are, Kelly, said Anthony, giving him the money. A thousand for you, and the three hundred of your own money that you had to spend. You like money, do you, Kelly? I do, said Kelly. Anthony stopped Kelly when he was at the door. Did you see? asked he. Anywhere on the street yesterday, a little fat boy with no clothes on. "'Carrying arrows?' "'Kelly looked surprised. "'No, I didn't. "'But if he was like that with no clothes, "'perhaps the cops caught him. <laughs> "'I thought Cupid wouldn't be there,' "'Anthony said, laughing. "'Goodbye, Kelly.' The Furnished Room Restless, always moving, forever passing, like time itself, are most of the people who live in these old red houses. This is on New York's west side.
The people are homeless. Yet they have a hundred homes. They go from furnished room to furnished room. They are transients. Transients forever. Transients in living place. Transients in heart and mind. They sing the song, Home Sweet Home, but they sing it without feeling what it means. They can carry everything they own in one small box. They know nothing of gardens. To them, flowers and leaves are something to put on a woman's hat. The houses of this part of the city have had a thousand people living in them. Therefore, each house should have a thousand stories to tell. Perhaps most of these stories would not be interesting. But it would be strange if you did not feel in some of these houses that you were among people you could not see. The spirits of some who had lived and suffered there must surely remain, though their bodies had gone. One evening a young man appeared going from one to another of these big old houses ringing the doorbell. At the twelfth house, he put down the bag he carried, he cleaned the dust from his face, then he touched the bell. It sounded far, far away, as if it were ringing deep underground. The woman who owned the house came to the door. The young man looked at her. He thought that she was like some fat, colorless, legless thing that had come up from a hole in the ground, hungrily hoping for something, or someone, to eat. He asked if there was a room that he could have for the night. Come in, said the woman. Her voice was soft, but for some reason he did not like it. I have the back room on the third floor. Do you wish to look at it? The young man followed her up. There was little light in the halls. He could not see where that light was coming from. The covering on the floor was old and ragged. There were places in the walls made perhaps to hold flowering plants. If this were true, the plants had died long before this evening. The air was bad. No flowers could have lived in it for long. This is the room said the lady in her soft, thick voice. It's a nice room. Someone is usually living in it. I had some very nice people in it last summer. I had no trouble with them. They paid on time. The water is at the end of the hall. Sprouse and Mooney had the room for three months. You know them? Theater people. The gas is here. You see, there's plenty of space to hang your clothes. It's a room everyone likes. If you don't take it, someone else will take it soon. Do you have many theater people living here? Asked the young man. They come and they go. Many of my people work in the theater. Yes, sir. This is the part of the city where theater people live. They never stay long any place. They live in all the houses near here. They come and they go. The young man paid for the room for a week. He was going to stay there, he said, and rest. He counted out the money. The room was all ready, she said. He would find everything that he needed. As she moved away, he asked his question. He had asked it already a thousand times. It was always there, waiting to be asked again. A young girl, Eloise Vashner. Do you remember her? Has she ever been in this house? She would be singing in the theater, probably. A girl of mid-height, thin, with red-gold hair, and a small dark spot on her face near her left eye. No, I don't remember the name. Theater people change names as often as they change their rooms. They come and they go. No, I don't remember that one. No. Always no. He had asked his question for five months and the answer was always no. Every day he questioned men who knew theater people. Had she gone to them to ask for work? Every evening he went to the theaters. He went to the good theaters and to bad ones. Some were so bad that he was afraid to find her there. Yet he went to them, hoping. 
He who had loved her best had tried to find her. She had suddenly gone from her home. He was sure that this great city, this island, held her. But everything in the city was moving, restless. What was on top today was lost at the bottom tomorrow. The furnished room received the young man with a certain warmth, or it seemed to receive him warmly. It seemed to promise that here he could rest. There was a bed, and there were two chairs with ragged covers. Between the two windows there was a looking-glass about twelve inches wide. There were pictures on the walls. The young man sat down in a chair while the room tried to tell him its history. The words it used were strange, not easy to understand, as if they were words of many distant foreign countries. There was a floor covering of many colors, like an island of flowers in the middle of the room. Dust lay all around it. There was a bright wallpaper on the wall. There was a fireplace. On the wall above it, some bright pieces of cloth were hanging. Perhaps they had been put there to add beauty to the room. This they did not do. And the pictures on the walls were pictures the young man had seen a hundred times before in other furnished rooms. Here and there around the room were small objects forgotten by others who had used the room. There were pictures of theater people, something to hold flowers, but nothing valuable. One by one the little signs grew clear. They showed the young man the others who had lived there before him. In front of the looking-glass there was a thin spot on the floor covering. It told him that women had been in the room. Small finger marks on the wall told of children trying to feel their way to sun and air. A larger spot on the wall made him think of someone, in anger, throwing something there. Across the looking-glass some person had written the name Marie. It seemed to him that those who had lived in the furnished room had been angry with it, and had done all they could to hurt it. Perhaps their anger had been caused by the room's brightness and its coldness for there was no true warmth in the room. There were cuts and holes in the chairs and in the walls. The bed was half broken. The floor cried out as if in pain when it was walked on. People for a time had called this room home, and yet they had heard it. This was a fact not easy to believe, but perhaps it was, strangely, a deep love of home that was the cause. The people who had lived in the room perhaps never knew what a real home was, but they knew that this room was not a home. Therefore their deep anger rose up and made them strike out. The young man in the chair allowed these thoughts to move one by one softly through his mind. At the same time, sounds and smells from other furnished rooms came into his room. He heard someone laughing, laughing in a manner that was neither happy nor pleasant. From other rooms he heard a woman talking too loudly. He heard people playing games for money. And he heard a woman singing to a baby. And he heard someone weeping. Above him there was music. Doors opened and closed. The trains outside rushed noisily past. Some animal cried out in the night outside. And the young man felt the breath of the house. It had a smell that was more than bad. It seemed cold and sick and old and dying. Then suddenly, as he rested there, the room was filled with the strong, sweet smell of a flower, small and white, named Mignonette. The smell came so surely and so strongly that it almost seemed like a living person entering the room. And the man cried out aloud, What, dear? As if he had been called. He jumped up and turned around. The rich smell was near and all around him. 
He opened his arms for it. For a moment, he did not know where he was or what he was doing. How could anyone be called by a smell? Surely it must have been a sound. But could a sound have touched him? She has been in this room, he cried, and he began to seek some sign of her. He knew that if he found any small thing that had belonged to her, he would know that it was hers. If she had only touched it, he would know it. This smell of flowers that was all around him, she had loved it and she had made it her own. Where did it come from? The room had been carelessly cleaned. He found many small things that women had left. Something to hold their hair in place, something to wear in the hair to make it more beautiful. A piece of cloth that smelled of another flower. A book. Nothing that had been hers. And he began to walk around the room like a dog hunting a wild animal. He looked in corners. He got down on his hands and knees to look at the floor. He wanted something that he could see. He could not realize that she was there, beside, around, against, within, above him, near to him, calling him. Then once again he felt the call. Once again he answered loudly, Yes, dear, and turned wild-eyed to look at nothing. For he could not yet see the form and color and love and reaching arms that were there in the smell of white flowers. Oh, God, where did the smell of flowers come from? Since when has a smell had a voice to call? So he wondered and went on seeking. He found many small things left by many who had used the room. But of her who may have been there, whose spirit seemed to be there, he found no sign. And then he thought of the owner. He ran from the room with its smell of flowers, going down into a door where he could see a light. She came out. He tried to speak quietly. Will you tell me, he asked her, who was in my room before I came here? Yes, sir, I can tell you again. It was Sprouse and Mooney, as I said. It was really Mr. and Mrs. Mooney, but she used her own name. You see, the people do that. Tell me about Mrs. Mooney. What did she look like? Black-haired, short, and fat. They left here a week ago. And before they were here? There was a gentleman not in the theater business he didn't pay. Before him was Mrs. Crowder and her two children. They stayed four months. And before them was old Mr. Doyle. His sons paid for him. He had the room six months. That is a year. And further... I do not remember. He thanked her and went slowly back to his room. The room was dead. The smell of flowers had made it alive, but the smell of flowers was gone. In its place was the smell of the house. His hope was gone. He sat looking at the yellow gaslight. Soon he walked to the bed and took the covers. He began to tear them into pieces. He pushed the pieces into every open space around the windows and door. No air now would be able to enter the room. When all was as he wished it, he put out the burning gaslight. Then, in the dark, he started the gas again, and he lay down thankfully on the bed. It was Mrs. McCool's night to go out and get them something cold to drink. So she went and came back and sat with Mrs. Purdy in one of those rooms underground where the women who own these old houses meet and talk. I have a young man in my third floor back room this evening, said Mrs. Purdy, taking a drink. He went up to bed two hours ago. Is that true, Mrs. Purdy, said Mrs. McCool. It was easy to see that she thought this was a fine and surprising thing. You always find someone to take a room like that. I don't know how you do it. Did you tell him about it? Rooms, said Mrs. Purdy in her soft, thick voice, are furnished to be used by those that need them. I did not tell him, Mrs. McCool. You're right, Mrs. Purdy, 
It's the money we get for the rooms that keep us alive. You have the real feeling for business. There are many people who wouldn't take a room like that if they knew. If you told them that someone had died in the bed, and died by their own hand, they wouldn't enter the room. As you say, we have our living to think of, said Mrs. Purdy. Yes, it is true. Only one week ago I helped you there in the third floor back room. She was a pretty little girl, and to kill herself with the gas. She had a sweet little face, Mrs. Purdy. Yes, she would have been called beautiful, as you say, said Mrs. Purdy. Except for that dark spot she had growing by her left eye. <sighs> Do fill up your glass again, Mrs. McCool. A Retrieved Reformation In a prison shoe shop, Timmy Valentine was busily at work making shoes. A prison officer came into the shop and led Jimmy to the prison office. There, Jimmy was given an important paper. It said that he was free. Jimmy took the paper without showing much pleasure or interest. He had been sent to prison to stay for four years. He had been there for ten months. But he had expected to stay only three months. Jimmy Valentine had many friends outside the prison. A man with so many friends does not expect to stay in prison long. Valentine, said the chief prison officer, you'll go out tomorrow morning. This is your chance. Make a man of yourself. You're not a bad fellow at heart. Stop breaking safes open and live a better life. Me? said Jimmy in surprise. I never broke into a safe in my life. Oh, no! the chief prison officer laughed. Never! Uh, let's see. How did you happen to get sent to prison for opening that safe in Springfield? Was it because you didn't want to tell where you really were? Perhaps you were with some lady and you didn't want to tell her name. Or was it because the judge didn't like you? You men always have a reason like that. You never go to prison because you broke open a safe. Me, Jimmy said. His face still showed surprise. I was never in Springfield in my life. Take him away, said the chief prison officer. Get him in the clothes he needs for going outside. Bring him here again at seven in the morning. And think about what I said, Valentine. At a quarter past seven on the next morning, Jimmy stood again in the office. He had on some new clothes that did not fit him and a pair of new shoes that hurt his feet. These are the usual clothes given to a prisoner when he leaves the prison. Next, they gave him money to pay for his trip on a train to the city near the prison. They gave him five dollars more. The five dollars was supposed to help him become a better man. Then the chief prison officer put out his hand for a handshake. That was the end of Valentine, prisoner 9762. Mr. James Valentine walked out into the sunshine. He did not listen to the song of the birds or look at the green trees or smell the flowers. He went straight to a restaurant. There he tasted the first sweet joys of being free. He had a good dinner. After that, he went to the train station. He gave some money to a blind man who sat there asking for money, and then he got on the train. Three hours later, he got off the train in a small town. Here, he went to the restaurant of Mike Dolan. Mike Dolan was alone there. After shaking hands, he said, I'm sorry we couldn't do it sooner, Jimmy, my boy. But there was that safe in Springfield, too. It wasn't easy. Feeling all right? Fine, said Jimmy. Is my room waiting for me? He went up and opened the door of a room at the back of the house. Everything was as he had left it. It was here they had found Jimmy when they took him to prison. There on the floor was a small piece of cloth. It had been torn from the coat of the cop as Jimmy was fighting to escape. There was a bed against the wall. Jimmy pulled the bed toward the middle of the room. The wall behind it looked like any wall. 
but now Jimmy found and opened a small door in it. From this opening, he pulled out a dust-covered bag. He opened this and looked lovingly at the tools for breaking open a safe. No finer tools could be found any place. They were complete. Everything needed was there. They had been made of a special material in the necessary sizes and shapes. Jimmy had planned them himself, and he was very proud of them. It had cost him over nine hundred dollars to have these tools made at a place where they make such things for men who work at the job of safe breaking. In half an hour, Jimmy went downstairs and through the restaurant. He was now dressed in good clothes that fitted him well. He carried his dusted and cleaned bag. Do you have everything planned? asked Mike Dolan. Me? asked Jimmy, as if surprised. I don't understand. I work for the New York famous bread and cake makers company. I sell the best bread and cake in the country. Mike enjoyed these words so much that Jimmy had to take a drink with him. Jimmy had some milk. He never drank anything stronger. A week after Valentine nine seven six two left the prison, a safe was broken open in Richmond, Indiana. No one knew who did it. Eight hundred dollars were taken. Two weeks after that, a safe in Logansport was opened. It was a new kind of safe. It had been made, they said, so strong that no one could break it open. But someone did and took fifteen hundred dollars. Then a safe in Jefferson City was opened. Five thousand dollars were taken. This loss was a big one. Ben Price was a cop who worked on such important matters, and now he began to work on this. He went to Richmond, Indiana, and to Logansport to see how the safe breaking had been done in those places. He was heard to say, "I can see that Jim Valentine has been here. He's in business again." Look at the way he opened this one. Everything easy, everything clean. He's the only man who has the tools to do it, and he's the only man who knows how to use tools like this. Yes, I want Mister Valentine. Next time he goes to prison, he's gonna stay there until his time is finished. Ben Price knew how Jimmy worked. Jimmy would go from one city to another, far away. He always worked alone. He always left quickly when he was finished. He enjoyed being with nice people. For all these reasons, it was not easy to catch Mister Valentine. People with safes full of money were glad to hear that Ben Price was at work trying to catch Mister Valentine. One afternoon, Jimmy Valentine and his bag arrived in a small town named Elmore. Jimmy, looking as young as a college boy, walked down the street towards the hotel. A young lady walked across the street, passing him at the corner, and entered the door. Over the door was the sign, "The Elmore Bank." Jimmy Valentine looked into her eyes, forgetting at once what he was. He became another man. She looked away, and brighter color came into her face. Young men like Jimmy did not appear often in Elmore. Jimmy saw a boy near the bank door and began to ask questions about the town. After a time, the young lady came out and went on her way. She seemed not to see Jimmy as she passed him. "Isn't that young lady Polly Simpson?" asked Jimmy. "No," said the boy. "She's Annabelle Adams. Her father owns this bank." Jimmy went to the hotel where he said his name was Ralph D. Spencer. He got a room there. He told the hotel man that he had come to Elmore to go into business. How was the shoe business? Was there already a good shoe shop? The man thought that Jimmy's clothes and manners were fine. He was happy to talk to him. Yes, Elmore needed a good shoe shop. There was no shop that sold just shoes. Shoes were sold in the big shops that sold everything. All business in Elmore was good. He hoped Mister Spencer would decide to stay in Elmore. It was a pleasant town to live in, and the people were friendly. Mister Spencer said that he would stay in town a few days and learn something about it. No, he said he himself would carry his bag up to the room. He didn't want a boy to take it; it was very heavy. Mister Ralph Spencer remained in Elmore. He started a shoe shop. Business was good. Also, he made many friends, and he was successful with the wish of his heart. He met Annabel Adams. He liked her better every day. At the end of a year, everyone in Elmore liked Mister Ralph Spencer. 
His shoe shop was doing very good business. And he and Annabel were going to be married in two weeks. Mr. Adams, the small-town banker, liked Spencer. Annabel was very proud of him. He seemed already to belong to the Adams family. One day, Jimmy sat down in his room to write this letter, which he sent to one of his old friends. Dear old friend, I want you to meet me at Sullivan's place next week on the evening of the 10th. I want to give you my tools. I know you'll be glad to have them. You couldn't buy them for a thousand dollars. I finished with the old business a year ago. I have a nice shop. I'm living a better life, and I'm going to marry the best girl on earth two weeks from now. It's the only life. I would never again touch another man's money. After I marry, I'm going to go further west, where I'll never see anyone who knew me in my old life. I tell you, she's a wonderful girl. She trusts me. Your old friend, Jimmy. On the Monday night after Jimmy sent this letter, Ben Price arrived quietly in Elmore. He moved slowly about the town in his quiet way. He learned all that he wanted to know. Standing inside a shop, he watched Ralph D. Spencer walk by. You're going to marry the banker's daughter, are you, Jimmy? said Ben to himself. I don't feel sure about that. The next morning, Jimmy was at the Adams home. He was going to a nearby city that day to buy new clothes for the wedding. He was also going to buy a gift for Annabelle. It would be his first trip out of Elmore. It was more than a year now since he had done any safe-breaking. Most of the Adams family went to the bank together that morning. There were Mr. Adams, Annabelle, Jimmy and Annabelle's married sister with her two little girls aged five and nine. They passed Jimmy's hotel and Jimmy ran up to his room and brought along his bag. Then they went to the bank. All went inside, Jimmy too, for he was one of the family. Everyone in the bank was glad to see the good-looking nice young man who was going to marry Annabelle. Jimmy put down his bag. Annabelle, laughing, put Jimmy's hat on her head and picked up the bag. How do I look? she asked. Ralph, how heavy this bag is. It feels full of gold. It's full of some things I don't need in my shop, Jimmy said. I'm taking them to the city to the place where they came from. That saves me the cost of sending them. I'm going to be a married man. I must learn to save money. The Elmore Bank had a new safe. Mr. Adams was very proud of it, and he wanted everyone to see it. It was as large as a small room, and it had a very special door. The door was controlled by a clock. Using the clock, the banker planned the time when the door would open. At other times, no one, not even the banker himself, could open it. He explained about it to Mr. Spencer. Mr. Spencer seemed interested, but he did not seem to understand very easily. The two children, May and Agatha, enjoyed seeing the shining heavy door with all its special parts. While they were busy like this, Ben Price entered the bank and looked around. He told a young man who worked there that he had not come on business. He was waiting for a man. Suddenly there was a cry from the women. They had not been watching the children. May, the nine-year-old, had playfully but firmly closed the door of the safe, and Agatha was inside. The old banker tried to open the door. He pulled at it for a moment. The door can't be opened, he cried. And the clock! I hadn't started it yet! Agatha's mother cried out again. Quiet, said Mr. Adams, raising a shaking hand. All be quiet for a moment! Agatha! He called as loudly as he could. Listen to me! They could hear, but not clearly, the sound of the child's voice. In the darkness inside the safe, she was wild with fear. My baby! Her mother cried. She will die of fear! Open the door! Break it open! Can't you men do something? There isn't a man nearer than the city who can open that door, said Mr. Adams in a shaking voice. My God, Spencer, what shall we do? That child, she can't live long in there. There isn't enough air, and the fear will kill her. Agatha's mother, wild too now, beat on the door with her hands. Annabel turned to Jimmy, her large eyes full of pain, but with some hope, too. 
A woman thinks that the man she loves can somehow do anything. Can't you do something, Ralph? Try, won't you? He looked at her with a strange, soft smile on his lips and in his eyes. Annabelle, he said, give me that flower you're wearing, will you? She could not believe that she had really heard him, but she put the flower in his hand. Jimmy took it and put it where he could not lose it. Then he pulled off his coat. With that act, Ralph D. Spencer passed away and Jimmy Valentine took his place. Stand away from the door, all of you, he commanded. He put his bag on the table and opened it flat. From that time on, he seemed not to know that anyone else was near. Quickly, he laid the shining strange tools on the table. The others watched as if they had lost the power to move. In a minute, Jimmy was at work on the door. In ten minutes, faster than he had ever done it before. He had the door open. Agatha was taken into her mother's arms. Jimmy Valentine put on his coat and picked up the flower and walked toward the front door. As he went, he thought he heard a voice call, Ralph! He did not stop. At the door, a big man stood in his way. Hello, Ben, said Jimmy, still with his strange smile. You're here at last, are you? Let's go. I don't care now. And then Ben Price acted rather strangely. I guess you were wrong about this, Mr. Spencer, he said. I don't believe I know you, do I? And Ben Price turned and walked slowly down the street. Hearts and Crosses Baldy Woods reached for a drink and got it. When Baldy wanted something, he usually got it. He... But this is not Baldy's story. Now he took his third drink, which was larger than the first and the second. Baldy had been listening to the troubles of a friend. Now Baldy was going to tell his friend what to do, so the friend was buying him the drinks. This was the right thing for the friend to do. I'd be king if I were you, said Baldy. He said it loudly and strongly. Webb Yeager moved his wide hat back on his head. He put his fingers in his yellow hair and moved it about. It now looked wilder than before, but this did not help him to think better. Therefore, he also got another drink. If a man marries a queen, it ought not make him nothing, said Webb. Here was his real problem. Surely not, said Baldy. You ought to be a king, but you're only the queen's husband. That's what happens to a man in Europe if he marries the king's daughter. His wife becomes a queen, but is he a king? No. His only duty is to appear with the queen in pictures and be the father of the next king. That's not right. Yes, Webb, you are only the queen's husband. And if I were you, I'd turn everything upside down and I would be king. Baldy finished his drink. Baldy, said Webb, you and I have been cowboys together for years. We've been riding the same road since we were very young. I wouldn't talk about my family to anyone but you. You were working on the Nopalito Ranch when I married Santa McAllister. I was foreman then. What am I now? Nothing. Well, when old McAllister was cattle king of West Texas, continued Baldy, you were important. You told people what to do. Your commands were as strong as his. That was true, said Webb until he discovered that I wanted to marry Santa. Then he sent me as far away from the ranch house as he could. When the old man died, they started to call Santa the cattle queen. Now, I tell the cattle what to do. That's all. She takes care of all the business. She takes care of all the money. I can't sell any cattle. 
not one animal. Santa is the queen, and I... I'm nothing. I would be king if I were you, said Baldy Woods again. When a man marries a queen, he ought to be the same as she is. Plenty of people think it's strange, Webb. Your words mean nothing on the Nopalita Ranch. Mrs. Yeager is a fine little lady, but a man ought to be the head of his own house. Webb's brown face grew long with sadness. With that expression in his wild yellow hair and his blue eyes, he looked like a schoolboy who had lost his leadership to another strong boy. Yet his tall body looked too strong for such a thing to happen to him. I'm riding back to the ranch today, he said. It was easy to see that he did not want to go. I have to start some cattle on the road to San Antonio tomorrow morning. Well, I'll go with you as far as Dry Lake, said Baldy. The two friends got on their horses and left the little town where they had met that morning. At Dry Lake, they stopped to say goodbye. They had been riding for miles without talking. But in Texas, talk does not often continue steadily. Many things may happen between words. But when you begin to talk again, you're still talking about the same thing. So now Webb added something to the talk that began ten miles away. You remember, Baldy, there was a time when Santa was different. You remember the days when old McAllister kept me away from the ranch house. Remember how she would send me a sign that she wanted to see me? Old McAllister said that he would kill me if I came near enough. You remember the sign she used to send, Baldy? The picture of a heart with a cross inside it? Me? cried Baldy. Sure, I remember. Every cowboy on the ranch knew that sign of the heart and the cross. We would see it on things sent out from the ranch. We would see it on anything. It would be on newspapers, on boxes of food. Once I saw it on the back of the shirt of a cook that McAllister sent from the ranch. Santa's father made a promise that she wouldn't write to me or send me any word. That heart and cross sign was her plan. When she wanted to see me, she would put that mark on something that she knew I would see. And when I saw it, I traveled fast to the ranch that same night. I would meet her outside the house. Now well, we all knew it, said Baldy. But we never said anything. We wanted you to marry Santa. We knew why you had that fast horse. When we saw the heart and the cross on something from the ranch... We always knew your horse was going to go fast that night. The last time Santa sent me the sign, said Webb, was when she was sick. When I saw it, I got on my horse and started. It was a forty-mile ride. She wasn't at our meeting place. I went to the house. Old McAllister met me at the door. Did you come here to get killed, he said. I won't kill you this time. I was going to send for you. Santa wants you. Go in that room and see her. Then come out here and see me. Santa was lying in bed very sick. But she smiled and put a hand in mine, and I sat down by the bed, mud and riding clothes and all. I could hear you coming for hours, Webb, she said. I was sure you would come. You saw the sign? I saw it, I said. It's our sign, she said. Hearts and crosses. To love and to suffer. That's what they mean. And old Dr. Musgrove was there. And Santa goes to sleep and Dr. Musgrove touches her face and he says to me, You were good for her, but go away now. The little lady will be all right in the morning. Old McAllister was outside her room. She's sleeping, I said. Now you can start killing me. You have plenty of time. I haven't anything to fight with. Old McAllister laughs and says to me, Killing the best foreman in West Texas is not good business. I don't know where I could get another good foreman. I don't want you in the family, but I can use you on the Nopalito if you stay away from the ranch house. You go up and sleep. And then we'll talk. The two men prepared to separate. They took each other's hand. Bye, Baldy, said Webb. 
I'm glad I saw you and had this talk. With a sudden rush, the two riders were on their way. Then Baldy pulled his horse to a stop and shouted. Webb turned. If I were you, came Baldy's loud voice, I would be king. At eight the following morning, Bud Turner got off his horse at the Nopalita Ranch House. Bud was the cowboy who was taking the cattle to San Antonio. Mrs. Yeager was outside the house putting water on some flowers. In many ways, Santa was like her father, King McAllister. She was sure about everything. She was afraid of nothing. She was proud. But Santa looked like her mother. She had a strong body and a soft prettiness. Because she was a woman, her manners were womanly. But she liked to be queen as her father had liked to be king. Webb stood near her, giving orders to two or three cowboys. Good morning, said Bud. Where do you want the cattle to go? To Barbers, as usual? The queen always answered such a question. All the business, buying, selling, and banking, had been held in her hands. Care of the cattle was given to her husband. When King McAllister was alive, Santa was his secretary and his helper. She had continued her work, and her work had been successful. But before she could answer, the queen's husband spoke. You drive those cattle to Zimmerman's and Nesbitt's. I spoke to Zimmerman about it. Bud turned, ready to go. Wait, called Santa quickly. She looked at her husband with surprise in her gray eyes. What do you mean, Webb? she asked. I never deal with Zimmerman and Nesbitt. Barbara has bought all the cattle from this ranch for five years. I'm not going to change. She said to Bud Turner, Take those cattle to Barber. Bud did not look at either of them. He stood there waiting. I want those cattle to go to Zimmerman and Nesbitt, said Webb. There was a cold light in his blue eyes. It's time to start, said Santa to Bud. Tell Barber we'll have more cattle ready in about a month. Bud allowed his eyes to turn and meet Webb's. You take those cattle, said Webb, to Bob, said Santa quickly. Let's say no more about it. What are you waiting for, Bud? Nothing, said Bud. But he did not hurry to move away, for man is man's friend. And he did not like what had happened. You heard what she said, cried Webb. We do what she commands. He took off his hat and made a wide movement with it, touching the floor. Webb, said Santa, what's wrong with you today? I'm acting like the queen's fool, said Webb. What can you expect? Let me tell you, I was a man before I married a cattle queen. What am I now? Something for the cowboys to laugh at. But I'm going to be a man again. Santa looked at him. Be reasonable, Webb, she said quietly. There's nothing wrong. You take care of the cattle, I take care of the business. You understand the cattle. I understand the business better than you do. I learned it from my father. I don't like kings and queens, said Webb, unless I'm one of them myself. All right, it's your ranch. Barbara gets the cattle. Webb's horse was tied near the house. He walked into the house and brought out the supplies he took on long rides. These he began to tie on his horse. Santa followed him. Her face had lost some of its color. Webb got on his horse. There was no expression on his face except a strange light burning in his eyes. There's some cattle at the Hondo water hole, he said. They ought to be moved. Wild animals have killed three of them. I did not remember to tell Sims to do it. You tell him. Santa put a hand on the horse and looked her husband in the eye. Are you going to leave me, Webb? She asked quietly. I'm going to be a man again, he answered. I wish you success, she said with a sudden coldness. She turned and walked into the house. Webb Yeager went to the southeast as straight as he could ride, and when he came to the place where the sky and the earth seemed to meet, he was gone. Those at the Nopalito knew nothing more about him. 
Days passed, then weeks, then months. But Webb Yeager did not return. Hearts and Crosses One day a man named Bartholomew, not an important man, stopped at the Nopalita Ranch House. It was noon and he was hungry. He sat down at the dinner table. While he was eating, he talked. Mrs. Yeager, he said. I saw a man on the Seco Ranch with your name, Webb Yeager. He was foreman there. He was a tall, yellow-haired man. Not a talker. Someone of your family? A husband, said Santa. That is fine for the Seco Ranch. Mr. Yeager is the best foreman in the West. Everything at the Nopalito Ranch had been going well. For several years, they'd been working at the Nopalito with a different kind of cattle. These cattle had been brought from England, and they were better than the usual Texas cattle. They had been successful at the Nopalito Ranch, and men on the other ranches were interested in them. As a result, one day a cowboy arrived at the Nopalito Ranch and gave the queen this letter. Mrs. Yeager, the Nopalito Ranch. I've been told by the owners of the Seiko Ranch to buy one hundred of your English cattle. If you can sell these to the Seiko, send them to us in care of the man who brings this letter. We will then send you the money. Webb Yeager, foreman, Seiko Ranch. Business is business to a queen as it is to others. That night the one hundred cattle were moved near the ranch house, ready for an early start the next morning. When the night came and the house was quiet, did Santa Yeager cry alone? Did she hold that letter near to her heart? Did she speak the name that she had been too proud to speak for many weeks? Or did she place the letter with other business letters in her office? I ask if you will, but there is no answer. What a queen does is something we cannot always know. But this you shall be told. In the middle of the night, Santa went quietly out of the ranch house. She was dressed in something dark. She stopped for a moment under a tree. There was moonlight, and a bird was singing. There was a smell of flowers. Santa turned her face toward the southeast and threw three kisses in that direction. But there was no one to see her. Then she hurried quietly to a small building. What she did there we can only guess. But there was the red light of a fire and noise as if Cupid might be making his arrows. Later she came out with some strange iron tool in one hand. In the other hand she carried something that held a small fire. She hurried in the moonlight to the place where the English cattle had been gathered. Most of the English cattle were a dark red, but among those one hundred, there was one as white as milk. And now Santa caught that white animal as cowboys catch cattle. She tried once and failed. Then she tried again, and the animal fell heavily. Santa ran to it, but the animal jumped up. Again she tried, and this time she was successful. The animal fell to earth again. Before it could rise, Santa had tied its feet together. Then she ran to the fire she had carried here. From it she took that strange iron tool. It was white hot. There was a loud cry from the animal as the white hot iron burned its skin. But no one seemed to hear. All the ranch were quiet. And in the deep night quiet, Santa ran back to the ranch house and there fell onto a bed. She let the tears from her eyes as if queens had hearts like the hearts of ranchmen's wives, and as if a queen's husband might become a king if he would ride back again. 
In the morning, the young man who had brought the letter started toward the Seiko Ranch. He had cowboys with him to help him with the English cattle. It was ninety miles, six days' journey. The animals arrived at Seiko Ranch one evening as the daylight was ending. They were received and counted by the foreman of the ranch. The next morning at eight, a horseman came riding to the Nopalito Ranch House. He got down painfully from the horse and walked to the house. His horse took a great breath and let his head hang and closed his eyes. But did not feel sorry for Belshazzar the horse. Today, he lives happily at Nopalito, where he is given the best care and the best food. No other horse there has ever carried a man for such a ride. The horseman entered the house. Two arms fell around his neck, and someone cried out in the voice of a woman and queen together, Webb! Oh, Webb! I was wrong, said Webb Yeager. I was a... and he named a small animal with a bad smell, an animal no one likes. Quiet, said Santa. Did you see it? I saw it, said Webb. What were they speaking of? Perhaps you can guess if you have read the story carefully. Be the cattle queen, said Webb. Forget what I did if you can. I was wrong as quiet, said Santa again, putting her fingers upon his mouth. There's no queen here. Do you know who I am? I am Santa Yeager, first lady of the bedroom. <laughs> Come here. She led him into a room. There stood a low baby's bed, and in the bed was a baby, a beautiful laughing baby, talking in words that no one could understand. There is no queen on this ranch, said Santa again. Look at the king. He has eyes like yours, Webb. Get down on your knees and look at the king. There was a sound of steps outside, and Bud Turner was there at the door. He was asking the same question he had asked almost a year ago. Good morning. Shall I drive those cattle to Barber's, or... He saw Webb and stopped with his mouth open. Bop, 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 cried the king, waving his arms. You hear what he says, Bud, said Webb Yeager. We do what the king commands. And that is all, except for one thing. When old man Quinn, owner of the Seiko Ranch, went to look at his new English cattle, he asked his new foreman, What's the Nopalito Ranch's mark? X over Y, said Wilson. I thought so, said Quinn. But look at that white animal there. She has another mark, a heart with a cross inside. Whose mark is that? After 20 years... The cop moved along the street looking strong and important. This was the way he always moved. He was not thinking of how he looked. There were a few people on the street to see him. It was only about ten at night, but it was cold, and there was a wind with a little rain in it. He stopped at doors as he walked along, trying each door to be sure that it was closed for the night. Now and then he turned and looked up and down the street. He was a fine-looking cop, watchful, guarding the peace. People in this part of the city went home early. Now and then you might see the lights of a shop or a small restaurant. But most of the doors belonged to business places that had been closed hours ago. Then the cop suddenly slowed his walk. Near the door of a darkened shop, a man was standing. As the cop walked toward him, the man spoke quickly. Uh, it's all right, officer, he said. I'm waiting for a friend. Twenty years ago, we agreed to meet here tonight. It sounds strange to you, doesn't it? I'll explain if you want to be sure that everything's all right. 
About twenty years ago, there was a restaurant here where this shop stands. Big Joe Brady's Restaurant. It was here until five years ago, said the cop. The man near the door had a colorless square face with bright eyes and a little white mark near his right eye. He had a large jewel in his necktie. Twenty years ago tonight, said the man, I had dinner here with Jimmy Wells. He was my best friend and the best fellow in the world. He and I grew up together here in New York like two brothers. I was eighteen and Jimmy was twenty. The next morning, I was to start for the West. I was going to find a job and make a great success. You couldn't have pulled Jimmy out of New York. He thought it was the only place on earth. <laughs> we agreed that night that we would meet here again in twenty years. We thought that in twenty years we would know what kind of men we were and what future waited for us. It sounds interesting, said the cop. A long time between meetings, it seems to me. Have you heard from your friends since you went west? Yes, for a time we did write to each other, said the man. But after a year or two we stopped. The west is big. I moved around everywhere, and I moved quickly. But I know that Jimmy will meet me here if he can. He was as true as any man in the world. He'll never forget. I came a thousand miles to stand here tonight. But I'll be glad about that if my old friend comes too. The man waiting took out a fine watch covered with small jewels. Three minutes before ten, he said. It was ten that night when we said goodbye here at the restaurant door. You were successful in the West, weren't you? asked the cop. I surely was. I hope Jimmy has done half as well. He was a slow mover. I've had to fight for my success. In New York, a man doesn't change much. In the West, you learn how to fight for what you get. The cop took a step or two. I'll go on my way, he said. I hope your friend comes all right. If he isn't here at ten, are you going to leave? I am not, said the other. I'll wait half an hour at least. If Jimmy is alive on this earth, he'll be here by that time. Good night, officer. Good night, said the cop, and walked away, trying doors as he went. There was now a cold rain falling, and the wind was stronger. The few people walking along that street were hurrying, trying to keep warm. At the door of the shop stood the man who had come a thousand miles to meet a friend. Such a meeting could not be certain, but he waited. About twenty minutes he waited. And then a tall man in a long coat came hurrying across the street. He went directly to the waiting man. Is that you, Bob? he asked doubtfully. Is that you, Jimmy Wells? cried the man at the door. The new man took the other man's hand in his. It's Bob! It surely is! I was certain I would find you here if you were still alive. Twenty years is a long time. The old restaurant is gone, Bob. I wish it were here. So that we could have another dinner in it. Has the West been good to you? They gave me everything I asked for. You've changed, Jimmy. I never thought you were so tall. Ah, oh, I grew a little after I was twenty. Are you doing well in New York, Jimmy? Well enough. I work for the city. Come on, Bob. We'll go to a place I know and have a good long talk about old times. The two men started along the street arm in arm. The man from the West was beginning to tell the story of his life. The other, with his coat up to his ears, listened with interest. At the corner stood a shop, bright with electric lights. When they came near, each turned to look at the other's face. The man from the west stopped suddenly and pulled his arm away. You're not Jimmy Wells, he said. Twenty years is a long time, but not long enough to change the shape of a man's nose. It sometimes changes a good man into a bad one, said the tall man. You've been under arrest for ten minutes, Bob. Chicago cops thought you might be coming to New York. They told us to watch for you. Are you coming with me quietly? That's wise. But first, here's something I was asked to give you. You may read it here at the window. It's from a cop named Wells. The man from the West opened the little piece of paper. His hand began to shake a little as he read. 
Bob, I was at the place on time. I saw the face of the man wanted by Chicago cops. I didn't want to arrest him myself. So I went and got another cop and sent him to do the job. Jimmy. Romance of a Busy Broker Pitcher, who worked in the office of Harvey Maxwell, broker, usually allowed his face to show no feeling. This morning, he allowed his face to show interest and surprise when Mr. Maxwell entered. It was half-past nine, and Mr. Maxwell was with his young lady secretary. Good morning, Pitcher, said Maxwell. He rushed to his table as if he were going to jump over it, and began to look at the many, many letters and other papers waiting there for him. The young lady had been Maxwell's secretary for a year. She was very beautiful and very different from most other secretaries. Her hair always looked plain and simple. She did not wear chains or jewels. Her dress was gray and plain, but it fitted her very well. On her small black hat was the gold-green wing of a bird. On this morning she seemed to shine softly. Her eyes were dreaming, but bright. Her face was warmly colored, and her expression was happy. Pitcher watched her. There was a question about her in his mind. She was different this morning. Instead of going straight to the room where she worked, she waited. She seemed not to know what to do. Once she went over to Maxwell's table near enough for him to see that she was there. The machine sitting at the table was no longer a man. It was a busy New York broker. "'What is it? Anything?' asked Maxwell shortly. Papers lay like snow covering his table. His gray eyes looked at her as if she were another machine. "'Nothing,' answered the secretary, moving away with a little smile. "'Mr. Pitcher,' she said, "'did Mr. Maxwell talk to you yesterday about getting another secretary?' "'He did,' Pitcher answered. "'He told me to get another one. Several are coming to talk to us this morning, but uh, it's now after nine, and not one has appeared. I will do the work as usual, said the young lady, until someone comes to fill the place. And she went to her table. She took off the black hat with the gold-green bird wing and put it away as usual. If you have never seen a busy New York broker on a busy day, you know little about men at work. Every minute of a broker's hour is crowded. And this day was Harvey Maxwell's busy day. Beside his table stood a machine. From this came a long, narrow, endless piece of paper bringing him business news as soon as it happened. Men began to come into the office and speak to him. Some were happy, some were not. Some were in a hurry. Some were full of anger. Boys ran in and out with letters for him to read and answer at once. Pitcher's face now showed that he was alive. The other men who worked in the office jumped around like sailors during a storm. And there were storms in the business world, fearful storms. Every storm was felt in the broker's office. Maxwell moved his chair against the wall. Now he was like a dancer. He jumped from the machine to his table, to the door, and back again. In the middle of all this, he slowly realized that something had come near him. There was golden hair. There was a very large amount of it, high on a head. On top of the hair was a big hat covered with bird's wings. There was a long silver chain hanging from a neck until it nearly touched the floor, and among all these things, there was a young lady. Pitcher was beside her to explain. Lady for that job is secretary, said Pitcher. Maxwell turned half around with his hands full of letters and paper from the machine. What job? he asked. Job as secretary, Pitcher said again. You told me yesterday to have someone sent here this morning. Are you losing your mind, Pitcher? said Maxwell. Why should I tell you anything like that? Miss Leslie is a perfect secretary. She can keep the job as long as she wants it. To the young lady, he said, There is no job here. And to Pitcher, he added this order. Tell them not to send any more, and don't bring any more in here to see me. The silver chain left the office, hitting chairs and tables with anger as it went. Pitcher said to another man in the office that Maxwell was more forgetful every day. 
The rush of business grew wilder and faster. Maxwell was working like some fine, strong machine. He was working as fast as he could. He never had to stop to think. He was never wrong. He was always ready to decide and to act. He worked as a clockworks. This was the world of business. It was not a human world, nor the world of nature. When the dinner hour was near, things grew quieter. Maxwell stood by his table with his hands full of papers and his hair hanging over his face. His window was open, for it was the time of the year when the weather was beginning to turn warm. And through the window came a soft, sweet smell of flowers. For a moment the broker was held there, without moving, for this smell of flowers belonged to Miss Leslie. It was hers, and hers only. The smell seemed almost to make her stand there before him. The world of business grew smaller and smaller. And she was in the next room, twenty steps away. I'll do it now, said Maxwell half aloud. I'll ask her now. I, I wonder why I didn't do it long ago. He rushed into the other room. He stopped beside the secretary. She looked up at him with a smile. Warm color came into her face, and her eyes were soft and kind. Maxwell's hands were still full of papers. Miss Leslie, he began quickly, I have only a moment. I want to say something in that moment. Uh, will you be my wife? I haven't had time to make love to you in the usual way, but I really do love you. Talk quick, please. I have to get back to my work. Oh, what are you talking about? cried the young lady. She rose to her feet and looked at him round-eyed. Don't you understand? said Maxwell. I want you to marry me. I love you, Miss Leslie. I wanted to tell you. So I took this moment when I wasn't too busy. But they're calling me now. Tell them to wait a minute, Pitcher. Won't you, Miss Leslie? The secretary acted very strangely. At first she seemed lost in surprise. Then tears began to run from her wondering eyes. And then she smiled through her tears, and one of her arms went around the broker's neck. I know now, she said softly. It's this business. It has put everything else out of your head. I was afraid at first. Don't you remember, Harvey? We were married last evening at eight in the little church around the corner. The Cop and the Anthem Soapy moved restlessly on his seat in Madison Square. There are certain signs to show that winter is coming. Birds begin to fly south. Women who want nice new warm coats become very kind to their husbands. And Soapy moves restlessly on his seat in the park. When you see these signs, you know that winter is near. A dead leaf fell at Soapy's feet. That was a special sign for him that winter was coming. It was time for all who lived in Madison Square to prepare. Soapy's mind now realized the fact. The time had come. He had to find some way to take care of himself during the cold weather, and therefore he moved restlessly on his seat. Soapy's hopes for the winter were not very high. He was not thinking of sailing away on a ship. He was not thinking of southern skies or the Bay of Naples. Three months in the prison on Blackwell's Island was what he wanted. Three months of food every day and a bed every night. Three months safe from the cold north wind and safe from cops. This seemed to Sophie the most desirable thing in the world. For years Blackwell's Island had been his winter home. Richer New Yorkers made their large plans to go to Florida, or to the shore of the Mediterranean Sea each winter. 
Soapy made his small plans for going to the island. And now the time had come. Three big newspapers, some under his coat and some over his legs, had not kept him warm during the night in the park. So Soapy was thinking of the island. There were places in the city where he could go and ask for food and a bed. These would be given to him. He could move from one building to another, and he would be taken care of through the winter. But he liked Blackwell's Island better. Soapy's spirit was proud. If he went to any of these places, there were certain things he had to do. In one way or another, he would have to pay for what they gave him. They would not ask him for money, but they would make him wash his whole body. They would make him answer questions. They would want to know everything about his life. No, prison was better than that. The prison had rules that he would have to follow, but in prison a gentleman's own life was still his own life. Soapy, having decided to go to the island, at once began to move toward his desire. There were many easy ways of doing this. The most pleasant way was to go and have a good dinner at some fine restaurant. Then he would say that he had no money to pay. And then a cop would be called. It would all be done very quietly. The cop would arrest him, he would be taken to a judge, the judge would do the rest. Soapy left his seat and walked out of Madison Square to the place where the great street called Broadway and Fifth Avenue meet. He went across this wide space and started north on Broadway. He stopped at a large and brightly lighted restaurant. This was where the best food and the best people and the best clothes appeared every evening. Soapy believed that above his legs, he looked all right. His face was clean, his coat was good enough. If he could get to a table, he believed that success would be his. The part of him that would be seen above the table would look all right. The waiter would bring him what he asked for. He began thinking of what he would like to eat. In his mind, he could see the whole dinner. The cost would not be too high. He did not want the restaurant people to feel any real anger. But the dinner would leave him filled and happy for the journey to his winter home. But as Soapy put his foot inside the restaurant door, the head waiter saw his broken old shoes and torn clothes that covered his legs. Strong and ready hands turned Soapy around and moved him quietly and quickly outside again. Soapy turned off Broadway. It seemed that this easy, this most desirable way to get to the island was not to be his. He must think of some other way of getting there. At a corner of Sixth Avenue was a shop with a wide glass window bright with electric lights. Soapy picked up a big stone and threw it through the glass. People came running around the corner. A cop was the first among them. Soapy stood still and smiled when he saw the cop. Where's the man that did that? asked the cop. Hey, don't you think that I might have done it? said Soapy. He was friendly and happy. What he wanted was coming toward him. But the cop's mind would not consider Soapy. Men who break windows do not stop there to talk to cops. They run away as fast as they can. The cop saw a man further along the street running. He ran after him. And Soapy, sick at heart, walked slowly away. He had failed two times. Across the street was another restaurant. It was not so fine as the one on Broadway. The people who went there were not so rich. Its food was not so good. Into this, Soapy took his old shoes and his torn clothes, and no one stopped him. He sat down at a table and was soon eating a big dinner. When he had finished, he said that he and Money were strangers. Yeah, get busy and call a cop said Soapy. And don't keep a gentleman waiting. No cop for you, said the waiter. He called another waiter. 
The two waiters threw Soapy upon his left ear on the hard street outside. He stood up slowly, one part at a time, and beat the dust from his clothes. Prison seemed only a happy dream. The island seemed very far away. A cop who was standing near laughed and walked away. Soapy traveled almost half a mile before he tried again. This time he felt very certain that he would be successful. A nice-looking young woman was standing before a shop window, looking at the objects inside. Very near stood a large cop. Soapy's plan was to speak to the young woman. She seemed to be a very nice young lady who would not want a strange man to speak to her. She would ask the cop for help, and then Soapy would be happy to feel the cop's hand on his arm. He would be on his way to the island. He went near her. He could see that the cop was already watching him. The young woman moved away a few steps. Soapy followed. Standing beside her, he said, Good evening, Bedelia. Don't you want to come and play with me? The cop was still looking. The young woman had only to move her hand and Soapy would be on his way to the place where he wanted to go. He was already thinking how warm he would be. The young woman turned to him. Putting out her hand, she took his arm. Sure, Mike, she said joyfully. If you buy me something to drink, I would have spoken to you sooner, but the cop was watching. With the young woman holding his arm, Soapy walked past the cop. He was filled with sadness. He was still free. Was he going to remain free forever? At the next corner, he pulled his arm away and ran. When he stopped, he was near several theaters. In this part of the city, streets are brighter, and hearts are more joyful than in other parts. Women and men in rich, warm coats moved happily in the winter air. A sudden fear caught Soapy. No cop was going to arrest him. Then he came to another cop standing in front of a big theater. He thought of something else to try. He began to shout as if he had had too much to drink. His voice was as loud as he could make it. He danced and cried out. And the cop turned his back to Soapy and said to a man standing near him, it's one of those college boys. He won't be hurting anything. We had orders to let him shout. Soapy was quiet. Was no cop going to touch him? He began to think of the island as if it were as far away as heaven. He pulled his thin coat around him. The wind was very cold. Then he saw a man in the shop buying a newspaper. The man's umbrella stood beside the door. Soapy stepped inside the shop, took the umbrella, and walked slowly away. The man followed him quickly. My umbrella, he said. Oh, is it? said Soapy. Why don't you call a cop? I took it. Your umbrella. Why don't you call a cop? There's one standing at the corner. The man walked more slowly. Soapy did the same, but... He had a feeling that he was going to fail again. The cop looked at the two men. I, said the umbrella man, that is, you know how these things happen. Uh, if that's your umbrella, I'm very sorry. I, I found it this morning in a restaurant. If you say it's yours, I hope you'll... It's mine, cried Soapy with anger in his voice. The umbrella man hurried away. The cop helped a lady across the street. Soapy walked east. He threw the umbrella as far as he could throw it. He talked to himself about cops and what he thought of them. Because he wished to be arrested, they seemed to believe he was like a king who could do no wrong. At last, Soapy came to one of the quiet streets on the east side of the city. He turned here and began to walk south towards Madison Square. He was going home although home was only a seat in the park. But on a very quiet corner, Soapy stopped. There was an old, old church. Through one of the colored glass windows came a soft light. 
sweet music came to Soapy's ears and seemed to hold him there. The moon was above peaceful and bright. There were few people passing. He could hear birds high above him. And the anthem that came from the church held Soapy there, for he had known it well long ago. In those days his life contained such things as mothers and flowers and high hopes and friends and clean thoughts and clean clothes. Soapy's mind was ready for something like this. He had come to the old church at the right time. There was a sudden and wonderful change in his soul. He saw with sick fear how he had fallen. He saw his worthless days, his wrong desires, his dead hopes, his lost power of his mind. And also in a moment, his heart answered this change in his soul. He would fight to change his life. He would pull himself up out of the mud. He would make a man of himself again. There was time. He was young enough. He would find his old purpose in life and follow it. That sweet music had changed him. Tomorrow he would find work. A man had once offered him a job. He would find that man tomorrow. He would be somebody in the world. He would... Soapy felt a hand on his arm. He looked quickly around into the broad face of a cop. What are you doing hanging around here? asked the cop. Nothing, said Soapy. You think I believe that? said the cop. Full of his new strength, Soapy began to argue. And it is not wise to argue with a New York cop. Come along, said the cop. Three months on the island, said the judge to Soapy the next morning. $1,000, said the lawyer Tolman in a severe and serious voice, and here is the money. Young Gillian touched the thin package of $50 bills and laughed. It's such an unusual amount, he explained kindly to the lawyer. If it had been 10000 a man might celebrate with a lot of fireworks. Even $50 would have been less trouble. You heard the reading of your uncle's will after he died, continued the lawyer Tolman. I do not know if you paid much attention to its details. I must remind you of one. You are required to provide us with a report of how you use this one thousand dollars as soon as you have spent it. I trust that you will obey the wishes of your late uncle. You may depend on it, said the young man respectfully. Gillian went to his club. He searched for a man he called Old Bryson. Old Bryson was a calm, antisocial man about 40 years old. He was in a corner reading a book. When he saw Gillian coming near, he took a noisy, deep breath, laid down his book, and took off his glasses. I have a funny story to tell you, said Gillian. I wish you would tell it to someone in the billiard room, said old Bryson. You know how I hate your stories. This is a better one than usual, said Gillian, rolling a cigarette, and I'm glad to tell it to you. It's too sad and funny to go with the rattling of billiard balls. I've just come from a meeting with my late uncle's lawyers. He leaves me an even thousand dollars. Now, what can a man possibly do with a thousand dollars? Old Bryson showed very little interest. I thought the late Septimus Gillian was worth something like half a million. 
He was, agreed Gillian happily, and that's where the joke comes in. He has left a lot of his money to an organism. That is, part of it goes to the man who invents a new bacillus, and the rest to establish a hospital for doing away with it again. There are one or two small, unimportant gifts on the side. The butler and the housekeeper get a seal ring and ten dollars each. His nephew gets one thousand dollars. "'Were there any others mentioned in your uncle's will?' asked old Bryson. "'None,' said Gillian. Well, "'There is a Miss Hayden. My uncle was responsible for her. She lived in his house. She's a quiet thing, musical, the daughter of somebody who was unlucky enough to be his friend. I forgot to say that she was in on the ring and ten-dollar joke, too. I wish I had been.' Then I could have had two bottles of wine, given the ring to the waiter, and had the whole business off my hands. Now tell me what a man can do with a thousand dollars. Old Bryson rubbed his glasses and smiled. And when Old Bryson smiled, Gillian knew that he intended to be more offensive than ever. "'There are many good things a man could do with a thousand dollars,' said Bryson. "'You,' he said with a gentle laugh, "'why, Bobby Gillian, there's only one reasonable thing you could do. "'You can go and buy Miss Lotta Laurier a diamond necklace with the money, "'and then take yourself off to Idaho and inflict your presence upon a ranch. "'I advise a sheep ranch.' "'as I have a particular dislike for sheep.' "'Thanks,' said Gillian, as he rose from his chair. "'I knew I could depend on you, old Bryson. "'You've hit on the very idea. "'I wanted to spend the money on one thing, "'because I have to turn in a report for it, "'and I hate itemizing.' "'Gillian phoned for a cab and said to the driver, the stage entrance of the Columbine Theater. The theater was crowded. Miss Lotta Laurier was preparing for her performance when her assistant spoke the name of Mr. Gillian. Let it in, said Miss Laurier. Now, what is it, Bobby? I'm going on stage in two minutes. It won't take two minutes for me. What do you say to a little thing in the jewelry line? I can spend one thousand dollars. Say, Bobby, said Miss Laurier, did you see that necklace Della Stacy had on the other night? It cost two thousand two hundred dollars at Tiffany's. <laughs> Miss Laurier was called to the stage for her performance. Gillian slowly walked out to where his cab was waiting. "'What would you do with a thousand dollars if you had it?' he asked the driver. "'Open a drinking place,' said the driver quickly. "'I know a place I could take money in with both hands. "'I've got it worked out, if you were thinking of putting up the money.' "'Oh, no,' said Gillian. "'I was just wondering.' Eight blocks down Broadway, Gillian got out of the cab. A blind man sat on the sidewalk selling pencils. Gillian went out and stood in front of him. Excuse me, but would you mind telling me what you would do if you had a thousand dollars? asked Gillian. The blind man took a small book from his coat pocket and held it out. Gillian opened it and saw that it was a bank deposit book. It showed that the blind man had a balance of $1,785 in his bank account. Gillian returned the bank book and got back into the cab. I forgot something, he said. You may drive to the law offices of Tolman and Sharp.
Lawyer Tolman looked at Gillian in a hostile and questioning way. I beg your pardon, said Gillian cheerfully, but was Miss Hayden left anything by my uncle's will in addition to the ring and the ten dollars? Nothing, said Mr. Tolman. I thank you very much, sir, said Gillian, and went to his cab. He gave the driver the address of his late uncle's home. Miss Hayden was writing letters in the library. The small, thin woman wore black clothes, but you would have noticed her eyes. Gillian entered the room as if the world were unimportant. I have just come from old Tolman's, he explained. They have been going over the papers down there. They found a... Gillian searched his memory for a legal term. They found an amendment or a postscript or something to the will. It seemed that my uncle had second thoughts and willed you a thousand dollars. Tolman asked me to bring you the money. Here it is. Gillian laid the money beside her hand on the desk. Miss Hayden turned white. Oh, she said, and again, oh. Gillian half turned and looked out the window. In a low voice, he said, I suppose, of course, that you know I love you. I am sorry, said Miss Hayden, as she picked up her money. There is no use, asked Gillian, almost light-heartedly. I am sorry, she said again. May I write a note, asked Gillian with a smile. Miss Hayden supplied him with paper and pen, and then went back to her writing table. Gillian wrote a report of how he spent the thousand dollars. Paid by Robert Gillian one thousand dollars on account of the eternal happiness owed by heaven to the best and dearest woman on earth. Gillian put the note into an envelope. He bowed to Miss Hayden and left. His cab stopped again at the offices of Tolman and Sharp. I have spent the one thousand dollars, he said cheerfully to Tolman, and I have come to present a report of it as I agreed. He threw a white envelope on the lawyer's table. Without touching the envelope, Mr. Tolman went to a door and called his partner Sharp. Together, they searched for something in a large safe. They brought out a big envelope sealed with wax. As they opened the envelope, they shook their heads together over its contents. Then Tolman became the spokesman. Mr. Gillian, he said, there was an addition to your uncle's will. It was given to us privately with instructions that it not be opened until you had provided us with a full report of your handling of the one thousand dollars received in the will. As you have satisfied the conditions, my partner and I have read the edition. I will explain to you the spirit of its contents." In the event that your use of the one thousand dollars shows that you possess any of the qualifications that deserve reward, you stand to gain much more. If your disposal of the money in question has been sensible, wise, or unselfish, it is in our power to give you bonds to the value of fifty thousand dollars. But if you have used this money in a wasteful, foolish way, as you have in the past, the fifty thousand dollars is to be paid to Miriam Hayton, ward of the late Mr. Gillian, without delay. 
Now, Mr. Gillian, Mr. Sharp and I will examine your report of the one thousand dollars. Mr. Tolman reached for the envelope. Gillian was a little quicker in taking it up. He calmly tore the report and its cover into pieces and dropped them into his pocket. It's all right, he said smilingly. There isn't a bit of need to bother you with this. I don't suppose you would understand these itemized bets anyway. I lost the thousand dollars on the races. Good day to you, gentlemen. Tolman and Sharp shook their heads mournfully at each other when Gillian left. They heard him whistling happily in the hallway as he waited for the elevator. We present a special Christmas story called The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. One dollar and eighty-seven cents, that was all, and sixty cents of it in the smallest pieces of money, pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by negotiating with the men at the market who sold vegetables and meat, negotiating until one's face burned with the silent knowledge of being poor. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but sit down and cry, so Della cried which led to the thought that life is made up of little cries and smiles, with more little cries than smiles. Della finished her crying and dried her face. She stood by the window and looked out, unhappily, at a gray cat walking along a gray fence in a gray back yard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy her husband Jim a gift. She had been saving every penny she could for months, with this result. Jim earned twenty dollars a week, which does not go far. Expenses had been greater than she had expected. They always are. Many a happy hour she had spent planning to buy something nice for him, something fine and rare, something close to being worthy of the honor of belonging to Jim. There was a tall glass mirror between the windows of the room. Suddenly Della turned from the window and stood before the glass mirror and looked at herself. Her eyes were shining, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Quickly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, Mr. and Mrs. James Dillingham Young had two possessions which they valued. One was Jim's gold timepiece, the watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in their building, Della would have let her hair hang out the window to dry, just to reduce the value of the Queen's jewels. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, shining like a brown waterfall. It reached below her knees and made itself almost like a covering for her. And then quickly she put it up again. She stood still while a few tears fell on the floor. She put on her coat and her old brown hat, 
With a quick motion and brightness still in her eyes, she danced out the door and down the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronia, hair goods of all kinds. Della ran up the steps to the shop, out of breath. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let us have a look at it. Down came the beautiful brown waterfall of hair. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the hair with an experienced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. The next two hours went by as if they had wings. Della looked in all the stores to choose a gift for Jim. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. It was a chain, simple round rings of silver. It was perfect for Jim's gold watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be for him. It was like him, quiet and with great value. She gave the shopkeeper twenty-one dollars, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents that was left. When Della arrived home, she began to repair what was left of her hair. The hair had been ruined by her love and her desire to give a special gift. Repairing the damage was a very big job. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny round curls of hair that made her look wonderfully like a schoolboy. She looked at herself in the glass mirror long and carefully. If Jim does not kill me before he takes a second look at me, she said to herself, he'll say I look like a song girl. But what could I do, oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock that night, the coffee was made, and the pan on the back of the stove was hot and ready to cook the meat. Jim was never late coming home from work. Della held the silver chain in her hand and sat near the door. Then she heard his step, and she turned white for just a minute. She had a way of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, Please, God, Make him think I am still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in. He looked thin and very serious. Poor man, he was only twenty-two, and he had to care for a wife. He needed a new coat and gloves to keep his hands warm. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a dog smelling a bird. His eyes were fixed upon Della. There was an expression in them that she could not read, and it frightened her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor fear, nor any of the feelings that she had been prepared for. He simply looked at her with a strange expression on his face. Della went to him. Jim, my love, she cried, do not look at me that way. I had my hair cut and sold because I could not have lived through Christmas without giving you a gift. My hair will grow out again. I just had to do it. My hair grows very fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let us be happy. You do not know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I have for you. You have cut off your hair, asked Jim, slowly, as if he had not accepted the information 
even after his mind worked very hard. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Do you not like me just as well? I am the same person without my hair, right? Jim looked about the room as if he were looking for something. You say your hair is gone? he asked. You need not look for it, said Della. It is sold, I tell you, sold and gone too. It is Christmas Eve, boy, be good to me, for it was cut for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with sudden serious sweetness, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the meat on, Jim? Jim seemed to awaken quickly and put his arms around Della. Then he took a package from his coat and threw it on the table. Do not make any mistake about me, Dell, he said. I do not think there is any haircut that could make me like my girl any less. But if you will open that package, you may see why you had me frightened at first. White fingers quickly tore at the string and paper. There was a scream of joy, and then, alas, a change to tears and cries, requiring the man of the house to use all his skill to calm his wife. For there were the combs, the special set of objects to hold her hair that Della had wanted ever since she saw them in a shop window. Beautiful combs, made of shells, with jewels at the edge, just the color to wear in the beautiful hair that was no longer hers. They cost a lot of money, she knew, and her heart had wanted them without ever hoping to have them. And now the beautiful combs were hers, but the hair that should have touched them was gone. But she held the combs to herself, and soon she was able to look up with a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. Then Della jumped up like a little burned cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful gift. She happily held it out to him in her open hands. The silver chain seemed so bright. Isn't it wonderful, Jim? I looked all over town to find it. You will have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim fell on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let us put our Christmas gifts away and keep them a while. They are too nice to use just right now. I sold my gold watch to get the money to buy the set of combs for your hair. And now, why not put the meat on? The Magi were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the baby Jesus. They invented the art of giving Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two young people who most unwisely gave for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. 
everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. Our story today is called A Municipal Report. It was written by O. Henry and first published in 1904. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It was raining as I got off the train in Nashville, Tennessee. A slow gray rain. I was tired, so I went straight to my hotel. A big heavy man was walking up and down in the hotel lobby. Something about the way he moved made me think of a hungry dog looking for a bone. He had a big, fat, red face and a sleepy expression in his eyes. He introduced himself as Wentworth Caswell, Major Wentworth Caswell, from a fine southern family. Caswell pulled me into the hotel's barroom and yelled for a waiter. We ordered drinks. While we drank, he talked continually about himself, his family, his wife, and her family. He said his wife was rich. He showed me a handful of silver coins that he pulled from his coat pocket. By this time, I had decided that I wanted no more of him. I said good night. I went up to my room and looked out the window. It was ten o'clock, but the town was silent. A nice, quiet place, I said to myself as I got ready for bed. Just an ordinary, sleepy, southern town. I was born in the South myself but I live in New York now. I write for a large magazine. My boss had asked me to go to Nashville. The magazine had received some stories and poems from a writer in Nashville named Azalea Adair. The editor liked her work very much. The publisher asked me to get her to sign an agreement to write only for his magazine. I left the hotel at nine o'clock the next morning to find Miss Adair. It was still raining. As soon as I stepped outside, I met Uncle Caesar. He was a big old black man with fuzzy gray hair. Uncle Caesar was wearing the strangest coat I had ever seen. It must have been a military officer's coat. It was very long, and when it was new, it had been gray, but now rain, sun, and age had made it a rainbow of colors. Only one of the buttons was left. It was yellow, and as big as a fifty-cent coin. Uncle Caesar stood near a horse and carriage. He opened the carriage door and said softly, Step right in, sir. I'll take you anywhere in the city. I want to go to 861 Jasmine Street, I said, and I started to climb into the carriage. But the old man stopped me. Why do you want to go there, sir? What business is it of yours, I said angrily. Uncle Caesar relaxed and smiled. Nothing, sir, but it's a lonely part of town. Just step in and I'll take you there right away. 861 Jasmine Street had been a fine house once, but now it was old and dying. I got out of the carriage. That will be two dollars, sir, Uncle Caesar said. I gave him two one-dollar bills. As I handed them to him, I noticed that one had been torn in half 
and fixed with a piece of blue paper. Also, the upper right-hand corner was missing. Azalea Adair herself opened the door when I knocked. She was about fifty years old. Her white hair was pulled back from her small, tired face. She wore a pale yellow dress. It was old, but very clean. Azalea Adair led me into her living room. A damaged table, three chairs, and an old red sofa were in the center of the floor. Azalea Adair and I sat down at the table and began to talk. I told her about the magazine's offer. She told me about herself. She was from an old southern family. Her father had been a judge. Azalea Adair told me she had never traveled or even attended school. Her parents taught her at home with private teachers. We finished our meeting. I promised to return with the agreement the next day, and rose to leave. At that moment, someone knocked at the back door. Azalea Adair whispered a soft apology and went to answer the caller. She came back a minute later with bright eyes and pink cheeks. She looked ten years younger. You must have a cup of tea before you go, she said. She shook a little bell on the table, and a small black girl about twelve years old ran into the room. Azalea Adair opened a tiny old purse and took out a dollar bill. It had been fixed with a piece of blue paper, and the upper right-hand corner was missing. It was the dollar I had given to Uncle Caesar. "'Go to Mr. Baker's store, Impey,' she said, "'and get me twenty-five cents worth of tea "'and ten cents worth of sugar cakes, and please hurry.' The child ran out of the room. We heard the back door close. Then the girl screamed, her cry mixed with a man's angry voice. Azalea Adair stood up. Her face showed no emotion as she left the room. I heard the man's rough voice and her gentle one. Then a door slammed, and she came back into the room. I am sorry, but I won't be able to offer you any tea after all, she said. It seems that Mr. Baker has no more tea. Perhaps he will find some for our visit tomorrow. We said goodbye. I went back to my hotel. Just before dinner, Major Wentworth Caswell found me. It was impossible to avoid him. He insisted on buying me a drink and pulled two one-dollar bills from his pocket. Again, I saw a torn dollar fixed with blue paper with a corner missing. It was the one I gave Uncle Caesar. How strange, I thought. I wondered how Caswell got it. Uncle Caesar was waiting outside the hotel the next afternoon. He took me to Miss Adair's house and agreed to wait there until we had finished our business. Azalea Adair did not look well. I explained the agreement to her. She signed it. Then, as she started to rise from the table, Azalea Adair fainted and fell to the floor. I picked her up and carried her to the old red sofa. I ran to the door and yelled to Uncle Caesar for help. He ran down the street. Five minutes later, he was back with a doctor. The doctor examined Miss Adair and turned to the old black driver. "'Uncle Caesar,' he said, "'run to my house and ask my wife for some milk and some eggs. Hurry!' Then the doctor turned to me. "'She does not get enough to eat,' he said. "'She has many friends who want to help her, 
but she is proud. Mrs. Caswell will accept help only from that old black man. He was once her family's slave. Mrs. Caswell, I said in surprise, I thought she was Azalea Adair. She was, the doctor answered, until she married Wentworth Caswell twenty years ago. But he's a hopeless drunk. He takes even the small amount of money that Uncle Caesar gives her. After the doctor left, I heard Caesar's voice in the other room. Did he take all the money I gave you yesterday, Mrs. Ilya? Yes, Caesar, I heard her answer softly. He took both dollars. I went into the room and gave Azalea a dare fifty dollars. I told her it was from the magazine. Then Uncle Caesar drove me back to the hotel. A few hours later I went out for a walk before dinner. A crowd of people was talking excitedly in front of a store. I pushed my way into the store. Major Caswell was lying on the floor. He was dead. Someone had found his body on the street. He had been killed in a fight. In fact, his hands were still closed into tight fists. But as I stood near his body, Caswell's right hand opened. Something fell from it and rolled near my feet. I put my foot on it, then picked it up and put it in my pocket. People said they believed a thief had killed him. They said Caswell had been showing everyone that he had fifty dollars, but when he was found he had no money on him. I left Nashville the next morning. As the train crossed a river, I took out of my pocket the object that had dropped from Caswell's dead hand. I threw it into the river below. It was a button, a yellow button, the one from Uncle Caesar's coat. <laughs> We present the short story, The Ransom of Red Chief, by O. Henry. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It looked like a good thing, but wait till I tell you. We were down south in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and myself when this kidnapping idea struck us. There was a town down there as flat as a pancake and called Summit. Bill and I had about $600. We needed just $2,000 more for an illegal land deal in Illinois. We chose for our victim the only child of an influential citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. He was a boy of ten, with red hair. Bill and I thought that Ebenezer would pay a ransom of two thousand dollars to get his boy back, but wait till I tell you. About two miles from Summit was a little mountain covered with cedar trees. There was an opening on the back of the mountain. We stored our supplies in that cave. One night, 
We drove a horse and carriage past old Dorset's house. The boy was in the street throwing rocks at a cat on the opposite fence. A hey, little boy, says Bill. Would you like to have a bag of candy and a nice ride? The boy hits Bill directly in the eye with a piece of rock. That boy put up a fight like a wild animal, but at last we got him down in the bottom of the carriage and drove away. We took him up to the cave. The boy had two large bird feathers stuck in his hair. He points a stick at me and says, Ha! Pale face! Do you dare to enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains? He's all right now, says Bill, rolling up his pants and examining wounds on his legs. We're playing Indian. I'm old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive. I'm going to be scalped at daybreak by Geronimo. That kid can kick hard. Red Chief, says I to the boy, would you like to go home? Ah, oh, what for, says he. I don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, will you? Not right away, says I. We'll stay here in the cave for a while. All right, says he. That'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. We went to bed about eleven o'clock. Just at daybreak, I was awakened by a series of terrible screams from Bill. Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand holding his hair. In the other, he had a sharp knife. He was attempting to cut off the top of Bill's head based on what he had declared the night before. I got the knife away from the boy, but after that event, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. Do you think anybody will pay out money to get a little imp like that back home? Bill asked. Sure, I said. A boy like that is just the kind that parents love. Now, you and the chief get up and make something to eat while I go up on the top of this mountain and look around. I climbed to the top of the mountain. Over toward summit, I expected to see the men of the village searching the countryside, but all was peaceful. Perhaps, says I to myself, it has not yet been discovered that the wolves have taken the lamb from the fold. I went back down the mountain. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the side of it. He was breathing hard, with the boy threatening to strike him with a rock. He put a red-hot potato down my back, explained Bill and then crushed it with his foot. I hit his ears. Have you got a gun with you, Sam? I took the rock away from the boy and ended the argument. I'll fix you, says the boy to Bill. No man ever yet struck the Red Chief but what he got paid for it. You better be careful. After eating, the boy takes a leather object with strings tied around it from his clothes, and goes outside the cave, unwinding it. Then we heard a kind of shout. It was Red Chief holding a sling in one hand. He moved it faster and faster around his head. Just then I heard a heavy sound and a deep breath from Bill. 
a rock. The size of an egg had hit him just behind his left ear. Bill fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I pulled him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. Then I went out and caught that boy and shook him. If your behavior doesn't improve, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now, are you going to be good or not? I was only funnin', says he. I didn't mean to hurt old Hank, but what did he hit me for? I'll behave if you don't send me home. I thought it best to send a letter to old man Dorset that day, demanding the ransom and telling how it should be paid. The letter said, We have your boy hidden in a place far from Summit. We demand fifteen hundred dollars for his return, the money to be left at midnight tonight at the same place and in the same box as your answer. If you agree to these terms, send the answer in writing by a messenger tonight at half past eight o'clock. After crossing Owl Creek on the road to Poplar Cove, there are three large trees. At the bottom of the fence, opposite the third tree, will be a small box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to Summit. If you fail to agree to our demand, you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. I took the letter and walked over to Poplar Cove. I then sat around the post office and store. An old man there says he hears Summit is all worried because of Ebenezer Dorset's boy having been lost or stolen. That was all I wanted to know. I mailed my letter and left. The postmaster said the mail carrier would come by in an hour to take the mail on to Summit. At half past eight, I was up in the third tree, waiting for the messenger to arrive. Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up the road on a bicycle. He finds the box at the foot of the fence. He puts a folded piece of paper into it and leaves, turning back toward Summit. I slid down the tree, got the note, and was back at the cave in a half hour. I opened the note and read it to Bill. This is what it said. Gentlemen, I received your letter about the ransom you ask for the return of my son. I think you're a little high in your demands. I hereby make you a counter-proposal, which I believe you will accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me $250 and I agree to take him off your hands. You had better come at night, because the neighbors believe he is lost, and I could not be responsible for what they would do to anybody they saw bringing him back. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the nerve. But I looked at Bill and stopped. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I ever saw on the face of a dumb or talking animal. 
Sam, says he, what's two hundred and fifty dollars after all? We've got the money. One more night of this boy will drive me crazy. I think Mr. Dorset is making us a good offer. You aren't going to let the chance go, are you? Tell you the truth, Bill, says I. This little lamb has got on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had bought him a gun and we were going to hunt bears the next day. It was twelve o'clock when we knocked on Ebenezer's front door. Bill counted out two hundred and fifty dollars into Dorset's hand. When the boy learned we were planning to leave him at home, he started to cry loudly and held himself as tight as he could to Bill's leg. His father pulled him away, slowly. Uh, how long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, says old Dorset. But I think I can promise you ten minutes. Enough, says Bill. In ten minutes, I shall cross the central, southern, and middle western states and be running for the Canadian border. And as dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good mile and a half out of Summit before I could catch up with him. <laughs> You have heard the American story, The Ransom of Red Chief, by O. Henry. Your storyteller was Shep O'Neill. This story was adapted by Shelley Gullist. It was produced by Luan Davis. From the cabbie's seat. The cabbie has his own special place from which he looks at life. His view of people is simpler, perhaps, than the view of a man who does any other kind of work. From the high seat of his cab, he looks down upon everybody. People are not important to him unless they wish to go somewhere. Then, they're only something to be carried from one place to another. You may be the president or you may be no one, but to a cabbie, you are only a fare, only someone who rides in his cab for a price. You get into his cab, he shakes you a while, and he puts you down. Then the time for payment has arrived. If you pay him the lawful amount and no more, you can easily see what he thinks of you. He thinks you're less than nothing. If you discover suddenly that you have no money with you, <laughs> you'll wish you were dead. It is probably true that the cabbie's view of life is formed by the shape of his cab. He sits up there on his seat high as a god. The seat is small. No one shares it with him. While you are in his cab, your future is in his hands. You are helpless. The cab shakes you. You can't get out until he stops his horse. If you want to speak to him, you must talk through a little hole in the back of the cab. In a cab, you no longer feel like a person. You may be someone very important, but in a cab, you're no more than something in a box being carried from one place to another. One night, there were sounds of pleasure and joy in the big house beside McGarry's family restaurant. The sounds seemed to come from the rooms of the Walsh family. A crowd of interested neighbors stood outside the door. Again and again, a waiter came bringing food or drink from the restaurant. The neighbors stood aside every time to let him pass. Then they would move near the door again. And all the time they were talking about what was happening inside. Anyone who listened would have learned quickly and easily that Nora Walsh was being married. After some time had gone by, the happy people started coming out the door. 
They mixed at once with the neighbors who were standing there. Joyful cries and laughing voices rose in the night air. All this noise was born of the drinks from McGarry's restaurant. At the edge of the street stood Jerry O'Donovan's cab. No cleaner or more shining cab could be found. And Jerry's horse. I tell you, he was fat with good food. Among the moving crowd, Jerry's high hat could now and then be seen. His nose, too, could be seen. It was thick and red, for it had been beaten by fares who wanted to fight. And also now and then, his fine green coat appeared. It was easy to see that Jerry had had more than enough to drink. Everyone had noticed it. Out of the crowd in the street, or perhaps from among the people walking past the house, came a young woman. She stopped beside the cab. Jerry saw her there. A fair! He made a sudden move and three or four people near him fell down. He himself? No. He caught himself in time and did not fall. Quickly he went up to his seat. When he was there, he was safe. All of McGarry's drink could not throw him down from there. Step in, lady, said Jerry. The young woman stepped into the cab. The door closed. The crowd on the street jumped away. The horse started and the fine cab rolled down the street. The horse went fast at first, but after a little time he went more slowly. Then Jerry called down through the hole in the back of the cab. He tried to make his voice soft. He wished to please. Oh, where will you be going to? Any place you wish, was the answer. The voice was happy. It sounded like music. Ah, she's riding for pleasure, thought Jerry. Then he said, Take a trip in the park, lady. It will be cool and fine. Just as you wish, answered the fair pleasantly. The cab turned towards Fifth Avenue, then went north on that perfect street. Jerry was moved up and down in his seat and from one side to the other. McGarry's drinks moved at the same time and seemed to rise inside his head. He began to sing. Inside the cab, the fair sat up straight on the seat. She looked to the right and to the left at the lights in the houses. It was dark inside the cab, and her eyes were shining like stars. When they came to 59th Street, Jerry was half asleep. But his horse went through the park gate. The horse knew where they were. The horse pulled the cab into the park every night. And the fair sat there as if in a happy dream. She could smell the clean, fresh smell of green leaves and flowers. And the wise animal pulling the cab moved as usual. He was at home here. Jerry, too, tried to do as he did every night. His voice was thick, but he asked the questions that cabbies always ask in the park. You want to stop at the casino restaurant, lady? I had something to eat. Listen to the music. Everyone stops. I think that would be nice, said the fair. They made a sudden stop at the door of the restaurant. The cab door opened. The fair stepped out. At once she seemed caught by the wonderful music. The lights and the colors were bright, almost blinding. Someone put a piece of paper into her hand. On it was a number, 34. She looked around and saw her cab. It was 20 yards away, taking its place in a line with other waiting cabs. She was led inside and soon was seated at a table. She realized that she was expected to buy something. She had a little money. She counted it and found enough to buy something cold and fresh to drink. There she sat, drinking slowly and looking at everything around her. Life here had new color, a new shape. It did not seem real. It was like a beautiful dream. At fifty tables sat people who looked to her like kings and queens. She thought their clothes and jewels were wonderfully rich. And now and then one of these people would look at her. They saw a small woman in a simple dress. They saw a plain face. But on that face they saw an expression of love of life. And the queens wished that they could look the same. While she sat there, two hours passed. The kings and queens began to leave. Their cabs rolled away. The music ended. 
The waiters took everything off the tables near hers. She was sitting there almost alone. Jerry's fare stood up and held out the numbered piece of paper. Is someone going to give me something for this? she asked. A waiter told her that it was for her cab. He said that she should go to the door and give it to the man there. This man took it and called the number. Only three cabs stood in line now. The driver of one of them went and found Jerry asleep inside his cab. Jerry spoke a few words in anger and then went up to his seat. He turned the horse and the cab rolled to the door and stopped. His fare entered. The cab turned again and went through the cool darkness of the park, following the street that would lead most quickly to the gate. At the gate, Jerry began suddenly to think. He was still half asleep, but there was a doubt in his mind. There were one or two things he had to ask about. He stopped his horse and his voice came down through the hole in the back of the cab. I want to see four dollars before we go any further. Have you got any money? Four dollars, laughed the fair softly. No, I've only got a few cents with me. Jerry made the horse run. The animal's feet were very loud on the street, but above the noise of the horse's feet, Jerry's voice could be heard. He was full of anger. He shouted at the stars in the sky. He shouted at other cabs as they passed. His words were so bad that another driver hearing them could not believe his ears. But Jerry knew what he was going to do about this fare without money. He knew where he was going. At the building with the green lights beside the door, he pulled his horse to a stop. He opened the cab door and jumped to the ground. Come on, you, he said, and his voice was hard. His fare came out with the dreaming smile still on a plain face. Jerry took her by the arm and led her inside. He was going to tell the cops what had happened. They would do something about it. A gray-haired cop looked across the table. He and the cabbie were no strangers. Jerry began in his loud, hard voice. I've got a fare here that... Jerry stopped. He put his hand, reddened by the weather, to his face. The drink from McGarry's restaurant no longer clouded his mind so darkly. A fair, sir, he continued with a wide smile, that I want you to meet. It's my wife that I married at old man Walsh's this evening, and a wild time we had, it's true. Shake hands with him, Nora, and we'll go home. Before stepping into the cab again, Nora took a long, deep breath. I've had a very nice time, Jerry, said she. Transients in Arcadia There is a certain hotel on Broadway that is very pleasant in the summer. Not many people have heard about it. It is wide and cool. Its rooms have walls of dark wood. There are green trees around it and soft winds. It has all the pleasures of mountain living, and none of the pains. You will eat better fish there than you could catch for yourself in the streams and hills. You will have better meat than a hunter brings home from the forest. A few have discovered this cool spot in the hot summer of New York. You will see these few guests eating dinner in the hotel restaurant. They are happy to be there, and happy to know that they are very few. They feel especially wise because they have found this delightful place. More waiters than necessary are always near. They bring what is wanted before anyone asks for it. The pleasing distant noise of Broadway sounds like running water in a forest. At every strange footstep, the guests turn quickly and look. They are afraid that the restless pleasure-seekers will find their hotel and destroy its pleasant quiet. 
And so these few live during the hot season. They enjoy the delights of mountain and seashore. All is brought to them in their Broadway hotel. This summer, a lady came to the hotel giving this name. Madame Eloise d'Arcet Beaumont. The name was like a name in the story of a great romance. And Madame Beaumont was the kind of lady the Hotel Lotus loved. She was beautiful, and her manner was very fine. Everyone wished to serve her. The other guests believed that, as a guest, she was perfection. This perfect guest did not often leave the hotel. In this, she was like the other guests of the Hotel Lotus. To enjoy that hotel, one needed to forget the city. New York might have been miles away. At night, sometimes one might go out, but during the hot day one remained in the cool shade of the Lotus. Madame was alone in the Hotel Lotus. She was alone as a queen is alone because of her high position. She rose from bed late in the morning. She was then a sweet, soft person who seemed to shine quietly. But at dinner she was different. She would wear a beautiful dress. I cannot find words fine enough to tell about it. Always there were red flowers at her shoulder. When the head waiter saw a dress like this, he met it at the door. You thought of Paris when you saw it, and of the theatre, and of old romances. A story about Madame Beaumont was told among the guests in the Hotel Lotus. It was said that she was a woman who had travelled all over the world. It was said that she knew the most important people everywhere. It was said that in her white hands she held the future of certain nations. It was no surprise, they said, that such a lady should choose the Hotel Lotus. It was the most desirable and the most restful place in America during the heat of summer. On the third day of Madame Beaumont's stay in the hotel, a young man entered as a guest. His clothes were quiet, but good. His face was pleasant. His expression was that of a man who had traveled and could understand the world. He said that he would remain three or four days. He asked about the sailing of certain ships. He seemed to like this hotel the best of all he had known. The young man put his name down on the list of hotel guests. Harold Farrington. It was a name with a fine sound, and the young man belonged perfectly in the quiet life of the Lotus. In one day he became like all the other guests. Like them he had his table and his waiter. He also had the same fear that the wrong people might suddenly discover this hotel and destroy its peace. After dinner on the next day, Madame Beaumont dropped something as she passed Harold Farrington's table. He picked it up and, following her, returned it. He spoke only a few quiet words as he did this, and she was pleased by his good manners. She knew that he was a gentleman. Guests of the Lotus seemed to understand each other very easily. Perhaps it was the result of having discovered this Broadway hotel. Guests felt sure that only especially fine people would enjoy the cool delights of the Lotus. Now, very quickly, a sudden friendship grew between Farrington and Madame Beaumont. They stood and talked for a few moments. I have seen too much of the usual summer hotels, said Madame Beaumont, with a small but sweet smile. Why go to the mountains or the seashore? We cannot escape noise and dust there. The people who make noise and dust follow us there. Even on the ocean, said Farrington sadly. Those same people are all around us. What shall we do when they discover the lotus? I hope they don't discover the lotus this week, said Madame. I only know one other place I like as well. 
It is the beautiful home of a prince in the mountains in Europe. The best people, said Farrington, are seeking for the quiet places like this one, where they can escape the crowds. I promised myself three more days of this delightful rest, said Madame Beaumont. The next day, my ship sails. Harold Farrington's eyes showed that he was sorry. I too must leave then, he said. But I am not sailing for Europe. We cannot stay here forever, though it is so delightful, said Madame Beaumont. I like it better than my usual life, which is too full of people. I shall never forget my week in the Hotel Lotus. Nor shall I, said Farrington in a low voice. And I shall never like the ship that carries you away. On their last evening, the two sat together at a little table. A waiter brought them something cool to eat. Madame Beaumont was wearing the same beautiful dress. She seemed thoughtful. When she had finished eating, she took out a dollar. Mr. Farrington, she said with a smile that everyone in the Lotus loved. I want to tell you something. I am going to leave early tomorrow morning because I must go back to work. I work selling women's clothes at Casey's shop. That dollar is all the money I have. I won't have any more till I get paid at the end of the week. You're a real gentleman and you've been good to me. I wanted to tell you before I went. For a year I've been planning to come here. Each week I put aside a little of my pay so... I would have enough money. I wanted to live one week like a rich lady. I wanted to get up in the morning when I wished. I wanted to be served by waiters. I wanted to have the best of everything. Now I've done it. And I've been happier than I ever was before. And now I'm going back to work. I, I wanted to tell you about it, Mr. Farrington, because I, I thought you liked me, and I... I liked you. This week I've told you many things that weren't true. I, I told you things I've read about. <laughs> they never happened to me. I've been living in a story. It wasn't real. I wanted you to think I was a great lady. This dress I'm wearing, it's the only pretty dress I own. I haven't paid for it yet. I'm paying for it a little at a time. The price was seventy-five dollars. It was made for me at O'Dowd and Levinsky's shop. I paid ten dollars first, and now I have to pay a dollar a week until it's all paid. And that's all I have to say, Mr. Farrington, except that my name is Mamie Civiter, and not Madame Beaumont. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. This dollar is the dollar I'm going to pay for my dress tomorrow. And now... I'll go up to my room. As Harold Farrington listened, his face had not changed. When she had finished, he took out a small book and began to write in it. Then he pulled out the small page with his writing on it and gave it to her, and he took the dollar from her hand. I go to work, too, tomorrow morning, he said, and I decided to begin now. That paper says you've paid your dollar for this week. I've been working for O'Dowd and Levinsky for three years. Strange, isn't it? We both had the same idea. I always wanted to stay at a good hotel. I get twenty dollars a week. Like you, I put aside a little money at a time until I had enough. <sighs> Listen, Mamie. Will you go to the pleasure park on Coney Island with me on payday? The girl who had been Madame Eloise d'Arcy Beaumont smiled. I'd love to go, Mr. Farrington. Coney will be all right. Although, we did live with rich people for a week. They could hear the night noises of the hot city. Inside the Hotel Lotus, it was cool. The waiter stood near, ready to get anything they asked for. Madame Beaumont started up to her room for the last time. And he said, Forget that Harold Farrington, will you? 
McManus is the name. James McManus. Some call me Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy, said Madame. Transients in Arcadia. There is a certain hotel on Broadway that is very pleasant in the summer. Not many people have heard about it. It is wide and cool. Its rooms have walls of dark wood. There are green trees around it and soft winds. It has all the pleasures of mountain living and none of the pains. You will eat better fish there than you could catch for yourself in the streams and hills. You will have better meat than a hunter brings home from the forest. A few have discovered this cool spot in the hot summer of New York. You will see these few guests eating dinner in the hotel restaurant. They are happy to be there, and happy to know that they are very few. They feel especially wise because they have found this delightful place. More waiters than necessary are always near. They bring what is wanted before anyone asks for it. The pleasing distant noise of Broadway sounds like running water in a forest. At every strange footstep, the guests turn quickly and look. They are afraid that the restless pleasure-seekers will find their hotel and destroy its pleasant quiet. And so these few live during the hot season. They enjoy the delights of mountain and seashore. All is brought to them in their Broadway hotel. This summer, a lady came to the hotel giving this name. Madame Eloise d'Arcé Beaumont. The name was like a name in the story of a great romance. And Madame Beaumont was the kind of lady the Hotel Lotus loved. She was beautiful, and her manner was very fine. Everyone wished to serve her. The other guests believed that, as a guest, she was perfection. This perfect guest did not often leave the hotel. In this, she was like the other guests of the Hotel Lotus. To enjoy that hotel, one needed to forget the city. New York might have been miles away. At night, sometimes one might go out, but during the hot day one remained in the cool shade of the Lotus. Madame was alone in the Hotel Lotus. She was alone as a queen is alone because of her high position. She rose from bed late in the morning, she was then a sweet, soft person who seemed to shine quietly. But at dinner she was different. She would wear a beautiful dress. I cannot find words fine enough to tell about it. Always there were red flowers at her shoulder. When the head waiter saw a dress like this, he met it at the door. You thought of Paris when you saw it, and of the theatre and of old romances. A story about Madame Beaumont was told among the guests in the Hotel Lotus. It was said that she was a woman who had travelled all over the world. It was said that she knew the most important people everywhere. It was said that in her white hands she held the future of certain nations. It was no surprise, they said, that such a lady should choose the Hotel Lotus. It was the most desirable and the most restful place in America during the heat of summer. On the third day of Madame Beaumont's stay in the hotel, a young man entered as a guest. His clothes were quiet, but good. His face was pleasant. His expression was that of a man who had traveled and could understand the world. He said that he would remain three or four days. 
He asked about the sailing of certain ships. He seemed to like this hotel the best of all he had known. The young man put his name down on the list of hotel guests. Harold Farrington. It was a name with a fine sound, and the young man belonged perfectly in the quiet life of the Lotus. In one day he became like all the other guests. Like them, he had his table and his waiter. He also had the same fear that the wrong people might suddenly discover this hotel and destroy its peace. After dinner on the next day, Madame Beaumont dropped something as she passed Harold Farrington's table. He picked it up and, following her, returned it. He spoke only a few quiet words as he did this, and she was pleased by his good manners. She knew that he was a gentleman. Guests of the Lotus seemed to understand each other very easily. Perhaps it was the result of having discovered this Broadway hotel. Guests felt sure that only especially fine people would enjoy the cool delights of the Lotus. Now, very quickly, a sudden friendship grew between Farrington and Madame Beaumont. They stood and talked for a few moments. I have seen too much of the usual summer hotels, said Madame Beaumont, with a small but sweet smile. Why go to the mountains or the seashore? We cannot escape noise and dust there. The people who make noise and dust follow us there. Even on the ocean, said Farrington sadly. Those same people are all around us. What shall we do when they discover the lotus? I hope they don't discover the lotus this week, said Madame. I only know one other place I like as well. It is the beautiful home of a prince in the mountains in Europe. The best people, said Farrington, are seeking for the quiet places like this one, where they can escape the crowds. I promise myself three more days of this delightful rest, said Madame Beaumont. The next day, my ship sails. Harold Farrington's eyes showed that he was sorry. I too must leave then, he said. But I am not sailing for Europe. We cannot stay here forever, though it is so delightful, said Madame Beaumont. I like it better than my usual life, which is too full of people. I shall never forget my week in the Hotel Lotus. Nor shall I, said Farrington in a low voice. And I shall never like the ship that carries you away. On their last evening, the two sat together at a little table. A waiter brought them something cool to eat. Madame Beaumont was wearing the same beautiful dress. She seemed thoughtful. When she had finished eating, she took out a dollar. Mr. Farrington, she said with a smile that everyone in the Lotus loved. I want to tell you something. I am going to leave early tomorrow morning because I must go back to work. I work selling women's clothes at Casey's shop. That dollar is all the money I have. I won't have any more till I get paid at the end of the week. You're a real gentleman and you've been good to me. I wanted to tell you before I went. For a year I've been planning to come here. Each week I put aside a little of my pay so... I would have enough money. I wanted to live one week like a rich lady. I wanted to get up in the morning when I wished. I wanted to be served by waiters. I wanted to have the best of everything. Now I've done it. And I've been happier than I ever was before. And now I'm going back to work. I, I wanted to tell you about it, Mr. Farrington, because I, I thought you liked me, and I... I liked you. This week I've told you many things that weren't true. I, I told you things I've read about. <laughs> they never happened to me. I've been living in a story. It wasn't real. I wanted you to think I was a great lady. This dress I'm wearing, it's the only pretty dress I own. I haven't paid for it yet. 
I'm paying for it a little at a time. The price was $75. It was made for me at O'Dowd and Levinsky's shop. I paid $10 first, and now I have to pay a dollar a week until it's all paid. And that's all I have to say, Mr. Farrington. Except that my name is Mamie Civiter, and not Madame Beaumont. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. This dollar is the dollar I'm going to pay for my dress tomorrow. And now, I'll go up to my room. As Harold Farrington listened, his face had not changed. When she had finished, he took out a small book and began to write in it. Then he pulled out the small page with his writing on it and gave it to her, and he took the dollar from her hand. I go to work too tomorrow morning, he said, and I decided to begin now. That paper says you've paid your dollar for this week. I've been working for O'Dowd and Levinsky for three years. Strange, isn't it? We both had the same idea. I always wanted to stay at a good hotel. I get twenty dollars a week. Like you, I put aside a little money at a time until I had enough. <sighs> Listen, Mamie, will you go to the pleasure park on Coney Island with me on payday? The girl who had been Madame Eloise d'Arcy Beaumont smiled. I'd love to go, Mr. Farrington. Coney will be all right. Although, we did live with rich people for a week. They could hear the night noises of the hot city. Inside the Hotel Lotus, it was cool. The waiter stood near, ready to get anything they asked for. Madame Beaumont started up to her room for the last time. And he said, Forget that Harold Farrington, will you? McManus is the name. James McManus. Some call me Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy, said Madame. From the cabbie's seat. The cabbie has his own special place from which he looks at life. His view of people is simpler, perhaps, than the view of a man who does any other kind of work. From the high seat of his cab, he looks down upon everybody. People are not important to him unless they wish to go somewhere. Then, they are only something to be carried from one place to another. You may be the president or you may be no one, but to a cabbie, you are only a fare, only someone who rides in his cab for a price. You get into his cab, he shakes you a while, and he puts you down. Then the time for payment has arrived. If you pay him the lawful amount and no more, you can easily see what he thinks of you. He thinks you're less than nothing. If you discover suddenly that you have no money with you, <laughs> you'll wish you were dead. It is probably true that the cabbie's view of life is formed by the shape of his cab. He sits up there on his seat high as a god. The seat is small. No one shares it with him. While you are in his cab, your future is in his hands. You are helpless. The cab shakes you. You can't get out until he stops his horse. If you want to speak to him, you must talk through a little hole in the back of the cab. In a cab, you no longer feel like a person. You may be someone very important, but in a cab, you're no more than something in a box being carried from one place to another. One night, there were sounds of pleasure and joy in the big house beside McGarry's family restaurant. The sounds seemed to come from the rooms of the Walsh family. A crowd of interested neighbors stood outside the door. Again and again, a waiter came bringing food or drink from the restaurant. The neighbors stood aside every time to let him pass. Then they would move near the door again. And all the time they were talking about what was happening inside. Anyone who listened would have learned quickly and easily that Nora Walsh was being married. 
After some time had gone by, the happy people started coming out the door. They mixed at once with the neighbors who were standing there. Joyful cries and laughing voices rose in the night air. All this noise was born of the drinks from McGarry's restaurant. At the edge of the street stood Jerry O'Donovan's cab. No cleaner or more shining cab could be found. And Jerry's horse! I tell you, he was fat with good food. Among the moving crowd, Jerry's high hat could now and then be seen. His nose, too, could be seen. It was thick and red, for it had been beaten by fares who wanted to fight. And also now and then, his fine green coat appeared. It was easy to see that Jerry had had more than enough to drink. Everyone had noticed it. Out of the crowd in the street, or perhaps from among the people walking past the house, came a young woman. She stopped beside the cab. Jerry saw her there. A fair! He made a sudden move and three or four people near him fell down. He himself? No. He caught himself in time and did not fall. Quickly he went up to his seat. When he was there, he was safe. All of McGarry's drink could not throw him down from there. "'Step in, lady,' said Jerry. The young woman stepped into the cab. The door closed. The crowd on the street jumped away. The horse started and the fine cab rolled down the street. The horse went fast at first, but after a little time he went more slowly. Then Jerry called down through the hole in the back of the cab. He tried to make his voice soft. He wished to please. Uh, "'Where will you be going to?' "'Any place you wish,' was the answer. The voice was happy. It sounded like music. Ah, she's riding for pleasure, thought Jerry. Then he said, Take a trip in the park, lady. It will be cool and fine. Just as you wish, answered the fair pleasantly. The cab turned towards Fifth Avenue, then went north on that perfect street. Jerry was moved up and down in his seat and from one side to the other. McGarry's drinks moved at the same time and seemed to rise inside his head. He began to sing. Inside the cab, the fair sat up straight on the seat. She looked to the right and to the left at the lights in the houses. It was dark inside the cab, and her eyes were shining like stars. When they came to 59th Street, Jerry was half asleep. But his horse went through the park gate. The horse knew where they were. The horse pulled the cab into the park every night. And the fair sat there as if in a happy dream. She could smell the clean, fresh smell of green leaves and flowers. And the wise animal pulling the cab moved as usual. He was at home here. Jerry, too, tried to do as he did every night. His voice was thick, but he asked the questions that cabbies always ask in the park. You want to stop at the casino restaurant, lady? I had something to eat. Listen to the music. Everyone stops. I think that would be nice, said the fair. They made a sudden stop at the door of the restaurant. The cab door opened. The fair stepped out. At once she seemed caught by the wonderful music. The lights and the colors were bright, almost blinding. Someone put a piece of paper into her hand. On it was a number, 34. She looked around and saw her cab. It was 20 yards away, taking its place in a line with other waiting cabs. She was led inside and soon was seated at a table. She realized that she was expected to buy something. She had a little money. She counted it and found enough to buy something cold and fresh to drink. There she sat, drinking slowly and looking at everything around her. Life here had new color, a new shape. It did not seem real. It was like a beautiful dream. At fifty tables sat people who looked to her like kings and queens. She thought their clothes and jewels were wonderfully rich. And now and then one of these people would look at her. They saw a small woman in a simple dress. They saw a plain face. But on that face they saw an expression of love of life. And the queens wished that they could look the same. While she sat there, two hours passed. The kings and queens began to leave. Their cabs rolled away. 
The music ended. The waiters took everything off the tables near hers. She was sitting there almost alone. Jerry's fare stood up and held out the numbered piece of paper. Is someone going to give me something for this? she asked. A waiter told her that it was for her cab. He said that she should go to the door and give it to the man there. This man took it and called the number. Only three cabs stood in line now. The driver of one of them went and found Jerry asleep inside his cab. Jerry spoke a few words in anger and then went up to his seat. He turned the horse and the cab rolled to the door and stopped. His fare entered. The cab turned again and went through the cool darkness of the park, following the street that would lead most quickly to the gate. At the gate, Jerry began suddenly to think. He was still half asleep, but there was a doubt in his mind. There were one or two things he had to ask about. He stopped his horse and his voice came down through the hole in the back of the cab. I want to see four dollars before we go any further. Have you got any money? Four dollars, laughed the fair softly. No, I've only got a few cents with me. Jerry made the horse run. The animal's feet were very loud on the street, but above the noise of the horse's feet, Jerry's voice could be heard. He was full of anger. He shouted at the stars in the sky. He shouted at other cabs as they passed. His words were so bad that another driver hearing them could not believe his ears. But Jerry knew what he was going to do about this fare without money. He knew where he was going. At the building with the green lights beside the door, he pulled his horse to a stop. He opened the cab door and jumped to the ground. Come on, you, he said, and his voice was hard. His fare came out with the dreaming smile still on a plain face. Jerry took her by the arm and led her inside. He was going to tell the cops what had happened. They would do something about it. A gray-haired cop looked across the table. He and the cabbie were no strangers. Jerry began in his loud, hard voice. I got a fare here that... Jerry stopped. He put his hand, reddened by the weather, to his face. The drink from McGarry's restaurant no longer clouded his mind so darkly. A fare, sir. He continued with a wide smile. Did I want you to meet? It's my wife that I married at old man Walsh's this evening. And a wild time we had, it's true. Shake hands with him, Nora, and we'll go home. Before stepping into the cab again, Nora took a long, deep breath. I've had a very nice time, Jerry, said she. Today, we present the short story, The Telltale Heart, by Edgar Allan Poe. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. True. Nervous. Very, very nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed them. Above all, it was... The sense of hearing. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in the underworld. How then am I mad? Observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me, he had never given me insult, for his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a bird, a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell on me, my blood ran cold, and so... Very slowly, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and free myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You think that I am mad. Madmen know nothing. 
but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely and carefully I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, late at night, I turned the lock of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening big enough for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, that no light shone out. And then I stuck in my head. I moved it slowly, very slowly, so that I might not interfere with the old man's sleep. And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern just so much that a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who was a problem for me, but his evil eye. On the eighth night, I was more than usually careful in opening the door. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my finger slid on a piece of metal and made a noise. The old man sat up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept still and said nothing. I did not move a muscle for a whole hour. During that time, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night. Then I heard a noise and I knew it was the sound of human terror. It was the low sound that arises from the bottom of the soul. I know the sound well. Many a night, late at night, when all the world slept, it has welled up from deep within my own chest. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I felt sorry for him, although I laughed to myself. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. When I had waited a long time, without hearing him lie down, I decided to open a little, a very, very little crack in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how carefully, carefully. Finally, a single ray of light shot from out and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew angry as I looked at it. I saw it clearly, all a dull blue with a horrible veil over it that chilled my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the light exactly upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but a kind of oversensitivity? Now there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when inside a piece of cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my anger, but even yet I kept still. I hardly breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I attempted to keep the ray of light upon the eye, but the beating of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every second. The old man's terror must have been extreme. The beating grew louder, I say, louder every moment. And now, at the dead hour of the night, in the horrible silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I stood still, but the beating grew louder 
Louder, I thought the heart must burst. And now a new fear seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud shout, I threw open the lantern and burst into the room. He cried once, once only. Without delay, I forced him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled to find the action so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a quiet sound. This, however, did not concern me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it stopped. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the body. I placed my hand over his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no movement. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise steps I took for hiding the body. I worked quickly, but in silence. First of all, I took apart the body. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three pieces of wood from the flooring and placed his body parts under the room. I then replaced the wooden board so well that no human eye, not even his, could have seen anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no mark of any kind, no blood, whatever. I had been too smart for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock in the morning. As a clock sounded the hour, there came a noise at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who said they were officers of the police. A cry had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of a crime had been aroused. Information had been given at the police office, and the officers had been sent to search the building. I smiled, for what had I to fear? The cry, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I said, was not in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I told them to search, search well. I led them at length to his room. I brought the chairs there and told them to rest. I placed my own seat upon the very place under which lay the body of the victim. The officers were satisfied. I was completely at ease. They sat, and while I answered happily, they talked of common things. But after a while I felt myself getting weak and wished them gone. My head hurt, and I had ringing in my ears, but still they sat and talked. The ringing became more severe. I talked more freely to do away with the feeling, but it continued until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. I talked more, and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound like a watch makes when inside a piece of cotton. I had trouble breathing, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more loudly, but the noise increased. I stood up and argued about silly things in a high voice and with violent hand movements, but the noise kept increasing. Why would they not be gone? I walked across the floor with heavy steps, as if excited to anger by the observations of the men. But the noise increased. What could I do? I swung my chair and moved it upon the floor. But the noise continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men talked pleasantly and smiled. 
believed? Was it possible they heard not? No, no, they heard. They suspected. They knew they were making a joke of my horror. This, I thought, and this, I think. But anything was better than this pain. I could bear those smiles no longer. I felt I must scream or die. And now, again, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I cried, pretend no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the floorboards. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart. Today, we tell a traditional American story called A Tall Tale. A Tall Tale is a story about a person who is larger than life. The descriptions in the story are exaggerated, much greater than in real life. This makes the story funny. Long ago, the people who settled in undeveloped areas in America first told tall tales. After a hard day's work, people gathered to tell each other funny stories. Each group of workers had its own tall tale hero. Paul Bunyan was a hero of North America's lumberjacks, the workers who cut down trees. He was known for his strength, speed, and skill. Tradition says he cleared forests from the northeastern United States to the Pacific Ocean. Some people say Paul Bunyan was the creation of storytellers from the Middle Western Great Lakes area of the United States. Other people say the stories about him came from French Canada. Early in the 20th century, a writer prepared a collection of Paul Bunyan stories. They were included in a publication from the Red River Lumber Company in Minnesota. It is not known if the stories helped the company's sales, but they became extremely popular. Here is Shep O'Neill with our story about Paul Bunyan. Many years ago, Paul Bunyan was born in the northeastern American state of Maine. His mother and father were shocked when they first saw the boy. Paul was so large at birth that five large birds had to carry him to his parents. When the boy was only a few weeks old, he weighed more than 45 kilograms. As a child, Paul was always hungry. His parents needed ten cows to supply milk for his meals. Before long, he ate fifty eggs and ten containers of potatoes every day. Young Paul grew so big that his parents did not know what to do with him. Once, Paul rolled over so much in his sleep that he caused an earthquake. This angered people in the town where his parents lived, so the government told his mother and father they would have to move him somewhere else. Paul's father built a wooden cradle, a traditional bed for a baby. His parents put the cradle in waters along the coast of Maine. However, Every time Paul rolled over, huge waves covered all the coastal towns. So his parents brought their son back on land. They took him into the woods. This is where he grew up. As a boy, Paul helped his father cut down trees. Paul had the strength of many men. He also was extremely fast. He could 
turn off a light and then jump into his bed before the room got dark. Maine is very cold for much of the year. One day, it started to snow. The snow covered Paul's home and a nearby forest. However, this snow was very unusual. It was blue. The blue snow kept falling until the forest was covered. Paul put on his snowshoes and went out to see the unusual sight. As he walked, Paul discovered an animal stuck in the snow. It was a baby ox. Paul decided to take the ox home with him. He put the animal near the fireplace. After the ox got warmer, his hair remained blue. Paul decided to keep the blue ox and named him Babe. Babe grew very quickly. One night, Paul left him in a small building with the other animals. The next morning, the barn was gone, and so was Babe. Paul searched everywhere for the animal. He found Babe calmly eating grass in a valley with the barn still on top of his back. Babe followed Paul and grew larger every day. Every time Paul looked, Babe seemed to grow taller. In those days, much of North America was filled with thick green forests. Paul Bunyan could clear large wooded areas with a single stroke of his large, sharp axe. Paul taught Babe to help with his work. Babe was very useful. For example, Paul had trouble removing trees along a road that was not straight. He decided to tie one end of the road to what remained of a tree in the ground. Paul tied the other end to Babe. Babe dug his feet in the ground and pulled with all his strength until the road became straight. In time, Paul and Babe the Blue Ox left Maine and moved west to look for work in other forests. Along the way, Paul dug out the Great Lakes to provide drinking water for Babe. They settled in a camp near the Onion River in the state of Minnesota. Paul's camp was the largest in the country. The camp was so large that a man had to have one week's supply of food when walking from one side of the camp to the other. Paul decided to get other lumberjacks to help with the work. His work crew became known as the Seven Axe Men. Each man was more than two meters tall and weighed more than 160 kilograms. All of the axemen were named Elmer. That way, they all came running whenever Paul called them. The man who cooked for the group was named Sourdough Sam. He made everything except coffee from sourdough, a substance used in making sourdough bread. Every Sunday, Paul and his crew ate hotcakes, each hot cake was so large that it took five men to eat one. Paul usually had ten or more hot cakes, depending on how hungry he was. The table where the men ate was so long that a server usually drove to one end of the table and stayed the night. The server drove back in the morning with a fresh load of food. 
Paul needed someone to help with the camp's finances. He gave the job to a man named Johnny Inkslinger. Johnny kept records of everything, including wages and the cost of feeding Babe. He sometimes used nine containers of writing fluid a day to keep such detailed records. The camp also was home to sport, the reversible dog. One of the workers accidentally cut sport in two. The man hurried to put the dog back together, but made a mistake. He bent the animal's back the wrong way. However, that was not a problem for sport. He learned to run on his front legs until he was tired. Then he turned the other way and ran on his back legs. Big mosquitoes were a problem at the camp. The men attacked the insects with their axes and long sticks. Before long, the men put barriers around their living space. Then Paul ordered them to get big bees to destroy the mosquitoes. But the bees married the mosquitoes, and the problem got worse. They began to produce young insects. One day, the insects' love of sweets caused them to attack a ship that was bringing sugar to the camp. At last, the mosquitoes and bees were defeated. They ate so much sugar, they could not move. Paul always gave Babe the blue ox a thirty-five kilogram piece of sugar when he was good, but sometimes Babe liked to play tricks. At night, Babe would make noises and hit the ground with his feet. The men at the camp would run out of the buildings where they slept, thinking it was an earthquake. When winter came. Babe had trouble finding enough food to eat. Snow covered everything. Oli, the blacksmith, solved the problem. He made huge green sunglasses for Babe. When Babe wore the sunglasses, he thought the snow was grass. Before long, Babe was strong and healthy again. One year, Paul's camp was especially cold. It was so cold that the men let their facial hair grow very long. When the men spoke, their words froze in the air. Everything they said remained frozen all winter long, and did not melt until spring. Paul Bunyan and Babe left their mark on many areas. Some people say they were responsible for creating Puget Sound in the western state of Washington. Others say Paul Bunyan and Babe cleared the trees from the states of North Dakota and South Dakota. They prepared this area for farming. Babe the blue ox died in South Dakota. One story says he ate too many hotcakes. Paul buried his old friend there. Today, the burial place is known as the Black Hills. Whatever happened to Paul Bunyan, there are lots of stories. Some people say he was last seen in Alaska, or even the Arctic Circle. Another tradition says he still returns to Minnesota every summer. It says Paul moves in and out of the woods, so few people ever know that he is there. <laughs> Thank you.
Our story today is called The Californian's Tale. It was written by Mark Twain. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. When I was young, I went looking for gold in California. I never found enough to make me rich, but I did discover a beautiful part of the country. It was called the Stanislau. The Stanislau was like heaven on earth. It had bright green hills and deep forests where soft winds touched the trees. Other men, also looking for gold, had reached the Stanislau Hills of California many years before I did. They had built a town in the valley with sidewalks and stores, banks and schools. They had also built pretty little houses for their families. At first they found a lot of gold in the Stanislau Hills, but their good luck did not last. After a few years, the gold disappeared. By the time I reached the Stanislaw, all the people were gone too. Grass now grew in the streets, and the little houses were covered by wild rose bushes. Only the sound of insects filled the air as I walked through the empty town that summer day so long ago. Then I realized I was not alone after all. A man was smiling at me as he stood in front of one of the little houses. This house was not covered by wild rose bushes. A nice little garden in front of the house was full of blue and yellow flowers. White curtains hung from the windows and floated in the soft summer wind. Still smiling, the man opened the door of his house and motioned to me. I went inside and could not believe my eyes. I had been living for weeks in rough mining camps with other gold miners. We slept on the hard ground, ate canned beans from cold metal plates, and spent our days in the difficult search for gold. Here in this little house, my spirit seemed to come to life again. I saw a bright rug on the shining wooden floor. Pictures hung all around the room, and on little tables there were seashells, books, and china vases full of flowers. A woman had made this house into a home. The pleasure I felt in my heart must have shone on my face. The man read my thoughts. Yes, he smiled, it is all her work. Everything in this room has felt the touch of her hand. One of the pictures on the wall was not hanging straight. He noticed it and went to fix it. He stepped back several times to make sure the picture was really straight. Then he gave it a gentle touch with his hand. She always does that, he explained to me. It is like the finishing pat a mother gives her child's hair after she has brushed it. I have seen her fix all these things so often that I can do it just the way she does. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. As he talked, I realized there was something in this room that he wanted me to discover. I looked around. When my eyes reached a corner of the room near the fireplace, he broke into a happy laugh and rubbed his hands together. That's it, he cried out. You have found it. I knew you would. It is her picture. I went to a little black shelf 
that held a small picture of the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. There was a sweetness and softness in the woman's expression that I had never seen before. The man took the picture from my hands and stared at it. She was nineteen on her last birthday. That was the day we were married. When you see her, oh, just wait until you meet her. Where is she now? I asked. Oh, she is away, the man sighed, putting the picture back on the little black shelf. She went to visit her parents. They live forty or fifty miles from here. She has been gone two weeks today. When will she be back? I asked. Well, this is Wednesday, he said slowly. She will be back on Saturday, in the evening. I felt a sharp sense of regret. I am sorry, because I will be gone by then, I said. Gone? No, why should you go? Don't go. She will be so sorry. You see, she likes to have people come and stay with us. No, I really must leave, I said firmly. He picked up her picture and held it before my eyes. Here, he said. Now you tell her to her face that you could have stayed to meet her and you would not. Something made me change my mind as I looked at the picture for a second time. I decided to stay. The man told me his name was Henry. That night, Henry and I talked about many different things, but mainly about her. The next day passed quietly. Thursday evening, we had a visitor. He was a big, gray-haired miner named Tom. I just came for a few minutes to ask when she's coming home, he explained. Is there any news? Oh, yes, the man replied. I got a letter. Would you like to hear it? He took a yellowed letter out of his shirt pocket and read it to us. It was full of loving messages to him and to other people, their close friends and neighbors. When the man finished reading it, he looked at his friend. Oh, no, you are doing it again, Tom. You always cry when I read a letter from her. I'm going to tell her this time. No, you must not do that, Henry, the gray-haired miner said. I am getting old, and any little sorrow makes me cry. I really was hoping she would be here tonight. The next day, Friday, another old miner came to visit. He asked to hear the letter. The message in it made him cry, too. We all miss her so much, he said. Saturday finally came. I found I was looking at my watch very often. Henry noticed this. You don't think something has happened to her, do you? he asked me. I smiled and said that I was sure she was just fine. But he did not seem satisfied. I was glad to see his two friends, Tom and Joe, coming down the road as the sun began to set. The old miners were carrying guitars. They also brought flowers and a bottle of whiskey. They put the flowers in vases and began to play some fast and lively songs on their guitars. Henry's friends kept 
giving him glasses of whiskey, which they made him drink. When I reached for one of the two glasses left on the table, Tom stopped my arm. Drop that glass and take the other one, he whispered. He gave the remaining glass of whiskey to Henry just as the clock began to strike midnight. Henry emptied the glass. His face grew whiter and whiter. Boys, he said, I am feeling sick. I want to lie down. Henry was asleep almost before the words were out of his mouth. In a moment, his two friends had picked him up and carried him into the bedroom. They closed the door and came back. They seemed to be getting ready to leave, so I said, Please don't go, gentlemen. She will not know me. I am a stranger to her. They looked at each other. His wife has been dead for nineteen years, Tom said. Dead? I whispered. Dead or worse, he said. She went to see her parents about six months after she got married. On her way back, on a Saturday evening in June, when she was almost here, the Indians captured her. No one ever saw her again. Henry lost his mind. He thinks she is still alive. When June comes, he thinks she has gone on her trip to see her parents. Then he begins to wait for her to come back. He gets out that old letter and we come around to visit so he can read it to us. On the Saturday night she is supposed to come home, we come here to be with him. We put a sleeping drug in his drink so he will sleep through the night. Then he is all right for another year. Joe picked up his hat and his guitar. We have done this every June for nineteen years, he said. The first year there were twenty-seven of us. Now just the two of us are left. He opened the door of the pretty little house, and the two old men disappeared into the darkness of the Stanislau. Our story today is called The Diamond Lens. It was written by Fitzjames O'Brien. We will tell the story in two parts. Now, here is Morris Joyce with part one of The Diamond Lens. When I was ten years old, one of my older cousins gave me a microscope. The first time I looked through its magic lens, the clouds that surrounded my daily life rolled away. I saw a universe of tiny living creatures in a drop of water. Day after day, night after night, I studied life under my microscope. The fungus that spoiled my mother's jam was, for me, a land of magic gardens. 
I would put one of those spots of green mold under my microscope and see beautiful forests where strange silver and golden fruit hung from the branches of tiny trees. I felt as if I had discovered another Garden of Eden. Although I didn't tell anyone about my secret world, I decided to spend my life studying the microscope. My parents had other plans for me. When I was nearly twenty years old, they insisted that I learn a profession. Even though we were a rich family, and I really didn't have to work at all. I decided to study medicine in New York. This city was far away from my family, so I could spend my time as I pleased. As long as I paid my medical school fees every year, my family would never know I wasn't attending any classes. In New York, I would be able to buy excellent microscopes and meet scientists from all over the world. I would have plenty of money and plenty of time to spend on my dream. I left home with high hopes. Two days after I arrived in New York, I found a place to live. It was large enough for me to use one of the rooms as my laboratory. I filled this room with expensive scientific equipment that I did not know how to use. But by the end of my first year in the city, I had become an expert with the microscope. I also had become more and more unhappy. The lens in my expensive microscope was still not strong enough to answer my questions about life. I imagined there were still secrets in nature that the limited power of my equipment prevented me from knowing. I lay awake nights wishing to find the perfect lens an instrument of great magnifying power. Such a lens would permit me to see life in the smallest parts of its development. I was sure that a powerful lens like that could be built, and I spent my second year in New York trying to create it. I experimented with every kind of material. I tried simple glass, crystal, and even precious stones, but I always found myself back where I started. My parents were angry at the lack of progress in my medical studies. I had not gone to one class since arriving in New York. Also, I had spent a lot of money on my experiments. One day, while I was working in my laboratory, Jules Simon knocked at my door. He lived in the apartment just above mine. I knew he loved jewelry, expensive clothing, and good living. There was something mysterious about him, too. He always had something to sell, a painting, a rare statue an expensive pair of lamps. I never understood why Simon did this. He didn't seem to need the money. He had many friends among the best families of New York. Simon was very excited as he came into my laboratory. Oh, my dear fellow, he gasped. I have just seen the most amazing thing in the world. He told me, he had gone to visit a woman who had strange, magical powers. She could speak to the dead and read the minds of the living. To test her, Simon had written some questions about himself on a piece of paper. The woman 
Madame Volpis had answered all of the questions correctly. Hearing about this woman gave me an idea. Perhaps she would be able to help me discover the secret of the perfect lens. Two days later, I went to her house. Madame Volpis was an ugly woman with sharp, cruel eyes. She didn't say a word to me when she opened the door, but took me right into her living room. We sat down at a large, round table, and she spoke. What do you want from me? I want to speak to a person who died many years before I was born. Put your hands on the table. We sat there for several minutes. The room grew darker and darker, but Madame Vulpes did not turn on any lights. I began to feel a little silly. Then I felt a series of violent knocks. They shook the table, the back of my chair, the floor, under my feet, and even the windows. Madame Vulpes smiled. They are very strong tonight. You are lucky. They want you to write down the name of the spirit you wish to talk to. I tore a piece of paper out of my notebook and wrote down a name. I didn't show it to Madame Vulpes. After a moment, Madame Vulpes' hand began to shake so hard the table moved. She said a spirit was now holding her hand and would write me a message. I gave her paper and a pencil. She wrote something and gave the paper to me. The message read, I am here. Question me. It was signed, Leeuwenhoek. I couldn't believe my eyes. The name was the same one I had written on my piece of paper. I was sure that an ignorant woman like Madame Wolpis would not know who Leeuwenhoek was. Why would she know the name of the man who invented the microscope? Quickly, I wrote a question on another piece of paper. How can I create the perfect lens? Leeuwenhoek wrote back, Find a diamond of 140 carats. Give it a strong electrical charge. The electricity will change the diamond's atoms. From that stone you can form the perfect lens. I left Madame Volpe's house in a state of painful excitement. Where would I find a diamond that large? All my family's money could not buy a diamond like that, and even if I had enough money, I knew that such diamonds are very difficult to find. When I came home, I saw a light in Simon's window. I climbed the stairs to his apartment and went in without knocking. Simon's back was toward me as he bent over a lamp. He looked as if he were carefully studying a small object in his hands. As soon as he heard me enter, he put the object in his pocket. His face became red, and he seemed very nervous. What are you looking at? I asked. Simon didn't answer me. Instead, he laughed nervously and told me to sit down. I couldn't wait to tell him my news. Simon, I have just come from Madame Volpe's. 
She gave me some important information that will help me find the perfect lens. If only I could find a diamond that weighs 140 carats. My words seemed to change Simon into a wild animal. He rushed to a small table and grabbed a long, thin knife. No, he shouted. You won't get my treasure. I'll die before I give it to you. My dear Simon, I said, I don't know what you are talking about. I went to Madame Volpe's to ask her for help with a scientific problem. She told me I needed an enormous diamond. You could not possibly own a diamond that large. If you did, you would be very rich, and you wouldn't be living here. He stared at me for a second, and then he laughed and apologized. Simon, I suggested, let us drink some wine and forget all this. I have two bottles downstairs in my apartment. What do you think? I like your idea, he said. I brought the wine to his apartment, and we began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very sleepy and very drunk. I felt as calm as ever, for I believed that I knew Simon's secret. Today we tell a traditional American story called A Tall Tale. A Tall Tale is a story about a person who is larger than life. The descriptions in the story are exaggerated, much greater than in real life. Long ago the people who settled in undeveloped areas in America first told tall tales. After a hard day's work, people gathered to tell each other funny stories. Pecos Bill was a larger-than-life hero of the American West. No one knows who first told stories about Pecos Bill. Cowboys may have invented the stories. Others say Edward O'Reilly invented the character in stories he wrote for the Century magazine in the early 1900s. The stories were collected in a book called The Saga of Pecos Bill, published in 1923. Another writer, James Cloyd Bowman, wrote an award-winning children's book called Pecos Bill, The Greatest Cowboy of All Time. The book won the Newbery Honor in 1938. Pecos Bill was not a historical person, but he does represent the spirit of early settlers in the American West. His unusual childhood and extraordinary actions tell about people who believed there were no limits to what they could do. Now, here is Barbara Klein with our story. Pecos Bill had one of the strangest childhoods a boy ever had. It all started after his father decided that there was no longer enough room in East Texas for his family. Pack up, Ma! he cried. Neighbors moving in fifty miles away. It's getting too crowded. So they loaded up a wagon with all their things. Now some say they had fifteen children, while others say eighteen. However many there were, 
the children were louder than thunder, and as they set off across the wild country of West Texas, their mother and father could hardly hear a thing. Now, as they came to the Pecos River, the wagon hit a big rock. The force threw little Bill out of the wagon, and he landed on the sandy ground. Mother did not know Bill was gone until she gathered the children for the midday meal. Mother set off with some of the children to look for Bill, but they could find no sign of him. Well, some people say Bill was just a baby when his family lost him. Others say he was four years old. But all agree that a group of animals called coyotes found Bill and raised him. Bill did all the things those animals did, like chase lizards and howl at the moon. He became as good a coyote as any. Now, Bill spent 17 years living like a coyote until one day a cowboy rode by on his horse. Some say the cowboy was one of Bill's brothers. Whoever he was, he took one look at Bill and asked, What are you? Bill was not used to human language. At first, he could not say anything. The cowboy repeated his question. This time, Bill said, Varmint! That is a word used for any kind of wild animal. No, you aren't, said the cowboy. Yes, I am, said Bill. I have fleas. Lots of people have fleas, said the cowboy. You don't have a tail. Yes, I do, said Bill. Show it to me then, the cowboy said. Bill looked at his backside and realized that he did not have a tail like the other coyotes. Well, what am I then? asked Bill. You're a cowboy, so start acting like one, the cowboy cried out. Well, that was all Bill needed to hear. He said goodbye to his coyote friends and left to join the world of humans. Now, Pecos Bill was a good cowboy. Still, he hungered for adventure. One day, he heard about a rough group of men. There is some debate over what the group was called, but one storyteller calls it the Hell's Gate Gang. So Bill set out across the rough country to find this gang of men. Well, Bill's horse soon was injured, so Bill had to carry it for a hundred miles. Then Bill met a rattlesnake fifty feet long. The snake made a hissing noise and was not about to let Bill pass. But after a tense minute, Bill beat the snake until it surrendered. He felt sorry for the varmint, though, and wrapped it around his arm. After Bill walked another hundred miles, he came across an angry mountain lion. There was a huge battle, but Bill took control of the big cat and put his saddle on it. He rode that mountain lion all the way to the camp of the Hell's Gate gang. Now, when Bill saw the gang, he shouted out, Who's the boss around here? A huge cowboy, nine feet tall, took one look at Bill and said in a shaky voice, 
I was the boss, but you are the boss from here on in. With his gang, Pecos Spill was able to create the biggest ranch in the Southwest. Bill and his men had so many cattle that they needed all of New Mexico to hold them. Arizona was the pasture where the cattle ate grass. Pecos Bill invented the art of being a cowboy. He invented the skill of throwing a special rope called a lasso over a cow's head to catch wandering cattle. Some say he used a rattlesnake for a lasso. Others say he made a lasso so big that it circled the whole earth. Bill invented the method of using a hot branding iron to permanently put the mark of a ranch on a cow's skin. That helped stop people from stealing cattle. Some say he invented cowboy songs to help calm the cattle and make the cowboy's life easier. But he is also said to have invented tarantulas and scorpions. As jokes, cowboys have had trouble with those poisonous creatures ever since. Now, Pecos Bill could ride anything that ever was. So, as some tell the story, there came a storm bigger than any other. It all happened during the worst drought the West had ever seen. It was so dry that horses and cows started to dry up and blow away in the wind. So when Bill saw the windstorm, he got an idea. The huge tornado kicked across the land like a wild bronco, but Bill jumped on it without a thought. He rode that tornado across Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, all the time squeezing the rain out of it to save the land from drought. When the storm was over, Bill fell off the tornado. He landed in California. He left a hole so deep that to this day it is known as Death Valley. Now Bill had a horse named Widowmaker. He got that name because any man who rode that horse would be thrown off and killed, and his wife would become a widow. No one could ride that horse but Bill. And Widowmaker, in the end, caused the biggest problem for Pecos Bill. You see, one day. Bill saw a woman, not just any woman, but a wild, red-haired woman, riding a giant catfish down the Rio Grande River. Her name was Slewfoot Sue, and Bill fell in love with her at first sight. Well, Bill would not rest until he had asked for her hand in marriage. And Slewfoot Sue accepted. On their wedding day, Pecos Bill dressed in his best buckskin suit, and Sue wore a beautiful white dress with a huge steel spring bustle in the back. It was the kind of big dress that many women wore in those days. The bigger, the better. Now. After the marriage ceremony, Slewfoot Sue got a really bad idea. She decided that she wanted to ride Widowmaker. Bill begged her not to try, but she had her mind made up. Well, the second she jumped on the horse's back, he began to kick and buck like nothing anyone had ever seen. 
he sent Sue flying so high that she sailed clear over the new moon. She fell back to earth, but the steel spring bustle just bounced her back up as high as before. Now there are many different stories about what happened next. One story says Bill saw that Sue was in trouble. She would keep bouncing forever if nothing was done, so he took his rope out, though some say it was a huge rattlesnake, and lassoed Sue to catch her and bring her down to earth. Only she just bounced him back up with her. Somehow the two came to rest on the moon, and that's where they stayed. Some people say they raised a family up there. Their children were as loud and wild as Bill and Sue were in their younger days. People say the sound of thunder that sometimes carries over the dry land around the Pecos River is nothing more than Pecos Bill's family laughing up a storm. For the toughest bitter west of the Alamo. Once there was a drought that spread all over Texas, so to sunny California he did go. And though the gag is kind of corny, he brought rain to California. That's the way we got to go for Mexico. So yippee i a i a yippee i o. For the toughest critter west of the Alamo. Long ago, in a very olden time, there lived a powerful king. Some of his ideas were progressive, but others caused people to suffer. One of the king's ideas was a public arena as an agent of poetic justice. Crime was punished, or innocence was decided, by the result of chance. When a person was accused of a crime, his future would be judged in the public arena. 
all the people would gather in this building. The king sat high up on his ceremonial chair. He gave a sign. A door under him opened. The accused person stepped out into the arena. Directly opposite the king were two doors. They were side by side, exactly alike. The person on trial had to walk directly to these doors and open one of them. He could open whichever door he pleased. If the accused man opened one door, out came a hungry tiger, the fiercest in the land. The tiger immediately jumped on him and tore him to pieces as punishment for his guilt. The case of the suspect was thus decided. Iron bells rang sadly. Great cries went up from the paid mourners, and the people, with heads hanging low and sad hearts, slowly made their way home. They mourned greatly that one so young and fair, or so old and respected, should have died this way. But if the accused opened the other door, there came forth from it a woman, chosen especially for the person. To this lady he was immediately married, in honor of his innocence. It was not a problem that he might already have a wife and family, or that he might have chosen to marry another woman. The king permitted nothing to interfere with his great method of punishment and reward. Another door opened under the king, and a clergyman, singers, dancers, and musicians joined the man and the lady. The marriage ceremony was quickly completed. Then the bells made cheerful noises. The people shouted happily, and the innocent man led the new wife to his home, following children who threw flowers on their path. This was the king's method of carrying out justice. Its fairness appeared perfect. The accused person could not know which door was hiding the lady. He opened either as he pleased, without knowing whether, in the next minute, he was to be killed or married. Sometimes the fierce animal came out of one door, sometimes it came out of the other. This method was a popular one. When the people gathered together on one of the great trial days, they never knew whether they would see a bloody killing or a happy ending. So everyone was always interested. And the thinking part of the community would bring no charge of unfairness against this plan. Did not the accused person have the whole matter in his own hands? The king had a beautiful daughter, who was like him in many ways. He loved her above all humanity. The princess secretly loved a young man who was the best-looking and bravest in the land. But he was a commoner, not part of an important family. One day, the king discovered the relationship between his daughter and the young man. The man was immediately put in prison. A day was set for his trial in the king's public arena. This, of course, was an especially important event. Never before had a common subject been brave enough to love the daughter of the king. The king knew that the young man would be punished, even if he opened the right door, and the king would take pleasure in watching the series of events, which would judge whether or not the man had done wrong in loving the princess.
The day of the trial arrived. From far and near, the people gathered in the arena and outside its walls. The king and his advisors were in their places opposite the two doors. All was ready. The sign was given. The door under the king opened, and the lover of the princess entered the arena. Tall, beautiful, and fair, his appearance was met with a sound of approval and tension. Half the people had not known so perfect a young man lived among them. No wonder the princess loved him. What a terrible thing for him to be there. As the young man entered the public arena, he turned to bend to the king. But he did not at all think of the great ruler. The young man's eyes instead were fixed on the princess, who sat to the right of her father. From the day it was decided that the sentence of her lover should be decided in the arena, she had thought of nothing but this event. The princess had more power, influence, and force of character than anyone who had ever before been interested in such a case. She had done what no other person had done. She had possessed herself of the secret of the doors. She knew behind which door stood the tiger and behind which waited the lady. Gold and the power of a woman's will had brought the secret to the princess. She also knew who the lady was. The lady was one of the loveliest in the kingdom. Now and then, the princess had seen her looking at and talking to the young man. The princess hated the woman behind that silent door. She hated her with all the intensity of the blood passed to her through long lines of cruel ancestors. Her lover turned to look at the princess. His eye met hers as she sat there, paler and whiter than anyone in the large ocean of tense faces around her. He saw that she knew behind which door waited the tiger and behind which stood the lady. He had expected her to know it. The only hope for the young man was based on the success of the princess in discovering this mystery. When he looked at her, he saw that she had been successful, as he knew she would succeed. Then his quick and tense look asked the question, Which? It was as clear to her as if he shouted it from where he stood. There was not time to be lost. The princess raised her hand and made a short, quick movement toward the right. No one but her lover saw it. Every eye but his was fixed on the man in the arena. He turned, and with a firm and quick step, he walked across the empty space. Every heart stopped beating. Every breath was held. Every eye was fixed upon that man. He went to the door on the right and opened it. Now, the point of the story is this. Did the tiger come out of that door, or did the lady? The more we think about this question, the harder it is to answer. It involves a study of the human heart. Think of it not as if the decision of the question depended upon yourself, but as if it depended upon that hot-blooded princess, her soul at a white heat under the fires of sadness and jealousy. She had lost him, but who should have him? How often in her waking hours and in her dreams 
had she started in wild terror and covered her face with her hands. She thought of her lover opening the door on the other side of which waited the sharp teeth of the tiger. But how much oftener had she seen him open the other door? How she had ground her teeth and torn her hair when she had seen his happy face as he opened the door of the lady! How her soul had burned in pain when she had seen him run to meet that woman with her look of victory, when she had seen the two of them get married, and when she had seen them walk away together upon their path of flowers, followed by the happy shouts of the crowd, in which her one sad cry was lost. Would it not be better for him to die quickly and go to wait for her in that blessed place of the future? And yet, that tiger, those cries, that blood. Her decision had been shown quickly, but it had been made after days and nights of thought. She had known she would be asked, and she had decided what she would answer, and she had moved her hand to the right. The question of her decision is one not to be lightly considered, and it is not for me to set myself up as the one person able to answer it. And so I leave it with all of you. Which came out of the open door, the lady or the tiger? <laughs> That very unusual man, old Dr. Heidegger, once invited four friends to meet him in his office. There were three white-bearded gentlemen, Mr. Medbourne, Colonel Killigrew, and Mr. Gascoigne. And there was a thin old lady whose husband had died, so she was called the Widow Wykerly. They were all sad old creatures who had been unfortunate in life. As a young man, Mr. Medbourne had lost all his money in a badly planned business deal. Colonel Killigrew had wasted his best years and health enjoying the pleasures of women and drink. Mr. Gascoigne was a ruined politician with an evil past. As for the widow Wykerly, tradition tells us that she was once a great beauty, but shocking stories about her past had led the people of the town to reject her, so she lived very much alone. It is worth stating that each of these three men were early lovers of the widow Wykerly, and they had once been on the point of killing each other over her. My dear old friends, said Dr. Heidegger, I would like your help in one of my little experiments. He motioned for them to sit down. Dr. Heidegger's office was a very strange place. The dark room was filled with books, cobwebs, and dust. An old mirror hanging between two bookcases was said to show the ghosts of all the doctor's dead patients. On another wall hung a painting of the young woman Dr. Heidegger was to have married long ago, but she died the night before their wedding after drinking one of the doctor's medicines. 
the most mysterious object in the room was a large book covered in black leather. It was said to be a book of magic. On the summer afternoon of our story, a black table stood in the middle of the room. On it was a beautiful cut glass vase. Four glasses were also on the table. Doctor Heidegger was known for his unusual experiments, but his four guests did not expect anything very interesting. The doctor picked up his black leather book of magic. From its pages, he removed a dried-up old rose. This rose, said the doctor, was given to me fifty-five years ago by Sylvia Ward, whose painting hangs on this wall. I was to wear it at our wedding. Would you think it possible that this ancient rose could ever bloom again? Nonsense," said the widow Wycherly with a toss of her head. "You might as well ask if an old woman's lined face could ever bloom again." "See," answered Doctor Heidegger. He reached for the vase and threw the dried rose into the water it contained. Soon, a change began to appear. The crushed and dried petals moved and slowly turned from brown to red, and there was the rose of half a century, looking as fresh as when Sylvia Ward had first given it to her lover. That is a very pretty trick," said the doctor's friends. "What is the secret?" Did you ever hear of the Fountain of Youth? Asked Doctor Heidegger. The Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon went in search of it centuries ago, but he was not looking in the right place. If I am rightly informed, the famous Fountain of Youth is in southern Florida. A friend of mine has sent me the water you see in the vase. The doctor filled the four glasses with water from the fountain of youth. The liquid produced little bubbles that rose up to the silvery surface. The old guests agreed to drink the water. Although they did not believe in its power, before you drink, my friends, the doctor said, you should draw up a few general rules as guidance before you pass a second time through the dangers of youth. You have had a lifetime of experience to direct you. Think what a shame it would be. If the wisdom of your experiences did not act as a guide and teacher, the doctor's four friends answered him with a laugh. The idea that they would ever repeat the mistakes of their youth was very funny. Drink, then," said the doctor. I am happy that I have so well chosen the subjects of my experiment. They raised the glasses to their lips. If the liquid really was magical, it could not have been given to four human beings who needed it more. They seemed as though they had never known youth or pleasure. They looked like they had always been the weak. Unhappy creatures who were bent over the doctor's table. They drank the water. There was an almost immediate improvement among the guests. A cheerful glow, like sunshine, brightened their faces. They looked at one another, imagining that some magic power had really started to smooth the lines on their faces. 
Quick, give us more of this wondrous water, they cried. We are younger, but we are still too old. Patience, said Dr. Heidegger, who watched the experiment with scientific coolness. You have been a long time growing old. Surely you could wait half an hour to grow young. Again, he filled their glasses. The four guests drank the liquid in one swallow. As the liquid passed down their throats, it seemed to change their whole systems. Their eyes grew clear and bright. Their hair turned from silver to darker shades. My dear widow, you are lovely, cried Colonel Killigrew, who watched as the signs of age disappeared from her face. The widow ran to the mirror. The three men started to behave in such a way that proved the magic of the fountain of youth's water. Mr. Gascoigne's mind turned to political topics. He talked about nationalism and the rights of the people. He also told secrets softly to himself. All this time, Colonel Killigrew had been shouting out happy drinking songs while his eyes turned towards the curvy body of the widow Wykerly. Mr. Medbourne was adding dollars and cents to pay for a proposed project. It would supply the East Indies with ice by linking a team of whales to the polar icebergs. As for the widow Wykerly, she stood in front of the mirror, greeting her image as a friend she loved better than anything in the world. My dear old doctor, she cried, please give me another glass. The doctor had already filled the glasses again. It was now near sunset, and the room was darker than ever. But a moonlike light shined from within the vase. The doctor sat in his chair, watching. As the four guests drank their third glass of water, they were silenced by the expression on the doctor's mysterious face. The next moment, the exciting rush of young life shot through their blood. They were now at the happy height of youth. The endless cares, sadness, and diseases of age were remembered only as a troubled dream from which they had awoken. We are young, they cried. The guests were a group of happy youngsters, almost crazy with energy. They laughed at the old-fashioned clothing they wore. They shouted happily and jumped around the room. The widow Wykerly, if such a young lady could be called a widow, ran to the doctor's chair and asked him to dance. Please excuse me, answered the doctor quietly. My dancing days were over long ago. But these three young men would be happy to have such a lovely partner. The men began to argue violently about who would dance with her. They gathered around the widow, each grabbing for her. Yet by a strange trick owing to the darkness of the room, the tall mirror is said to have reflected the forms of three old gray men competing for a faded old woman. As the three fought for the woman's favor, they reached violently for each other's throats. In their struggle, they turned over the table. The vase broke into a thousand pieces, the water of youth flowed in a bright stream across the floor. 
the guests stood still. A strange coldness was slowly stealing over them all. They looked at Dr. Heidegger, who was holding his treasured rose. The flower was fading and drying up once more. The guests looked at each other and saw their looks changing back. Are we grown old again so soon? they cried. In truth, they had. The water of youth had powers that were only temporary. Yes, friends, you are old again, the doctor said, and the water of youth lies wasted on the ground. But even if it flowed in a river at my door, I still would not drink it. This is the lesson you have taught me. But the doctor's four friends had learned no such lesson. They decided at that moment to travel to Florida and drink morning, noon, and night from the fountain of youth. <laughs> Our story today is called Rappaccini's Daughter. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. We will tell the story in two parts. Here is Kay Gallant with the first part of our story. Many years ago, a young man named Giovanni Guasconti left his home in Naples to study in northern Italy. He rented a small room on the top floor of a dark and ancient palace. Long ago, the building had belonged to a noble family. Now, an old woman, Signora Lisabetta, rented its rooms to students at the University of Padua. Giovanni's room had a small window. From it, he could see a large garden that had many plants and flowers. Does the garden belong to you? he asked Signora Lisabetta one day. Oh, no, she said quickly. That garden belongs to the famous doctor, Giacomo Rappaccini. People say he uses those plants to make strange kinds of medicine. He lives in that small brown house in the garden with his daughter Beatrice. Giovanni often sat by his window to look at the garden. He had never seen so many different kinds of plants. They all had enormous green leaves and magnificent flowers in every color of the rainbow. Giovanni's favorite plant was in a white marble vase near the house. It was covered with big, purple flowers. One day, while Giovanni was looking out his window, he saw an old man in a black cape walking in the garden. The old man was tall and thin. His face was an unhealthy yellow color. His black eyes were very cold. The old man wore thick gloves on his hands and a mask over his mouth and nose. He walked carefully among the plants, as if he were walking among wild animals or poisonous snakes. Although he looked at the flowers very closely, he did not touch or smell any of them. When the old man arrived at the plant with the big purple flowers, he stopped he took off his mask and called loudly, Beatrice, come help me. I am coming, father. What do you want? answered a warm young voice from inside the house. A young woman came into the garden. Her thick 
Dark hair fell around her shoulders in curls. Her cheeks were pink, and her eyes were large and black. She seemed full of life, health, and energy as she walked among the plants. Giovanni thought she was as beautiful as the purple flowers in the marble vase. The old man said something to her. She nodded her head as she touched and smelled the flowers that her father had been so careful to avoid. Several weeks later, Giovanni went to visit Pietro Baglioni, a friend of his father's. Professor Baglioni taught medicine at the university. During the visit, Giovanni asked about Dr. Rappaccini. He is a great scientist, Professor Baglioni replied, but he is also a dangerous man. Why? asked Giovanni. The older man shook his head slowly. Because Rappaccini cares more about science than he does about people. He has created many terrible poisons from the plants in his garden. He thinks he can cure sickness with these poisons. It is true that several times he has cured a very sick person that everyone thought would die. But Rappaccini's medicine has also killed many people. I think he would sacrifice any life, even his own, for one of his experiments. But what about his daughter? Giovanni said. I'm sure he loves her. The old professor smiled at the young man. So, he said, You have heard about Beatrice Rappaccini. People say she is very beautiful. But few men in Padua have ever seen her. She never leaves her father's garden. Giovanni left Professor Baglioni's house as the sun was setting. On his way home, he stopped at a flower shop where he bought some fresh flowers. He returned to his room and sat by the window. Very little sunlight was left. The garden was quiet. The purple flowers on Giovanni's favorite plant seemed to glow in the evening's fading light. Then someone came out of the doorway of the little brown house. It was Beatrice. She entered the garden and walked among the plants. She bent to touch the leaves of a plant or to smell a flower. Rappaccini's daughter seemed to grow more beautiful with each step. When she reached the purple plant, she buried her face in its flowers. Giovanni heard her say, Give me your breath, my sister. The ordinary air makes me weak, and give me one of your beautiful flowers. Beatrice gently broke off one of the largest flowers. As she lifted it to put it in her dark hair, a few drops of liquid from the flower fell to the ground. One of the drops landed on the head of a tiny lizard crawling near the feet of Beatrice. For a moment, the small animal twisted violently. Then it moved no more. Beatrice did not seem surprised. She sighed and placed the flower in her hair. Giovanni leaned out of the window so he could see her better. At this moment, a beautiful butterfly flew over the garden wall. It seemed to be attracted by Beatrice and flew once around her head. Then the insect's bright wings stopped and it fell to the ground dead. Beatrice shook her head sadly. Suddenly 
She looked up at Giovanni's window. She saw the young man looking at her. Giovanni picked up the flowers he had bought and threw them down to her. Young lady, he said, wear these flowers as a gift from Giovanni Guasconti. Thank you, Beatrice answered. She picked up the flowers from the ground and quickly ran to the house. She stopped at the door for a moment to wave shyly at Giovanni. It seemed to him that his flowers were beginning to turn brown in her hands. For many days, the young man stayed away from the window that looked out on Rappuccini's garden. He wished he had not talked to Beatrice, because now he felt under the power of her beauty. He was a little afraid of her, too. He could not forget how the little lizard and the butterfly had died. One day, while he was returning home from his classes, he met Professor Baglione on the street. Well, Giovanni, the old man said, have you forgotten me? Then he looked closely at the young man. What is wrong, my friend? Your appearance has changed since the last time we met. It was true. Giovanni had become very thin. His face was white, and his eyes seemed to burn with fever. As they stood talking, a man dressed in a long black cape came down the street. He moved slowly, like a person in poor health. His face was yellow, but his eyes were sharp and black. It was the man Giovanni had seen in the garden. As he passed them, the old man nodded coldly to Professor Baglioni, but he looked at Giovanni with a great deal of interest. It's Dr. Rappuccini, Professor Baglioni whispered after the old man had passed them. Has he ever seen your face before? Giovanni shook his head. No, he answered. I don't think so. Professor Baglioni looked worried. I think he has seen you before. I know that cold look of his. He looks the same way when he examines an animal he has killed in one of his experiments. Giovanni, I will bet my life on it. You are the subject of one of Rappuccini's experiments. Giovanni stepped away from the old man. You are joking, he said. No, I am serious. The professor took Giovanni's arm. Be careful, my young friend. You are in great danger. Giovanni pulled his arm away. I must be going, he said. Good night. As Giovanni hurried to his room, he felt confused and a little frightened. Signora Lisabetta was waiting for him outside his door. She knew he was interested in Beatrice. I have good news for you, she said. I know where there is a secret entrance into Rappuccini's garden. Giovanni could not believe his ears. Where is it? he asked. Show me the way. Our story today is called Paul's Case. It was written by Willa Cather. Paul's Case will be told in two parts. 
Here is Kay Gallant with part one of the story. Paul hated school. He did not do his homework. He did not like his teachers. Paul's father did not know what to do with him. His teachers did not know either. One afternoon, all his teachers at Pittsburgh High School met together with him to discuss his case. Paul was late. When he entered the room, his teachers sat waiting for him. He was tall for his age and very thin. His clothes were too small for him, but they were clean. He had a bright red flower in the buttonhole of his black jacket. One of the teachers asked Paul why he had come to the meeting. Paul said politely that he wanted to do better in school. This was a lie. Paul often lied. His teachers began to speak. They had many complaints. One said Paul talked to the other students instead of paying attention to the lessons. Another said Paul always sat in class with his hands covering his eyes. A third teacher said Paul looked out the window instead of looking at her. His teachers attacked him without mercy. Paul's eyebrows moved up and down as his teacher spoke. His smile never left his face, but his fingers shook as he touched the flower on his coat. At last the meeting was over. Paul's smile got even wider. He bowed gracefully and left the room. His teachers were angry and confused. The art teacher spoke for all of them when he said there was something about Paul that he didn't understand. I don't think he really means to be bad, he said. There's just something wrong with that boy. Then the art teacher remembered one warm afternoon when Paul had fallen asleep in his class. Paul's face was white with thin blue veins under the skin. The boy's face looked tired and lined, like an old man's. His eyebrows moved up and down, even in his sleep. After he left the meeting, Paul ran down the hill from the school, whistling. He was late for his job at the concert hall. Paul was an usher there. He showed people to their seats. He carried messages for them. He brought them their programs with a polite bow. Everyone thought he was a charming boy and the best usher at the hall. When Paul reached the concert hall that evening, he went immediately to the dressing room. About six boys were already there, Paul began changing his clothes with excited hands. He loved his green uniform with the gold pockets and design. Paul rushed into the concert hall as soon as he had changed clothes. He ran up and down the hall, helping people. He became more and more excited. His face became pink and his eyes seemed larger and very bright. He looked almost handsome. At last, everyone was seated. The orchestra began to play, and Paul sat down with a sigh of relief. The music seemed to free something in Paul's spirit. Then a woman came out and began to sing. She had a rich, strong soprano voice. Paul felt truly happy for the first time that day. At the end of the concert, Paul went back to the dressing room. 
after he had changed his clothes again, he went outside the concert hall. He decided to wait for the singer to come out. While he waited, he looked across the street to the large hotel called the Shenley. All the important people stayed at the Shenley when they visited Pittsburgh. Paul had never been inside it, but he used to stand near the hotel's wide glass doors. He liked to watch the people enter and leave. He believed if he could only enter this kind of a hotel, he would be able to leave school, his teachers, and his ordinary gray life behind him forever. At last, the singer came out of the concert hall. Paul followed her as she walked to the hotel. He was part of a large crowd of admirers who had waited to see her. When they all reached the hotel, she turned and waved. Then the doors opened and she disappeared inside. Paul stared into the hotel as the doors slowly closed. He could feel the warm, sweet air inside. And for a moment, he felt part of a golden world of sparkling lights and marble floors. He thought about the mysterious dishes of food being served in the hotel's dining room. He thought about green bottles of wine growing cold in silver buckets of ice. He turned away from the hotel and walked home. He thought of his room with its horrible yellow wallpaper, the old bed with its ugly red cover. He shook his head. Soon he was walking down the street where he lived. All the houses on Cordelia Street were exactly alike. Middle-class businessmen had bought them for their families. All their children went to school and to church. They loved arithmetic. As Paul walked toward his house, he felt as if he were drowning in ugliness. He longed for cool colors and soft lights and fresh flowers. He didn't want to see his ugly bedroom or the cold bathroom with its cracked mirror and gray floor. Paul went around to the back of his father's house. He found an open window and climbed into the kitchen. Then he went downstairs to the basement. He was afraid of rats, but he did not want to face his own bedroom. Paul couldn't sleep. He sat on the floor and stared into the darkness until morning came. The following Sunday, Paul had to go to church with his family. Afterwards, everyone came home and ate a big dinner. Then all the people who lived on Cordelia Street came outside to visit each other. After supper... Paul asked his father if he could visit a friend to get some help with his arithmetic. Paul left the house with his school books under his arm, but he didn't go to his friend's house. Instead, he went to see Charlie Edwards. Charlie was a young actor. Paul liked to spend as much time as he could at the theater where Charlie Edwards and his group acted in their plays. It was only at the theater and the concert hall that Paul felt really alive. The moment he smelled the air of these places, he felt like a prisoner suddenly set free. As soon as he heard the concert hall orchestra play, he forgot all the ugly, unpleasant events in his own life. Paul had discovered that any kind of music awakened his imagination. Paul didn't want to become a musician, however. He didn't want to become an actor, either. 
He only wanted to be near people who were actors and musicians. He wanted to see the kind of life these artists led. Paul found the schoolroom even worse after a night at the theater or the concert hall. He hated the school's bare floors and cracked walls. He turned away from his dull teachers in their plain clothes. He tried to show them how little he thought of them and the studies they taught. He would bring photographs of all the actors he knew to school. He would tell the other students that he spent his evenings with these people at elegant restaurants. Then he would announce that he was going away to Europe or to California or to Egypt for a while. The next day he would come to school smiling nervously. His sister was ill, he would say, but he was still planning to make his trip next spring. Paul's problems at school became worse. Even after the meeting with his teachers, things did not get better. He told them he had no time to study grammar and arithmetic. He told them he had to help the actors in the theater. They were old friends of his. Finally, his teachers went to Paul's father. He took Paul out of school and made him get a job. He told the manager at the concert hall that Paul could not work there any more. His father warned the doorman at the theater not to let Paul into the place. And Charlie Edwards promised Paul's father not to see Paul again. All the actors at the theater laughed when they heard about the stories Paul had been telling. The women thought it was funny that Paul had told people he took them out to nice restaurants and sent them flowers. They agreed with the teachers and with his father that Paul's was a bad case. <laughs> The huge green warrior Tars Tarkas came slowly toward me with his thin sword. I backed away. I did not want to fight him. I did not wish his death. He had been as kind to me as a green Martian can be. As I stood watching him, a rifle fired in the distance. Then another. And another. Tars Tarkas and his warriors were under attack from another tribe of green warriors. Within seconds, a terrible battle raged. As I watched, three of the attackers fell on Tars Tarkas. He killed one and was fighting with the other two when he slipped and fell. I ran to his aid, swinging my sword. He was on his feet. Shoulder to shoulder, we fought against the attackers. They finally withdrew after an hour of fierce fighting. John Carter, I think I understand the meaning of the word friend. You saved my life when I was about to take yours. From this day, you are no longer a captive among our people, but a leader and great warrior among us. There was a smile on his face. Once again, he took off a metal band from his arm and gave it to me. I have a question for you, John Carter. I understand why you took the Red Woman with you. 
But why did Sola leave her people and go with you? She did not want to see me or the princess harmed. She does not like the great games held by your people where captives are led to die. She knows if she is caught, she too will die in the games. She told me she hates the games because her mother died there. What? How could she know her mother? She told me her mother was killed in the games because she had hidden the egg that produced her. Her mother hid Sola among other children before she was captured. Sola said she was a kind woman, not like others of your tribe. Tars Tarkas grew angry as I was speaking, but I could see past his anger. I could see pain in his eyes. I immediately knew Sola's great secret. I have a question for you, Tars Tarkas. Did you know Sola's mother? Yes, and if I could have, I would have prevented her death. I know this story to be true. I have always known the woman who died in those games had a child. I never knew the child. I do now. Sola is also my child. For three days we followed the trail left by the Princess Deja Torres, Sola, and poor ugly Wula. At last we could see them in the distance. Their animal could no longer be ridden. They were talking. When we came near, Wula turned to fight us. I slowly walked to him with my hand out. Sola was standing nearby. She was armed and prepared to fight. The princess was lying next to her feet. Sola, what is wrong with the princess? She has been crying much these past few days, John Carter. We believed you died so we could escape. The thought of your death was very heavy on this woman, my friend Deja Thoris. Come and tell her you are among the living. Perhaps that will stop her crying. I walked to where the Princess Deja Thoris was lying on the ground. She looked at me with eyes that were red from crying. Princess, you are no longer in danger. Tars Tarkas has come with me as a friend. He and his warriors will help to see you safely home. And Sola, I would have you greet your father, Tars Tarkas, a great leader among your people. Your secret no longer means death to anyone. He already knows you are his daughter. The two of you have nothing to fear. Sola turned and looked at Tars Tarkas. She held out her hand. He took it. It was a new beginning for them. I know our world has never before seen anyone like you, John Carter. Can it be that all Earthmen are like you? I was alone, a stranger, hunted, threatened, yet you would freely give your life to save me. You come to me now with a tribe of green warriors who offer their friendship. You are no longer a captive, but wear the medal of great rank among their people. No man has ever done this. Princess, I have done many strange things in my life, 
Many things much smarter men would not have done. And now, before my courage fails, I would ask you to be mine in marriage. She smiled at me for a moment, and then her dark eyes flashed in the evening light. You have no need of your courage, John Carter, because you already knew the answer before you asked the question. Several days later, we reached the city of Helium. At first, the red men of Helium thought we were an attacking army, but they soon saw their princess. We were greeted with great joy. Tars Tarkas and his green warriors caused the greatest excitement. This huge group of green warriors entered the city as friends and allies. I soon met Tardos Mors, the grandfather of Deja Thoris. He tried several times to thank me for saving the life of the princess, but tears filled his eyes and he could not speak. For nine years I served in the government and fought in the armies of Helium as a prince of the royal family. It was a happy time. The princess Deja Thoris and I were expecting a child. Then, one day, a soldier returned from a long flight. When he landed, he hurried to the great meeting room. Tardos Moors met with the soldier and reported that every creature on the planet had but three days to live. He said the great machines that produced the atmosphere on the planet had stopped producing oxygen. He said no one knew why this had happened, but there was nothing that could be done. The air grew thin within a day. Many people could do nothing but sleep. I watched as my princess was slowly dying. I had to try something. I could still move with great difficulty. I went to our airport and chose a fast aircraft. I flew as fast as I could to the building that produced the atmosphere of the planet. Workers were trying to enter. I tried to help. With a great effort, I opened a hole. I grew very weak. I asked one of the workers if he could start the engines. He said he would try. I fell asleep on the ground. It was dark when I opened my eyes again. My clothing felt stiff and strange. I sat up. I could see light from an opening. I walked outside. The land looked strange to me. I looked up to the sky and saw the red planet Mars. I was once again on Earth in the desert of Arizona. I cried out with deep emotion. Did the worker reach the machines to renew the atmosphere? Did the air reach the people of that planet in time to save them? Was my princess Deja Thoris alive, or did she lie cold in death? For ten years now, I have watched the night sky looking for an answer. I believe she and our child are waiting there for me. 
Something tells me that I shall soon know. Today, we complete the story, Rappaccini's Daughter. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Kay Gallant with the second and final part of Rappaccini's Daughter. Many years ago, a young man named Giovanni Guasconti left his home in Naples to study in northern Italy. He took a room in an old house next to a magnificent garden filled with strange flowers and other plants. The garden belonged to a doctor, Giacomo Rappaccini. He lived with his daughter Beatrice in a small brown house in the garden. From a window in his room, Giovanni had seen that Rappaccini's daughter was very beautiful but everyone in Padua was afraid of her father. Pietro Baglioni, a professor at the university, warned Giovanni about the mysterious Dr. Rappaccini. He is a great scientist, Professor Baglioni told the young man, but he is also dangerous. Rappaccini cares more about science than he does about people. He has created many terrible poisons from the plants in his garden. One day, Giovanni found a secret entrance to Rappaccini's garden. He went in. The plants all seemed wild and unnatural. Giovanni realized that Rappaccini must have created these strange and terrible flowers through his experiments. Suddenly, Rappaccini's daughter came into the garden. She moved quickly among the flowers until she reached him. Giovanni apologized for coming into the garden without an invitation, but Beatrice smiled at him and made him feel welcome. I see you love flowers, she said, and so you have come to take a closer look at my father's rare collection. While she spoke, Giovanni noticed a perfume in the air around her. He wasn't sure if this wonderful smell came from the flowers or from her breath. She asked him about his home and his family. She told him she had spent her life in this garden. Giovanni felt as if he were talking to a very small child. Her spirit sparkled like clear water. They walked slowly through the garden as they talked. At last, they reached a beautiful plant that was covered with large purple flowers. He realized that the perfume from those flowers was like the perfume of Beatrice's breath, but much stronger. The young man reached out to break off one of the purple flowers, but Beatrice gave a scream that went through his heart like a knife. She caught his hand and pulled it away from the plant with all her strength. Don't ever touch those flowers, she cried. They will take your life. Hiding her face, she ran into the house. Then Giovanni saw Dr. Rappaccini standing in the garden. That night, Giovanni could not stop thinking about how sweet and beautiful Beatrice was. Finally, he fell asleep. 
But when the morning came, he woke up in great pain. He felt as if one of his hands was on fire. It was the hand that Beatrice had grabbed in hers when he had reached for one of the purple flowers. Giovanni looked down at his hand. There was a purple mark on it that looked like four small fingers and a little thumb. But because his heart was full of Beatrice, Giovanni forgot about the pain in his hand. He began to meet her in the garden every day. At last, she told him that she loved him, but she would never let him kiss her or even hold her hand. One morning, several weeks later, Professor Baglioni visited Giovanni. I was worried about you, the older man said. You have not come to your classes at the university for more than a month. Is something wrong? Giovanni was not pleased to see his old friend. No, nothing is wrong. I am fine, thank you. He wanted Professor Barlioni to leave, but the old man took off his hat and sat down. My dear Giovanni, he said, you must stay away from Rappaccini and his daughter. Her father has given her poison from the time she was a baby. The poison is in her blood and on her breath. If Rappaccini did this to his own daughter, what is he planning to do to you? Giovanni covered his face with his hands. Oh, my God, he cried. Don't worry, the old man continued. It is not too late to save you, and we may succeed in helping Beatrice too. Do you see this little silver bottle? It holds a medicine that will destroy even the most powerful poison. Give it to your Beatrice to drink. Professor Baglioni put the little bottle on the table and left Giovanni's room. The young man wanted to believe that Beatrice was a sweet and innocent girl, and yet... Professor Baglioni's words had put doubts in his heart. It was nearly time for his daily meeting with Beatrice. As Giovanni combed his hair, he looked at himself in a mirror near his bed. He could not help noticing how handsome he was. His eyes looked particularly bright, and his face had a healthy, warm glow. He said to himself, At least her poison has not gotten into my body yet. As he spoke, he happened to look at some flowers he had just bought that morning. A shock of horror went through his body. The flowers were turning brown. Giovanni's face became very white as he stared at himself in the mirror. Then he noticed a spider crawling near his window. He bent over the insect and blew a breath of air at it. The spider trembled and fell dead. I am cursed, Giovanni whispered to himself. My own breath is poison. At that moment... A rich, sweet voice came floating up from the garden. Giovanni, you are late. Come down. You are a monster, Giovanni shouted as soon as he reached her. And with your poison you have made me into a monster too. I am a prisoner of this garden. Giovanni... Beatrice cried, looking at him with her large, bright eyes. Why are you saying these terrible things? It is true that I can never leave this 
garden, but you are free to go wherever you wish. Giovanni looked at her with hate in his eyes. Don't pretend that you don't know what you've done to me. A group of insects had flown into the garden. They came toward Giovanni and flew around his head. He blew his breath at them. The insects fell to the ground dead. Beatrice screamed, I see it! I see it! My father's science has done this to us. Believe me, Giovanni, I did not ask him to do this to you. I only wanted to love you. Giovanni's anger changed to sadness. Then he remembered the medicine that Professor Baglioni had given him. Perhaps the medicine would destroy the poison in their bodies and help them to become normal again. Dear Beatrice, he said, our fate is not so terrible. He showed her the little silver bottle and told her what the medicine inside it might do. I will drink first, she said. You must wait to see what happens to me before you drink it. She put Baglioni's medicine to her lips and took a small sip. At the same moment, Rappuccini came out of his house and walked slowly toward the two young people. He spread his hands out to them as if he were giving them a blessing. My daughter, he said, you are no longer alone in the world. Give Giovanni one of the purple flowers from your favorite plant. It will not hurt him now. My science and your love have made him different from ordinary men. My father, Beatrice said weakly, why did you do this terrible thing to your own child? Rappuccini looked surprised. What do you mean, my daughter? he asked. You have power no other woman has. You can defeat your strongest enemy with only a breath. Would you rather be a weak woman? I want to be loved, not feared, Beatrice replied. But now it does not matter. I am leaving you, father. I am going where the poison you have given me will do no harm. Goodbye to you, Giovanni. Beatrice dropped to the ground. She died at the feet of her father and Giovanni. The poison had been too much a part of the young woman. The medicine that destroyed the poison destroyed her as well. Our story today is called Paul's Case. It was written by Willa Cather. Paul's case will be told in two parts. Here is Kay Gallant with part one of the story. Paul hated school. He did not do his homework. He did not like his teachers. Paul's father did not know what to do with him. His teachers did not know either. One afternoon, all his teachers at Pittsburgh High School met together with him to discuss his case. Paul was late. When he entered the room, his teachers sat waiting for him. He was tall for his age and very thin. His clothes were too small for him, but they were clean. He had a bright red flower in the buttonhole of his black jacket. One of the teachers asked Paul why he had come to the meeting. Paul said politely that he wanted to do better in school. This was a lie. 
Paul often lied. His teachers began to speak. They had many complaints. One said Paul talked to the other students instead of paying attention to the lessons. Another said Paul always sat in class with his hands covering his eyes. A third teacher said Paul looked out the window instead of looking at her. His teachers attacked him without mercy. Paul's eyebrows moved up and down as his teacher spoke. His smile never left his face, but his fingers shook as he touched the flower on his coat. At last the meeting was over. Paul's smile got even wider. He bowed gracefully and left the room. His teachers were angry and confused. The art teacher spoke for all of them when he said there was something about Paul that he didn't understand. I don't think he really means to be bad, he said. There's just something wrong with that boy. Then the art teacher remembered one warm afternoon when Paul had fallen asleep in his class. Paul's face was white with thin blue veins under the skin. The boy's face looked tired and lined, like an old man's. His eyebrows moved up and down, even in his sleep. After he left the meeting, Paul ran down the hill from the school, whistling. He was late for his job at the concert hall. Paul was an usher there. He showed people to their seats. He carried messages for them. He brought them their programs with a polite bow. Everyone thought he was a charming boy and the best usher at the hall. When Paul reached the concert hall that evening, he went immediately to the dressing room. About six boys were already there, Paul began changing his clothes with excited hands. He loved his green uniform with the gold pockets and design. Paul rushed into the concert hall as soon as he had changed clothes. He ran up and down the hall, helping people. He became more and more excited. His face became pink and his eyes seemed larger and very bright. He looked almost handsome. At last, everyone was seated. The orchestra began to play, and Paul sat down with a sigh of relief. The music seemed to free something in Paul's spirit. Then a woman came out and began to sing. She had a rich, strong soprano voice. Paul felt truly happy for the first time that day. At the end of the concert, Paul went back to the dressing room. After he had changed his clothes again, he went outside the concert hall. He decided to wait for the singer to come out. While he waited, he looked across the street to the large hotel called the Shenley. All the important people stayed at the Shenley when they visited Pittsburgh. Paul had never been inside it, but he used to stand near the hotel's wide glass doors. He liked to watch the people enter and leave. He believed if he could only enter this kind of a hotel, he would be able to leave school, his teachers, and his ordinary gray life behind him forever. At last, the singer came out of the concert hall. Paul followed her as she walked to the hotel. He was part of a large crowd of admirers who had waited to see her. 
When they all reached the hotel, she turned and waved. Then the doors opened and she disappeared inside. Paul stared into the hotel as the doors slowly closed. He could feel the warm, sweet air inside. And for a moment, he felt part of a golden world of sparkling lights and marble floors. He thought about the mysterious dishes of food being served in the hotel's dining room. He thought about green bottles of wine growing cold in silver buckets of ice. He turned away from the hotel and walked home. He thought of his room with its horrible yellow wallpaper, the old bed with its ugly red cover. He shook his head. Soon he was walking down the street where he lived. All the houses on Cordelia Street were exactly alike. Middle-class businessmen had bought them for their families. All their children went to school and to church. They loved arithmetic. As Paul walked toward his house, he felt as if he were drowning in ugliness. He longed for cool colors and soft lights and fresh flowers. He didn't want to see his ugly bedroom or the cold bathroom with its cracked mirror and gray floor. Paul went around to the back of his father's house. He found an open window and climbed into the kitchen. Then he went downstairs to the basement. He was afraid of rats, but he did not want to face his own bedroom. Paul couldn't sleep. He sat on the floor and stared into the darkness until morning came. The following Sunday, Paul had to go to church with his family. Afterwards, everyone came home and ate a big dinner. Then all the people who lived on Cordelia Street came outside to visit each other. After supper... Paul asked his father if he could visit a friend to get some help with his arithmetic. Paul left the house with his school books under his arm, but he didn't go to his friend's house. Instead, he went to see Charlie Edwards. Charlie was a young actor. Paul liked to spend as much time as he could at the theater where Charlie Edwards and his group acted in their plays. It was only at the theater and the concert hall that Paul felt really alive. The moment he smelled the air of these places, he felt like a prisoner suddenly set free. As soon as he heard the concert hall orchestra play, he forgot all the ugly, unpleasant events in his own life. Paul had discovered that any kind of music awakened his imagination. Paul didn't want to become a musician, however. He didn't want to become an actor, either. He only wanted to be near people who were actors and musicians. He wanted to see the kind of life these artists led. Paul found the schoolroom even worse after a night at the theater or the concert hall. He hated the school's bare floors and cracked walls. He turned away from his dull teachers in their plain clothes. He tried to show them how little he thought of them and the studies they taught. He would bring photographs of all the actors he knew to school. He would tell the other students that he spent his evenings with these people at elegant restaurants. Then he would announce that he was going away to Europe or to California or to Egypt for a while. The next day, he would come to school smiling nervously. His sister was ill, he would say, but he was still planning to make his trip 
next spring. Paul's problems at school became worse. Even after the meeting with his teachers, things did not get better. He told them he had no time to study grammar and arithmetic. He told them he had to help the actors in the theater. They were old friends of his. Finally, his teachers went to Paul's father. He took Paul out of school and made him get a job. He told the manager at the concert hall that Paul could not work there any more. His father warned the doorman at the theater not to let Paul into the place. And Charlie Edwards promised Paul's father not to see Paul again. All the actors at the theater laughed when they heard about the stories Paul had been telling. The women thought it was funny that Paul had told people he took them out to nice restaurants and sent them flowers. They agreed with the teachers and with his father that Paul's was a bad case. <laughs> Our story today is called The Diamond Lens. It was written by Fitzjames O'Brien. We will tell the story in two parts. Now, here is Morris Joyce with part one of The Diamond Lens. <laughs> When I was ten years old, one of my older cousins gave me a microscope. The first time I looked through its magic lens, the clouds that surrounded my daily life rolled away. I saw a universe of tiny living creatures in a drop of water. Day after day, Night after night, I studied life under my microscope. The fungus that spoiled my mother's jam was, for me, a land of magic gardens. I would put one of those spots of green mold under my microscope and see beautiful forests where strange silver and golden fruit hung from the branches of tiny trees. I felt as if I had discovered another Garden of Eden. Although I didn't tell anyone about my secret world, I decided to spend my life studying the microscope. My parents had other plans for me. When I was nearly 20 years old, they insisted that I learn a profession. Even though we were a rich family, and I really didn't have to work at all. I decided to study medicine in New York. This city was far away from my family, so I could spend my time as I pleased. As long as I paid my medical school fees every year, my family would never know I wasn't attending any classes. In New York, I would be able to buy excellent microscopes and meet scientists from all over the world. I would have plenty of money and plenty of time to spend on my dream. I left home with high hopes. Two days after I arrived in New York, I found a place to live. It was large enough for me to use one of the rooms as my laboratory. I filled this room with expensive scientific equipment that I did not know how to use. 
but by the end of my first year in the city I had become an expert with the microscope. I also had become more and more unhappy. The lens in my expensive microscope was still not strong enough to answer my questions about life. I imagined there were still secrets in nature that the limited power of my equipment prevented me from knowing. I lay awake nights, wishing to find the perfect lens, an instrument of great magnifying power. Such a lens would permit me to see life in the smallest parts of its development. I was sure that a powerful lens like that could be built, and I spent my second year in New York trying to create it. I experimented with every kind of material. I tried simple glass, crystal, and even precious stones, but I always found myself back where I started. My parents were angry at the lack of progress in my medical studies. I had not gone to one class since arriving in New York. Also, I had spent a lot of money on my experiments. One day, while I was working in my laboratory, Jules Simon knocked at my door. He lived in the apartment just above mine. I knew he loved jewelry, expensive clothing, and good living. There was something mysterious about him, too. He always had something to sell, a painting, a rare statue, an expensive pair of lamps. I never understood why Simon did this. He didn't seem to need the money. He had many friends among the best families of New York. Simon was very excited as he came into my laboratory. Oh, my dear fellow, he gasped, I have just seen the most amazing thing in the world. He told me he had gone to visit a woman who had strange, magical powers. She could speak to the dead and read the minds of the living. To test her, Simon had written some questions about himself on a piece of paper. The woman, Madame Wolpes, had answered all of the questions correctly. Hearing about this woman gave me an idea. Perhaps she would be able to help me discover the secret of the perfect lens. Two days later, I went to her house. Madame Vulpes was an ugly woman with sharp, cruel eyes. She didn't say a word to me when she opened the door, but took me right into her living room. We sat down at a large, round table, and she spoke. What do you want from me? I want to speak to a person who died many years before I was born. Put your hands on the table. We sat there for several minutes. The room grew darker and darker, but Madame Vulpes did not turn on any lights. I began to feel a little silly. Then I felt a series of violent knocks they shook the table, the back of my chair, the floor, under my feet, and even the windows. Madame Vulpes smiled. They are very strong tonight. You are lucky. They want you to write down the name of the spirit you wish to talk to. I tore a piece of paper out of my notebook and wrote down a name. I didn't show it to Madame Vulpes. After a moment, Madame Vulpes' hand began to shake so hard 
the table moved. She said a spirit was now holding her hand and would write me a message. I gave her paper and a pencil. She wrote something and gave the paper to me. The message read, I am here. Question me. It was signed, Leeuwenhoek. I couldn't believe my eyes. The name was the same one I had written on my piece of paper. I was sure that an ignorant woman like Madame Wolpis would not know who Leeuwenhoek was. Why would she know the name of the man who invented the microscope? Quickly, I wrote a question on another piece of paper. How can I create the perfect lens? Leeuwenhoek wrote back, Find a diamond of 140 carats. Give it a strong electrical charge. The electricity will change the diamond's atoms. From that stone you can form the perfect lens. I left Madame Wolpe's house in a state of painful excitement. Where would I find a diamond that large? All my family's money could not buy a diamond like that, and even if I had enough money, I knew that such diamonds are very difficult to find. When I came home, I saw a light in Simon's window. I climbed the stairs to his apartment and went in without knocking. Simon's back was toward me as he bent over a lamp. He looked as if he were carefully studying a small object in his hands. As soon as he heard me enter, he put the object in his pocket. His face became red, and he seemed very nervous. What are you looking at? I asked. Simon didn't answer me. Instead, he laughed nervously and told me to sit down. I couldn't wait to tell him my news. Simon, I have just come from Madame Volpi's. She gave me some important information that will help me find the perfect lens. If only I could find a diamond that weighs 140 carats. My words seemed to change Simon into a wild animal. He rushed to a small table and grabbed a long, thin knife. No, he shouted, you won't get my treasure. I'll die before I give it to you. My dear Simon, I said, I don't know what you are talking about. I went to Madame Wolpe's to ask her for help with a scientific problem. She told me I needed an enormous diamond. You could not possibly own a diamond that large. If you did, you would be very rich, and you wouldn't be living here. He stared at me for a second, and then he laughed and apologized. Simon, I suggested, let us drink some wine and forget all this. I have two bottles downstairs in my apartment. What do you think? I like your idea, he said. I brought the wine to his apartment, and we began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very sleepy and very drunk. I felt as calm as ever, for I believed that I knew Simon's secret.
We present the short story, The Ransom of Red Chief, by O. Henry. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It looked like a good thing. But, wait till I tell you. We were down south, in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and myself, when this kidnapping idea struck us. There was a town down there as flat as a pancake and called Summit. Bill and I had about $600. We needed just $2,000 more for an illegal land deal in Illinois. We chose for our victim the only child of an influential citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. He was a boy of ten, with red hair. Bill and I thought that Ebenezer would pay a ransom of two thousand dollars to get his boy back, but wait till I tell you. About two miles from Summit was a little mountain covered with cedar trees. There was an opening on the back of the mountain. We stored our supplies in that cave. One night, we drove a horse and carriage past old Dorset's house. The boy was in the street throwing rocks at a cat on the opposite fence. Hey, little boy, says Bill. Would you like to have a bag of candy and a nice ride? The boy hits Bill directly in the eye with a piece of rock. That boy put up a fight like a wild animal, but at last we got him down in the bottom of the carriage and drove away. We took him up to the cave. The boy had two large bird feathers stuck in his hair. He points a stick at me and says, Ha! Pale face! Do you dare to enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains? He's all right now, says Bill, rolling up his pants and examining wounds on his legs. We're playing Indian. I'm old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive. I'm going to be scalped at daybreak by Geronimo. That kid can kick hard. Red Chief, says I to the boy, would you like to go home? Ah, oh, what for, says he. I don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, will you? Not right away, says I. We'll stay here in the cave for a while. All right, says he. That'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. We went to bed about eleven o'clock. Just at daybreak, I was awakened by a series of terrible screams from Bill. Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand holding his hair. In the other, he had a sharp knife. He was attempting to cut off the top of Bill's head based on what he had declared the night before. I got the knife away from the boy. But after that event, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. Do you think anybody will pay out money to get a little imp like that back home? Bill asked. Sure, I said. A boy like that is just the kind that parents love. Now, you and the chief get up and make something to eat while I go up on the top of this mountain and look around. I climbed to the top of the mountain. Over toward Summit, I expected to see the men of the village searching the countryside, but all was peaceful. Perhaps, says I to myself, 
It has not yet been discovered that the wolves have taken the lamb from the fold. I went back down the mountain. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the side of it. He was breathing hard, with the boy threatening to strike him with a rock. He put a red-hot potato down my back, explained Bill, and then crushed it with his foot. I hit his ears. Have you got a gun with you, Sam? I took the rock away from the boy and ended the argument. I'll fix you, says the boy to Bill. No man ever yet struck the Red Chief but what he got paid for it. You better be careful. After eating, the boy takes a leather object with strings tied around it from his clothes and goes outside the cave, unwinding it. Then we heard a kind of shout. It was Red Chief holding a sling in one hand. He moved it faster and faster around his head. Just then I heard a heavy sound and a deep breath from Bill. A rock, the size of an egg, had hit him just behind his left ear. Bill fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I pulled him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. Then I went out and caught that boy and shook him. If your behavior doesn't improve, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now are you going to be good or not? I was only funnin', says he. I didn't mean to hurt old Hank, but what did he hit me for? I'll behave if you don't send me home. I thought it best to send a letter to old man Dorset that day, demanding the ransom and telling how it should be paid. The letter said, We have your boy hidden in a place far from Summit. We demand fifteen hundred dollars for his return the money to be left at midnight tonight at the same place and in the same box as your answer. If you agree to these terms, send the answer in writing by a messenger tonight at half-past eight o'clock. After crossing Owl Creek, on the road to Poplar Cove, there are three large trees. At the bottom of the fence, opposite the third tree, will be a small box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to Summit. If you fail to agree to our demand, you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. I took the letter and walked over to Poplar Cove. I then sat around the post office and store. An old man there says he hears Summit is all worried because of Ebenezer Dorset's boy having been lost or stolen. That was all I wanted to know. I mailed my letter and left. The postmaster said the mail carrier would come by in an hour to take the mail on to Summit. At half past eight, I was up in the third tree, waiting for the messenger to arrive. 
Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up the road on a bicycle. He finds the box at the foot of the fence. He puts a folded piece of paper into it and leaves, turning back toward Summit. I slid down the tree, got the note, and was back at the cave in a half hour. I opened the note and read it to Bill. This is what it said. Gentlemen, I received your letter about the ransom you ask for the return of my son. I think you're a little high in your demands. I hereby make you a counter-proposal, which I believe you will accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me two hundred and fifty dollars, and I agree to take him off your hands. You had better come at night, because the neighbors believe he is lost, and I could not be responsible for what they would do to anybody they saw bringing him back. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the nerve! But I looked at Bill and stopped. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I ever saw on the face of a dumb or talking animal. Sam, says he, what's two hundred and fifty dollars after all? We've got the money. One more night of this boy will drive me crazy. I think Mr. Dorset is making us a good offer. You aren't going to let the chance go, are you? Tell you the truth, Bill, says I. This little lamb has got on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had bought him a gun, and we were going to hunt bears the next day. It was twelve o'clock when we knocked on Ebenezer's front door. Bill counted out two hundred and fifty dollars into Dorset's hand. When the boy learned we were planning to leave him at home, he started to cry loudly and held himself as tight as he could to Bill's leg. His father pulled him away, slowly. Uh, how long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, says old Dorset. But I think I can promise you ten minutes. Enough, says Bill. In ten minutes I shall cross the central, southern, and middle western states and be running for the Canadian border. And as dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good mile and a half out of summit before I could catch up with him. You have heard the American story... The Ransom of Red Chief by O. Henry. Your storyteller was Shep O'Neill. This story was adapted by Shelley Gullist. It was produced by Luan Davis. The Western American city of San Francisco, California, suffered a huge earthquake on April 18, 1906. More than 3,000 people are known to have died. The true number of dead will never be known. 250,000 people lost their homes. Just a few hours after the terrible earthquake, a magazine named Collier's sent a telegraph message to the famous American writer Jack London. They asked Mr. London to go to San Francisco and report about what he saw. He arrived in the city only a few hours after the earthquake. The report he wrote is called The Story of an Eyewitness. 
Here is Doug Johnson with the story. Not in history has a modern city been so completely destroyed. San Francisco is gone. Nothing remains of it but memories and a few homes that were near the edge of the city. Its industrial area is gone. Its business area is gone. Its social and living areas are gone. The factories, great stores and newspaper buildings, the hotels, and the huge homes of the very rich are all gone. Within minutes of the earthquake, the fires began. Within an hour, a huge tower of smoke caused by the fires could be seen a hundred miles away, and for three days and nights this huge fire moved in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. There was no opposing the flames. There was no organization, no communication. The earthquake had smashed all the modern inventions of a twentieth-century city. The streets were broken and filled with pieces of fallen walls. The telephone and telegraph systems were broken, and the great water pipes had burst. All inventions and safety plans of man had been destroyed by thirty seconds of movement by the earth. By Wednesday afternoon, only twelve hours after the earthquake, half the heart of the city was gone. I watched the huge fire. It was very calm. There was no wind, yet from every side wind was pouring in upon the city. East, west, north, and south, strong winds were blowing upon the dying city. The heated air made a huge wind that pulled air into the fire, rising into the atmosphere. Day and night the calm continued, and yet, near the flames, the wind was often as strong as a storm. There was no water to fight the fire. Firefighters decided to use explosives to destroy buildings in its path. They hoped this would create a block to slow or stop the fire. Building after building was destroyed. And still the great fires continued. Jack London told how people tried to save some of their possessions from the fire. Wednesday night, the whole city crashed and roared into ruin, yet the city was quiet. There were no crowds. There was no shouting and yelling. There was no disorder. I passed Wednesday night in the path of the fire. In all those terrible hours, I saw not one woman who cried, not one man who was excited, not one person who caused trouble. Throughout the night, tens of thousands of homeless ones fled the fire. Some were wrapped in blankets. Others carried bedding and dear household treasures. Many of the poor left their homes with everything they could carry. Many of their loads were extremely heavy. Throughout the night, they dropped items they could no longer hold. They left on the street clothing and treasures they had carried for miles. Many carried large boxes called trunks. They held on to these the longest. 
It was a hard night, and the hills of San Francisco are steep, and up these hills, mile after mile, were the trunks dragged. Many a strong man broke his heart that night. Before the march of the fire were soldiers. Their job was to keep the people moving away from the fire. The extremely tired people would arise and struggle up the steep hills, pausing from weakness every five or ten feet. Often, after reaching the top of a heartbreaking hill, they would find the fire was moving at them from a different direction. After working hour after hour through the night to save part of their lives, thousands were forced to leave their trunks and flee. At night, I walked down through the very heart of the city. I walked through mile after mile of beautiful buildings. Here was no fire. All was in perfect order. The police patrolled the streets, and yet it was all doomed, all of it. There was no water. The explosives were almost used up, and two huge fires were coming toward this part of the city from different directions. Four hours later, I walked through this same part of the city, Everything still stood as before, and yet there was a change. A rain of ashes was falling. The police had been withdrawn. There were no firemen, no fire engines, and no men using explosives. I stood at the corner of Kearney and Market Streets in the very heart of San Francisco. Nothing could be done. Nothing could be saved. The surrender was complete. It was impossible to guess where the fire would move next. In the early evening, I passed through Union Square. It was packed with refugees. Thousands of them had gone to bed on the grass. Government tents had been set up, food was being cooked, and the refugees were lining up for free meals. Late that night, I passed Union Square again. Three sides of the square were in flames. The square with mountains of trunks was deserted. The troops, refugees, and all had retreated. The next morning, I sat in front of a home on San Francisco's famous Knob Hill. With me sat Japanese, Italians, Chinese, and Negroes. All about were the huge homes of the very rich. To the east and south of us were advancing two huge walls of fire. I went inside one house and talked to the owner. He smiled and said the earthquake had destroyed everything he owned. All he had left was his beautiful house. He looked at me and said, The fire will be here in fifteen minutes. Outside the house, the troops were falling back and forcing the refugees ahead of them. From every side came the roaring of flames the crashing of walls, and the sound of explosives. Day was trying to dawn through the heavy smoke. A sickly light was creeping over the face of things. When the sun broke through the smoke, it was blood red and small. The smoke changed color from red to rose to purple. I walked past the broken dome of the City Hall building. This part of the city was already a waste of smoking ruins. 
Here and there through the smoke came a few men and women. It was like the meeting of a few survivors the day after the world ended. The huge fires continued to burn on. Nothing could stop them. Mr. London walked from place to place in the city, watching the huge fires destroy the city. Nothing could be done to halt the firestorm. In the end, the fire went out by itself because there was nothing left to burn. Jack London finishes his story. All day Thursday and all Thursday night, all day Friday and Friday night, the flames raged on. Friday night saw the huge fires finally conquered, but not before the fires had swept three quarters of a mile of docks and storehouses on the waterfront. San Francisco at the present time is like the center of a volcano. Around this volcano are tens of thousands of refugees. All the surrounding cities and towns are jammed with the homeless ones. The refugees were carried free by the railroads to any place they wished to go. It is said that more than 100,000 people have left the peninsula on which San Francisco stood. The government has control of the situation, and thanks to the immediate relief given by the whole United States, there is no lack of food. The bankers and businessmen have already begun making the necessary plans to rebuild this once beautiful city of San Francisco. Our story today is The Devil and Tom Walker. It was written by Washington Irving. Here is Shep O'Neill with our story. Before we begin our story, let us go back 300 years to the late 1600s. In those years, one of the most famous men in the world was Captain William Kidd. Captain Kidd was a pirate. He sailed the seas, capturing any ships he found. He and his men took money from these ships. Captain Kidd hid this money in different places. Captain Kidd was captured by the English in Boston, Massachusetts, and executed in the year 1701. From that time on, People all over the world searched in many places for Captain Kidd's stolen money. The people who lived in Massachusetts in the 1700s believed Captain Kidd buried some of his treasure near Boston. Not far from Boston was a small river which ran into the Atlantic Ocean. An old story said that Captain Kidd had come up this river from the ocean. Then he buried his gold and silver and jewels under a big tree. The story said that this treasure was protected by the devil himself, who was a good friend of Captain Kidd. In the year 1727, a man named Tom Walker lived near this place. 
Tom Walker was not a pleasant man. He loved only one thing, money. There was only one person worse than Tom. That was his wife. She also loved money. These two were so hungry for money that they even stole things from each other. One day, Tom Walker was returning home through a dark forest. He walked slowly and carefully so that he would not fall into a pool of mud. At last, he reached a piece of dry ground. Tom sat down on a tree that had fallen. As he rested, he dug into the earth with a stick. He knew the story that Indians had killed prisoners here as sacrifices to the devil. But this did not trouble him. The only devil Tom was afraid of was his wife. Tom's stick hit something hard. He dug it out of the earth. It was a human skull. In the skull was an Indian axe. Suddenly, Tom Walker heard an angry voice. Don't touch that skull. Tom looked up. He saw a giant sitting on a broken tree. Tom had never seen such a man. He wore the clothes of an Indian. His skin was almost black and covered with ashes. His eyes were big and red. His black hair stood up from his head. He carried a large axe. The giant asked, What are you doing on my land? But Tom Walker was not afraid. He answered, What do you mean? This land belongs to Mr. Peabody. The strange man laughed and pointed to the tall trees. Tom saw that one of the trees had been cut by an axe. He looked more closely and saw that the name Peabody had been cut into the tree. Mr. Peabody was a man who got rich by stealing from Indians. Tom looked at the other trees. Every one had the name of some rich, important man from Massachusetts. Tom looked at the tree on which he was sitting. It also had a name cut into it, the name of Absalom Croninshield. Tom remembered that Mr. Croninshield was a very rich man. People said he got his money, as Captain Kidd did, by stealing ships. Suddenly the giant shouted, Croninshield is ready to be burned. I'm going to burn many trees this winter. Tom told the man that he had no right to cut Mr. Peabody's trees. The stranger laughed and said, I have every right to cut these trees. This land belonged to me a long time before Englishmen came to Massachusetts. The Indians were here. Then you Englishmen killed the Indians. Now I show Englishmen how to buy and sell slaves, and I teach their women how to be witches. Tom Walker now knew that the giant was the devil himself. But Tom Walker was still not afraid. The giant said Captain Kidd had buried great treasures under the trees, but nobody could have them unless the giant permitted it. He said Tom could have these treasures, but Tom had to agree to give the giant what he demanded. 
Tom Walker loved money as much as he loved life, but he asked for time to think. Tom went home. He told his wife what had happened. She wanted Captain Kidd's treasure. She urged him to give the devil what he wanted. Tom said no. At last, Mrs. Walker decided to do what Tom refused to do. She put all her silver in a large piece of cloth and went to see the dark giant. Two days passed. She did not return home. She was never seen again. People said later that Tom went to the place where he had met the giant. He saw his wife's cloth hanging in a tree. He was happy because he wanted to get her silver. But when he opened the cloth, there was no silver in it, only a human heart. Tom was sorry he lost the silver, but not sorry he lost his wife. He wanted to thank the giant for this, and so every day he looked for the giant. Tom finally decided that he would give the giant what he wanted in exchange for Captain Kidd's treasure. One night, Tom Walker met the giant and offered his soul in exchange for Captain Kidd's treasure. The devil now wanted more than that. He said that Tom would have to use the treasure to do the devil's work. He wanted Tom to buy a ship and bring slaves to America. As we have said, Tom Walker was a hard man who loved nothing but money. But even he could not agree to buy and sell human beings as slaves. He refused to do this. The devil then said that his second most important work was lending money. The men who did this work for the devil forced poor people who borrowed money to pay back much more than they had received. Tom said he would like this kind of work. So the devil gave him Captain Kidd's treasure. A few days later, Tom Walker was a lender of money in Boston. Everyone who needed help, and there were many who did, came to him. Tom Walker became the richest man in Boston. When people were not able to pay him, he took away their farms, their horses, and their houses. As he got older and richer, Tom began to worry. What would happen when he died? He had promised his soul to the devil. Maybe, maybe he could break that promise. Tom then became very religious. He went to church every week. He thought that if he prayed enough, he could escape from the devil. One day, Tom took the land of a man who had borrowed money. The poor man asked for more time to pay. Please do not destroy me, he said. You have already taken all my money. Tom got angry and started to shout, Let the devil take me if I have taken any money from you. That was the end of Tom Walker, for just then he heard a noise. He opened the door. There was the black giant holding a black horse. The giant said, Tom, I have come for you. He picked up Tom and put him on the horse. Then he hit the horse, which ran off, carrying Tom. Nobody ever saw Tom Walker again. 
A farmer said that he saw the black horse, with a man on it, running wildly into the forest. After Tom Walker disappeared, the government decided to take Tom's property, but there was nothing to take. All the papers which showed that Tom owned land and houses were burned to ashes. His boxes of gold and silver had nothing in them but small pieces of wood. The wood came from newly cut trees. Tom's horses died, and his house suddenly burned to ashes. Our story today is called A Municipal Report. It was written by O. Henry and first published in 1904. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It was raining as I got off the train in Nashville, Tennessee. A slow gray rain. I was tired, so I went straight to my hotel. A big heavy man was walking up and down in the hotel lobby. Something about the way he moved made me think of a hungry dog looking for a bone. He had a big, fat, red face and a sleepy expression in his eyes. He introduced himself as Wentworth Caswell, Major Wentworth Caswell, from a fine southern family. Caswell pulled me into the hotel's barroom and yelled for a waiter. We ordered drinks. While we drank, he talked continually about himself, his family, his wife, and her family. He said his wife was rich. He showed me a handful of silver coins that he pulled from his coat pocket. By this time, I had decided that I wanted no more of him. I said good night. I went up to my room and looked out the window. It was ten o'clock, but the town was silent. A nice, quiet place, I said to myself as I got ready for bed. Just an ordinary, sleepy, southern town. I was born in the South myself but I live in New York now. I write for a large magazine. My boss had asked me to go to Nashville. The magazine had received some stories and poems from a writer in Nashville named Azalea Adair. The editor liked her work very much. The publisher asked me to get her to sign an agreement to write only for his magazine. I left the hotel at nine o'clock the next morning to find Miss Adair. It was still raining. As soon as I stepped outside, I met Uncle Caesar. He was a big old black man with fuzzy gray hair. Uncle Caesar was wearing the strangest coat I had ever seen. It must have been a military officer's coat. It was very long, and when it was new, it had been gray, but now rain, sun, and age had made it a rainbow of colors. Only one of the buttons was left. It was yellow, and as big as a fifty-cent coin. Uncle Caesar stood near a horse and carriage. He opened the carriage door and said softly, Step right in, sir. I'll take you anywhere in the city. I want to go to 861 Jasmine Street, I said, and I started to climb into the carriage. 
but the old man stopped me. Why do you want to go there, sir? What business is it of yours? I said angrily. Uncle Caesar relaxed and smiled. Nothing, sir, but it's a lonely part of town. Just step in and I'll take you there right away. 861 Jasmine Street had been a fine house once, but now it was old and dying. I got out of the carriage. That will be two dollars, sir, Uncle Caesar said. I gave him two one-dollar bills. As I handed them to him, I noticed that one had been torn in half and fixed with a piece of blue paper. Also, the upper right-hand corner was missing. Azalea Adair herself opened the door when I knocked. She was about fifty years old. Her white hair was pulled back from her small, tired face. She wore a pale yellow dress. It was old, but very clean. Azalea Adair led me into her living room. A damaged table, three chairs, and an old red sofa were in the center of the floor. Azalea Adair and I sat down at the table and began to talk. I told her about the magazine's offer. She told me about herself. She was from an old southern family. Her father had been a judge. Azalea Adair told me she had never traveled or even attended school. Her parents taught her at home with private teachers. We finished our meeting. I promised to return with the agreement the next day, and rose to leave. At that moment, someone knocked at the back door. Azalea Adair whispered a soft apology and went to answer the caller. She came back a minute later with bright eyes and pink cheeks. She looked ten years younger. You must have a cup of tea before you go, she said. She shook a little bell on the table, and a small black girl about twelve years old ran into the room. Azalea Adair opened a tiny old purse and took out a dollar bill. It had been fixed with a piece of blue paper, and the upper right-hand corner was missing. It was the dollar I had given to Uncle Caesar. Go to Mr. Baker's store, Impey, she said, and get me twenty-five cents worth of tea and ten cents worth of sugar cakes, and please hurry. The child ran out of the room. We heard the back door close. Then the girl screamed, her cry mixed with a man's angry voice. Azalea Adair stood up. Her face showed no emotion as she left the room. I heard the man's rough voice and her gentle one. Then a door slammed, and she came back into the room. I am sorry, but I won't be able to offer you any tea after all, she said. It seems that Mr. Baker has no more tea. Perhaps he will find some for our visit tomorrow. We said goodbye. I went back to my hotel. Just before dinner, Major Wentworth Caswell found me. It was impossible to avoid him. He insisted on buying me a drink and pulled two one-dollar bills from his pocket. Again, I saw a torn dollar fixed with blue paper with a corner missing. It was the one I gave Uncle Caesar. How strange, I thought. I wondered how Caswell got it. Uncle Caesar was waiting outside the hotel the next afternoon. He took me to Miss Adair's house and agreed to wait there until we had finished our business. Azalea Adair did not look well. I explained the agreement to her. She signed it. 
Then, as she started to rise from the table, Azalea Adair fainted and fell to the floor. I picked her up and carried her to the old red sofa. I ran to the door and yelled to Uncle Caesar for help. He ran down the street. Five minutes later, he was back with a doctor. The doctor examined Miss Adair and turned to the old black driver. Uncle Caesar, he said, run to my house and ask my wife for some milk and some eggs. Hurry. Then the doctor turned to me. She does not get enough to eat, he said. She has many friends who want to help her, but she is proud. Mrs. Caswell will accept help only from that old black man. He was once her family's slave. Mrs. Caswell, I said in surprise, I thought she was Azalea Adair. She was, the doctor answered, until she married Wentworth Caswell twenty years ago. But he's a hopeless drunk. He takes even the small amount of money that Uncle Caesar gives her. After the doctor left, I heard Caesar's voice in the other room. Did he take all the money I gave you yesterday, Mrs. Ilya? Yes, Caesar, I heard her answer softly. He took both dollars. I went into the room and gave Azalea a dare fifty dollars. I told her it was from the magazine. Then Uncle Caesar drove me back to the hotel. A few hours later I went out for a walk before dinner. A crowd of people was talking excitedly in front of a store. I pushed my way into the store. Major Caswell was lying on the floor. He was dead. Someone had found his body on the street. He had been killed in a fight. In fact, his hands were still closed into tight fists. But as I stood near his body, Caswell's right hand opened. Something fell from it and rolled near my feet. I put my foot on it, then picked it up and put it in my pocket. People said they believed a thief had killed him. They said Caswell had been showing everyone that he had fifty dollars, but when he was found he had no money on him. I left Nashville the next morning. As the train crossed a river, I took out of my pocket the object that had dropped from Caswell's dead hand. I threw it into the river below. It was a button, a yellow button, the one from Uncle Caesar's coat. <laughs> Our story is called The Diamond Lens. It was written by Fitzjames O'Brien. Today we will hear the second and final part of the story. Here is Morris Joyce with part two of The Diamond Lens. When I was a child, someone gave me a microscope. I spent hours looking through that microscope, exploring nature's tiny secrets. As I grew up, I became more interested in my microscope than in people. When I was twenty years old, my parents sent me to New York City to study medicine. I never went to any of my classes. 
Instead, I spent all my time and a lot of my money trying to build the perfect microscope. I wanted to make a powerful lens that would let me see even the smallest parts of life. But all my experiments failed. Then, one day, I met a young man who lived in the apartment above mine. Jules Simon told me about a woman who could speak to the dead. When I visited Madame Volpe's, she let me speak to the spirit of the man who invented the microscope. The spirit of Anton Leeuwenhoek told me how to make a perfect lens from a diamond of 140 carats. But where could I find a diamond that big? When I returned home, I went to Simon's apartment. He was surprised to see me and tried to hide a small object in his pocket. I wanted to discover what it was, so I brought two bottles of wine to his apartment. We began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very drunk. Simon, I know you have a secret. Why don't you tell me about it? Something in my voice must have made him feel safe. He made me promise to keep his secret. Then he took a small box from his pocket. When he opened it, I saw a large diamond, shaped like a rose, a pure white light seemed to come from deep inside the diamond. Simon told me he had stolen the diamond from a man in South America. He said it weighed exactly 140 carats. Excitement shook my body. I could not believe my luck. On the same evening that the spirit of Leeuwenhoek tells me the secret of the perfect lens, I find the diamond I need to create it. I decided to steal Simon's treasure. I sat across the table from him as he drank another glass of wine. I knew I could not simply steal the diamond. Simon would call the police. There was only one way to get the diamond. I had to kill Simon. Everything I needed to murder Simon was right there in his apartment. A bottle full of sleeping powder was on a table near his bed. A long, thin knife lay on the table. Simon was so busy looking at his diamond that I was able to put the drug in his glass quite easily. He fell asleep in fifteen minutes. I put his diamond in my pocket and carried Simon to the bed. I wanted to make the police think Simon had killed himself. I picked up Simon's long, thin knife and stared down at him. I tried to imagine exactly how the knife would enter Simon's heart if he were holding the knife himself. I pushed the knife deep into his heart. I heard a sound come from his throat, like the bursting of a large bubble. His body moved, and his right hand grabbed the handle of the knife. He must have died immediately. I washed our glasses and took the two wine bottles away with me. I left the lights on, closed the door, and went back to my apartment. Simon's death was not discovered until three o'clock the next day. One of the neighbors knocked at his door, and when there was no answer, she called the police. They discovered Simon's body on the bed. 
The police questioned everyone, but they did not learn the truth. The police finally decided Jules Simon had killed himself, and soon everyone forgot about him. I had committed the perfect crime. For three months after Simon's death, I worked day and night on my diamond lens. At last, the lens was done. My hands shook as I put a drop of water on a piece of glass. Carefully, I added some oil to the water to prevent it from drying. I turned on a strong light under the glass and looked through the diamond lens. For a moment, I saw nothing in that drop of water, and then I saw a pure white light. Carefully, I moved the lens of my microscope closer to the drop of water. Slowly, the white light began to change. It began to form shapes. I could see clouds and wonderful trees and flowers. These plants were the most unusual colors, bright reds, greens, purples, as well as silver and gold. The branches of these trees moved slowly in a soft wind. Everywhere I looked, I could see fruits and flowers of a thousand different colors. How strange, I thought, that this beautiful place has no animal life in it. Then I saw something moving slowly among the brightly colored trees and bushes. The branches of a purple and silver bush were gently pushed aside, and there, before my eye, stood the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She was perfect, pink skin, large blue eyes, and long golden hair that fell over her shoulders to her knees. She stepped away from the rainbow-colored trees. Like a flower, floating on water, she drifted through the air. Watching her move was like listening to the sound of tiny bells ringing in the wind. She went to the rainbow-colored trees and looked up at one of them. The tree moved one of its branches that was full of fruit. It lowered the branch to her, and she took one of the fruits. She turned it in her tiny hands and began to eat. How I wished I had the power to enter that bright light and float with her through those beautiful forests. Suddenly, I realized I had fallen in love with this tiny creature. I loved someone who would never love me back, someone who was a prisoner in a drop of water. I ran out of the room, threw myself on my bed, and cried till I fell asleep. Day after day, I returned to my microscope to watch her. I never left my apartment. I rarely even ate or slept. One day, as usual, I went to my microscope, ready to watch my love. She was there, but a terrible change had taken place. Her face had become thin, and she could hardly walk. The wonderful light in her golden hair and blue eyes was gone. At that moment, I would have given my soul to become as small as she and enter her world to help her. What was causing her to be so sick? She seemed in great pain. I watched her for hours, helpless, and alone with my breaking heart. She grew weaker and weaker. The forest also was changing. 
the trees were losing their wonderful colors. Suddenly, I realized I had not looked at the drop of water for several days. I had looked into it with the microscope, but not at it. As soon as I looked at the glass under the microscope, I understood the horrible truth. I had forgotten to add more oil to the drop of water to stop it from drying. The drop of water had disappeared. I rushed again to look through the lens. The rainbow forests were all gone. My love, lay in a spot of weak light. Her pink body was dried and wrinkled. Her eyes were black as dust. Slowly, she disappeared forever. I fainted and woke many hours later on pieces of my microscope. I had fallen on it when I fainted. My mind was as broken as the diamond lens. I crawled to my bed and withdrew from the world. When I finally got better, months later, all my money was gone. People now say I am crazy. They call me Linley, the mad scientist. No one believes I spoke to the spirit of Leeuwenhoek. They laugh when I tell them how I killed Jules Simon and stole his diamond to make the perfect lens? They think I never saw that beautiful world in a drop of water. But I know the truth of the diamond lens, and now so do you. Our story today is called The Birthmark. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Barbara Klein with the story. A long time ago, there lived a skillful scientist who had experienced a spiritual reaction more striking than any chemical one. He had left his laboratory in the care of his assistant, washed the chemicals from his hands, and asked a beautiful woman to become his wife. In those days, new scientific discoveries, such as electricity, seemed to open paths into the area of miracles. It was not unusual for the love of science to compete with the love of a woman. The scientist's name was Aylmer. He had so totally given himself to scientific studies that he could not be weakened by a second love. His love for his young wife could only be the stronger of the two if it could link itself with his love of science. Such a union did take place, with truly remarkable results. But one day, very soon after their marriage, Aylmer looked at his wife with a troubled expression. Georgiana, he said, have you ever considered that the mark upon your cheek might be removed? No, she said, smiling. But seeing the seriousness of his question, she said, The mark has so often been called a charm that I was simple enough to imagine it might be so. On another face it might, answered her husband, but not on yours. No, dear, 
Nature made you so perfectly that this small defect shocks me as being a sign of earthly imperfection. Shocks you? cried Georgiana, deeply hurt. Her face reddened, and she burst into tears. Then why did you marry me? You cannot love what shocks you. We must explain that in the center of Georgiana's left cheek, there was a mark deep in her skin. The mark was usually a deep red color. When Georgiana blushed, the mark became less visible. But when she turned pale, there was the mark like a red stain upon snow. The birthmark would come and go with the emotions in her heart. The mark was shaped like a very small human hand. Georgiana's past lovers used to say that the hand of a magical fairy had touched her face when she was born. Many a gentleman would have risked his life for the honor of kissing that mysterious hand. But other people had different opinions. Some women said the red hand quite destroyed the effect of Georgiana's beauty. Male observers who did not praise the mark simply wished it away so that they did not see it. After his marriage, Aylmer discovered that this was the case with himself. Had Georgiana been less beautiful, he might have felt his love increased by the prettiness of that little hand. But because she was otherwise so perfect, he found the mark had become unbearable. Aylmer saw the mark as a sign of his wife's eventual sadness, sickness, and death. Soon, the birthmark caused him more pain than Georgiana's beauty had ever given him pleasure. During a period that should have been their happiest, Aylmer could only think of this disastrous subject. With the morning light, Aylmer opened his eyes upon his wife's face and recognized the sign of imperfection. When they sat together in the evening near the fire, he would look at the mark. Georgiana soon began to fear his look. His expression would make her face go pale and the birthmark would stand out like a red jewel on white stone. Do you remember, dear Aylmer, about the dream you had last night about this hateful mark? She asked with a weak smile. None! None whatever, answered Aylmer, surprised. The mind is in a sad state when sleep cannot control its ghosts and allows them to break free with their secrets. Aylmer now remembered his dream. He had imagined himself with his assistant, Aminadab, trying to remove the birthmark with an operation. But the deeper his knife went, the deeper the small hand sank until it had caught hold of Georgiana's heart. Aylmer felt guilty remembering the dream. Aylmer, said Georgiana, I do not know what the cost would be to both of us to remove this birthmark. Removing it could deform my face or damage my health. Dearest Georgiana, 
I have spent much thought on the subject, said Aylmer. I am sure it can be removed. Then let the attempt be made at any risk, said Georgiana. Life is not worth living while this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror. You have deep science and have made great discoveries. Remove this little mark for the sake of your peace and my own. Dearest wife, cried Aylmer, do not doubt my power. I am ready to make this cheek as perfect as its pair. Her husband gently kissed her right cheek, the one without the red hand. The next day, the couple went to Aylmer's laboratory, where he had made all his famous discoveries. Georgiana would live in a beautiful room he had prepared nearby while he worked tirelessly in his lab. One by one, Aylmer tried a series of powerful experiments on his wife, but the mark remained. Georgiana waited in her room. She read through his notebooks of scientific observations. She could not help see that many of his experiments had ended in failure. She decided to see for herself the scientist at work. The first thing that struck Georgiana when entering the laboratory was the hot furnace. From the amount of soot above it, it seemed to have been burning for ages. She saw machines, tubes, cylinders, and other containers for chemical experiments. What most drew her attention was Aylmer himself. He was nervous and pale as death as he worked on preparing a liquid. Georgiana realized that her husband had been hiding his tension and fear. Think not so little of me that you cannot be honest about the risks we are taking, she said. I will drink whatever you make for me, even if it is a poison. My dear, nothing shall be hidden, Aylmer said. I have already given you chemicals powerful enough to change your entire physical system. Only one thing remains to be tried, and if that fails, we are ruined. He led her back to her room, where she waited once more, alone with her thoughts. She hoped that for just one moment she could satisfy her husband's highest ideals, but she realized then that his mind would forever be on the march, always requiring something newer, better, and more perfect. Hours later, Aylmer returned carrying a crystal glass with a colorless liquid. The chemical process went perfectly, he said. Unless all my science has tricked me, it cannot fail. To test the liquid, he placed a drop in the soil of a dying flower growing in a pot in the room. In a few moments, the plant became healthy and green once more. I do not need proof. Georgiana said quietly. Give me the glass. I'm happy to put my life in your hands. She drank the liquid and immediately fell asleep. Aylmer sat next to his wife, observing her and taking notes. He noted everything, her breathing, the movement of an eyelid. He stared at the birthmark. And slowly, with every breath that came and went, 
it lost some of its brightness. By heaven, it's nearly gone, said Aylmer. Success, success! He opened the window coverings to see her face in daylight. She was so pale. Georgiana opened her eyes and looked into the mirror her husband held. She tried to smile as she saw the barely visible mark. My poor Aylmer, she said gently, you have aimed so high. With so high and pure a feeling, you have rejected the best the earth could offer. I am dying, dearest. It was true. The hand on her face had been her link to life. As the last trace of color disappeared from her cheek, she gave her last breath. Blinded by a meaningless imperfection and an impossible goal, Aylmer had thrown away her life and with it his chance for happiness. In trying to improve his lovely wife, he had failed to realize she had been perfect all along. Our story today is called The Lady in Black. It was written by Eleanor H. Porter. Here is Faith Lapidus with the story. The house was very still. In the little room over the porch, the Lady in Black sat alone. Near her, a child's white dress lay across a chair. On the floor at her feet, lay a tiny pair of shoes. A doll hung over a chair, and a toy soldier occupied the little stand by the bed. And everywhere was silence, the strange silence that comes only to a room where the clock has stopped ticking. The clock stood on the shelf near the end of the bed. The lady in black looked at it, she remembered the wave of anger that had come over her when she had reached out her hand and silenced the clock that night three months before. It had been silent ever since, and it should remain silent, too. Of what possible use were the hours it would tick away now, as if anything mattered, with little Kathleen lying out there white and still under the black earth. Mother! The lady in black moved restlessly and looked toward the closed door. Behind it, she knew, was a little boy with wide blue eyes who wanted her. But she wished he would not call her by that name. It only reminded her of those other little lips, silent now. Mother! The voice was more demanding. The lady in black did not answer. He might go away, she thought, if she did not answer. There was a short silence, and then the door opened slowly. Peek! It was a cry of joyful discovery, but it was followed almost immediately by silence. The unsmiling woman did not invite him to come near. The boy was unsteady at his first step. He paused, then spoke carefully. Eyes here? It was maybe the worst thing he could have said. To the lady in black, it was a yet more painful reminder of that other one who was not there. She gave a sharp cry and covered her face with her hands. Bobby! 
Bobby, she cried out in a release of unreasoning sadness. Go away, go away. I want to be alone, alone. All the brightness fled from the boy's face. His eyes showed a feeling of deep hurt. He waited, but she did not move. Then, with a half-quieted cry, he left the room. Long minutes afterward, the lady in black raised her head and saw him through the window. He was in the yard with his father, playing under the apple tree. Playing! The lady in black looked at them with serious eyes, and her mouth hardened at the corners. Bobby had someone to play with him, someone to love him and care for him, while out there on the hillside, Kathleen was alone, all alone. With a little cry, the lady in black sprang to her feet and hurried into her own room. Her hands shook as she pinned on her hat and covered herself with her black veil. But her step was firm as she walked downstairs and out through the hall. The man under the apple tree rose hurriedly and came forward. Helen, dearest, not again today, he begged. Darling, it can't do any good. But she's alone, all alone. You don't seem to think. No one thinks. No one knows how I feel. You don't understand. If you did, you'd come with me. You wouldn't ask me to stay here, choked the woman. I have been with you, dear, said the man gently. I've been with you today and every day, almost since since she left us. But it can't do any good, this continuous mourning over her grave. It only makes more sadness for you, for me, and for Bobby. Bobby is here, you know, dear. No, no, don't say it, cried the woman wildly. You don't understand. You don't understand. And she turned and hurried away, followed by the worried eyes of the man and the sad eyes of the boy. It was not a long walk to the burial place. The lady in black knew the way, yet she stumbled and reached out blindly. She fell before a little stone marked Kathleen. Near her, a gray-haired woman, with her hands full of pink and white roses, watched her sympathetically. The gray-haired woman paused and opened her lips as if she would speak. Then she turned slowly and began to arrange her flowers on a grave nearby. The lady in black raised her head. For a time she watched in silence. Then she threw back her veil and spoke. "'You care, too,' she said softly. "'You understand.' I've seen you here before, I'm sure. And was yours a little girl? The gray-haired woman shook her head. No, dearie, it's a little boy. Or he was a little boy forty years ago. Forty years? So long. How could you have lived forty years without him? Again the little woman shook her head. One has to... Sometimes, dearie, but this little boy wasn't mine. But you care, you understand. I've seen you here so often before. Yes, you see, there's no one else to care. But 
there was once, and I'm caring now for her sake. For her? His mother. Oh! It was a tender little cry, full of quick sympathy. The eyes of the lady in black were on the stone marked Kathleen. It ain't as if I didn't know how she'd feel, said the gray-haired woman. You see, I was nurse to the boy when it happened, and for years afterward I worked in the family, so I know. I saw the whole thing from the beginning, from the very day when the little boy here met with the accident. Accident? It was a cry of concern and sympathy from Kathleen's mother. Yes, it was a runaway, and he didn't live two days. I know, I know, choked the lady in black. Yet she was not thinking of the boy and the runaway horse accident. Things stopped then for my mistress, and that was the beginning of the end. She had a husband and a daughter, but they didn't seem to be important, not either of them. Nothing seemed important except this little grave out here. She came and spent hours over it, bringing flowers and talking to it. The lady in black raised her head suddenly and quickly looked into the woman's face. The woman went on speaking. The house got sadder and sadder. She didn't seem to mind. She seemed to want it so. She shut out the sunshine and put away many of the pictures. She sat only in the boy's room, and there everything was just as it was when he left it. She wouldn't let a thing be touched. I wondered afterward that she didn't see where it was all leading to, but she didn't. Leading to? The voice shook. Yeah, I wondered she didn't see she was losing em, that husband and daughter, but she didn't see it. The lady in black sat very still. Even the birds seemed to have stopped their singing. Then the gray-haired woman spoke. So, you see, that's why I come and put flowers here. It's for her. There's no one else now to care, she sighed rising to her feet. "'But you haven't told yet what happened,' said the lady in black, softly. "'Oh, I don't know myself, really. I know the man went away. He got something to do traveling, so he wasn't home much. When he did come, he looked sick and bad. He come less and less, and, and he died. But that was after she died.' He's buried over there beside her and the boy. The girl, well, nobody knows where the girl is. Girls like flowers and sunshine and laughter and and young people, you know. And she didn't get any of them at home. So she went where she did get them, I suppose. There, and if I haven't gone and tired you all out with my talking said the little gray-haired woman regretfully. No, no, I was glad to hear it, said the lady in black, rising unsteadily to her feet. Her face had grown white, and her eyes showed a sudden fear. But I must go now. Thank you. And she turned and hurried away. The house was very still, when the lady in black reached home. She shivered at its silence. She hurried up the stairs, almost with guilt. In her own room, she pulled at the dark veil that covered her face. She was crying now, a choking little cry with broken words running through it. She was still crying as she removed her black dress. Long minutes later, the lady, in black no longer, moved slowly down the stairway. Her eyes showed traces of tears, but her lips were bravely curved in a smile. 
She wore a white dress and a single white rose in her hair. Behind her, in the little room over the porch, a tiny clock ticked loudly on its shelf near the end of the bed. There came a sound of running feet in the hall below. Then, Mother! It's Mother! Come back! shouted a happy voice. And with a little sobbing cry, Bobby's mother opened her arms to her son. Our story today is called To Build a Fire. It was written by Jack London. Here is Harry Monroe with the story. The man walked down the trail on a cold gray day. Pure white snow and ice covered the earth for as far as he could see. This was his first winter in Alaska. He was wearing heavy clothes and fur boots, but he still felt cold and uncomfortable. The man was on his way to a camp near Henderson Creek. His friends were already there. He expected to reach Henderson Creek by six o'clock that evening. It would be dark by then. His friends would have a fire and hot food ready for him. A dog walked behind the man. It was a big gray animal, half dog and half wolf. The dog did not like the extreme cold. It knew the weather was too cold to travel. The man continued to walk down the trail. He came to a frozen stream called Indian Creek. He began to walk on the snow-covered ice. It was a trail that would lead him straight to Henderson Creek and his friends. As he walked, he looked carefully at the ice in front of him. Once he stopped suddenly, and then walked around a part of the frozen stream. He saw that an underground spring flowed under the ice at that spot. It made the ice thin. If he stepped there, he might break through the ice into a pool of water. To get his boots wet in such cold weather might kill him. His feet would turn to ice quickly. He could freeze to death. At about twelve o'clock, the man decided to stop to eat his lunch. He took off the glove on his right hand. He opened his jacket and shirt and pulled out his bread and meat. This took less than twenty seconds, yet his fingers began to freeze. He hit his hand against his leg several times until he felt a sharp pain. Then he quickly put his glove on his hand. He made a fire, beginning with small pieces of wood and adding larger ones. He sat on a snow-covered log and ate his lunch. He enjoyed the warm fire for a few minutes. Then he stood up and started walking on the frozen stream again. A half hour later, it happened. At a place where the snow seemed very solid, the ice broke. The man's feet sank into the water. It was not deep, but his legs got wet to the knees. 
The man was angry. The accident would delay his arrival at the camp. He would have to build a fire now to dry his clothes and boots. He walked over to some small trees. They were covered with snow. In their branches were pieces of dry grass and wood left by floodwaters earlier in the year. He put several large pieces of wood on the snow under one of the trees. On top of the wood, he put some grass and dry branches. He pulled off his gloves, took out his matches, and lighted the fire. He fed the young flame with more wood. As the fire grew stronger, he gave it larger pieces of wood. He worked slowly and carefully. At sixty degrees below zero, a man with wet feet must not fail in his first attempt to build a fire. While he was walking, his blood had kept all parts of his body warm. Now that he had stopped, cold was forcing his blood to withdraw deeper into his body. His wet feet had frozen. He could not feel his fingers. His nose was frozen, too. The skin all over his body felt cold. Now, however, his fire was beginning to burn more strongly. He was safe. He sat under the tree and thought of the old men in Fairbanks. The old men had told him that no man should travel alone in the Yukon when the temperature is sixty degrees below zero. Yet here he was. He had had an accident. He was alone. And he had saved himself. He had built a fire. Those old men were weak, he thought. A real man could travel alone. If a man stayed calm, he would be all right. The man's boots were covered with ice. The strings on his boots were as hard as steel. He would have to cut them with his knife. He leaned back against the tree to take out his knife. Suddenly, without warning, a heavy mass of snow dropped down. His movement had shaken the young tree only a tiny bit, but it was enough to cause the branches of the tree to drop their heavy load. The man was shocked. He sat and looked at the place where the fire had been. The old man had been right, he thought. If he had another man with him, he would not be in any danger now. The other man could build the fire. Well, it was up to him to build the fire again. This time he must not fail. The man collected more wood. He reached into his pocket for the matches. But his fingers were frozen. He could not hold them. He began to hit his hands with all his force against his legs. After a while, feeling came back to his fingers. The man reached again into his pocket for the matches. But the tremendous cold quickly drove the life out of his fingers. All the matches fell onto the snow. He tried to pick one up, but failed. The man pulled on his glove, 
and again beat his hand against his leg. Then he took the gloves off both hands and picked up all the matches. He gathered them together. Holding them with both hands, he scratched the matches along his leg. They immediately caught fire. He held the blazing matches to a piece of wood. After a while, he became aware that he could smell his hands burning. Then he began to feel the pain. He opened his hands, and the blazing matches fell onto the snow. The flame went out in a puff of gray smoke. The man looked up. The dog was still watching him. The man got an idea. He would kill the dog, and bury his hands inside its warm body. When the feeling came back to his fingers, he could build another fire. He called to the dog. The dog. Heard danger in the man's voice. It backed away. The man called again. This time the dog came closer. The man reached for his knife. But he had forgotten that he could not bend his fingers. He could not kill the dog. Because he could not hold his knife, the fear of death came over the man. He jumped up and began to run. The running began to make him feel better. Maybe running would make his feet warm. If he ran far enough, he would reach his friends at Henderson Creek. They would take care of him. It felt strange to run and not feel his feet when they hit the ground. He fell several times. He decided to rest a while. As he lay in the snow, he noticed that he was not shaking. He could not feel his nose, or fingers, or feet. Yet he was feeling quite warm. And comfortable, he realized he was going to die. Well, he decided he might as well take it like a man. There were worse ways to die. The man closed his eyes, and floated into the most comfortable sleep he had ever known. The dog sat facing him, waiting. Finally, the dog moved closer to the man, and caught the smell of death. The animal threw back its head. It let out a long, soft cry, to the cold stars, in the black sky. And then, it turned. And ran toward Henderson Creek, where it knew there was food, and a fire. Our story today is called Benito Sereno. It was written by Herman Melville. We will tell this story in three parts. Here is Shep O'Neill with part one of Benito Sereno. Captain Benito Sereno hurried aboard his ship. It was ready to sail. A bright sun and a soft breeze promised good weather ahead. 
the ship's anchor was raised, and the San Dominique, old but still seaworthy, moved slowly out of the harbor of Valparaiso, on the west coast of Chile. It was carrying valuable products and slaves up the Pacific coast to Callao, another Spanish colonial port near Lima, Peru. The slaves, both male and female, slept on deck. They were not chained because their owner, Don Alejandro, said they were peaceful. The San Dominique moved steadily forward under a clear sky. The weather showed no sign of change. Day after day, the soft breeze kept the ship on course toward Peru. Slave traffic between Spain's colonial ports in this year of 1799 had been steady, but there were few outbreaks of violence. What happened, therefore, on board the San Dominique could not have been expected. On the seventh day out, before daybreak, the slaves rose up in rebellion. They swept through the ship with handspikes and hatchets, moving with the fury of desperate men. The attack was a complete surprise. Few of the crew were awake. All hands, except the two officers on the watch, lay in a deep, untroubled sleep. The rebels sprang upon the two officers and left them half dead. Then, one by one, they killed eighteen of the sleeping crew. They threw some overboard alive. A few hid and escaped death. The rebels tied up seven others, but left them alive to navigate the ship. As the day began to break, Captain Sereno came slowly, carefully, up the steps toward the chief rebel leader, Babo, and begged for mercy. He promised to follow Babbo's commands if he would only put an end to the killings. But this had no effect. Babbo had three men brought up on deck and tied. Then the three Spaniards were thrown overboard. Babbo did this to show his power and authority, that he was in command. Babo, however, promised not to kill Captain Sereno, but everything he said carried a threat. He asked the captain if in these seas there were any Negro countries. None, Sereno answered. Then take us to Senegal, or the neighboring island of St. Nicholas. Captain Sereno was shaken. That is impossible, he said. It would mean going around Cape Horn, and this ship is in no condition for such a voyage, and we do not have enough supplies or sails or water. Take us there anyway, Babo answered sharply showing little interest in such details. If you refuse, we will kill every white man on board. Captain Sereno knew he had no choice. He told the rebel leader that the most serious problem in making such a long voyage was water. Babo said they should sail to the island of Santa Maria, near the southern end of Chile. He knew that no one lived on the island, but water and supplies could be found there. He forced Captain Sereno to keep away from any port. He threatened to kill him 
the moment he saw him start to move toward any city, town, or settlement on shore. Sereno had to agree to sail to the island of Santa Maria. He still hoped that he might meet along the way, or at the island itself, a ship that could help him. Perhaps, who knows, he might find a boat on the island and be able to escape to the nearby coast of Arruco. Hope was all he had left, and that was getting smaller each day. Captain Sereno steered south for Santa Maria. The voyage would take weeks. Eight days after the ship turned south, Babo told Captain Sereno that he was going to kill Don Alejandro, owner of the slaves on board. He said it had to be done. Otherwise, he and the other slaves could never be sure of their freedom. He refused to listen to the captain's appeals and ordered two men to pull Don Alejandro up from below and kill him on deck. It was done as ordered. Three other Spaniards were brought up and thrown overboard. Babo warned Sereno and the other Spaniards that each one of them would go the same way if any of them gave the smallest cause for suspicion. Sereno decided to do everything possible to save the lives of those remaining. He agreed to carry the rebels safely to Senegal if they promised peace and no further bloodshed. And he signed a document that gave the rebels ownership of the ship and its cargo. Later, as they sailed down the long coast of Chile, the wind suddenly dropped the ship drifted into a deep calm. For days it lay still in the water. The heat was fierce, the suffering intense. There was little water that made matters worse. Some of those on board were driven mad. A few died. The pressure and tension made many violent and they killed a Spanish officer. After a time, a breeze came up and set the ship free again, and it continued south. The voyage seemed endless. The ship sailed for weeks with little water on board. It moved through days of good weather and periods of bad weather. There were times when it sailed under heavy skies, and times when the wind dropped and the ship lay becalmed in lifeless air. The crew seemed half dead. At last, one evening in the month of August, the San Dominique reached the lonely island of Santa Maria. It moved slowly toward one of the island's bays to drop anchor. Not far off lay an American ship, and the sight of the ship caught the rebels by surprise. The slaves became tense and fearful. They wanted to sail away quickly, but their leader, Babo, opposed such a move. Where could they go? Their water and food were low. He succeeded in bringing them under control and in quieting their fears. He told them they had nothing to fear, and they believed him. Then he ordered everyone to go to work, to clean the decks, and put the ship in proper and good condition so that no visitor would suspect anything was wrong. Later, he spoke to Captain Sereno, warning him that he would kill him 
if he did not do as he was told. He explained in detail what Sereno was to do and say if any stranger came on board. He held a dagger in his hand, saying it would always be ready for any emergency. The American vessel was a large trade ship and seal hunter, commanded by Captain Amasa Delano. He had stopped at Santa Maria for water. On the American ship, shortly after sunrise, an officer woke Captain Delano and told him a strange sail was coming into the bay. The captain quickly got up, dressed, and went up on deck. Captain Delano raised his spyglass and looked closely at the strange ship coming slowly in. He was surprised that there was no flag. A ship usually showed its flag when entering a harbor where another ship lay at anchor. As the ship got closer, Captain Delano saw it was damaged. Many of its sails were ripped and torn. A mast was broken, and the deck was in disorder. Clearly, the ship was in trouble. The American captain decided to go to the strange vessel and offer help. He ordered his whaleboat put into the water and had his men bring up some supplies and put them in the boat. Then they set out toward the mystery ship. As they approached, Captain Delano was shocked at the poor condition of the ship. He wondered what could have happened, and what he would find. Today we continue the story, Benito Sereno. It was written by Herman Melville. Last week, we told how African slaves on a Spanish ship rebelled in 1799. They killed most of the Spanish sailors. Only the captain, Benito Sereno, and a few others were left alive. The leader of the rebellion was a slave named Babo. He ordered Captain Sereno to sail the ship back to Senegal, the slave's homeland. But food and water were low, so the ship stopped at an island off the coast of Chile to get the needed supplies. When it arrived, an American ship was in the harbor. The American captain Amasa Delano thought the Spanish ship might be in trouble. He would offer help. Babo decided to remain close to Captain Sereno and act as if he were the captain's slave. Babo would kill him if he told Captain Delano the truth about what happened. Now, here is Shep O'Neill to continue our story. As Captain Delano came up in his whaleboat, he saw that the other ship needed scraping, tarring, and brushing. It looked old and decayed. He climbed up the side and came aboard. He was quickly surrounded by a crowd of black men. Captain Delano looked around for the man who commanded the ship. The Spanish captain stood a little way off, against the main mast. He was young-looking, richly dressed, but seemed troubled and tired with the spirit gone out of him. He looked unhappily toward his American visitor. At the Spanish captain's side stood a small black man, 
with a rough face. Captain Delano struggled forward through the crowd, went up to the Spaniard, and greeted him. He offered to help him in any way he could. Captain Benito Sereno returned the American's greeting, politely, but without warmth. Captain Delano pushed his way back through the crowd to the gangway. He told his men to go and bring back as much water as they could, also bread, pumpkins, sugar, and a dozen of his private bottles of cider. The whale boat pushed off. Left alone, Captain Delano again observed with fresh surprise the general disorder aboard the ship. Some of the men were fighting. There were no deck officers to discipline or control the violent ones, and everyone seemed to do as he pleased. Captain Delano could not fully understand how this could have happened. What could explain such a breakdown of order and responsibility? He asked Don Benito to give him the full story of his ship's misfortunes. Don Benito did not answer. He just kept looking at his American visitor as if he heard nothing. This angered Captain Delano who suddenly turned away and walked forward to one of the Spanish seamen for his answer. But he had hardly gone five steps when Don Benito called him back. It is now a hundred and ninety days, Don Benito began, that the ship sailed from Buenos Aires for Lima with a general cargo pedigree, tea, and the like, and a number of negroes, now not more than a hundred and fifty, as you see, but then numbering over three hundred souls. The ship was officered, and well manned, with several cabin passengers, some fifty Spaniards in all. Off Cape Horn we had heavy gales. Captain Sereno coughed suddenly and almost collapsed. He fell heavily against his body servant. His mind wanders, said Babo. He was thinking of the disease that followed the gales, my poor, poor master. Be patient, senor. These attacks do not last long. Master will soon be himself. Don Benito recovered, and in a broken voice continued his story. My ship was tossed about many days in storms off Cape Horn, and then... There was an outbreak of scurvy. The disease carried off many whites and blacks. Most of my surviving seamen had become so sick that they could not handle the sails well. For days and nights we could not control the ship. It was blown northwestward. The wind suddenly left us in unknown waters with oppressive hot calms. Most of our water was gone, and we suffered terribly, especially after a deadly fever broke out among us. Whole families of blacks and many Spaniards including every officer but myself, were killed by the disease. Don Benito paused. 
He looked down at the black man at his side. Babo seemed satisfied. The Spanish captain saw him take his hand from the knife, hidden under his shirt. Captain Delano saw nothing. His mind was filled with the terrible tale he had just heard. Now he could understand why the other captain seemed so shaken. He took Don Benito's hand and promised to give him all the help possible. He would give him a large, permanent supply of water and some sails and equipment for sailing the ship. And he also promised to let Don Benito have three of his best seamen for temporary deck officers. In this way, the San Dominique could, without delay, start for Concepcion. There, the ship could be fixed and prepared for its voyage to Lima. Don Benito's face lighted up. He seemed excited by Captain Delano's generous offer. But Babo appeared troubled. This excitement is bad for Master, Babo whispered, taking Don Benito's arm and with soothing words gently drawing him aside. When Don Benito returned, Captain Delano observed that his excitement was gone. Captain Delano decided to talk of other matters, but the Spanish captain showed no further interest. He answered Captain Delano's questions with sharp words, and suddenly, with an angry movement, he walked back to Babo. Captain Delano watched the two men whispering together in low voices, it made an ugly picture, which Captain Delano found so extremely unpleasant that he turned his face to the other side of the ship. Their actions made Delano suspicious of Captain Sereno. He began to wonder about him, his behavior, his coughing attacks, his weakness, his empty, wild looks. Was he really half mad, or a faker playing a part? One moment Captain Delano had the worst suspicions of Don Benito, but the next he felt guilty and ashamed of himself for having such doubts about the man. Presently, Don Benito moved back toward his guest, still supported by his servant. His pale face twitched. He seemed more nervous than usual, and there was a strange tone in his husky whisper as he spoke. May I ask how many men you have on board, senor? Captain Delano became uneasy, but answered, About twenty-five all total. And at present, senor, all on board? All on board, Captain Delano answered. And will be tonight, senor? At this last question, Captain Delano looked very seriously at Don Benito, who could not return the look, but dropped his eyes to the deck. Captain Delano could think of only one reason for such a question, but no. It was foolish to think that these weak and starving men could have any idea of seizing his ship. But still, he remained silent. And will they be aboard tonight? 
again the question from Don Benito. Captain Delano decided to answer truthfully. Some of his men had talked of going off on a fishing party about midnight, and he told Don Benito this. As he answered, Captain Delano again looked straight at Don Benito, but the Spanish captain refused to meet his eyes. Then, as before, he suddenly withdrew with his servant, and again the two men began whispering to each other in low voices. Captain Delano tried to push the worry from his mind, but what were those two strange men discussing? That will be our story next week. Today, we complete the story Benito Sereno, written by Herman Melville. As we told you in earlier parts of our story, rebel slaves seized the ship San Dominic off the coast of Chile. They killed many of its officers and crew. The captain, Benito Sereno, was ordered to sail to Senegal, but first he was forced to take the ship to the lonely island of Santa Maria, near the southern end of Chile. There it could safely get water and supplies for the long, dangerous voyage to Africa. At the island, the rebels were surprised and frightened when they found an American ship anchored in the harbor. It also had stopped for water. Many of the rebels wanted to sail away, but their leader, Babo, opposed it. They had little food and water and could not go far. Babo created a story to keep anyone from suspecting that the Spanish vessel was in the hands of rebels and that its captain was a prisoner. At first, Babo seemed successful. The captain of the American ship, Amasa Delano, visited the San Dominic. He suspected nothing, although he was surprised by the general disorder on board. He also could not understand the strange behavior of its captain, Benito Sereno. Later incidents, however, began to worry him. Captain Delano grew more and more suspicious. At one time, he even feared that his life might be in danger. Twice, he caught the Spanish captain and his servant, Babo, with their heads together, whispering like two conspirators. It made Captain Delano wonder, were they plotting to kill him? and seize his ship? Who were these men? Cutthroats? Pirates? Captain Delano grew nervous. Then he was happy to see his whale boat off in the distance. It was returning with supplies for the Spanish ship. The sight of his boat calmed him. It made his suspicions and fear quickly disappear. He felt foolish for having had such dark thoughts. Now, here is Shep O'Neill with the rest of our story, Benito Sereno. Captain Delano went down to Captain Sereno's cabin to cheer him up and say goodbye. Better and better, Don Benito, he said as he entered the cabin. Your troubles will soon be over. The American invited the Spanish captain to come aboard his boat for a cup of coffee. Sereno's eyes brightened, 
but then the light in them died. He shook his head and said he could not accept the invitation. Captain Delano was offended. He was about to withdraw when Don Benito rose from his chair and took Delano's hand. The Spaniard's hand shook, and he was too excited to speak. Delano pulled his hand away and turned, climbing back to the deck. His face was troubled. Captain Delano could not understand Don Benito's actions. One minute the Spaniard was warm and polite, then just as quickly cold and hostile. Captain Delano asked himself, Why did he refuse to join me? Why is he so unfriendly? Captain Delano got to the deck and was about to step down into his boat when he heard his name. To his surprise, Don Benito was calling, coming quickly toward him. Captain Delano was pleased and turned back to meet him. Don Benito warmly took his hand with more energy and emotion than he had ever shown. But his excitement seemed too much for him, and he could not speak. Babo then came between the two men and put his arm around Don Benito to support him. Clearly he wanted to end the meeting between the two captains. Walking between the two men, Babo went with them to the walkway. Don Benito would not let go of Captain Delano's hand. He held it tightly across his servant's body. Soon they were standing by the ship's side, looking down into the American boat. Its crew turned up their wondering eyes. Captain Delano did not know what to do as he waited for Don Benito to let go of his hand. He wanted to step down into his boat, but Don Benito still firmly held his hand. Then, in an excited voice, the Spaniard said, I can go no further. Here I must say goodbye. Farewell, my dear, dear Don Namasa. Go, go, and he tore his hand loose. Go, and God protect you better than he did me. Go, Don Amasa, my best friend. Captain Delano was deeply moved. He would have stayed for another minute or so, but he caught the eye of Babo. It seemed to say, This is bad for Don Benito's health. And so he quickly took the short step down into his boat with the continuing farewells of Don Benito, who stood rooted at the ship's side. Captain Delano sat down in the back of his boat, gave Don Benito a last salute, and ordered his men to push off. The boat began to move. Suddenly Don Benito sprang over the side and came down at Delano's feet, and he kept shouting toward the Spanish ship. His cries were so wild that no one could understand him. An American officer asked, What does this mean? Captain Delano turned a cold smile upon Captain Sereno and said he neither knew nor cared. It seems, he added, 
that the Spaniard has taken it into his head to give his people the idea that we want to kidnap him. Or else, and suddenly Captain Delano shouted, Watch out for your lives! He saw Babo the servant on the rail above with a dagger in his hand. He was ready to jump. What followed happened so quickly that Captain Delano could not tell one incident from another. They all came together in one great blur of violent action and excitement. As Babo came down, Captain Delano flung Don Benito aside and caught the rebel leader, pulling the dagger from his hand. He pushed Babo firmly down in the bottom of the boat, which now began to pick up speed. Then Babo, with his one free hand, pulled a second dagger from his clothes and struck at Captain Sereno. Captain Delano knocked it from his hand. Now he saw everything clearly. Babo had leaped into the whale boat, not to kill him, but to kill Captain Sereno. For the first time he understood the mysterious behavior of Don Benito, a prisoner under sentence of death. He looked back at the Spanish ship and got a clear picture of what its captain had escaped. On board the San Dominique, the shouting rebels were raising their axes and knives in a wild revolt. They stopped some of the Spanish sailors from jumping into the sea. A few, however, jumped, while two or three who were not quick enough went hurrying up the topmost wood arms. Captain Delano signaled to his ship, ordering it to get its guns ready. When the whale boat reached his ship, Captain Delano asked for ropes. He tied Babo and had him pulled up on deck. A small boat was quickly sent out to pick up three Spanish sailors who had jumped from Captain Sereno's ship. Captain Delano asked Don Benito what guns the rebels had. He answered, that they had none that could be used. In the first days of the rebellion, a cabin passenger, now dead, had destroyed the few guns there were. The Americans fired six shots at the San Dominique, but the rebel ship moved out of reach. Small boats were armed and lowered. Captain Delano ordered his men into them, and they moved out to capture the rebel ship. The boats caught up with the San Dominique when it was nearly night. But the moon was rising, and the gunners were able to see where they were shooting. The rebels had no bullets, and they could do nothing but yell. Many of the rebels were killed, and the San Dominique was captured. After an investigation, Babo was found guilty of stealing a ship and of murder, and was hanged. Captain Benito Sereno never was well again, and he soon died. So ended the terrible story of the slave revolt aboard the slave ship, the San Dominique. <laughs> Thank you. 
today we complete the story, Paul's Case. It was written by Willa Cather. Here is Kay Gallant with the story. Paul was a student with a lot of problems. He hated school. He didn't like living with his family on Cordelia Street in the industrial city of Pittsburgh. Paul wanted to be surrounded by beautiful things. He loved his part-time job as an usher at the concert hall. He helped people find their seats before the concert. Then he could listen to the music and dream of exciting places. Paul also spent a lot of time at the local theater. He knew many of the actors who worked there. He used to do little jobs for them, and they would let him see plays for free. Paul had little time left for his studies, so he was always in trouble with his teachers. Finally, Paul's teachers complained again to his father. His father took him out of school and made him take a job in a large company. He would not let Paul go near the concert hall or the theater. Paul did not like his job as a messenger boy. He began to plan his escape. A few weeks later, Paul's boss, Mr. Denny, gave Paul a large amount of money to take to the bank. He told Paul to hurry because it was Friday afternoon. He said the bank would close soon and would not open again until Monday. At the bank, Paul took the money out of his pocket. It was five thousand dollars. Paul put the money back in his coat pocket, and he walked out of the bank. He went to the train station and bought a one-way ticket for New York City. That afternoon, Paul left Pittsburgh forever. The train traveled slowly through a January snowstorm. The slow movement made Paul fall asleep. The train whistle blew just as the sun was coming up. Paul awoke, feeling dirty and uncomfortable. He quickly touched his coat pocket. The money was still there. It was not a dream. He really was. On his way to New York City, with five thousand dollars in his pocket. Finally, the train pulled into Central Station. Paul walked quickly out of the station, and went immediately to an expensive clothing store for men. The salesman was very polite when he saw Paul's money. Paul bought two suits. Several white silk shirts, some silk ties of different colors. Then, he bought a black tuxedo suit for the theater, a warm winter coat, a red bathrobe, and the finest silk underclothes. He told the salesman he wanted to wear one of the new suits and the coat immediately. The salesman bowed and smiled. Paul then took a taxi to another shop, where he bought several pairs of leather shoes and boots. Next, he went to the famous jewelry store, Tiffany's, and bought a tie pin, and some brushes with silver handles. His last stop was a luggage store, where he had all his new clothes put into several expensive suitcases. It was a little before one o'clock in the afternoon when Paul arrived at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The doorman opened the hotel's glass doors for Paul, and the boy entered. The thick carpet under his feet had the colors of a thousand jewels, 
the lights sparkled from crystal chandeliers. Paul told the hotel clerk he was from Washington, D.C. He said his mother and father were arriving in a few days from Europe. He explained he was going to wait for them at the hotel. In his dreams, Paul had planned this trip to New York a hundred times. He knew all about the Waldorf Astoria, one of New York's most expensive hotels. As soon as he entered his rooms, he saw that everything was perfect, except for one thing. He rang the bell and asked for fresh flowers to be sent quickly to his rooms. When the flowers came, Paul put them in water, and then he took a long, hot bath. He came out of the bathroom wearing the red silk bathrobe. Outside his windows, the snow was falling so fast that he could not see across the street. But inside, the air was warm and sweet. He lay down on the sofa in his sitting room. It had all been so very simple, he thought. When they had shut him out of the theater and the concert hall, Paul knew he had to leave. But he was surprised that he had not been afraid to go. He could not remember a time when he had not been afraid of something, even when he was a little boy. But now he felt free. He wasn't afraid anymore. He watched the snow until he fell asleep. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when Paul woke up. He spent nearly an hour getting dressed. He looked at himself often in the mirror. His dark blue suit fit him so well that he did not seem too thin. The white silk shirt and the blue and lilac tie felt cool and smooth under his fingers. He was exactly the kind of boy he had always wanted to be. Paul put on his new winter coat and went downstairs. He got into a taxi and told the driver to take him for a ride along Fifth Avenue. Paul stared at the expensive stores. As the taxi stopped for a red light, Paul noticed a flower shop. Through the window, he could see all kinds of flowers. Paul thought the violets, roses, and lilies of the valley looked even more lovely because they were blooming in the middle of winter. Paul began to feel hungry, so he asked the taxi driver to take him back to the hotel. As he entered the dining room, the music of the hotel orchestra floated up to greet him. He sat at a table near a window. The fresh flowers, the white tablecloth, and the colored wine glasses pleased Paul's eyes. The soft music, the low voices of the people around him, and the soft popping of champagne corks whispered into Paul's ears. This is what everyone wants, he thought. He could not believe he had ever lived in Pittsburgh on Cordelia Street. That belonged to another time and place. Paul lifted the crystal glass of champagne and drank the cold, precious, bubbling wine. He belonged here. Later that evening, Paul put on his black tuxedo and went to the opera. He felt perfectly at ease. He had only to look at his tuxedo to know he belonged with all the other beautiful people in the opera house. He didn't talk to anyone, but his eyes recorded everything. 
Paul's golden days went by without a shadow. He made each one as perfect as he could. On the eighth day after his arrival in New York, he found a report in the newspaper about his crime. It said that his father had paid the company the five thousand dollars that Paul had stolen. It said Paul had been seen in a New York hotel, and it said Paul's father was in New York. He was looking for Paul to bring him back to Pittsburgh. Paul's knees became weak. He sat down in a chair. And put his head in his hands. The dream was ended. He had to go back to Cordelia Street, back to the yellow papered bedroom, the smell of cooked cabbage, the daily ride to work on the crowded street cars. Paul poured himself a glass of champagne, and drank it quickly. He poured another glass. And drank that one too. Paul had a taxi take him out of the city and into the country. The taxi left him near some railroad tracks. Paul suddenly remembered all the flowers he had seen in a shop window, his first night in New York. He realized that by now, every one of those flowers was dead. They had had only one splendid moment to challenge winter. A train whistle broke into Paul's thoughts. He watched as the train grew bigger and bigger. As it came closer, Paul's body shook. His lips wore a frightened smile. Paul looked nervously around, as if someone might be watching him. When the right moment came, Paul jumped, and as he jumped, he realized his great mistake. The blue of the ocean and the yellow of the desert flashed through his brain. He had not seen them yet. There was so much he had not seen. Paul felt something hit his chest. He felt his body fly through the air far and fast. Then, everything turned black, and Paul dropped back into the great design of things. Our story today is called "The Boarded Window." It was written by Ambrose Bierce. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. In 1830. Only a few miles away from what is now the great city of Cincinnati, Ohio, lay a huge and almost endless forest. The area had a few settlements established by people of the frontier. Many of them had already left the area for settlements further to the west, but among those remaining was a man. Who had been one of the first people to arrive there? He lived alone, in a house of logs, surrounded on all sides by the great forest. He seemed a part of the darkness and silence of the forest, for no one had ever known him to smile, or speak an unnecessary word. His simple needs were supplied by selling. Or trading the skins of wild animals in the town. His little log house had a single door. Directly opposite 
was a window. The window was boarded up. No one could remember a time when it was not. And no one knew why it had been closed. It surely was not because of the man's dislike of light and air. Sometimes he could be seen lying in the sun on his doorstep. I imagine there are few people living today who ever knew the secret of that window. But I am one, as you shall see. The man's name was said to be Murlock. He appeared to be 70 years old, but he was really 50. Something other than years had been the cause of his aging. His hair and long, full beard were white. His gray, lifeless eyes were sunken. His face was wrinkled. He was tall and thin, with drooping shoulders, like someone with many problems. I never saw him. These details I learned from my grandfather. He told me the man's story when I was a boy. He had known him when living nearby in that early day. One day, Murlock was found in his cabin, dead. It was not a time and place for medical examiners and newspapers. I suppose it was agreed that he had died from natural causes, or I should have been told and should remember. I know only that the body was buried near the cabin, next to the burial place of his wife. She had died so many years before him that local tradition noted very little of her existence. That closes the final part of this true story. Except for the incident that followed many years later. With a fearless spirit, I went to the place and got close enough to the ruined cabin to throw a stone against it. I ran away to avoid the ghost which every well-informed boy in the area knew haunted the spot. But there is an earlier part to this story, supplied by my grandfather. When Murloc built his cabin, he was young, strong, and full of hope. He began the hard work of creating a farm. He kept a gun, a rifle, for hunting to support himself. He had married a young woman in all ways worthy of his honest love and loyalty. She shared the dangers of life with a willing spirit and a light heart. There is no known record of her name or details about her. They loved each other and were happy. One day, Murlock returned from hunting in a deep part of the forest. He found his wife sick with fever and confusion. There was no doctor or neighbor within miles. She was in no condition to be left alone while he went to find help. So Murloc tried to take care of his wife and return her to good health. But at the end of the third day, she fell into unconsciousness and died. From what we know about a man like Murloc, we may try to imagine some of the details of the story told by my grandfather. When he was sure she was dead, Murlock had sense enough to remember that the dead must be prepared for burial. He made a mistake now and again while performing this special duty. He did certain things wrong, and others which he did correctly were done over and over again.
He was surprised that he did not cry, surprised and a little ashamed. Surely it is unkind not to cry for the dead. Tomorrow, he said out loud, I shall have to make the coffin and dig the grave, and then I shall miss her when she is no longer in sight. But now she is dead, of course. But it is all right. It must be all right somehow. Things cannot be as bad as they seem. He stood over the body of his wife in the disappearing light. He fixed the hair and made finishing touches to the rest. He did all of this without thinking, but with care. And still through his mind ran a feeling that all was right, that he should have her again as before, and everything would be explained. Murlock had no experience in deep sadness. His heart could not contain it all. His imagination could not understand it. He did not know he was so hard struck. That knowledge would come later and never leave. Deep sadness is an artist of powers that affects people in different ways. To one it comes like the stroke of an arrow, shocking all the emotions to a sharper life. To another it comes as the blow of a crushing strike. We may believe Murlock to have been affected that way. Soon after he had finished his work, he sank into a chair by the side of the table upon which the body lay. He noted how white his wife's face looked in the deepening darkness. He laid his arms upon the table's edge and dropped his face into them, tearless and very sleepy. At that moment, a long screaming sound came in through the open window. It was like the cry of a lost child in the far deep of the darkening forest, but the man did not move. He heard that unearthly cry upon his failing sense again and nearer than before. Maybe it was a wild animal, or maybe it was a dream, for Murlock was asleep. Some hours later, he awoke, lifted his head from his arms, and listened closely. He knew not why. There, in the black darkness by the side of the body, he remembered everything without a shock. He strained his eyes to see he knew not what. His senses were all alert. His breath was suspended. His blood was still as if to assist the silence. Who, what had awakened him, and where was it? Suddenly the table shook under his arms. At the same time he heard, or imagined he heard, a light, soft step, and then... Another. The sounds were as bare feet walking upon the floor. He was afraid beyond the power to cry out or move. He waited, waited, there in the darkness, through what seemed like centuries of such fear. Fear as one may know, but yet live to tell. He tried but failed to speak the dead woman's name. He tried, but failed to stretch his hand across the table to learn if she was there. His throat was powerless. His arms and hands were like lead. Then something most frightful happened. It seemed as if a heavy body was thrown against the table with a force that pushed against his chest. At the same time, he heard and felt the fall of something upon the floor. It was so violent a crash that the whole house shook. A fight followed and a confusion of sounds impossible to describe. Murlock had risen to his feet 
Extreme fear had caused him to lose control of his senses. He threw his hands upon the table. Nothing was there. There is a point at which fear may turn to insanity, and insanity incites to action. With no definite plan, and acting like a madman, Murlock ran quickly to the wall. He seized his loaded rifle, and without aim, fired it! The flash from the rifle hit the room with a clear brightness. He saw a huge, fierce panther dragging the dead woman toward the window. The wild animal's teeth were fixed on her throat. Then there was darkness blacker than before. And... When he returned to consciousness, the sun was high, and the forest was filled with the sounds of singing birds. The body lay near the window, where the animal had left it when frightened away by the light and sound of the rifle. The clothing was ruined. The long hair was in disorder. The arms and legs lay in a careless way. And a pool of blood flowed from the horribly torn throat. The ribbon he had used to tie the wrists was broken. The hands were tightly closed. And... Between the teeth was a piece of the animal's ear. Our story today is called... The Return of a Private. It was written by Hamlin Garland. Here is Harry Monroe with our story. The soldiers cheered as the train crossed the border into the state of Wisconsin. It had been a long trip from the south back to their homes in the north. One of the men had a large red scar across his forehead. Another had an injured leg that made it painful for him to walk. The third had unnaturally large and bright eyes because he had been sick with malaria. The three soldiers spread their blankets on the train seats and tried to sleep. It was a cold evening, even though it was summertime. Private Smith, the soldier with the fever, shivered in the night air. His joy in coming home was mixed with fear and worry. He knew he was sick and weak. How could he take care of his family? Where would he find the strength to do the heavy work all farmers have to do. He had given three years of his life to his country, and now he had very little money and strength left for his family. Morning came slowly with a pale yellow light. The train was slowing down, as it came into the town of La Crosse, where the three soldiers would get off the train. The station was empty, because it was Sunday. I'll get home in time for dinner, Smith thought. She usually has dinner about one o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And he smiled. Smith 
and the other two soldiers jumped off the train together. Well, boys, Smith began, here's where we say goodbye. We've marched together for many miles. Now, I suppose, we are done. The three men found it hard to look at each other. We ought to go home with you, one of the soldiers said to Smith. You'll never be able to walk all those miles with that heavy pack on your back. Oh, I'm all right, Smith said, putting on his army cap. Every step takes me closer to home. They all shook hands. Goodbye. Good luck. Same to you. Goodbye. Smith turned and walked away quickly. After a few minutes, he turned again and waved his cap. His two friends did the same. Then they marched away with their long, steady soldier's step. Smith walked for a while, thinking of his friends. He remembered the many days they had been together during the war. He thought of his friend Billy Tripp, too. Poor Billy. A bullet came out of the sky one day and tore a great hole in Billy's chest. Smith knew he would have to tell the sad story to Billy's mother and young wife. But there was little to tell. The sound of a bullet cutting through the air, Billy crying out, then falling with his face in the dirt. The fighting he had done since then had not made him forget the horror of that moment when Billy died. Soon the fields and houses became familiar. Smith knew he was close to home. The sun was burning hot as he began climbing the last hill. Finally, he reached the top and looked down at his farm in the beautiful valley. He was almost home. Mrs. Smith was alone on the farm with her three children. Mary was nine years old, Tommy was six, and little Teddy had just turned four. Mrs. Smith had been dreaming about her husband when the chickens awakened her that Sunday morning. She got out of bed, got dressed, and went out to feed the chickens. Then she saw the broken fence near the chicken house. She had tried to fix it again and again. Mrs. Smith sat down and cried. The farmer who had promised to take care of the farm while her husband was away, had been lazy and dishonest. The first year he shared the wheat with Mrs. Smith, but the next year he took almost all of it for himself. She had sent him away. Now the fields were full of wheat, but there was no man on the farm to cut it down and sell it. Six weeks before, her husband told her in a letter that he would be coming home soon. Other soldiers were returning home, but her husband had not come. Every day she watched the road leading down the hill. This Sunday morning she could no longer stand being alone. She jumped up, ran into the house, and quickly dressed the children. She carefully locked the door and started walking down the road to the farmhouse of her neighbor, Mrs. Gray. Mary Gray was a widow with a large family of strong sons and pretty daughters. She was poor, but she never said no to a hungry person who came to her farm and asked for food. She worked hard, laughed often, 
and was always in a cheerful mood. When she saw Mrs. Smith and the children coming down the road, Mrs. Gray went out to meet them. Please come right in, Mrs. Smith. We were just getting ready to have dinner. Mrs. Smith went into the noisy house. Mrs. Gray's children were laughing and talking all at the same time. Soon she was laughing and singing with the rest of them. The long table in the kitchen was piled with food. There were potatoes, fresh corn, apple pies, hot bread, sweet pickles, bread and butter, and honey. They all ate until they could eat no more. Then the men and children left the table. The women stayed to drink their tea. Mama, said one of Mrs. Gray's daughters, please read our fortunes in the tea leaves. Tell us about our futures. Mrs. Gray picked up her daughter's cup and stirred it first to the left, then to the right. Then she looked into it with a serious expression. I see a handsome man with a red beard in your future, she said. Her daughter screamed with laughter. Mrs. Smith trembled with excitement when it was her turn. Somebody is coming home to you, Mrs. Gray said slowly. He's carrying a rifle on his back, and he's almost there. Mrs. Smith felt as if she could hardly breathe. And there he is, Mrs. Gray cried, pointing to the road. They all rushed to the door to look. A man in a blue coat, with a gun on his back, was walking down the road toward the Smith farm. His face was hidden by a large pack on his back. Laughing and crying, Mrs. Smith grabbed her hat and her children and ran out of the house. She hurried down the road after him, calling his name and pulling her children along with her. But the soldier was too far away for her voice to reach him. When she got back to their farm, she saw the man standing by the fence. He was looking at the little house and the field of yellow wheat. The sun was almost touching the hills in the west. The cow bells rang softly as the animals moved toward the barn. How peaceful it all is, Private Smith thought. How far away from the battles, the hospitals, the wounded and the dead. My little farm in Wisconsin. How could I have left it for those years of killing and suffering? Trembling and weak with emotion, Mrs. Smith hurried up to her husband. Her feet made no sound on the grass, but he turned suddenly to face her. For the rest of his life, he would never forget her face at that moment. Emma, he cried. The children stood back, watching their mother kissing this strange man. He saw them, and kneeling down, he pulled from his pack three huge red apples. In a moment, all three children were in their father's arms. Together, the family entered the little, unpainted farmhouse. Later that evening, after supper, Smith and his wife went outside. The moon was bright above the eastern hills. Sweet, peaceful stars filled the sky as the night birds sang softly and tiny insects buzzed in the soft air. 
His farm needed work. His children needed clothing. He was no longer young and strong, but he began to plan for next year. With the same courage he had faced the war, Private Smith faced his difficult future. Our story today is called A Horseman in the Sky. It was written by Ambrose Bierce. Here is Roy DePew with the story. Carter Drews was born in Virginia. He loved his parents, his home, and the South. But he loved his country, too. And in the autumn of 1861, when the United States was divided by a terrible civil war, Carter Drews, a Southerner, decided to join the Union Army of the North. He told his father about his decision one morning at breakfast. The older man looked at his only son for a moment, too shocked to speak. Then he said, As of this moment, you are a traitor to the South. Please don't tell your mother about your decision. She's sick, and we both know she has only a few weeks to live. Carter's father paused again looking deep into his son's eyes. Carter, he said, no matter what happens, be sure you always do what you think is your duty. Both Carter Drews and his father left the table that morning with broken hearts. And Carter soon left his home and everyone he loved to wear the blue uniform of the Union soldier. One sunny afternoon, a few weeks later, Carter Drews lay with his face in the dirt by the side of a road. He was on his stomach, his arms still holding his gun. Carter would not receive a medal for his actions. In fact, if his commanding officer were to see him, he would order Carter shot immediately. For Carter was not dead or wounded. He was sleeping while on duty. Fortunately, no one could see him. He was hidden by some bushes growing by the side of the road. The road Carter Drews had been sent to guard was only a few miles from his father's house. It began in a forest down in the valley and climbed up the side of a huge rock. Anyone standing on the top of this high rock would be able to see down into the valley. And that person would feel very dizzy looking down. If he dropped a stone from the edge of this cliff, it would fall for 600 meters before disappearing into the forest in the valley below. Giant cliffs, like the one Carter lay on, surrounded the valley. Hidden in the valley's forest were five Union regiments, thousands of Carter's fellow soldiers. They had marched for 36 hours. Now they were resting. But at midnight, they would climb that road up the rocky cliff. Their plan was to attack by surprise 
an army of southerners camped on the other side of the cliff. But if their enemy learned about the Union army hiding in the forest, the soldiers would find themselves in a trap with no escape. That was why Carter Drews had been sent to guard the road. It was his duty to be sure that no enemy soldier, dressed in gray, spied on the valley where the Union army was hiding. But Carter Drews had fallen asleep. Suddenly, as if a messenger of fate came to touch him on the shoulder, the young man opened his eyes. As he lifted his head, he saw a man on horseback standing on the huge rocky cliff that looked down into the valley. The rider and his horse stood so still that they seemed made of stone. The man's gray uniform blended with the blue sky and the white clouds behind him. He held a gun in his right hand and the horse's reins in the other. Carter could not see the man's face because the rider was looking down into the valley. But the man and his horse seemed to be of heroic, almost gigantic size, standing there motionless against the sky. Carter discovered he was very much afraid, even though he knew the enemy soldier could not see him hiding in the bushes. Suddenly the horse moved, pulling back its head from the edge of the cliff. Carter was completely awake now. He raised his gun, pushing its barrel through the bushes, and he aimed for the horseman's heart. A small squeeze of the trigger, and Carter Drews would have done his duty. At that instant, the horseman turned his head and looked in Carter's direction. He seemed to look at Carter's face, into his eyes, and deep into his brave, generous heart. Carter's face became very white. His entire body began shaking. His mind began to race, and in his fantasy, the horse and rider became black figures, rising and falling in slow circles against a fiery red sky. Carter did not pull the trigger. Instead, he let go of his gun and slowly dropped his face until it rested again in the dirt. Brave and strong as he was, Carter almost fainted from the shock of what he had seen. Is it so terrible to kill an enemy who might kill you and your friends? Carter knew that this man must be shot from ambush without warning. This man must die without a moment to prepare his soul, without even the chance to say a silent prayer. Slowly, a hope began to form in Carter Drews's mind. Perhaps the southern soldier had not seen the northern troops. Perhaps he was only admiring the view. Perhaps he would now turn and ride carelessly away. Then Carter looked down into the valley so far below. He saw a line of men in blue uniforms and their horses slowly leaving the protection of the forest. A foolish Union officer had permitted his soldiers to bring their horses to drink at a small stream near the forest, and there they were in plain sight. Carter Drews looked back to the man and horse standing there against the sky. Again he took aim, but this time he pointed his gun at the horse. Words rang in his head, the last words his father ever spoke to him. 
no matter what happens, be sure you always do what you think is your duty. Carter Drews was calm as he pulled the trigger of his gun. At that moment, a Union officer happened to look up from his hiding place near the edge of the forest. His eyes climbed to the top of the cliff that looked over the valley. Just looking at the top of the gigantic rock so far above him made the soldier feel dizzy. And then the officer saw something that filled his heart with horror. A man on a horse was riding down into the valley through the air. The rider sat straight in his saddle. His hair streamed back, waving in the wind. His left hand held his horse's reins, while his right hand was hidden in the cloud of the horse's mane. The horse looked as if it were galloping across the earth. Its body was proud and noble. As the frightened Union officer watched this horseman in the sky, he almost believed he was witnessing a messenger from heaven, a messenger who had come to announce the end of the world. The officer's legs grew weak, and he fell. At almost the same instant, he heard a crashing sound in the trees. The sound died without an echo, and all was silent. The officer got to his feet, still shaking. He went back to his camp, but he didn't tell anyone what he had seen. He knew no one would ever believe him. Soon after firing his gun, Carter Drews was joined by a Union sergeant. Carter did not turn his head as the sergeant kneeled beside him. Did you fire? The sergeant whispered. Yes. At what? A horse. It, it was on that rock. It's not there now. It, it went over the cliff. Carter's face was white, but he showed no other sign of emotion. The sergeant did not understand. See here, Drews, he said after a moment's silence. Why are you making this into a mystery? I order you to report. Was there anyone on the horse? Yes. Who? My, my father. Our story today is called Pigs is Pigs. It was written by Ellis Parker Butler. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. Mike Flannery, the agent of the Interurban Express Company, leaned over the desk in the company's office in Westcott and shook his fist. Mr. Morehouse, angry and red, stood on the other side of the desk, shaking with fury. The argument had been long and hot. At last, Mr. Morehouse had become speechless. The cause of the trouble lay on the desk between the two men. It was a box with two guinea pigs inside. "'Do as you like, then,' shouted Flannery. Pay for them and take them, or don't pay for them and leave them here. Rules are rules, Mr. Morehouse, and Mike Flannery is not going to break them. But you stupid idiot, shouted Mr. Morehouse, madly shaking a thin book beneath the agent's nose. Can't you read it here, in your own book of transportation rates? 
pets, domestic, Franklin to Westcott, if correctly boxed, twenty-five cents each. He threw the book on the desk. What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they correctly boxed? What? He turned and walked back and forth rapidly with a furious look on his face. Pets, he said. P-E-T-S. Twenty-five cents each. Two times twenty-five is fifty. Can you understand that? I offer you fifty cents. Flannery reached for the book. He ran his hand through the pages and stopped at page sixty-four. I don't take fifty cents, he whispered in an unpleasant voice. Here's the rule for it. When the agent be in any doubt about which two rates should be charged on a shipment, he shall charge the larger. The person receiving the shipment may put in a claim for the overcharge. In this case, Mr. Morehouse, I be in doubt. Pets them animals may be, and domestic they may be, but pigs I'm sure they do be, and my rule says plain as the nose on your face, pigs, Franklin to Westcott, thirty cents each. Mr. Morehouse shook his head savagely. Nonsense, he shouted. Confounded nonsense, I tell you. That rule means common pigs, not guinea pigs. Pigs is pigs, Flannery said firmly. Mr. Morehouse bit his lip and then flung his arms out wildly. Very well, he shouted. You shall hear of this. Your president shall hear of this. It is an outrage. I have offered you fifty cents. You refuse it. Keep the pigs until you are ready to take the fifty cents. But by George, sir, if one hair of those pigs' heads is harmed, I will have the law on you. He turned and walked out, slamming the door. Flannery carefully lifted the box from the desk and put it in a corner. Mr. Morehouse quickly wrote a letter to the president of the Transportation Express Company. The president answered, informing Mr. Morehouse that all claims for overcharge should be sent to the claims department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the claims department. One week later, he received an answer. The claims department said it had discussed the matter with the agent at Westcott. The agent said Mr. Morehouse had refused to accept the two guinea pigs shipped to him. Therefore, the department said, Mr. Morehouse had no claim against the company and should write to its tariff department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the Tariff Department. He stated his case clearly. The head of the Tariff Department read Mr. Morehouse's letter. Ha! Ah, guinea pigs, he said. Probably starved to death by this time. He wrote to the agent asking why the shipment was held up. He also wanted to know if the guinea pigs were still in good health. Before answering, Agent Flannery wanted to make sure his report was up to date. So he went to the back of the office and looked into the cage. Good Lord, there were now eight of them, all well and eating like hippopotamuses. He went back to the office and explained to the head of the tariff department what the rules said about pigs. And as for the condition 
of the guinea pigs, said Flannery. They were all well. But there were eight of them now, all good eaters. The head of the tariff department laughed when he read Flannery's letter. He read it again and became serious. By George, he said, Flannery is right. Pigs is pigs. I'll have to get something official on this. He spoke to the president of the company. The president treated the matter lightly. What is the rate on pigs and on pets? he asked. Pigs, thirty cents. Pets, twenty-five, the head of the tariff department answered. Then, of course, guinea pigs are pigs, the president said. Yes, the head of the tariff department agreed. I look at it that way, too. A thing that can come under two rates is naturally to be charged at the higher one. But are guinea pigs pigs? Aren't they rabbits? Come to think of it, the president said, I believe they are more like rabbits, sort of halfway between pig and rabbit. I think the question is this. Are guinea pigs of the domestic pig family? I'll ask Professor Gordon. He is an expert about such things. The president wrote to Professor Gordon. Unfortunately, the professor was in South America, collecting zoological samples. His wife forwarded the letter to him. The professor was in the high Andes Mountains, the letter took many months to reach him. In time, the president forgot the guinea pigs. The head of the tariff department forgot them. Mr. Morehouse forgot them. But Agent Flannery did not. The guinea pigs had increased to thirty-two. He asked the head of the traffic department what he should do with them. Don't sell the pigs, Agent Flannery was told. They are not your property. Take care of them until the case is settled. The guinea pigs needed more room. Flannery made a large and airy room for them in the back of his office. Some months later, he discovered he now had 160 of them. He was going out of his mind. Not long after this, the president of the express company heard from Professor Gordon. It was a long and scholarly letter. It pointed out that the guinea pig was the cavia aporia, while the common pig was the genus Sus of the family Suidae. The president then told the head of the traffic department that guinea pigs are not pigs and must be charged only 25 cents as domestic pets. The traffic department informed Agent Flannery that he should take the 160 guinea pigs to Mr. Morehouse and collect 25 cents for each of them. Agent Flannery wired back, I've got 800 now. Shall I collect for 800 or what? How about the $64 I paid for cabbages to feed them? Many letters went back and forth. Flannery was crowded into a few feet at the extreme front of the office. The guinea pigs had all the rest of the room. Time kept moving on as the letters continued to go back and forth. Flannery now had 4,064 guinea pigs. He was beginning to lose control of himself. Then he got a telegram from the company that said, 
error in guinea pig bill. Collect for two guinea pigs, 50 cents. Flannery ran all the way to Mr. Morehouse's home, but Mr. Morehouse had moved. Flannery searched for him in town, but without success. He returned to the express office and found that 206 guinea pigs had entered the world since he left the office. At last he got an urgent telegram from the main office. Send the pigs to the main office of the company at Franklin. Flannery did so. Soon came another telegram. Stop sending pigs. Warehouse full. But he kept sending them. Agent Flannery finally got free of the guinea pigs. Rules may be rules, he said, but so long as Flannery runs this express office, pigs is pets, and cows is pets, and horses is pets, and lions and tigers and rocky mountain goats is pets, and the rate on them is twenty-five cents. Then... He looked around and said cheerfully, Well, anyhow, it is not as bad as it might have been. What if them guinea pigs had been elephants? <laughs> We present a special Christmas story called The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. One dollar and eighty-seven cents, that was all, and sixty cents of it in the smallest pieces of money, pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by negotiating with the men at the market who sold vegetables and meat, negotiating until one's face burned with the silent knowledge of being poor. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but sit down and cry, so Della cried which led to the thought that life is made up of little cries and smiles, with more little cries than smiles. Della finished her crying and dried her face. She stood by the window and looked out, unhappily, at a gray cat walking along a gray fence in a gray back yard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy her husband Jim a gift. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Jim earned twenty dollars a week, which does not go far. Expenses had been greater than she had expected. They always are. Many a happy hour she had spent planning to buy something nice for him, something fine and rare, something close to being worthy of the honor of belonging to Jim. There was a tall glass mirror between the windows of the room. Suddenly Della turned from the window and stood before the glass mirror and looked at herself. Her eyes were shining, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Quickly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, Mr. and Mrs. James Dillingham Young had two possessions which they valued. 
One was Jim's gold timepiece, the watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in their building, Della would have let her hair hang out the window to dry, just to reduce the value of the Queen's jewels. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, shining like a brown waterfall. It reached below her knees and made itself almost like a covering for her. And then quickly she put it up again. She stood still while a few tears fell on the floor. She put on her coat and her old brown hat. With a quick motion and brightness still in her eyes, she danced out the door and down the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronia, hair goods of all kinds. Della ran up the steps to the shop, out of breath. "'Will you buy my hair?' asked Della. "'I buy hair,' said Madame. "'Take your hat off, and let us have a look at it.' Down came the beautiful brown waterfall of hair. Twenty dollars,' said Madame, lifting the hair with an experienced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. The next two hours went by as if they had wings. Della looked in all the stores to choose a gift for Jim. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. It was a chain, simple round rings of silver. It was perfect for Jim's gold watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be for him. It was like him, quiet and with great value. She gave the shopkeeper twenty-one dollars, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents that was left. When Della arrived home, she began to repair what was left of her hair. The hair had been ruined by her love and her desire to give a special gift. Repairing the damage was a very big job. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny round curls of hair, that made her look wonderfully like a schoolboy. She looked at herself in the glass mirror long and carefully. If Jim does not kill me before he takes a second look at me, she said to herself, he'll say I look like a song girl. But what could I do, oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock that night, the coffee was made, and the pan on the back of the stove was hot and ready to cook the meat. Jim was never late coming home from work. Della held the silver chain in her hand and sat near the door. Then she heard his step, and she turned white for just a minute. She had a way of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in. He looked thin and very serious. Poor man, he was only twenty-two and he had to care for a wife. He needed a new coat and gloves to keep his hands warm. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a dog smelling a bird. His eyes were fixed upon Della. There was an expression in them that she could not read, and it frightened her. 
It was not anger, nor surprise, nor fear, nor any of the feelings that she had been prepared for. He simply looked at her with a strange expression on his face. Della went to him. Jim, my love, she cried, do not look at me that way. I had my hair cut and sold because I could not have lived through Christmas without giving you a gift. My hair will grow out again. I just had to do it. My hair grows very fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let us be happy. You do not know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I have for you. You have cut off your hair, asked Jim, slowly, as if he had not accepted the information, even after his mind worked very hard. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Do you not like me just as well? I am the same person without my hair, right? Jim looked about the room as if he were looking for something. You say your hair is gone? he asked. You need not look for it, said Della. It is sold, I tell you, sold and gone too. It is Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it was cut for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with sudden serious sweetness, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the meat on, Jim? Jim seemed to awaken quickly and put his arms around Della. Then he took a package from his coat and threw it on the table. Do not make any mistake about me, Dell, he said. I do not think there is any haircut that could make me like my girl any less. But if you will open that package, you may see why you had me frightened at first. White fingers quickly tore at the string and paper. There was a scream of joy, and then... Alas, a change to tears and cries, requiring the man of the house to use all his skill to calm his wife. For there were the combs, the special set of objects to hold her hair that Della had wanted ever since she saw them in a shop window. Beautiful combs, made of shells, with jewels at the edge, just the color to wear in the beautiful hair that was no longer hers. They cost a lot of money, she knew, and her heart had wanted them without ever hoping to have them. And now the beautiful combs were hers, but the hair that should have touched them was gone. But she held the combs to herself, and soon she was able to look up with a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. Then Della jumped up like a little burned cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful gift. She happily held it out to him in her open hands. The silver chain seemed so bright. Isn't it wonderful, Jim? I looked all over town to find it. You will have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying... Jim fell on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell said he, let us put our Christmas gifts away and keep them a while. They are too nice to use just right now. I sold my gold watch to get the money to buy the set of combs for your hair. 
And now, why not put the meat on? The Magi were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the baby Jesus. They invented the art of giving Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two young people who most unwisely gave for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. The huge green warrior Tars Tarkas came slowly toward me with his thin sword. I backed away. I did not want to fight him. I did not wish his death. He had been as kind to me as a green Martian can be. As I stood watching him, a rifle fired in the distance. Then another... And another. Tars Tarkas and his warriors were under attack from another tribe of green warriors. Within seconds, a terrible battle raged. As I watched, three of the attackers fell on Tars Tarkas. He killed one and was fighting with the other two when he slipped and fell. I ran to his aid, swinging my sword. He was on his feet. Shoulder to shoulder, we fought against the attackers. They finally withdrew after an hour of fierce fighting. John Carter, I think I understand the meaning of the word friend. You saved my life when I was about to take yours. From this day, you are no longer a captive among our people, but a leader and great warrior among us. There was a smile on his face. Once again, he took off a metal band from his arm and gave it to me. I have a question for you, John Carter. I understand why you took the Red Woman with you. But why did Sola leave her people and go with you? She did not want to see me or the princess harmed. She does not like the great games held by your people where captives are led to die. She knows if she is caught, she too will die in the games. She told me she hates the games because her mother died there. What? How could she know her mother? She told me her mother was killed in the games because she had hidden the egg that produced her. Her mother hid Sola among other children before she was captured. Sola said she was a kind woman, not like others of your tribe. Tars Tarkas grew angry as I was speaking, but I could see past his anger. I could see pain in his eyes. I immediately knew Sola's great secret. I have a question for you, Tars Tarkas. Did you know Sola's mother? Yes, 
And if I could have, I would have prevented her death. I know this story to be true. I have always known the woman who died in those games had a child. I never knew the child. I do now. Sola is also my child. For three days we followed the trail left by the Princess Deja Torres, Sola, and poor ugly Wula. At last we could see them in the distance. Their animal could no longer be ridden. They were talking. When we came near, Wula turned to fight us. I slowly walked to him with my hand out. Sola was standing nearby. She was armed and prepared to fight. The princess was lying next to her feet. Sola, what is wrong with the princess? She has been crying much these past few days, John Carter. We believed you died so we could escape. The thought of your death was very heavy on this woman. My friend, Deja Thoris, come and tell her you are among the living. Perhaps that will stop her crying. I walked to where the princess Deja Thoris was lying on the ground. She looked at me with eyes that were red from crying. Princess, you are no longer in danger. Tars Tarkas has come with me as a friend. He and his warriors will help to see you safely home. And Sola, I would have you greet your father, Tars Tarkas, a great leader among your people. Your secret no longer means death to anyone. He already knows you are his daughter. The two of you have nothing to fear. Sola turned and looked at Tars Tarkas. She held out her hand. He took it. It was a new beginning for them. I know our world has never before seen anyone like you, John Carter. Can it be that all Earthmen are like you? I was alone, a stranger, hunted, threatened, yet you would freely give your life to save me. You come to me now with a tribe of green warriors who offer their friendship. You are no longer a captive, but wear the medal of great rank among their people. No man has ever done this. Princess, I have done many strange things in my life, many things much smarter men would not have done. And now, before my courage fails, I would ask you to be mine in marriage. She smiled at me for a moment, and then her dark eyes flashed in the evening light. You have no need of your courage, John Carter, because you already knew the answer before you asked the question. Several days later, we reached the city of Helium, at first, the red men of Helium thought we were an attacking army, but they soon saw their princess. We were greeted with great joy. Tars Tarkas and his green warriors caused the greatest excitement. This huge group of green warriors entered the city as friends and allies. I soon met Tardos Mors, the grandfather of Dejah Thoris. 
He tried several times to thank me for saving the life of the princess, but tears filled his eyes and he could not speak. For nine years I served in the government and fought in the armies of Helium as a prince of the royal family. It was a happy time. The Princess Deja Thoris and I were expecting a child. Then, one day, a soldier returned from a long flight. When he landed, he hurried to the great meeting room. Tardos Moors met with the soldier and reported that every creature on the planet had but three days to live. He said, the great machines that produced the atmosphere on the planet had stopped producing oxygen. He said no one knew why this had happened, but there was nothing that could be done. The air grew thin within a day. Many people could do nothing but sleep. I watched as my princess was slowly dying. I had to try something. I could still move with great difficulty. I went to our airport and chose a fast aircraft. I flew as fast as I could to the building that produced the atmosphere of the planet. Workers were trying to enter. I tried to help. With a great effort, I opened a hole. I grew very weak. I asked one of the workers if he could start the engines. He said he would try. I fell asleep on the ground. It was dark when I opened my eyes again. My clothing felt stiff and strange. I sat up. I could see light from an opening. I walked outside. The land looked strange to me. I looked up to the sky and saw the red planet Mars. I was once again on Earth in the desert of Arizona. I cried out with deep emotion. Did the worker reach the machines to renew the atmosphere? Did the air reach the people of that planet in time to save them? Was my princess Deja Thoris alive, or did she lie cold in death? For ten years now, I have watched the night sky looking for an answer. I believe she and our child are waiting there for me. Something tells me that I shall soon know. Today, we begin a new series from a book by American writer Edgar Rice Burroughs. The book is called A Princess of Mars. It is the first book in a series that Mr. Burroughs wrote about a man who travels to Mars during the last years of the 1800s. There, the man meets strange beings and sees strange sights. At first, he is a captive, then a warrior, and after many battles, a prince of a royal family. Shep O'Neill begins the story of A Princess of Mars. Ah. 
I am a very old man. How old, I do not know. It is possible I am a hundred, maybe more. I cannot tell, because I have never aged as other men do. So far as I can remember, I have always been a man of about thirty. I appear today as I did forty years ago, yet I feel that I cannot go on living forever. Someday, I will die the real death from which there is no escape. I do not know why I should fear death, I who have died two times, and am still alive. I have never told this story. I know the human mind will not believe what it cannot understand. I cannot explain what happened to me. I can only tell of the ten years my dead body lay undiscovered in an Arizona cave. My name is John Carter. I am from the state of Virginia. At the close of the Civil War, I found myself without a home, without money, and without work. I decided the best plan was to search for gold in the great deserts of the American Southwest. I spent almost a year searching for gold with another former soldier, Captain James Powell, also of Virginia. We were extremely lucky. In the winter of 1865, we found rocks that held gold. Powell was trained as a mining engineer. He said we had uncovered over a million dollars worth of gold in only three months. But the work was slow, with only two men and not much equipment. So we decided Powell should go to the nearest settlement to seek equipment and men to help us with the work. On March 3rd, 1866, Powell said goodbye. He rode his horse down the mountain toward the valley. I followed his progress for several hours. The morning Powell left was like all mornings in the deserts of the great southwest, clear and beautiful. Not much later I looked across the valley. I was surprised to see three riders in the same place where I had last seen my friend. After watching for some time, I decided the three riders must be hostile Indians. Powell, I knew, was well armed and an experienced soldier, but I knew he would need my aid. I found my weapons, placed a saddle on my horse, and started as fast as possible down the trail taken by Powell. I followed as quickly as I could until dark. About nine o'clock, the moon became very bright. I had no difficulty following Powell's trail. I soon found the trail left by the three riders following Powell. I knew they were Indians. I was sure they wanted to capture Powell. Suddenly I heard shots far ahead of me. I hurried ahead as fast as I could. Soon I came to a small camp. Several hundred Apache Indians were in the center of the camp. I could see Powell on the ground. I did not even think about what to do. I just acted. I pulled out my guns and began shooting. The Apaches were surprised and fled. I forced my horse into the camp and toward Powell. I reached down and pulled him up on the horse by his belt. I urged the horse to greater speed. 
The Apaches, by now, realized that I was alone and quickly began to follow. We were soon in very rough country. The trail I chose began to rise sharply. It went up and up. I followed the trail for several hundred meters more until I came to the mouth of a large cave. It was almost morning now. I got off my horse and laid Powell on the ground. I tried to give him water, but it was no use. Powell was dead. I laid his body down and continued to the cave. I began to explore the cave. I was looking for a safe place to defend myself, or perhaps for a way out, but I became very sleepy. It was a pleasant feeling. My body became extremely heavy. I had trouble moving. Soon I had to lay down against the side of the cave. For some reason, I could not move my arms or legs. I lay facing the opening of the cave. I could see part of the trail that had led me here. And now I could see the Apaches. They had found me, but I could do nothing. Within a minute, one of them came into the cave. He looked at me, but he came no closer. His eyes grew wide, his mouth opened. He had a look of terror on his face. He looked behind me for a moment and then fled. Suddenly, I heard a low noise behind me. So could the rest of the Apaches. They all turned and fled. The sound became louder, but still I could not move. I could not turn my head to see what was behind me. All day I lay like this. I tried again to rise and again, but I still could not move. Then I heard a sharp sound. It was like a steel wire breaking. I quickly stood up. My back was against the cave wall. I looked down. There before me lay my body. For a few moments, I stood looking at my body. I could not bring myself to touch it. I was very frightened. The sounds of the cave and the sight of my body forced me away. I slowly backed to the opening of the cave. I turned to look at the Arizona night. I could see a thousand stars. As I stood there, I turned my eyes to a large red star. I could not stop looking at it. It was Mars, the red planet, the red god of war. It seemed to pull me near. Then, for a moment, I closed my eyes. There was an instant of extreme cold and total darkness. Suddenly, I was in deep, dreamless, peaceful sleep. I opened my eyes upon a very strange land. I immediately knew then I was on Mars. Not once did I question this fact. My mind told me I was on Mars as your mind tells you that you are upon Earth. You do not question the fact, nor did I. I found myself lying on a bed of yellow-colored grass that covered the land for kilometers. The time was near the middle of the day, and the sun was shining full upon me. It was warm. 
I decided to do a little exploring. Springing to my feet, I received my first Martian surprise. The effort to stand carried me into the Martian air to the height of about one meter. I landed softly upon the ground, however, without incident. I found that I must learn to walk all over again. My muscles were used to the gravity of Earth. Mars has less gravity. My attempts to walk resulted in jumps and hops, which took me into the air. I once landed on my face. I soon learned that it took much less effort for me to move on Mars than it did on Earth. Near me was a small, low wall. Carefully, I made my way to the wall and looked over. It was filled with eggs, some already broken open. Small, Green creatures were in them. They looked at me with huge red eyes. As I watched the fierce-looking creatures, I failed to hear twenty full-grown Martians coming from behind me. They had come without warning. As I turned, I saw them. One was coming at me with a huge spear, with its sharp tip pointed at my heart. And now, the second program in our series, A Princess of Mars. The creature with the spear was huge. There were many other similar creatures. They had ridden behind me on the backs of large animals. Each of them carried a collection of strange-looking weapons. The one with the large spear got down from the back of his animal and began walking toward me. He was almost five meters tall and a dark green color. Huge teeth stuck out of his face, and his expression showed much hate and violence. I immediately knew I was facing a terrible warrior. He began moving quickly toward me with the spear. I was completely unarmed. I could not fight. My only chance was to escape. I used all my strength to jump away from him. I was able to jump almost thirty meters. The green Martian stopped and watched my effort. I would learn later that the look on his face showed complete surprise. The creatures gathered and talked among themselves. While they talked, I thought about running away. However, I noticed several of them carried devices that looked very much like rifles. I could not run. Soon all but one of the creatures moved away. The one who had threatened me stayed. He slowly took off a metal band from his arm and held it out to me. He spoke in a strange language. Niktu Maktuta Sakota. Slowly he laid down his weapons. I thought this would have been a sign of peace anywhere on Earth. Why not Mars, too? I walked toward him, and in a normal voice, announced my name, and said I had come in peace. I knew he did not understand, but like me, he took it to mean that I meant no harm. Slowly we came together. He gave me the large metal band that had been around his arm. He turned and made signs with his hands that I should follow him. Soon, 
we arrived at the large animal he had been riding. He again made a sign with his hands that I should ride on the same animal behind him. The group turned and began riding across the land. We moved quickly toward mountains in the distance. The large animals we rode moved quickly across the land. I could tell from the surrounding mountains that we were on the bottom of a long, dead sea. In time we came to a huge city. At first I thought the city was empty. The buildings were all empty and in poor repair. But soon I saw hundreds of the green warriors. I also saw green women and children. I soon learned about many cities like this. The cities were built hundreds of years ago by a people that no longer existed. The green Martians used the cities. They moved from one empty city to another, never stopping for more than a day or two. We got down from our animals and walked into a large building. We entered a room that was filled with fierce green warriors. It was not difficult to tell that these were the leaders of the green Martians. One of them took hold of my arm. He shook me and lifted me off the ground. He laughed when he did so. I was to learn that green Martians only laugh at the pain or suffering of others. This huge warrior threw me to the ground and then took hold of my arm again to pick me up. I did the only thing I could do. I hit him with my closed fist as hard as I could. The green warrior fell to the floor and did not move. The others in the room grew silent. I had knocked down one of their warriors with only my hand. I moved away from him and prepared to defend myself as best I could, but they did not move. The green Martian that had captured me walked toward me. He said in a clear voice, Tars Tarkas, Tars Tarkas. As he spoke, he pointed to his own chest. He was telling me his name. I pointed to my chest and said, My name, John Carter. He turned and said the word, Sola. Immediately, a green Martian woman came close. He spoke to her. She led me to another building and into a large room. The room was filled with equipment carried by the green Martians. She prepared something for me to eat. I was very hungry. I pointed to her and said the word, Sola. She pointed at me and said my name. It was a beginning. Sola was my guard. She also became my teacher. In time, she would become a close and valued friend. As I ate my meal, my lessons in the language of the green Martians continued. Two days later, Tars Tarkas came to my room. He carried the weapons and the metal armbands the green warriors wear. He put them on the ground near my feet. Sola told him I now understood some of their language. He turned to me and spoke slowly. The warrior you hit is dead. His weapons and the metal of his rank are yours, John Carter. He was a leader of one small group among our people. Because you have killed him, you now are a leader. You are still a captive and not free to leave. However, you will be treated with the respect you have earned. 
You are now a warrior among our people. Tars Tarkas turned and spoke softly. From beyond the door, a strange creature entered the room. It was bigger than a large dog and very ugly. It had rows of long teeth and ten very short legs. Tars Tarkas spoke to the creature and pointed at me. He left. The creature looked at me, watching closely. Then Sola spoke about the creature. His name is Wula. The men of our tribe use them in hunting and war. He has been told to guard and protect you. He has also been told to prevent your escape. There is no faster creature in our world, and in a fight they can kill very quickly. Do not try to escape, John Carter. Wula will tear you to small pieces. I continued to watch the creature named Wula. I had already seen how the green Martians treated other animals. They were very cruel. I thought, perhaps this beast can be taught to be my friend, much like a dog on earth. I walked close to the creature and began speaking in much the same way I would speak to a dog or other animal on earth. I sat down next to him while I talked softly. At first he seemed confused. I believe the creature Wula had never heard a kind word. In the next several days I gained the trust and friendship of Wula. In a few short days Wula was my friend and fierce protector. He would remain my loyal friend as long as I was on Mars. Several days later, Sola came to me with a look of great concern. John Carter, come with me. A great battle is about to take place. An enemy is coming near this city. We must prepare to fight, and we must be ready to flee. Sola, what enemy is this? A race of red men who travel our world in flying machines. A great number of their machines have come over the far mountain. Take your weapons with you and hurry. I collected my sword and a spear. I hurried out of the building and joined a group of warriors moving toward the end of the city. Far in the distance, I could see the airships. They were firing large guns at the Green Warriors. I heard huge explosions. The Green Warriors were firing back with their deadly rifles. The air was filled with the sound of violent battle. Suddenly, a huge airship exploded. It came down, crashing near me. Red Martians were falling from the side of the huge ship, and then it exploded again. Special English program, American Stories. I'm Pat Bodner. October 31st is Halloween. In the spirit of this ancient holiday, we present a story written by Special English reporter and producer Katie Weaver. It's called The Boy on Gravesend Road. Kelly Ryan 
was making dinner. A 10-year-old son, Benjamin, was watching television in the living room. Or at least she thought he was. Benny boy, do you want black beans or red beans? Red beans, oh, Mama. Oh, don't do that, Ben. You scared me half to death. You're going to get it. <laughs> ben had come up quietly right behind her. <laughs> oh, I'll get back to you, you stinker. Kelly goes to the phone. But as soon as she lays her hand on it, the ringing stops. How strange. Oh, the beans. Kelly turns her attention back to cooking. As soon as she does, the phone rings again. Honey, can you get that? Hello? Oh, hi. Yes, I remember. Sure, it sounds fun. Let me ask my mom. Can you hold? She might want to talk to your mom. Uh, oh. Um, okay. See you tomorrow. Ben, your rice and beans are on the table. Let's eat. So... What was that call about? That was Wallace Gray. You know him from class? Mm -hmm. He wants to play tomorrow. Can I go home with him after school? Please, Mom, I get bored around here waiting for you after work. But I don't even know his parents. Maybe I should talk to them. You can't, Mom. He was with his babysitter. He said his parents wouldn't be home until late tonight, and they would leave before he went to school in the morning. Please, Mom, Wallace lives right over on Gravesend Road. It's a five-minute walk from here. Please? Well, okay. What's so great about this guy anyway? You've got a ton of friends to play with. I know, but Wallace is just different. He's got a lot of imagination. The school week passes, and Ben starts to go home almost every day with Wallace. Kelly notices a change in her son. He seems tired and withdrawn. His eyes do not seem to really look at her. They seem lifeless. On Friday night, she decides they need to have a talk. Sweetie, what's going on with you? You seem so tired and far away. Is something wrong? Did you and your new friend have a fight? No, Mom. We've been having a great time. There's nothing wrong with us. Why don't you like Wallace? You don't even know him, but you don't trust him. Benjamin, what are you talking about? I don't dislike Wallace. You're right, I don't know him. You just don't seem like yourself. You've been very quiet the past few nights. I'm sorry, Mom. I guess I'm just tired. I have a great time with Wallace. We play games like cops and robbers. But they seem so real that half of the time I feel like I'm in another world. It's hard to explain. It's like, it's like... I think the word you're looking for is intense? Yeah, that's it. It's intense. Well, tell me about today. What kind of game did you play? We were train robbers, or Wallace was. I was the station manager. Wallace was running through a long train from car to car. He had stolen a lot of money and gold from the passengers. I was chasing right behind him, moving as fast as I could. Finally, he jumps out of the train into the station to make his escape. But I block his path. He grabs a woman on the station platform. She screams, no, no. But he yells, let me through or she dies. So I let him go. What happened then? Well, that's what was weird and, like you said, intense. Wallace threw the lady onto the tracks and laughed. He said that's what evil characters do in the game. They always do the worst. Later, after Ben went to bed, Kelly turned on the 11 o'clock news. She was only half listening as she prepared a list of things to do the next day on Halloween. Okay, let's see. Grocery shopping, tragedy, Halloween decorating, oh, the dog's station. got to go to the groomer, the I've got to go to the hardware store, clean up the garden, and the... instantly. Reports say it appears she was pushed off the station platform into the path of the oncoming train. No. It happened during rush hour today. Some witnesses reported seeing two boys running and playing near the woman. But police say they did not see any images like that on security cameras at the station. No. 
No. In other it news, can't be. The station no is an hour away. They couldn't have gotten there. The How could they? It's just a coincidence. The wind blew low and lonely that night. Kelly slept little. She dreamed she was waiting for Ben at a train station. Then she saw him on the other side, running with another little boy. It must be Wallace, she thought. The little boy went in and out of view. Then, all of a sudden, he stopped and looked across the tracks directly at her. He had no face. Saturday morning was bright and sunny, a cool October day. Kelly made Ben eggs and toast and watched him eat happily. You know, Benny boy, um, a woman did get hurt at the train station yesterday. She actually got hit by a train. Isn't that strange? She looked at Ben. What do you mean, Mom? Well, you and Wallace were playing that game yesterday about being at a train station. You said he threw a woman off the platform and she was killed by a train. Kelly felt like a fool even saying the words. She was speaking to a ten-year-old who had been playing an imaginary game with another ten-year-old. What was she thinking? I said we played that yesterday. I did? Hmm. No, we played that a few days ago, I think. It was just a really good game. Really intense. Yesterday we played pirates. I got to be Captain Frank on the pirate ship, the Arg. Wallace was Davy, the first mate. But he tried to rebel and take over the ship, so I made him walk the plank. Davy walked off into the sea and drowned. Wallace told me I had to order him to walk the plank. He said that's what evil pirates do. <laughs> well, I guess he's right. I don't know any pirates, but I do hear they're pretty evil. So can I play with Wallace today when you are doing your errands? Please, Mom, I don't want to go shopping and putting up Halloween decorations. Oh, whatever. I guess so. I'll pick you up at Wallace's house at about um, 5.30 so you can get ready for trick-or-treating. Where does he live again? Graveson Road. I don't know the street number, but there are only two houses on each side. His is the second one on the left. Okay, I can find that easy enough. Do you still want me to pick up a ghost costume for you? Yep. Oh, and guess what, Mom? Wallace says he's a ghost, too. I suppose we'll haunt the neighborhood together. Everywhere Kelly went that day was crowded. She spent an hour and a half just at the market. When she got home, decorating the house for Halloween was difficult. But finally, she had it all the way she wanted. Oh, oh, gosh, it's five already. I don't even have Ben's costume. She jumped into her car and drove to Wilson Boulevard. The party store was just a few blocks away. Kelly soon found the ghost costume that Ben wanted. She bought it and walked out of the store. Hey, Kelly, long time no see. How's Benjamin doing? Eileen, wow, it's great to see you. How's Matt? We've been so busy since the school year started, we haven't seen anyone. Oh, Matt's good. I mean, he broke his arm last month, oh. so no sports for him. It is driving him crazy. <laughs> um, but at least he's got a lot of time for school That's now. That's good, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Matt was wondering why Benny Boy never comes by anymore. We saw him running around the neighborhood after school last week. It looks like he's having fun, but he's always alone we don't need to set up a play date ben should know that you just tell him to come by and wait, wait wait a minute alone what do you mean alone he started playing with a new friend a wallace somebody after school like every day this past week ben hasn't been alone uh, wallace gray that's it do you know him does matt Oh, Kel Kelly, I'm sure he's a fine kid. I, I don't know him, but don't worry. Ben's got great taste in friends. We know that. I'm sure he really wasn't alone. He was probably just playing hide-and-seek or something. I didn't mean to worry you. I guess everybody's on edge because of what happened to the Godwin boy this morning. Kelly suddenly felt cold and scared. What Godwin boy? And what happened to him? She was not sure she wanted to know. But she had to ask. 
Frank Godwin's youngest boy, Davy, the five-year-old. You know Frank. We call him Captain. He used to be a ship captain. Well, this morning, the rescue squad found Davy in Blackheart Lake. They also found a little toy boat that his dad had made for him. Davy and his dad named it the Arg. Davy must have been trying to sail it. It's so sad. Wait, he's dead? Yes. Davy drowned. Where's Blackheart Lake? It's right off Gravesend Road, right behind that little cemetery. That's why they call it Gravesend. Kelly, where are you going? I've got to get Benjamin. Kelly raced down Main Street. She had no idea who Wallace Gray was or how he was involved in any of this. But she did not trust him, and she knew her child was in danger. Finally, she was at Gravesend Road. Only two houses on each side. She remembered what Ben had told her. Right behind that little cemetery. And what Eileen had told her. Kelly got out of the car and walked down the street. She looked around. The second one on the left. She could see the lake. Some fog was coming up as the sky darkened on this Halloween night. But there was no second house. Instead, what lay before her was grass and large white stones. The cemetery. Kelly walked through the gate into the yard of graves. Ben? No answer. She kept walking. Ben, answer me. I know you're here. Again, no answer. But the wind blew and some leaves began to dance around a headstone. Kelly walked slowly toward the grave. Suddenly, the sky blackened so dark she could not see anything. She felt a force pushing at her. It tried to push her away from the grave, but she knew she had to stay. Benjamin Owen Orr, this is your mother. Come out this second. No one answered, except for the sound of the blowing wind. The darkness lifted. Silvery moonlight shone down directly onto the old gravestone in front of her. But Kelly already knew whose name she would see. Wallace Gray, October 31st, 1900 to October 31st, 1910. Some are best when laid to rest. Kelly took a deep breath, then... Wallace Gray, this play date is over! Give me back my son! Wallace, you are in time! Out! Suddenly, the ground shoots upward like a small volcano. Soil, sticks, and worms fly over Kelly's head and rain down again, followed by her son, who lands beside her. <coughs> ben! <coughs> ben! Mom, Mom, are you there? I yes. can't see all this dirt in my eyes. Ben, I'm here. I'm here, baby. Right here. Oh, sweet Betty boy. Can you breathe? Are you really okay? What I'm happened? Fine. How long were you in there? I don't know, Mom, but I didn't like it. I didn't like where Wallace lives. I want to go home. Oh, me too, sweetie. Come on. Ben, put your arm around me. Come on. Mom, one more thing. What is it, Ben? I don't want to be a ghost for Halloween. Our story today is called The Californian's Tale. It was written by Mark Twain. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. When I was young, I went looking for gold in California. I never found enough to make me rich, but I did discover a beautiful part of the country. It was called the Stanislaw. The Stanislaw was like heaven on earth. It had bright green hills and deep forests where soft winds touched the trees. Other men 
also looking for gold, had reached the Stanislaus Hills of California many years before I did. They had built a town in the valley with sidewalks and stores, banks and schools. They had also built pretty little houses for their families. At first they found a lot of gold in the Stanislaus Hills, but their good luck did not last. After a few years, the gold disappeared. By the time I reached the Stanislaw, all the people were gone too. Grass now grew in the streets, and the little houses were covered by wild rose bushes. Only the sound of insects filled the air as I walked through the empty town that summer day so long ago. Then I realized I was not alone after all. A man was smiling at me as he stood in front of one of the little houses. This house was not covered by wild rose bushes. A nice little garden in front of the house was full of blue and yellow flowers. White curtains hung from the windows and floated in the soft summer wind. Still smiling, the man opened the door of his house and motioned to me. I went inside and could not believe my eyes. I had been living for weeks in rough mining camps with other gold miners. We slept on the hard ground, ate canned beans from cold metal plates, and spent our days in the difficult search for gold. Here in this little house, my spirit seemed to come to life again. I saw a bright rug on the shining wooden floor. Pictures hung all around the room, and on little tables there were seashells, books, and china vases full of flowers. A woman had made this house into a home. The pleasure I felt in my heart must have shown on my face. The man read my thoughts. Yes, he smiled, it is all her work. Everything in this room has felt the touch of her hand. One of the pictures on the wall was not hanging straight. He noticed it and went to fix it. He stepped back several times to make sure the picture was really straight. Then he gave it a gentle touch with his hand. She always does that, he explained to me. It is like the finishing pat a mother gives her child's hair after she has brushed it. I have seen her fix all these things so often that I can do it just the way she does. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. As he talked, I realized there was something in this room that he wanted me to discover. I looked around. When my eyes reached a corner of the room near the fireplace, he broke into a happy laugh and rubbed his hands together. That's it, he cried out. You have found it. I knew you would. It is her picture. I went to a little black shelf that held a small picture of the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. There was a sweetness and softness in the woman's expression that I had never seen before. The man took the picture from my hands and stared at it. She was nineteen on her last birthday. That was the day we were married. When you see her, oh, just wait until you meet her. Where is she now? I asked. Oh, she is away, the man sighed putting the picture back on the little black shelf. She went to visit her parents. They live forty or fifty miles from here. 
She has been gone two weeks today. When will she be back? I asked. Well, this is Wednesday, he said slowly. She will be back on Saturday, in the evening. I felt a sharp sense of regret. I am sorry, because I will be gone by then, I said. Gone? No, why should you go? Don't go. She will be so sorry. You see, she likes to have people come and stay with us. No, I really must leave, I said firmly. He picked up her picture and held it before my eyes. Here, he said. Now you tell her to her face that you could have stayed to meet her and you would not. Something made me change my mind as I looked at the picture for a second time. I decided to stay. The man told me his name was Henry. That night, Henry and I talked about many different things, but mainly about her. The next day passed quietly. Thursday evening, we had a visitor. He was a big, gray-haired miner named Tom. I just came for a few minutes to ask when she's coming home, he explained. Is there any news? Oh, yes, the man replied. I got a letter. Would you like to hear it? He took a yellowed letter out of his shirt pocket and read it to us. It was full of loving messages to him and to other people, their close friends and neighbors. When the man finished reading it, he looked at his friend Oh, no, you are doing it again, Tom. You always cry when I read a letter from her. I'm going to tell her this time. No, you must not do that, Henry, the gray-haired miner said. I am getting old, and any little sorrow makes me cry. I really was hoping she would be here tonight. The next day, Friday, Another old miner came to visit. He asked to hear the letter. The message in it made him cry, too. We all miss her so much, he said. Saturday finally came. I found I was looking at my watch very often. Henry noticed this. You don't think something has happened to her, do you? he asked me. I smiled and said that I was sure she was just fine. But he did not seem satisfied. I was glad to see his two friends, Tom and Joe, coming down the road as the sun began to set. The old miners were carrying guitars. They also brought flowers and a bottle of whiskey. They put the flowers in vases and began to play some fast and lively songs on their guitars. Henry's friends kept giving him glasses of whiskey, which they made him drink. When I reached for one of the two glasses left on the table, Tom stopped my arm. Drop that glass and take the other one, he whispered. He gave the remaining glass of whiskey to Henry just as the clock began to strike midnight. Henry emptied the glass. His face grew whiter and whiter. Boys, he said, I am feeling sick. I want to lie down. Henry was asleep 
almost before the words were out of his mouth. In a moment, his two friends had picked him up and carried him into the bedroom. They closed the door and came back. They seemed to be getting ready to leave, so I said, Please don't go, gentlemen. She will not know me. I am a stranger to her. They looked at each other. His wife has been dead for nineteen years, Tom said. Dead? I whispered. Dead or worse, he said. She went to see her parents about six months after she got married. On her way back, on a Saturday evening in June, when she was almost here, the Indians captured her. No one ever saw her again. Henry lost his mind. He thinks she is still alive. When June comes, he thinks she has gone on her trip to see her parents. Then he begins to wait for her to come back. He gets out that old letter, and we come around to visit so he can read it to us. On the Saturday night she is supposed to come home, we come here to be with him. We put a sleeping drug in his drink so he will sleep through the night. Then he is all right for another year. Joe picked up his hat and his guitar. We have done this every June for nineteen years, he said. The first year there were twenty-seven of us. Now just the two of us are left. He opened the door of the pretty little house, and the two old men disappeared into the darkness of the Stanislaw. Our story today is called The Line of Least Resistance. It was written by Edith Wharton. Here is Larry West with the story. Mr. Minden returned home for lunch. His wife, Millicent, was not at home. The servants did not know where she was. Mr. Minden sat alone at the table in the garden. He ate a small piece of meat and drank some mineral water. Mr. Minden always ate simple meals because he had problems with his stomach. Why then did he keep a cook among his servants? Because his wife, Millicent, liked to invite her friends to big dinners and serve them rare and expensive food and wine. Mr. Minden did not enjoy his wife's parties. Millicent complained that he did not know how to enjoy life. She did a lot of things that he did not like. Millicent wasted Mr. Minden's money and was unpleasant to him, but he never got angry with his wife. After eating, Mr. Minden took a walk through his house. He did not stay long in the living room. It reminded him of all the hours he had spent there at his wife's parties. The sight of the formal dining room made him feel even more uncomfortable. 
He remembered the long dinners where he had to talk to his wife's friends for hours. They never seemed very interested in what he was saying. Mr. Minden walked quickly past the ballroom where his wife danced with her friends. He would go to bed after dinner, but he could hear the orchestra playing until three in the morning. Mr. Minden walked into the library. No one in the house ever read any of the books, but Mr. Minden was proud to be rich enough to have a perfectly useless room in his house. He went into the sunny little room where his wife planned her busy days and evenings. Her writing table was covered with notes and cards from all her friends. Her waste paper basket was full of empty envelopes that had carried invitations to lunches, dinners, and theater parties. Mr. Minden saw a letter crushed into a small ball on the floor. He bent to pick it up. Just as he was about to throw it into the waste paper basket, he noticed that the letter was signed by his business partner, Thomas Antrim. But Antrim's letter to Mr. Minden's wife was not about business. As Mr. Minden read it, he felt as if his mind was spinning out of control. He sat down heavily in the chair near his wife's little writing table. Now the room looked cold and unfamiliar. Who are you? the walls seemed to say. Who am I? Mr. Minden said in a loud voice. I'll tell you who I am. I am the man who paid for every piece of furniture in this room. If it were not for me and my money, this room would be empty. Suddenly, Mr. Minden felt taller. He marched across his wife's room. It belonged to him, didn't it? The house belonged to him, too. He felt powerful. He sat at the table and wrote a letter to Millicent. One of the servants came into the room. Did you call, sir? he asked. No, Mr. Minden replied. But since you are here, please telephone for a taxicab at once. The taxi took him to a hotel near his bank. A clerk showed him to his room. It smelled of cheap soap. The window in the room was open, and hot noises came up from the street. Mr. Minden looked at his watch. Four o'clock. He wondered if Millicent had come home yet and read his letter. His head began to ache, and Mr. Minden lay down on the bed. When he woke up, it was dark. He looked at his watch. Eight o'clock. Millicent must be dressing for dinner. They were supposed to go to Mrs. Targe's house for dinner tonight. Well, Mr. Minden thought, Millicent would have to go alone. Maybe she would ask Thomas Antrim to take her to the party. Mr. Minden realized he was hungry. He left his room and walked down the stairs to the hotel dining room. The air, smelling of coffee and fried food, wrapped itself around his head. Mr. Minden could not eat much of the food that the hotel waiter brought him. He went back to his room, feeling sick. 
He also felt hot and dirty in the clothing he had worn all day. He had never realized how much he loved his home. Someone knocked at his door. Mr. Minden jumped to his feet. Minden? a voice asked. Are you there? Mr. Minden recognized that voice. It belonged to Lawrence Macy. Thirty years ago, Macy had been very popular with women, especially with other men's wives. As a young man, he had interfered in many marriages. Now, in his old age, Lawrence Macy had become a kind of marriage doctor. He helped husbands and wives save their marriages. Mr. Minden began to feel better as soon as Lawrence Macy walked into his hotel room. Two men followed him. One was Mr. Minden's rich uncle, Ezra Brownrigg. The other was the Reverend Dr. Bonifant, the minister of St. Luke's Church, where Mr. Minden and his family prayed every Sunday. Mr. Minden looked at the three men and felt very proud that they had come to help him. For the first time in his married life, Mr. Minden felt as important as his wife Millicent. Lawrence Macy sat on the edge of the bed and lit a cigarette. Mrs. Minden sent for me, he said. Mr. Minden could not help feeling proud of Millicent. She had done the right thing. Macy continued. She showed me your letter. She asks you for mercy. Macy paused and then said, The poor woman is very unhappy, and we have come here to ask you what you plan to do. Now, Mr. Minden began to feel uncomfortable. To do? he asked. To do? Well, uh, I... I plan to... to leave her. Macy stopped smoking his cigarette. Do you want to divorce her? he asked. Why, yes, yes, Mr. Minden replied. Macy knocked the ashes from his cigarette. Are you absolutely sure that you want to do this? he asked. Mr. Minden nodded his head. I plan to divorce her, he said loudly. Mr. Minden began to feel very excited. It was the first time he had ever had so many people sitting and listening to him. He told his audience everything, beginning with his discovery of his wife's love affair with his business partner, and ending with his complaints about her expensive dinner parties. His uncle looked at his watch. Dr. Bonifant began to stare out of the hotel window. Macy stood up. Do you plan to dishonor yourself then? he asked. No one knows what has happened. You are the only one who can reveal the secret. You will make yourself look foolish. Mr. Minden tried to rise, but he fell back weakly. The three men picked up their hats. In another moment, they would be gone. When they left... Mr. Minden would lose his audience 
and his belief in himself and his decision. I won't leave for New York until tomorrow, he whispered. Lawrence Macy smiled. Tomorrow will be too late, he said. Tomorrow everyone will know you are here. Macy opened the hotel room door. Mr. Brownrigg and Dr. Bonifant walked out of the room. Macy turned to follow them when he felt Mr. Minden's hand grab his arm. I... I will come with you, Mr. Minden sighed. It's... It's... For the children. Lawrence Macy nodded as Mr. Minden walked out of the room. He closed the door gently. Our story today is called A Piece of Red Calico. It was written by Frank Stockton. Stockton was a popular writer in the second half of the 19th century. He wrote a large number of stories for children and other stories for adults. His most famous work, The Lady or the Tiger, can also be heard in VOA Special English. Now, here is Steve Ember with Frank Stockton's A Piece of Red Calico. I was going to town one morning when my wife gave me a little piece of red calico cloth. She asked me if I would have time during the day to buy her two and a half meters of calico cloth like that. I told her that it would be no trouble at all. Putting the piece of brightly colored cloth in my pocket, I took the train to the city. During the day, I stopped in at a large store. I saw a man walking the floor and asked him where I could see some red calico. This way, sir, and he led me up the store. Miss Stone, said he to a young woman, show this gentleman some red calico. What kind of red do you want? asked Miss Stone. I showed her the little piece of calico cloth that my wife had given me. She looked at it and gave it back to me. Then she took down a great roll of cloth and spread it out on the counter. Why, that isn't the right kind of red, said I. No, not exactly, said she, but it looks nicer than your sample. That may be, said I, but you see, I want it to look like this piece. There is something already made of this kind of calico, which needs to be enlarged or fixed or something. I want some calico of the same shade. The girl made no answer, but took down another roll of cloth. That's the right color, said she. Yes, I answered. But it is striped. Stripes are worn more than anything else in calicoes, said she. Yes, but this isn't to be worn, I said. It's for a piece of furniture, I think. At any rate, I want perfectly plain material to go with something already in use. Well, I don't think you can find it perfectly plain unless you get turkey red, she said. What is turkey red? I asked. 
Turkey red is perfectly plain in calicoes, she answered. Well, let me see some. We haven't any turkey red calico left, she said, but we have some very nice plain calicoes in other colors. I don't want any other color. I want cloth to go with this. It's hard to find low-cost calico like that, she said, and so I left her. I next went into a store a few doors up the street. I gave a salesman my sample and asked, Have you any calico like this? Yes, sir, said he, third counter to the right. I went to the third counter to the right. A man there looked at my sample on both sides. Then he said, We haven't any of this. I was told you had, said I. We had it, but we're out of it now. You'll get that from an upholsterer, someone who recovers furniture. I went across the street to the upholsterer's store. Have you anything like this? I asked. No, said the man. We haven't. Is it for furniture? Yes, I answered. Then turkey red is what you want. Is turkey red just like this? I asked. No, said he, but it's much better. That makes no difference to me, I said. I want something just like this. But they don't use that for furniture, he said. I should think people could use anything they wanted for furniture, I said, somewhat sharply. They can, but they don't, he said calmly. They don't use red like that. They use turkey red. I said no more, but left. The next place I visited was a very large store. Of the first salesman I saw, I asked if they sold red calico like my sample. "'You'll find that on the second floor,' said he. I went up the steps. There I asked a man, "'Where will I find red calico?' "'In the far room to the left, over there,' and he pointed to a distant corner." I walked through the crowds of purchasers and salespeople, and around the counters and tables filled with goods, to the far room to the left. When I got there, I asked for red calico. "'The second counter down this side,' said the man. I went there and produced my sample. "'Calicos are downstairs,' said the man." They told me they were up here, I said. Not these plain goods. You'll find them downstairs at the back of the store over on that side. I went downstairs to the back of the store. Where will I find red calico like this? I asked. Next counter but one, said the man, walking with me in the direction he pointed out. Done. Show this man red calicos. Mr. Dunn took my sample and looked at it. "'We haven't this shade in that quality of goods,' he said. "'Well, do you have it in any quality of goods?' I asked. "'Yes, we've got it finer.' And he took down a piece of calico and unrolled a meter or two of it on the counter. "'That's not this shade,' I said. "'No,' said he. It is finer, and the color is better. I want it to match this, I said. I thought you didn't care about the match, said the salesman. You said you didn't care for the quality of the goods. You know, you can't match goods unless you take into consideration quality and color both. If you want that quality of goods in red, you ought to get turkey red. I did not think it necessary to answer this comment, but said, "'Then you've got nothing like this.' "'No, sir. But perhaps they may have it in the upholstery department on the sixth floor.' 
So I got in the elevator and went to the sixth floor. Have you any red material like this? I said to a young man. Red material? Upholstery department, other end of this floor. I went to the other end of the floor. I want some red calico, I said to a man. Furniture goods? he asked. Yes, said I. Fourth counter to the left. I went to the fourth counter to the left and showed my sample to a salesman. He looked at it and said, You'll get this down on the first floor, calico department. I went down in the elevator and out on the street. I was completely sick of red calico, but I decided to make one more effort. My wife had bought her red calico not long before, and there must be some to be had somewhere. I should have asked her where she got it, but I thought a simple little thing like that could be bought anywhere. I went into another large store. As I entered the door, a sudden nervousness took hold of me. I just could not take out that piece of red calico again. If I had had any other kind of cloth, I think I would have asked them if they could match that. But I stepped up to a young woman and presented my sample with the usual question. Back room, counter on the left, she said. I went there. Have you any red calico like this? I asked the saleswoman. No, sir, she said, but we have it in turkey red. Turkey red again. I surrendered. All right, I said. Give me turkey red. How much, sir? she asked. I don't know. Say fifteen meters. She looked at me strangely but measured off fifteen meters of turkey red calico. Then she touched the counter and called out, Cash! A young girl with yellow hair appeared. The woman wrote the number of meters, the name of the goods, her own number, the price, and the amount of money I gave her on a piece of paper. She probably wrote some other things, like, the color of my eyes and the direction and speed of the wind. She then copied all this into a little book. Then she gave the piece of paper, the money, and the turkey red cloth to the yellow-haired girl. This girl copied the information into a little book she carried. Then she went away with the calico, the paper, and the money. After a very long time, the girl came back, bringing the money I was owed and the package of turkey red calico. I returned to my office, but had time for very little work the rest of the day. When I reached home, I gave the package of calico to my wife. She opened it and declared, Why, this doesn't match the piece I gave you. Match it, I cried. Oh, no, it doesn't match it. You didn't want that matched. You were mistaken. What you wanted was turkey red, third counter to the left. I mean, turkey red is what they use. My wife looked at me in surprise, and then I told her my troubles. Well, said she, this turkey red is much nicer looking than what I had. You've got so much of it that I don't have to use the other at all. I wish I had thought of turkey red before. I wish from the bottom of my heart you had, said I.
Our story today is called Luck. It was written by Mark Twain. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. I was at a dinner in London, given in honor of one of the most celebrated English military men of his time. I do not want to tell you his real name and titles. I will just call him Lieutenant General Lord Arthur Scoresby. I cannot describe my excitement when I saw this great and famous man. There he sat, the man himself, in person, all covered with medals. I could not take my eyes off him. He seemed to show the true mark of greatness. His fame had no effect on him. The hundreds of eyes watching him, the worship of so many people, did not seem to make any difference to him. Next to me sat a clergyman, who was an old friend of mine. He was not always a clergyman. During the first half of his life he was a teacher in the military school at Woolwich. There was a strange look in his eye as he leaned toward me and whispered, Privately, he is a complete fool. He meant, of course, the hero of our dinner. This came as a shock to me. I looked hard at my friend. I could not have been more surprised if he had said the same thing about Napoleon, or Socrates, or Solomon. But I was sure of two things about the clergyman. He always spoke the truth, and his judgment of men was good. Therefore, I wanted to find out more about our hero as soon as I could. Some days later, I got a chance to talk with the clergyman, and he told me more. These are his exact words. About forty years ago, I was an instructor in the military academy at Woolwich when young Scoresby was given his first examination. I felt extremely sorry for him. Everybody answered the questions, well, intelligently, while he, why, dear me, he did not know anything, so to speak. He was a nice pleasant young man. It was painful to see him stand there and give answers that were miracles of stupidity. I knew, of course, that when examined again, he would fail and be thrown out. So, I said to myself, it would be a simple, harmless act to help him as much as I could. I took him aside, and found he knew a little about Julius Caesar's history, but he did not know anything else. So I went to work, and tested him, and worked him like a slave. I made him work over and over again on a few questions about Caesar, which I knew he would be asked. If you will believe me, he came through very well on the day of the examination. He got high praise, too, while others who knew a thousand times more than he were sharply criticized. By some strange, lucky accident, he was asked no questions but those I made him study. Such an accident does not happen more than once in an hundred years. Well, all through his studies, I stood by him with the feeling a mother has for a disabled child. And he always saved himself by some miracle. I thought that what in the end would destroy him would be the mathematics examination. I decided to make his end as painless as possible. So 
I pushed facts into his stupid head for hours. Finally, I let him go to the examination to experience what I was sure would be his dismissal from school. Well, sir, try to imagine the result. I was shocked out of my mind. He took first prize, and he got the highest praise. I felt guilty day and night. What I was doing was not right, but I only wanted to make his dismissal a little less painful for him. I never dreamed it would lead to such strange, laughable results. I thought that, sooner or later, one thing was sure to happen. The first real test, once he was through school, would ruin him. Then the Crimean War broke out. I felt that sad for him that there had to be a war. Peace would have given this donkey a chance to escape from ever being found out as being so stupid. Nervously, I waited for the worst to happen. It did. He was appointed an officer, a captain of all things, who could have dreamed that they would place such a responsibility on such weak shoulders as his. I said to myself that I was responsible to the country for this. I must go with him and protect the nation against him as far as I could. So I joined up with him, and away we went to the field. And there, oh dear, it was terrible. Mistakes, fearful mistakes. Why, he never did anything that was right. Nothing but mistakes. But you see, nobody knew the secret of how stupid he really was. Everybody misunderstood his actions. They saw his stupid mistakes as works of great intelligence. They did, honestly. His smallest mistakes made a man in his right mind cry and shout and scream, too, to himself, of course. And what kept me in a continual fear was the fact that every mistake he made increased his glory and fame. I kept saying to myself that when at last they find out about him, it will be like the sun falling out of the sky. He continued to climb up over the dead bodies of his superiors. Then, in the hottest moment of one battle, down went our colonel. My heart jumped into my mouth, for Scoresby was the next in line to take his place. Now we are in for it, I said. The battle grew hotter. The English and their allies were steadily retreating all over the field. Our regiment occupied a position that was extremely important. One mistake now would bring total disaster. And what did Scoresby do this time? He just mistook his left hand for his right hand, that was all. An order came for him to fall back and support our right. Instead, he moved forward and went over the hill to the left. We were over the hill before this insane movement could be discovered and stopped. And what did we find? A large and unsuspected Russian army waiting. And what happened? Were we all killed? That is exactly what would have happened in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred. But no, those surprised Russians thought that no one regiment by itself would come around there at such a time. It must be the whole British army, they thought. They turned tail 
Away they went over the hill and down into the field in wild disorder, and we after them. In no time there was the greatest turn around you ever saw. The Allies turned defeat into a sweeping and shining victory. The Allied commander looked on, his head spinning with wonder, surprise, and joy. He sent right off for Scoresby and put his arms around him and hugged him on the field in front of all the armies. Scoresby became famous that day as a great military leader, honored throughout the world. That honor will never disappear while history books last. He is just as nice and pleasant as ever, but he still does not know enough to come in out of the rain. He is the stupidest man in the universe. Until now, nobody knew it but Scoresby and myself. He has been followed day by day, year by year, by a strange luck. He has been a shining soldier in all our wars for years. He has filled his whole military life with mistakes. Every one of them brought him another honorary title. Look at his chest flooded with British and foreign medals. Well, sir, every one of them is the record of some great stupidity or other. They are proof that the best thing that can happen to a man is to be born lucky. I say again, as I did at the dinner, Scoresby's a complete fool. Our story today is called The Cask of Amontillado. It was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Here is Larry West with the story. Fortunato and I both were members of very old and important Italian families. We used to play together when we were children. Fortunato was bigger, richer, and more handsome than I was. And he enjoyed making me look like a fool. He hurt my feelings a thousand times during the years of my childhood. I never showed my anger, however, so he thought we were good friends. But I promised myself that one day I would punish Fortunato for his insults to me. Many years passed. Fortunato married a rich and beautiful woman who gave him sons. Deep in my heart, I hated him. But I never said or did anything that showed him how I really felt. When I smiled at him, he thought it was because we were friends. He did not know it was the thoughts of his death 
that made me smile. Everyone in our town respected Fortunato. Some men were afraid of him because he was so rich and powerful. He had a weak spot, however. He thought he was an excellent judge of wine. I also was an expert on wine. I spent a lot of money buying rare and costly wines. I stored the wines in the dark rooms under my family's palace. Our palace was one of the oldest buildings in the town. The Montresor family had lived in it for hundreds of years. We had buried our dead in the rooms under the palace. These tombs were quiet, dark places that no one but myself ever visited. Late one evening, during carnival season, I happened to meet Fortunato on the street. He was going home alone from a party. Fortunato was beautiful in his silk suit, made of many colors, yellow, green, purple, and red. On his head he wore an orange cap, covered with little silver bells. I could see he had been drinking too much wine. He threw his arms around me. He said he was glad to see me. I said I was glad to see him, too, because I had a little problem. What is it? he asked, putting his large hand on my shoulder. My dear Fortunato, I said, I'm afraid I have been very stupid. The man who sells me wine said he had a rare barrel of Amontillado wine. I believed him, and I bought it from him. But now I'm not so sure that the wine is really Amontillado. What? he said. A cask of Amontillado at this time of year? An entire barrel? Impossible. Yes, I was very stupid. I paid the wine man the full price he wanted without asking you to taste the wine first. But I couldn't find you, and I was afraid he would sell the cask of Amontillado to someone else. So I bought it. A cask of Amontillado, Fortunato repeated. Where is it? I pretended I didn't hear his question. Instead, I told him I was going to visit our friend Lucreci. He will be able to tell me if the wine is really Amontillado, I said. Fortunato laughed in my face. Lucreci cannot tell Amontillado from vinegar. I smiled to myself and said, But some people say that he is as good a judge of wine as you are. Fortunato grabbed my arm. Take me to it, he said. I'll taste the Amontillado for you. But, my friend, I protested, it is late. The wine is in my wine cellar underneath the palace. Those rooms are very damp and cold, and the walls drip with water. I don't care, he said. I am the only person who can tell you if your wine man has cheated you. Lucreci cannot. Fortunato turned, and still holding me by the arm, pulled me down the street to my home. The building was empty. My servants were enjoying carnival. I knew they would be gone all night. I took two large candles, lit them, and gave one to Fortunato. I started down the dark, twisting stairway with Fortunato close behind me. At the bottom of the stairs, the damp air wrapped itself around our bodies. Where are we? Fortunato asked. I thought you said the cask of Amontillado was in your wine cellar. It is, I said. 
The wine cellar is just beyond these tombs, where the dead of my family are kept. Surely you are not afraid of walking through the tombs. He turned and looked into my eyes. Tombs, he said. He began to cough. The silver bells on his cap jingled. My poor friend, I said, how long have you had that cough? It's nothing, he said. But he couldn't stop coughing. Come, I said firmly, we will go back upstairs. Your health is important. You are rich, respected, admired, and loved. You have a wife and children. Many people would miss you if you died. We will go back before you get seriously ill. I can go to Lucrece for help with the wine. No, he cried. This <coughs> cough is nothing. It will not kill me. I won't die <coughs> from a cough. Uh, that is true, I said. But you must be careful. He took my arm, and we began to walk through the cold, dark rooms. We went deeper and deeper into the cellar. Finally, we arrived in a small room. Bones were pushed high against one wall. A doorway in another wall opened to an even smaller room, about one meter wide and two meters high. Its walls were solid rock. Here we are, I said. I hid the cask of Amontillado in there. I pointed to the smaller room. Fortunato lifted his candle and stepped into the tiny room. I immediately followed him. He stood stupidly staring at two iron handcuffs chained to a wall of the tiny room. I grabbed his arms and locked them into the metal handcuffs. It took only a moment. He was too surprised to fight me. I stepped outside the small room. Where is the Amadiado? he cried. Ah, yes, I said. The cask of Amontillado. I leaned over and began pushing aside the pile of bones against the wall. Under the bones was a basket of stone blocks, some cement, and a small shovel. I had hidden the materials there earlier. I began to fill the doorway of the tiny room with stones and cement. By the time I laid the first row of stones, Fortunato was no longer drunk. I heard him moaning inside the tiny room for ten minutes. Then there was a long silence. I finished the second and third rows of stone blocks. As I began the fourth row, I heard Fortunato begin to shake the chains that held him to the wall. He was trying to pull them out of the granite wall. I smiled to myself and stopped working so that I could better enjoy listening to the noise. After a few minutes, he stopped. I finished the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh rows of stones. The wall I was building in the doorway was now almost up to my shoulders. Suddenly loud screams burst from the throat of the chained man. For a moment I worried. What if someone heard him? Then I placed my hand on the solid rock of the walls and felt safe. I looked into the tiny room where he was still screaming. And I began to scream, too. My screams grew louder than his, and he stopped. It was now almost midnight. I finished the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth rows. All that was left was a stone for the last hole in the wall. I was about to push it in, when I heard a low laugh from behind the stones. 
The laugh made the hair on my head stand up. Then Fortunato spoke in a sad voice that no longer sounded like him. He said, Well, you have played a good joke on me. We will laugh about it soon over a glass of that Amontillado. But isn't it getting late? My wife and my friends will be waiting for us. Let us go. Yes, I replied. Let us go. I waited for him to say something else. I heard only my own breathing. Fortunato, I called. No answer. I called again. Fortunato! Still no answer. I hurried to put the last stone into the wall and put the cement around it. Then I pushed the pile of bones in front of the new wall I had built. That was fifty years ago. For half a century now, no one has touched those bones. May he rest in peace.